This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on February 12, 2006. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby, Part 1, Translator's Preface. 1. About this translation. It was with considerable reluctance that I abandoned in favor of the present undertaking what had long been a favorite project, that of a new edition of Shelton's Don Quixote, which has now become a somewhat scarce book. There are some, and I confess myself to be one, for whom Shelton's racy old version with all its defects has a charm that no modern translation, however skillful or correct, could possess. Shelton had the inestimable advantage of belonging to the same generation as Cervantes. Don Quixote had to him a vitality that only a contemporary could feel. It cost him no dramatic effort to see things as Cervantes saw them. There is no anachronism in his language. He put the Spanish of Cervantes into the English of Shakespeare. Shakespeare himself most likely knew the book. He may have carried it home with him in his saddlebags to Stratford on one of his last journeys, and under the mulberry tree at New Place joined hands with a kindred genius in its pages. But it was soon made plain to me that to hope for even a moderate popularity for Shelton was vain. His fine old crusted English would no doubt be relished by a minority, but it would only be a minority. His warmest admirers must admit that he is not a satisfactory representative of Cervantes. His translation of the first part was very hastily made, and was never revised by him. It has all the freshness and vigor, but also a full measure of the faults of a hasty production. It is often very literal, barbarously literal frequently, but just as often very loose. He had, evidently, a good colloquial knowledge of Spanish, but apparently not much more. It never seems to occur to him that the same translation of a word will not suit in every case. It is often said that we have no satisfactory translation of Don Quixote. To those who are familiar with the original, it savors of truism or platitude to say so, for, in truth, there can be no thoroughly satisfactory translation of Don Quixote into English or any other language. It is not that the Spanish idioms are so utterly unmanageable, or that the untranslatable words, numerous enough, no doubt, are so superabundant, but rather that the sententious terseness to which the humor of the book owes its flavor is peculiar to Spanish, and can at best be only distantly imitated by any other tongue. The history of our English translations of Don Quixote is instructive. Shelton's, the first in any language, was made apparently about 1608, but was not published until 1612. This, of course, was only the first part. It had been asserted that the second, published in 1620, is not the work of Shelton, but there is nothing to support the assertion, save the fact that it has less spirit, less of what we generally understand by go about it than the first, which would be only natural if the first were the work of a young man, writing Corrente Calamo, and the second that of a middle-aged man, writing for a bookseller. On the other hand, it is closer and more literal. The style is the same, the very same translations or mistranslations occur in it, and it is extremely unlikely that a new translator would, by suppressing his name, have allowed Shelton to carry off the credit. In 1687, John Phillips, Milton's nephew, produced a Don Quixote, made English, he says, according to the humor of our modern language. His Quixote is not so much a translation as a travesty, and a travesty that, for coarseness, vulgarity, and buffoonery, is almost unexampled even in the literature of that day. Ned Ward's Life and Noble Adventures of Don Quixote, merrily translated into Hudibrastic verse, 1700, can scarcely be reckoned a translation, but it serves to show the light in which Don Quixote was regarded at the time. A further illustration may be found in the version published in 1712 by Peter Motu, 
who had then recently combined tea-dealing with literature. It is described as translated from the original by several hands, but if so, all Spanish flavor has entirely evaporated under the manipulation of the several hands. The flavor that it has, on the other hand, is distinctly Franco-Cockney. Anyone who compares it carefully with the original will have little doubt that it is a concoction from Shelton and the French of Fiot de Saint-Martin, eked out by borrowings from Phillips, whose mode of treatment it adopts. It is, to be sure, more decent and decorous, but it treats Don Quixote in the same fashion as a comic book, and cannot be made too comic. To attempt to improve the humor of Don Quixote by the infusion of cockney flippancy and facetiousness, as Motteux's operators did, is not merely an impertinence like larding a sirloin of prize beef, but an absolute falsification of the spirit of the book, and it is a proof of the uncritical way in which Don Quixote is generally read, that this worse-than-worthless translation, worthless as failing to represent, worse than worthless as misrepresenting, should have been favored as it has been. It had the effect, however, of bringing out a translation undertaken and executed in a very different spirit, that of Charles Gervas, the portrait painter and friend of Pope, Swift, Obrutnot, and Gay. Gervas has been allowed little credit for his work. Indeed, it may be said none, for it is known to the world in general as Jarvis's. It was not published until after his death, and the printers gave the name according to the current pronunciation of the day. It has been the most freely used and the most freely abused of all the translations. It has seen far more editions than any other. It is admitted on all hands to be by far the most faithful, and yet nobody seems to have a good word to say for it or for its author. Gervas, no doubt, prejudiced readers against himself in his preface, where, among many true words about Shelton, Stevens, and Motteau, he rashly and unjustly charges Shelton with having translated not from the Spanish, but from the Italian version of Francisconi, which did not appear until ten years after Shelton's first volume. A suspicion of incompetence, too, seems to have attached to him, because he was by profession a painter, and a mediocre one, although he has given us the best portrait we have of Swift, and this may have been strengthened by Pope's remark that he translated Don Quixote without understanding Spanish. He has been also charged with borrowing from Shelton, whom he disparaged. It is true that in a few difficult or obscure passages he has followed Shelton and gone astray with him, but for one case of this sort there are fifty where he is right and Shelton wrong. As for Pope's dictum, anyone who examines Gervas's version carefully, side by side with the original, will see that he was a sound Spanish scholar, incomparably a better one than Shelton, except perhaps in mere colloquial Spanish. He was, in fact, an honest, faithful, and painstaking translator, and he has left a version which, whatever its shortcomings may be, is singularly free from errors and mistranslations. The charge against it is that it is stiff, dry, wooden in a word, and no one can deny that there is a foundation for it. But it may be pleaded for Gervas that a good deal of this rigidity is due to his abhorrence of the light, flippant, jocose style of his predecessors. He was one of the few, very few, translators that have shown any apprehension of the unsmiling gravity which is the essence of the quixotic humor. It seems to him a crime to bring Cervantes forward, smirking and grinning at his own good things, and to this may be attributed in great measure the aesthetic abstinence from everything savoring of liveliness, which is the characteristic of his translation. In most modern editions, it should be observed, his style has been smoothed and smartened, but without any reference to the original Spanish, so that it is as if he has been made to read more agreeably, he has also been robbed of his chief merit of fidelity. Smollett's version, published in 1755, may almost be counted as one of these. At any rate, it is plain that in its construction Gervas' translation was very freely drawn upon, and very little, or probably no heed, given to the original Spanish. The later translations may be dismissed in a few words. 
George Kelly's, which appeared in 1769, printed for the translator, was an impudent imposture, being nothing more than Motteux's version, with a few of the words here and there artfully transposed. Charles Wilmot's, in 1774, was only an abridgment, like Florian's, but not so skillfully executed, and the version published by Miss Smirk in 1818 to accompany her brother's plates was merely a patchwork production made out of former translations. On the latest, Mr. A. J. Duffield's, it would be in every sense of the word impertinent in me to offer an opinion here. I had not even seen it when the present undertaking was proposed to me, and since then I may say vidi tantum, having for obvious reasons resisted the temptation which Mr. Duffield's reputation and comely volumes hold out to every lover of Cervantes. From the foregoing history of our translations of Don Quixote, it will be seen that there are a good many people, provided they get the mere narrative of it with its full complement of facts, incidents, and adventures served up to them in the form that amuses them, care very little whether that form is the one in which Cervantes originally shaped his ideas. On the other hand, it is clear that there are many who desire to have not merely the story he tells, but the story as he tells it, so far at least as differences of idiom and circumstances permit, who will give a preference to the conscientious translator, even though he may have acquitted himself somewhat awkwardly. But, after all, there is no real antagonism between the two classes. There is no reason why what pleases the one should not please the other, or why a translator who makes it his aim to treat Don Quixote with the respect due to a great classic should not be as acceptable even to the careless reader as the one who treats it as a famous old jest book. It is not with the question of caviar to the general or, if it is, the fault rests with him who makes it so. The method by which Cervantes won the ear of the Spanish people ought, mutatis mundantis, to be equally effective with the great majority of English readers. At any rate, even if there are readers to whom it is a matter of indifference, fidelity to the method is as much a part of the translator's duty as fidelity to the matter. If he can please all parties, so much the better, but his first duty is to those who look to him for as faithful a representation of his author as it is in his power to give them, faithful to the letter so long as fidelity is practical, faithful to the spirit so far as he can make it. My purpose here is not to dogmatize on the rules of translation, but to indicate those who I have followed or at least tried to the best of my ability to follow, in the present instance. One which, it seems to me, cannot be too rigidly followed in translating Don Quixote, is to avoid everything that savors of affectation. The book itself is, indeed, in one sense, a protest against it, and no man abhorred it more than Cervantes. For this reason, I think, any temptation to use antiquated or obsolete language should be resisted. It is, after all, an affectation, and one for which there is no warrant or excuse. Spanish has probably undergone less change since the seventeenth century than any language in Europe, and by far the greater and certainly the best part of Don Quixote differs but little in language from the colloquial Spanish of the present day. Except in the tales and Don Quixote's speeches, the translator who uses the simplest and plainest everyday language will almost always be the one who approaches nearest to the original. Seeing that the story of Don Quixote and all its characters and incidents have now been for more than two centuries and a half familiar as household words in English mouths, it seems to me that the old familiar names and phrases should not be changed without good reason. Of course, a translator who holds that Don Quixote should receive the treatment a great classic deserves will feel himself bound by the injunction laid upon the Morisco in Chapter 9 not to omit or add anything. 2. About Cervantes and Don Quixote Four generations had laughed over Don Quixote before it occurred to any one to ask who and what manner of man was this Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, whose name is on the title page. 
and it was too late for a satisfactory answer to the question when it was proposed to add a life of the author to the London edition, published at Lord Carteret's insistence in 1738. All traces of the personality of Cervantes had by that time disappeared. Any floating traditions that may once have existed, transmitted from men who had known him, had long since died out, and of other record there was none. For the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries were incurious as to the men of the time, a reproach against which the nineteenth has at any rate secured itself, if it has produced no Shakespeare or Cervantes. All that Mayans Isiscar, to whom the task was entrusted, or any of those who followed him, Rios, Pelusier, or Navarrete, could do was to eke out the few allusions Cervantes makes to himself in his various prefaces with such pieces of documentary evidence bearing upon his life as they could find. This, however, has been done by the last-named biographer to such good purpose that he has superseded all predecessors. Thoroughness is the chief characteristic of Navarrete's work. Besides sifting, testing, and methodizing with rare patience and judgment what had been previously brought to light, he left, as the saying is, no stone unturned under which anything to illustrate his subject might possibly be found. Navarrete has done all that industry and acumen could do, and it is no fault of his if he has not given us what we want. What Hallam says of Shakespeare may be applied to the almost parallel case of Cervantes. It is not the register of his baptism, nor the draft of his will, nor the orthography of his name that we seek. No letter of his writing, no record of his conversation, no character of him drawn by a contemporary has been produced. It is only natural, therefore, that the biographers of Cervantes, forced to make brick without straw, should have recourse largely to conjecture, and that conjecture should in some instances come by degrees to take the place of established fact. All that I propose to do here is to separate what is matter of fact from what is matter of conjecture, and leave it to the reader's judgment to decide whether the data justify the inference or not. The men whose names by common consent stand in the front rank of Spanish literature, Cervantes, Lope de Vega, Quevedo, Calderon, Garcilaso de Vega, the Mendozas, Gongora, were all men of ancient families, and curiously all except the last of families that trace their origin to the same mountain district in the north of Spain. The family of Cervantes is commonly said to have been of Galatian origin, and unquestionably it was in possession of lands in Galatia at a very early date. But I think the balance of the evidence tends to show that the Solar, the original site of the family, was at Cervatos in the northwest corner of Old Castile, close to the junction of Castile, Leon, and the Asturias. As it happens, there is a complete history of the Cervantes family from the 10th century down to the 17th, extant under the title of Illustrious Ancestry, Glorious Deeds, and Noble Posterity of the famous Nuno Alfonso Alciade of Toledo, written in 1648 by the industrious genealogist Rodrigo Mendez Silva, who availed himself of the manuscript genealogy by Juan de Meña, the poet laureate and historiographer of John the Second. The origin of the name Cervantes is curious. Nuno Alfonso was almost as distinguished in the struggle against the Moors in the reign of Alfonso the Seventh as the Cid had been a half century before in that of Alfonso the Sixth and was rewarded by divers grants of land in the neighborhood of Toledo. On one of his acquisitions, about two leagues from the city, he built himself a castle which he called Cervatos, because he was the lord of the solar of Cervatos in the Montana, as the mountain region extending from the Basque provinces to Leon was always called. At his death in battle in 1143, the castle passed by will to his son Alfonso Muno, who, as territorial or local surnames were then coming into vogue in place of the simple patronymic, took the additional name of Cervatos. 
His eldest son Pedro succeeded him in the possession of the castle, and followed his example in adopting the name, an assumption at which the younger son Gonzalo seems to have taken umbrage. Everyone who has paid even a flying visit to Toledo will remember the ruined castle that crowns the hill above the spot where the bridge of Alcantara spans the gorge of the Tagus, and with its broken outline and crumbling walls makes such an admirable pendant to the square, solid Alcazar, towering over the city roofs on the opposite side. It was built, or as some say restored, by Alfonso the Sixth, shortly after his occupation of Toledo in 1085, and called by him San Servando, after a Spanish martyr, a name subsequently modified into San Servan, in which form it appears in The Poem of the Cid. San Cervantes with an S, and San Cervantes with a C, with regard to which the last handbook of Spain warns its readers against the supposition that it has anything to do with the author of Don Quixote. Ford, as all know who have taken him for a companion and counsellor on the roads of Spain, is seldom wrong in matters of literature or history. In this instance, however, he is in error. It has everything to do with the author of Don Quixote, for it is, in fact, these old walls that have given to Spain the name she is proudest of today. Gonzalo, above mentioned, it may be readily conceived, did not relish the appropriation by his brother of a name to which he himself had an equal right, for, although nominally taken from the castle, it was, in reality, derived from the ancient territorial possessions of the family, and to distinguish himself from his brother, he took as a surname the name of the castle on the bank of the Tagus, in the building of which, according to a family tradition, his great-grandfather had a share. Both brothers founded families. The Cervantes branch had more tenacity. It sent offshoots in various directions, Andalusia, Estradamoria, Galicia, and Portugal, and produced a goodly line of men distinguished in the service of the church and the state. Gonzalo himself, and apparently a son of his, followed Ferdinand III in the great campaign of 1236 through 48 that gave Cordova and Seville to Christian Spain, and penned up the Moors in the kingdom of Granada, and his descendants intermarried with some of the noblest families of the peninsula, and numbered among them soldiers, magistrates, and church dignitaries, including at least two cardinal archbishops. Of the line that settled in Andalusia, Diego de Cervantes, commander of the Order of Santiago, married Juana Alvinanda, daughter of Juan Arias de Saavedra, and had several sons, one of whom, Gonzalo Gomez, corregidor of Yerez, an ancestor of the Mexican and Colombian branches of the family, and another, Juan, whose son Rodrigo married Dona Lenor de Cortinas, and by her had four children, Rodrigo, Andrea, Luisa, and Miguel, our author. The pedigree of Cervantes is not without its bearing on Don Quixote. A man who could look back upon an ancestry of genuine knights-errant, extending from well-nigh the time of Peleo to the siege of Granada, was likely to have a strong feeling on the subject of the sham chivalry of the romances. It gives a point, too, to what he says in more than one place about families that have once been great and have tapered away until they have come to nothing like a pyramid. It was the case with his own. He was born at Alcala de Henares and baptized in the church of Santa Maria Mayor on the ninth of October, 1547. Of his boyhood and youth we know nothing, unless it be from the glimpse he gives us in the preface to his comedies of himself as a boy, looking on with delight while Lope de Redure and his company set up their rude plank stage in the plaza, and acted the rustic farces which he himself afterwards took as a model for his interludes. This first glimpse, however, is a significant one for it shows the early development of that love of the drama which exercised such an influence on his life, and seems to have grown stronger as he grew older, and of which this very preface, written only a few months before his death, is such a striking proof. He gives us to understand, too, that he was a great reader in his youth, 
but of this no assurance was needed. For the first part of Don Quixote alone proves the vast amount of miscellaneous reading, romances of chivalry, ballads, popular poetry, chronicles, for which he had no time or opportunity except in the first twenty years of his life, and his misquotations and mistakes in matters of detail are always, it may be noticed, those of a man recalling the reading of his boyhood. Other things besides the drama were in their infancy when Cervantes was a boy. The period of his boyhood was in every way a transition period for Spain. The old chivalrous Spain had passed away. The new Spain was the mightiest power the world had seen since the Roman Empire, and it had not yet been called upon to pay the price of its greatness. By the policy of Ferdinand and Imenez, the sovereign was made absolute, and the church and inquisition adroitly adjusted to keep him so. The nobles, who had always resisted absolutism as strenuously as they had fought the Moors, had been divested of all political power. A like fate had befallen the cities. The free constitutions of Castile and Aragon had been swept away, and the only function that remained to the Cortes was that of granting money at the king's dictation. The transition extended to literature. Men who, like Garcilaso de la Vega and Diego Huarto de Mendoza, followed the Italian wars, and brought back from Italy the products of the post-Renaissance literature, which took root and flourished, and even threatened to extinguish the native growths. Damon and Thrysus, Phyllis and Chloe, have been fairly neutralized in Spain, together with all the devices of pastoral poetry for investing with an air of novelty the idea of a despairing shepherd and inflexible shepherdess. As a set-off against this, the historical and traditional ballads, and the true pastorals, the songs and ballads of peasant life, were being collected assiduously and printed in the cancionarios that succeeded one another with increasing rapidity. But the most noble consequence, perhaps, of the spread of printing was the flood of romances of chivalry that had continued to pour from the press ever since García Ordóñez de Montalvo had resuscitated Amadis of Gaul at the beginning of the century. For a youth fond of reading, solid or light, there could have been no better spot in Spain than Alcala de Henares in the middle of the sixteenth century. It was then a busy, populous university town, something more than the enterprising rival of Salamanca, and altogether a very different place from melancholy, silent, deserted Alcala the traveller sees now as he goes from Madrid to Saragossa. Theology and medicine may have been the strong points of the university, but the town itself seems to have inclined rather to the humanities and light literature, and, as a producer of books, Alcala was already beginning to compete with the older presses of Toledo, Burgos, Salamanca, and Seville. A pendant to the picture Cervantes has given us, his first playgoings might, no doubt, have been often seen in the streets of Alcala at that time. A bright, eager, tawny-haired boy, peering into a bookshop where the latest volumes lay open to tempt the public, wondering, it may be, what the little book with the woodcut of the blind beggar and his boy could be about or, with his eyes brimming over with merriment, gazing at one of those preposterous portraits of a knight-errant in outrageous panoply and plumes with which the publishers of chivalry romances love to embellish the title-pages of their folios. If the boy was the father of the man, the sense of the incongruous that was strong at fifty was lively at ten, and some such reflections as these may have been the true genesis of Don Quixote. For his more solid education, we are told, he went to Salamanca. But why Rodrigo de Cervantes, who was very poor, should have sent his son to a university a hundred and fifty miles away when he had one at his own door, would be a puzzle, if we had any reason for supposing that he did so. The only evidence is a vague statement by Professor Tomas González that once he saw an old entry of the matriculation of a Miguel de Cervantes. This does not appear to have ever been seen again, but even if it had, and if the date corresponded, it would prove nothing, as there were at least two other Miguels born about the middle of the century. 
One of them, moreover, a Cervantes Saavedra, a cousin, no doubt, who was a source of great embarrassment to the biographers. That he was a student neither at Salamanca nor at Alcala is best proved by his own works. No man drew more largely on experience than he did, and he has nowhere left a single reminiscence of student life, for the Tia Flingia, if it be his, is not one. Nothing, not even a college joke, to show that he remembered days that most men remember best. All that we know positively about his education is that Juan López de Hoyos, a professor of humanities and belletre of some eminence, calls him his dear and beloved pupil. This was in a little collection of verses by different hands on the death of Isabella de Valois, second queen of Philip the Second, published by the professor in 1569, to which Cervantes contributed four pieces, including an elegy and an epitaph in the form of a sonnet. It is only by a rare chance that a Lycidas finds its way into a volume of this sort, and Cervantes was no Milton. His verses were no worse than such things usually are, so much at least may be said for them. By the time the book appeared, he had left Spain, and as fate ordered it for twelve years, the most eventful ones in his life. Julio, afterwards Cardinal Aquaviva, had been sent at the end of 1568 to Philip II by the Pope, on a mission partly of condolence, partly political, and on his return to Rome, which was somewhat brusquely expedited by the king, he took Cervantes with him as his camarero, or chamberlain, the office he himself held in the Pope's household. The post would, no doubt, have led to advancement at the papal court, had Cervantes retained it, but in the summer of 1570 he resigned it, and enlisted as a private soldier in Captain Diego Urbina's company, belonging to Don Miguel de Moncada's regiment, but at that time forming a part of the command of Mark Antony Colonna. What impelled him to this step we know not whether it was distaste for the career before him, or purely military enthusiasm. It may well have been the latter, for it was a stirring time. The events, however, which led to the alliance between Spain, Venice, and the Pope, against the common enemy, the Porte, and to the victory of the combined fleets of Lepanto, belong rather to the history of Europe than to the life of Cervantes. He was one of those who sailed from Messina in September of 1571, under the command of Don John of Austria, but on the morning of the 7th of October, when the Turkish fleet was sighted, he was lying below, ill with fever. At the news that the enemy was in sight, he insisted on taking his post, saying he preferred death in the service of God and the King to health. His galley, the Marquesa, was in the thick of the fight, and before it was all over he had himself received three gunshot wounds, two in the breast and one in the left hand or arm. On the morning after the battle, according to Navarrete, he had an interview with the commander-in-chief, Don John, who was making a personal inspection of the wounded, one result of which was an addition of three crowns to his pay, and another, apparently, the friendship of his general. How severely Cervantes was wounded may be inferred from the fact that, with youth of vigorous frame and as cheerful and buoyant a temperament as ever invalid had, he was seven months in the hospital at Messina before he was discharged. He came out with his left hand permanently disabled. He had lost the use of it, as Mercury told him in the Viejo de Paranaso, for the greater glory of the right. This, however, did not absolutely unfit him for service, and in April of 1572 he joined Manuel Ponce de Leon's company of Lope de Figueroa's regiment, in which, it seems probable, his brother Rodrigo was serving, and shared in the operations of the next three years, including the capture of the Galeta and Tunis. 
Taking advantage of the lull which followed the recapture of these places by the Turks, he obtained leave to return to Spain, and sailed from Naples in September of 1575 on board the Sun Galley, in company with his brother Rodrigo, Pedro Carrillo de Queseda, late governor of the Goleta, and some others, and furnished with letters from Don John of Austria and the Duke of Sesa, the Viceroy of Sicily, recommending him to the king for the command of a company, on account of his services, a dono in Velice, as events proved. On the 26th they fell in with a squadron of Algerine galleys, and, after a stout resistance, were overpowered and carried into Algiers. By means of a ransomed fellow-captive, the brothers contrived to inform their family of their condition, and the poor people of Alcala at once strove to raise the ransom money, the father disposing of all he possessed, and the two sisters giving up their marriage portions. But Dali Mami had found on Cervantes the letters addressed to the king by Don John and the Duke of Sesa, and— concluding that his prize must be a person of great consequence, when the money came he refused it scornfully as being altogether insufficient. The owner of Rodrigo, however, was more easily satisfied. Ransom was accepted in his case, and it was arranged between the brothers that he should return to Spain and procure a vessel in which he was to come back to Algiers and take off Miguel and as many of their comrades as possible. This was not the first attempt to escape that Cervantes had made. Soon after the commencement of his captivity, he induced several of his companions to join him in trying to reach Oran, then a Spanish post, on foot. But after the first day's journey, the Moor who had agreed to act as their guide deserted them, and they had no choice but to return. The second attempt was more disastrous. In a garden outside the city on the seashore he constructed, with the help of the gardener, a Spaniard, a hiding-place, to which he brought, one by one, fourteen of his fellow-captives, keeping there in secrecy for several months, and supplying them with food, through a renegade known as El Dorador, the glider. How he, a captive himself, contrived to do all this is one of the mysteries of the story. Wild as the project may appear, it was very nearly successful. The vessel procured by Rodrigo made its appearance off the coast, and under cover of night was proceeding to take off the refugees when the crew, alarmed by a passing fishing-boat, had beat a hasty retreat. On renewing the attempt shortly afterwards, they, or a portion of them at least, were taken prisoners, and just as the poor fellows in the garden were exulting in the thought that in a few moments more freedom would be within their grasp, they found themselves surrounded by Turkish troops, horse and foot. The Dorador had revealed the whole scheme to the de Hassan. When Cervantes saw what had befallen them, he charged his companions to lay all the blame upon him, and, as they were being bound, he declared aloud that the whole plot was of his contriving, and that nobody else had any share in it. Brought before the day, he said the same. He was threatened with impalement and with torture, and as cutting off ears and noses were playful freaks with the Algernines, it may be conceived what their tortures were like but nothing could make him swerve from his original statement that he alone was responsible. The upshot was that the unhappy gardener was hanged by his master, and the prisoners taken possession of by the day, who, however, afterwards restored most of them to their masters, but kept Cervantes, paying Dali Mami five hundred crowns for him. He felt no doubt that a man of such resource, energy, and daring, was too dangerous a piece of property to be left in private hands, and he had him heavily ironed and lodged in his own prison. If he thought that by these means he could break the spirit or shake the resolution of his prisoner, he was soon undeceived, for Cervantes contrived before long to dispatch a letter to the governor of Oran, entreating him to send him some one who could be trusted, to enable him and three other gentlemen, fellow-captives of his, to make their escape, intending evidently to renew his first attempt with a more trustworthy guide. 
Unfortunately, the Moor who carried the letter was stopped just outside of Oran, and the letter being found upon him, he was sent back to Algiers, where, by the order of the day, was promptly impaled as a warning to others, while Cervantes was condemned to receive two thousand blows of the stick, a number which most likely would have deprived the world of Don Quixote, had not some persons, who they were we know not, interceded on his behalf. After this he seems to have been kept in still closer confinement than before, for nearly two years passed before he made another attempt. This time his plan was to purchase, by the aid of a Spanish renegade and two Valencian merchants resident in Algiers, an armed vessel in which he and about sixty of the leading captives were to make their escape. But just as they were about to put it into execution, one Dr. Juan Blanco de Paz, an ecclesiastic and a compatriot, informed the day of the plot. Cervantes, by force of character, by his self-devotion, by his untiring energy and his exertions to lighten the lot of his companions in misery, had endeared himself to all and become the leading spirit in the captive colony, and, incredible as it may seem, jealousy of his influence and the esteem in which he was held moved this man to compass his destruction by a cruel death. The merchants, finding that the day knew all, and fearing that Cervantes under torture might make disclosures that would imperil their own lives, tried to persuade him to slip away on board a vessel that was on the point of sailing for Spain. But he told them that they had nothing to fear, for no tortures would make him compromise anybody, and he went at once and gave himself up to the day. As before, the day tried to force him to name his accomplices. Everything was made ready for his immediate execution. The halter was put round his neck, his hands tied behind him. But all that could be got from him was that he himself, with the help of four gentlemen who had since left Algiers, had arranged the whole, and that the sixty who were to accompany him were not to know anything of it until the last moment. Finding he could make nothing of him, the day sent him back to prison, more heavily ironed than before. The poverty-stricken Cervantes family had been all this time trying once more to raise the ransom money, and at last a sum of three hundred ducats was got together and entrusted to the redemptorist father Juan Gil, who was about to sail for Algiers. The day, however, demanded more than double the sum offered, and as his term of office had expired, and he was about to sail for Constantinople, taking all his slaves with him, the case of Cervantes was critical. He was already on board, heavily ironed, when the day at length agreed to reduce his demand by one half, and Father Gil, by borrowing, was able to make up that amount, and on September 19, 1580, after a captivity of five years all but a week, Cervantes was at last set free. Before long he discovered that Blanco de Paz, who claimed to be an officer of the Inquisition, was now concocting on false evidence a charge of misconduct to be brought against him when he returned to Spain. To checkmate him, Cervantes drew up a series of twenty-five questions, covering the whole period of his captivity, upon which he requested Father Gil to make depositions of credible witnesses before a notary. Eleven witnesses, taken from among the principal captives in Algiers, deposed to all the facts above stated, and to a great deal more besides. There is something touching in the admiration, love, and gratitude we see struggling to find expression in the formal language of the notary, as they testify one after another to the good deeds of Cervantes, how he comforted and helped the weak-hearted, how he kept up their drooping courage, how he shared his poor purse with this disponent, and how in him this disponent found father and mother. On his return to Spain, he found his old regiment about to march off to Portugal to support Philip's claim to the crown, and utterly penniless now, he had no choice but to rejoin it. He was in the expeditions to the Azores in 1582, and the following year, and on the conclusion of the war, returned to Spain in the autumn of 1583, 
bringing with him the manuscript of his pastoral romance, the Galatia, and probably also, to judge by internal evidence, that of the first portion of Pericles and Sigismunda. He also brought back with him, his biographers assert, an infant daughter, the offspring of an amour, as some of them with great circumstantiality inform us, with a Lisbon lady of noble birth, whose name, however, as well as that of the street she lived in, they omit to mention. The sole foundation for all this is that in 1605 there certainly was living in the family of Cervantes a Dona Isabel de Saavedra, who is described in an official document as his natural daughter, and then twenty years of age. So ends the first part of the translator's preface. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on February 19, 2006. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby, Part 1. Second part of The Translator's Preface. With his crippled left hand, promotion in the army was hopeless. Now that Don John was dead, and he had no one to press his claims and services, and for a man drawing on forty, life in the ranks was a dismal prospect. He had already a certain reputation as a poet. He made up his mind, therefore, to cast his lot with literature, and, for a first venture, committed his Galeta to the press. It was published, as Salva y Malen shows conclusively, at Alcala, his own birthplace, in 1585, and no doubt helped to make his name more widely known, but certainly did not do him much good in any other way. While it was going through the press, he married Doña Catalina de Palacio Salazar y Vozimadio, a lady of Esquivas, near Madrid, and apparently a friend of the family, who brought him a fortune which may possibly have served to keep the wolf from the door, but if so, that was all. The drama had by this time outgrown marketplace stages and strolling companies, and with his old love for it he naturally turned to it for congenial employment. In about three years he wrote twenty or thirty plays, which he tells us were performed without any throwing of cucumbers or other missiles, and ran their course without any hisses, outcries, or disturbances. In other words, his plays were not bad enough to be hissed off the stage, but not good enough to hold their own upon it. Only two of them have been preserved, but as they happen to be two of the seven or eight he mentions with complacency, we may assume they are favorable specimens, and no one who reads the Numancia and the Trato d'Algel will feel any surprise that they failed as acting dramas. Whatever merits they might have, whatever occasional they may show, they are, as regards construction, incurably clumsy. How completely they failed is manifest from the fact that, with all his sanguine temperament and indomitable perseverance, he was unable to maintain the struggle to gain a livelihood as a dramatist for more than three years. Nor was the rising popularity of Lope the cause, as was often said, notwithstanding his own words to the contrary. When Lope began to write for the stage is uncertain, but it was certainly after Cervantes went to Seville. Among the Nuevos Documentos, printed by Señor Arsenio E. Toledo, is one dated 1592, and curiously characteristic of Cervantes, it is an agreement with one Rodrigo Osirio, a manager who was to accept six comedies at fifty ducats apiece, not to be paid in any case unless it appeared on representation that the said comedy was one of the best that had ever been represented in Spain. The test does not seem to have been ever applied. Perhaps it was sufficiently apparent to Rodrigo Osirio that the comedies were not among the best that had ever been represented. Among the correspondence of Cervantes there might have been found no doubt more than one letter, like we see in The Rake's Progress. Sir, I have read your play, and it will not do. 
He was more successful in a literary contest at Saragossa in 1595, in honor of the canonization of San Jacinto, when his composition won the first prize, Three Silver Spoons. The year before this he had been appointed a collector of revenues for the kingdom of Granada. In order to remit the money he had collected more conveniently to the treasury, he entrusted it to a merchant, who failed and absconded, and as the bankrupt's assets were insufficient to cover the whole, he was sent to prison at Seville in September of 1597. The balance against him, however, was a small one, about 261, and on giving security for it he was released at the end of the year. It was as he journeyed from town to town collecting the king's taxes that he noted down those bits of inn and wayside life and character that abound in the pages of Don Quixote. The Benedictine monks with their spectacles and sunshades mounted on their tall mules, the strollers in costume bound for the next village, the barber with his basin on his head on his way to bleed a patient, the recruit with his breeches in his bundle, tramping along the road singing, the reapers gathered in the Venta gateway, listening to Felix Marte of Hircania read out to them, and those little Hogarthian touches that he so well knew how to bring in, the oxtail hanging up with the landlord's comb stuck in it, the wine-skins at the bedhead, and those notable examples of hostelry art, Helen going off in high spirits on Paris's arm, and Dido on the tower dropping tears as big as walnuts. Nay, it may well be said that on those journeys into remote regions he came across, now and then a specimen of the pauper gentleman, with his lean hack and his greyhound and his boots of chivalry, dreaming away his life in happy ignorance that the world had changed since his great-grandfather's old helmet was new. But it was in Seville that he found out his true vocation, though he himself would not by any means have admitted it be so. It was here, in Triana, that he was first tempted to try his hand at drawing from life, and first brought his humor into play in the exquisite little sketch of Rinconete e Cordidillo, the germ in more ways than one of Don Quixote. Where and when that was written we cannot tell. After his imprisonment, all trace of Cervantes in his official capacity disappears, from which it may be inferred that he was not reinstated. That he was still in Seville in November of 1598 appears from a satirical sonnet of his on the elaborate cataphlac erected to testify to the grief of the city at the death of Philip the Second. But from this up to 1603 we have no clue to his movements. The words in the preface of the first part of Don Quixote are generally held to be conclusive that he conceived the idea of the book and wrote the beginning of it at least in a prison, and that he may have done so is extremely likely. There is a tradition that Cervantes read some portions of his work to a select audience at the Duke of Behar's, which may have helped to make the book known. But the obvious conclusion is that the first part of Don Quixote lay on his hands some time before he could find a publisher bold enough to undertake a venture of so novel a character, and so little faith in it had Francisco Robles of Madrid, to whom at last he sold it, that he did not care to incur the expense of securing the copyright for Aragon or Portugal, contenting himself with that for Castile. The printing was finished in December, and the book came out with the new year, 1605. It is often said that Don Quixote was at first received coldly. The facts show just the contrary. No sooner was it in the hands of the public than preparations were made to issue pirated editions at Lisbon and Valencia, and to bring out a second edition with the additional copyrights for Aragon and Portugal, which he secured in February. No doubt it was received with something more than coldness by certain sections of the community. Men of wit, taste, and discrimination among the aristocracy gave it a hearty welcome, but the aristocracy in general was not likely to relish a book that turned their favorite reading into ridicule, and laughed at so many of their favorite ideas. 
The dramatists who gathered round Lope as their leader regarded Cervantes as their common enemy, and it is plain that he was equally obnoxious to the other clique. The culto poets, who had Gongora for their chief, Navarrete, who knew nothing of the letter above mentioned, tries hard to show that the relations between Cervantes and Lope were of a very friendly sort, as indeed they were until Don Quixote was written. Cervantes, indeed, to the last, generously and manfully declared his admiration of Lope's powers, his unfailing invention, and his marvellous fertility. But in the preface of the first part of Don Quixote, and in the verses of Urganda the Unknown, and one or two other places, there are, if we read between the lines, sly hits at Lope's vanities and affections that argue no personal good will and Lope openly sneers at Don Quixote and Cervantes, and fourteen years after his death gives him only a few lines of cold commonplace in the Laurel de Apollo, that seem all the colder for the eulogies of a host of non-entities whose names are found nowhere else. In 1601 Valladolid was made the seat of the court, and in the beginning of 1603 Cervantes had been summoned thither in connection with the balance due by him to the treasury, which was still outstanding. He remained at Valladolid, apparently supporting himself by agencies and scrivener's work of some sort, probably drafting petitions and drawing up statements of claims to be presented to the council and the like. So, at least, we gather from the depositions taken on the occasion of the death of a gentleman, the victim of a street brawl, who had been carried into the house in which he lived. In these he himself is described as a man who wrote untransacted business, and it appears that his household then consisted of his wife, the natural daughter Isabel de Saavedra, already mentioned, his sister Andrea, now a widow, her daughter Constanza, a mysterious Magdalena de Sotomayor, calling herself his sister, for whom his biographers cannot account, and a servant-maid. Meanwhile, Don Quixote had been growing in favor, and its author's name was now known beyond the Pyrenees. In 1607 an edition was printed at Brussels. Robles, the Madrid publisher, found it necessary to meet the demand by a third edition, the seventh in all, in 1608. The popularity of the book in Italy was such that a Milan bookseller was led to bring out an edition in 1610, and another was called for in Brussels in 1611. It might naturally have been expected that, with such proofs before him that he had hit the taste of the public, Cervantes would have set at once about redeeming his rather vague promise of a second volume. But to all appearance nothing was further from his thoughts. He had still by him one or two short tales of the same vintage as those he had inserted in Don Quixote, and instead of continuing the adventures of Don Quixote, he set to work to write more of these novelas exemplars, as he afterward called them, with a view toward making a book of them. The novels were published in the summer of 1613, with a dedication to the Conde de Lemos, the Massienus of the day, and with one of those chatty confidential prefaces Cervantes was so fond of. In this, eight years and a half after the first part of Don Quixote had appeared, we get the first hint of a forthcoming second part. You shall see shortly, he says, the further exploits of Don Quixote and humors of Sancho Panza. His idea of shortly was a somewhat elastic one, for, as we know by the date to Sancho's letter, he had barely one half of the book completed, that time twelve months. But more than poems or pastorals or novels, it was his dramatic ambition that engrossed his thoughts. The same indomitable spirit that kept him from despair in the Bagnos of Algiers, and prompted him to attempt the escape of himself and his comrades again and again, made him persevere in spite of failure and discouragement in his efforts to win the ear of the public as a dramatist. The temperament of Cervantes was essentially sanguine. The portrait he draws in the preface to the novels with the aquiline features, chestnut hair, smooth, untroubled forehead, and bright, cheerful eyes, is the very portrait of a sanguine man. 
Nothing that the managers might say could persuade him that the merits of his plays would not be recognized at last if they were only given a fair chance. The old soldier of the Spanish Salamis was bent on being the Aeschylus of Spain. He was to found a great national drama based on the true principles of art that was to be the envy of all nations. He was to drive from the stage the silly childish plays, the mirrors of nonsense and models of folly that were in vogue, through the cupidity of the managers and short-sightedness of the authors. He was to correct and educate the public taste until it was ripe for tragedies on the model of the Greek drama, like the Numancia, for instance, and the comedies that would not only amuse but improve and instruct. All this he was to do could he once get a hearing, and that was the initial difficulty. He shows plainly enough, too, that Don Quixote and the demolition of the chivalry romances was not the work that lay next to his heart. He was indeed, he says to himself in his preface, more a stepfather than a father to Don Quixote. Never was great work so neglected by its author. That it was written carelessly, hastily, and by fits and starts was not always his fault. But it seems clear that he never read what he sent to the press. He knew how the printers had blundered, but he never took the trouble to correct them when the third edition was in progress, as a man who really cared for the child of his brain would have done. He appears to have regarded the book as little more than a mere libro di entretenimento, an amusing book, a thing, as he says, in the viaje, to divert the melancholy, moody heart at any time or season. No doubt he had an affection for his hero, and was very proud of Sancho Panza. It would have been strange indeed if he had not been proud of the most humorous creation in all fiction. He was proud, too, of the popularity and success of the book, and beyond measure delightful is the naivete with which he shows his pride in a dozen messages in the second part. But it was not the success he coveted. In all probability he would have given all the success of Don Quixote, nay, he would have seen every copy of Don Quixote burned in the Plaza Mayor, for such success as Lope de Vega was enjoying on an average once a week. And so he went on, dawdling over Don Quixote, adding a chapter now and then, and putting it aside to turn to Persiles and Sigismunda, which, as we know, was to be the most entertaining book in the language, and the rival of Theagenes and Charcelea, or finishing off one of his darling comedies, and if Robles had asked when Don Quixote would be ready, the answer, no doubt, was, En breve, shortly. There was enough time for that. At sixty-eight he was as full of life and hope and plans for the future as a boy of eighteen. Nemesis was coming, however. He had got as far as chapter fifty-nine, which, at his leisurely pace, he could hardly have reached before October or November of 1614, when there was put into his hand a small octave lately printed at Tarragona, and calling itself second volume of the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha, by the licentiate Alonso Fernandez de Alvenada of Tordesillas. The last part of chapter 59, and most of the following chapters of the second part, give us some idea of the effect produced upon him, and his irritation was not likely to be lessened by the reflection that he had no one to blame but himself. Had Alavananda, in fact, been content with merely bringing out a continuation to Don Quixote, Cervantes would have had no reasonable grievance. His own intentions were expressed in the very vaguest language, and at the end of the book. Nay, in his last words he seems actually to invite someone to continue the work, and he made no sign until eight years and a half had gone by, by which time Alvanada's volume was no doubt written. In fact, Cervantes had no case, or a very bad one, as far as the mere continuation was concerned. But Alvananda had chosen to write a preface to it, full of such coarse personal abuse as only an ill-conditioned man could pour out. He taunts Cervantes with being old, with having lost his hand, with having been in prison, with being poor, 
with being friendless, accuses him of envy of Lope's success, of petulance and querulousness, and so on. And it was in this that the sting lay. Alivananda's reason for this personal attack is obvious enough. Whoever he may have been, it is clear that he was one of the dramatists of Lope's school, for he has the impudence to charge Cervantes with attacking him as well as Lope in his criticism on the drama. His identification has exercised the best critics and baffled all the ingenuity and research that has been brought to bear on it. Navarrete and Tickner both inclined to the belief that Cervantes knew who he was, but I must say that I think the anger he shows suggests an invisible assailant. It is like the irritation of a man stung by a mosquito in the dark. Cervantes, from certain solecisms of language, pronounces him to be an Aragonese, and Pellissier, an Aragonese himself, supports this view, and believes him, moreover, to have been an ecclesiastic, a Dominican, probably. Any merit Alabananda has is reflected from Cervantes, and he is too dull to reflect much. Dull and dirty will always be, I imagine, the verdict of the vast majority of unprejudiced readers. He is, at best, a poor plagiarist. All he can do is follow slavishly the lead given him by Cervantes. His only humor lies in making Don Quixote take inns for castles, and fancy himself some legendary or historical personage, and Sancho mistake words, invert proverbs, and display his gluttony, all through he shows a proclivity to coarseness and dirt, and he has contrived to introduce two tales, filthier than anything by the sixteenth-century novilieri, and without their sprightliness. But whatever Alabananda and his book may be, we must not forget the debt we owe them. But for them there can be no doubt Don Quixote would have come to us a mere torso instead of a complete work. Even if Cervantes had finished the volume he had in hand, most assuredly he would have left off with a promise of a third part, giving the further adventures of Don Quixote and humors of Sancho Panza as shepherds. It is plain that he had at one time an intention of dealing with the pastoral romances, as he had dealt with the books on chivalry, but for Alabananda he would probably have tried to carry it out. But it is more likely that, with his pains and projects and hopefulness, the volume would have remained unfinished till his death, and that we should never have made the acquaintance of the Duke and Duchess, or gone with Sancho to Barataria. From the moment the book came into his hands, he seems to have been haunted by the fear that there might be more Alabinandas in the field and putting everything else aside, he set himself to finish off his task, and protect Don Quixote in the only way he could, by killing him. The conclusion is no doubt a hasty, and in some places clumsy, piece of work, and the frequent repetition of the scolding administered to Alabananda becomes, in the end, rather wearisome. But it is, in any rate, a conclusion, and for that we must thank Alabananda. The new volume was ready for the press in February, but was not printed until the very end of 1615, and during the interval Cervantes put together the comedies and interludes he had written in the last few years, and, as he adds plentifully, found no demand for among the managers, and published them with a preface, worth the book it introduces tenfold, in which he gives an account of the early Spanish stage, and of his own attempts as a dramatist. It is needless to say that they were put forward by Cervantes in all good faith and full confidence of their merits. The reader, however, was not to suppose they were his last word, or final effort in the drama, for he had in hand a comedy called Engaggio a los Olchos, about which, if he mistook not, there would be no question. Of this dramatic masterpiece the world has no opportunity of judging. His health had been failing for some time, and he died, apparently of dropsy, on the 23rd of April, 1616, the day on which the English lost Shakespeare, nominally at least, for the English calendar had not yet been reformed. He died as he had lived, accepting his lot bravely and cheerfully. 
Was it an unhappy life, that of Cervantes? His biographers all tell us that it was, but I must say I doubt it. It was a hard life, a life of poverty, of incessant struggle, of toil ill-paid, of disappointment, but Cervantes carried within himself the antidote to all these evils. His was not one of those light natures that rise above adversity merely by virtue of their buoyancy. It was in the fortitude of a high spirit that he was proof against it. It is impossible to conceive Cervantes giving way to despondency or prostrated by dejection. As for poverty, it was with him a thing to be laughed over, and the only sigh he ever allows to escape him is when he says, Happy he whom heaven has given a piece of bread, for which he is not bound to give thanks to any but heaven itself. Add to all this his vital energy and mental activity, his restless invention and his sanguine temperament, and there will be reason enough to doubt that this could have been a very unhappy life. He who could take Cervantes' distresses together with its apparatus for enduring them would not make so bad a bargain, perhaps, as far as happiness in life is concerned. Of his burial place nothing is known, except that he was buried, in accordance with his will, in the neighboring convent of Trinitarian nuns, of which it is supposed his daughter, Isabel de Saavedra, was an inmate, and that a few years afterward the nuns removed to another convent, carrying their dead with them. But whether the remains of Cervantes were included in the removal or not, no one knows, and the clue to their resting place is now lost beyond all hope. This furnishes perhaps the least defensible of the items in the charge of neglect brought against his contemporaries. In some of the others there is a good deal of exaggeration. To listen to most of his biographers, one would suppose that all Spain was in league not only against the man, but against his memory, or at least that it was insensible to his merits, and left him to live in misery and die of want. To talk of his hard life and unworthy employments in Andalusia is absurd. What had he done to distinguish him from thousands of other struggling men earning a precarious livelihood? True, he was a gallant soldier who had been wounded, and had undergone captivity and suffering in his country's cause, but there were hundreds of others in the same case. He had written a mediocre specimen of an insipid class of romance, and some plays which manifestly did not comply with the primary condition of pleasing. Were the playgoers to patronize plays that did not amuse them, because the author was to produce Don Quixote twenty years afterward? The scramble for copies, which, as we have seen, followed immediately upon the appearance of the work, does not look like general insensibility to its merits. No doubt it was received coldly by some, but if a man writes a book of ridicule of periwigs, he must make his account with being coldly received by the periwig wearers, and hated by the whole tribe of wig-makers. If Cervantes had other chivalry romance readers, the sentimentalists, the dramatists, and the poets of the period, all against him, it was because Don Quixote was what it was, and if the general public did not come forward to make him comfortable for the rest of his days, it was no more to be charged with neglect and ingratitude than the English-speaking public that did not pay off Scott's liabilities. It did the best it could, it read his book, and liked it, and bought it, and encouraged the bookseller to pay him well for others. It has been also made a reproach to Spain that she has erected no monument to the man she is proudest of, no monument, that is to say, of him, for the bronze statue in the little garden of the Plaza de las Cortes, a fair work of art, no doubt, and unexceptional had it been set up to the local poet in the marketplace of some provincial town, is not worthy of Cervantes, or of Madrid. But what need has Cervantes of such weak witness of his name? Or what could a monument do in his case except testify to the self-glorification of those who had put it up? The nearest bookseller's shop will show what bathos there would be in a monument to the author of Don Quixote. 
Nine editions of the first part of Don Quixote had already appeared before Cervantes died, thirty thousand copies in all, according to his own estimate, and a tenth was printed at Barcelona the year after his death. So large a number naturally supplied the demand for some time, but by 1634 it appears to have been exhausted, and from that time down to the present day the stream of editions has continued to flow rapidly and regularly. The translations show still more clearly in what request the book has been from the very outset. In seven years from the completion of the work it had been translated into the four leading languages of Europe. Except the Bible, in fact, no book has been so widely diffused as Don Quixote. The Imitatio Criste may have been translated into as many different languages, and perhaps Robinson Crusoe and the Vicar of Wakefield into nearly as many, but in multiplicity of translations and editions Don Quixote leaves them all far behind. Still more remarkable is the character of this wide diffusion. Don Quixote has been thoroughly naturalized among people whose ideas about knight-errantry, if they had any at all, were of the vaguest, who had never seen or heard a book of chivalry, who could not possibly feel the humor of the burlesque or sympathize with the author's purpose. Another curious fact is that this, the most cosmopolitan book in the world, is one of the most intensely national. Manon Lescaut is not more thoroughly French, Tom Jones not more English, Rob Roy not more Scotch than Don Quixote is Spanish, in character, in ideas, in sentiment, in local color, in everything. What, then, is the secret of this unparalleled popularity, increasing year by year for well-nigh three centuries? One explanation, no doubt, is that of all the books in the world, Don Quixote is the most Catholic. There is something in it for every sort of reader, young or old, sage or simple, high or low. As Cervantes himself says with a touch of pride, it is thumbed and read and got by heart by people of all sorts. The children turn its leaves, the young people read it, the grown men understand it, the old folks praise it. But it would be idle to deny that the ingredient which, more than its humor or its wisdom, or the fertility of invention or knowledge of the human nature it displays, has ensured its success with the multitude, is the vein of farce that runs through it. It was the attack upon the sheep, the battle with the wineskins, Mambrino's helmet, the balsam of Firabras, Don Quixote knocked over by the sails of a windmill, Sancho tossed in the blanket, the mishaps and misadventures of master and man that were originally the great attraction, and perhaps are so still to some extent with the majority of readers. It is plain that Don Quixote was generally regarded at first, indeed in Spain for a long time, as little more than a queer droll book full of laughable incidents and absurd situations, very amusing, but not entitled to much consideration or care. All the editions printed in Spain from 1637 to 1771, when the famous printer Ibarra took it up, were mere trade editions, badly and carelessly printed on vile paper, and got up in the style of chapbooks intended only for popular use, with, in most instances, uncouth illustrations and claptrap editions by the publisher. To England belongs the credit of having been the first country to recognize the right of Don Quixote to better treatment than this. The London edition of 1738, commonly called Lord Carteret's from having been suggested by him, was not a mere edition de luxe. It produced Don Quixote in becoming form as regards paper and type, embellished with plates which, if not particularly happy as illustrations, were at least well-intentioned and well-executed. But it also aimed at correctness of text, a matter to which nobody except the editors of the Valencia and Brussels editions had given even a passing thought, and for a first attempt it was fairly successful, for though some of its emendations are inadmissible, a good many of them have been adopted by all subsequent editors. 
The zeal of publishers, editors, and annotators brought about a remarkable change of sentiment with regard to Don Quixote. A vast number of its admirers began to grow ashamed of laughing over it. It became almost a crime to treat it as a humorous book. The humor was not entirely denied, but, according to the new view, it was rated as an altogether secondary quality, a mere accessory, nothing more than the stalking horse under the presentation of which Cervantes shot his philosophy or satire, or whatever it was he meant to shoot, for on this point opinions varied. All were agreed, however, that the object he aimed at was not the books of chivalry. He said emphatically in the preface to the first part, and in the last sentence of the second, that he had no other object in view than to discredit these books, and these, to advanced criticism, made it clear that his object must have been something else. One theory was that the book was a kind of allegory, setting forth the eternal struggle between the ideal and the real, between the spirit of poetry and the spirit of prose, and perhaps German philosophy never evolved a more ungainly or unlikely camel out of the depths of its inner consciousness. Something of the antagonism, no doubt, is to be found in Don Quixote, because it is to be found everywhere in life, and Cervantes drew from life. It is difficult to imagine a community in which the never-ceasing game of cross-purposes between Sancho Panza and Don Quixote would not be recognized as true to nature. In the Stone Age, among lake-dwellers, among the cave-men, there were Don Quixotes and Sancho Panzas. There must have been the troglodyte who could never see the facts before his eyes, and the troglodyte who could see nothing else. But to suppose Cervantes deliberately setting himself to expound any such idea in two stout quarto volumes is to suppose something not only very unlike the age in which he lived, but altogether unlike Cervantes himself, who would have been the first to laugh at an attempt of the sort made by anyone else. The extraordinary influence of the romances of chivalry in his day is quite enough to account for the genesis of the book. Some idea of the prodigious development of this branch of literature in the sixteenth century may be obtained from the scrutiny of chapter seven, if the reader bears in mind that only a portion of the romances belonging to by far the largest group are enumerated. As to its effects on the nation, there is abundant evidence. From the time when the Almadises and the Palmerins began to grow popular, down to the very end of the century there is a steady stream of invective, from men whose character and position lend weight to their words against the romances of chivalry and the infatuation of their readers. Ridicule was the only besom to sweep away that dust. That this was the task Cervantes set himself, and that he had ample provocation to urge him to do it, will be sufficiently clear to those who look into the evidence, as it will be also that it was not chivalry itself that he attacked and swept away. Of all the absurdities that, thanks to poetry, will be repeated to the end of time, there is no greater one than saying that Cervantes smiled Spain's chivalry away. In the first place, there was no chivalry for him to smile away. Spain's chivalry had been dead for more than a century. Its work was done when Granada fell, and as chivalry was essentially republican in its nature, it could not live under the rule that Ferdinand substituted for the free institutions of medieval Spain. What he did smile away was not chivalry, but a degrading mockery of it. The true nature of the right arm and the bright array, before which, according to the poet, the world gave ground, and which Cervantes' single laugh demolished, may be gathered from the words of one of his own countrymen, Don Felix Pacheco, as reported by Captain George Carleton in his military memoirs from 1672 through 1713. Before the appearance in the world of that labor of Cervantes, he said, it is next to an impossibility for a man to walk the streets with any delight or without danger. 
there were seen so many cavaliers prancing and curvetting before the windows of their mistresses, that a stranger might have imagined the whole nation to have been nothing less than a race of knight-errants. But after the world became a little acquainted with that notable history, the man that was seen in that once celebrated drapery was pointed to as a Don Quixote, and found himself the jest of high and low. And I verily believe that to this, and this only, we owe that dampness and poverty of spirit which has run through all our councils for a century past, so little agreeable to those nobler actions of our famous ancestors. To call Don Quixote a sad book, preaching a pessimist view of life, argues a total misconception of its drift. It would be so if its moral were that, in this world, true enthusiasm naturally leads to ridicule and discomfiture, but it preaches nothing of the sort. Its moral, so far as it can be said to have one, is that the spurious enthusiasm that is born of vanity and self-conceit, that is made an end of itself, not a means to an end, that acts on mere impulse, regardless of circumstances and consequences, is mischievous to its owner, and a very considerable nuisance to the community at large. To those who cannot distinguish between the one kind and the other, no doubt Don Quixote is a sad book. No doubt to some minds it is very sad that a man who had just uttered so beautiful a sentiment as that it is a hard case to make slaves of those whom God and nature made free should be ungratefully pelted by the scoundrels his crazy philanthropy had let loose on society. But to others of a more judicial cast it will be a matter of regret that Recklessness and self-sufficient enthusiasm is not oftener requited in some such way for all the mischief it does in the world. A very slight examination of the structure of Don Quixote will suffice to show that Cervantes had no deep design or elaborate plan in his mind when he began the book. When he wrote those lines in which, with a few strokes of a great master, he sets before us the pauper gentleman, he had no idea of the goal to which his imagination was leading him. There can be little doubt that all he contemplated was a short tale to range with those he had already written, a tale setting forth the ludicrous results that might be expected to follow the attempt of a crazy gentleman to act the part of a knight-errant in modern life. It is plain, for one thing, that Sancho Panza did not enter into the original scheme, for had Cervantes thought of him, he certainly would not have omitted him in his hero's outfit, which he obviously meant to be complete. Him we owe to the landlord's chance remark in Chapter 3 that knights seldom travelled without squires. To try to think of a Don Quixote without Sancho Panza is like trying to think of a one-bladed pair of scissors. The story was written at first, like the others, without any division, and without the intervention of Sidiamete Benegaletti, it seems not unlikely that Cervantes had some intention of bringing Dulcinea, or Aldonza Lorenzo, on the scene in person. It was probably the ransacking of the Don's library, and the discussion on the books of chivalry that first suggested to him that his idea was capable of development. What if, instead of a mere string of farcical misadventures, he was to make his tale a burlesque of one of these books, caricaturing their style, incidents, and spirit? In pursuance of this change of plan, he hastily, and somewhat clumsily, divided what he had written into chapters on the model of Amadis, invented the fable of a mysterious Arabic manuscript, and set up C. de Amate Benegali in imitation of the almost invariable practice of the chivalry romance authors who were fond of tracing their books to some recondite source. In working out the new ideas, he soon found the value of Sancho Panza. Indeed, the keynote, not only to Sancho's part, but to the whole book, is struck in the first words Sancho utters when he announces his intention of taking his ass with him. About the ass, we are told, Don Quixote hesitated a little, trying whether he could to call to mind any knight-errant taking with him a squire mounted on ass-back. 
but no instance occurred to his memory. We can see the whole scene at a glance, the stolid unconsciousness of Sancho, and the perplexity of his master, upon whose perception the incongruity has just forced itself. This is Sancho's mission throughout the book. He is an unconscious Mephistopheles, always unwittingly making mockery of his master's aspirations, always exposing the fallacy of his ideas by some unintentional ad absurdum, always bringing him back to the world of fact and commonplace by force of sheer stolidity. By the time Cervantes had got his volume of novels off his hands, had summoned up resolution enough to set about the second part in earnest, the case was very much altered. Don Quixote and Sancho Panza had not merely found favor, but had already become what they have never since ceased to be, veritable entities to the popular imagination. There was no occasion for him by now to interpolate extraneous matter. Nay, his readers told him plainly that what they wanted of him was more Don Quixote and more Sancho Panza, and not novels, tales, or digressions. To himself, too, his creations had become realities, and he had become proud of them, especially of Sancho. He began the second part, therefore, under very different conditions, and the difference makes itself manifest at once. Even in translation the style will be seen to be far easier, more flowing, more natural, and more like a man sure of himself and of his audience. Don Quixote and Sancho undergo a change also. In the first part, Don Quixote has no character or individuality whatsoever. He is nothing more than a crazy representative of the sentiments of the chivalry romances. In all that he says and does, he is simply repeating the lesson he has learned from his books, and therefore it is absurd to speak of him in the gushing strain of the sentimental critics when they dilate upon his nobleness, disinterestedness, dauntless courage, and so forth. It was the business of a knight-errant to right wrongs, redress injuries, and succor the distressed, and this, as a matter of course, he makes his business when he takes up the part. A knight-errant was bound to be intrepid, and so he feels bound to cast fear aside. Of all Byron's melodious nonsense about Don Quixote, the most nonsensical statement is that "'Tis his virtue makes him mad.' The exact opposite is the truth. It is his madness which makes him virtuous. In the second part, Cervantes repeatedly reminds the reader, as if it was a point upon which he was anxious there be no mistake, that his hero's madness is strictly confined to delusions on the subject of chivalry, and that on every other subject he is discreto, one, in fact, whose faculty of discernment is in perfect order. The advantage of this is that he is enabled to make use of Don Quixote as a mouthpiece for his own reflections, without seeming to digress, allow himself and the relief of digression when he requires it, as freely as a commonplace book. It is true the amount of individuality bestowed upon Don Quixote is not very great. There are some natural touches of character about him, such as his mixture of irascibility and placability, and his curious affection for Sancho, together with his impatience of the squire's loquacity and impertinence. But in the main, apart from his craze, he is little more than a thoughtful, cultured gentleman, with instinctive good taste and a great deal of shrewdness and originality of mind. As to Sancho, it is plain from the concluding words of the preface to the first part that he was a favorite with his creator even before he had been taken into favor by the public. An inferior genius, taking him in hand a second time, would very likely have tried to improve him by making him more comical, clever, amiable, or virtuous. But Cervantes was too true an artist to spoil his work this way. Sancho, when he reappears, is the old Sancho with the old familiar features, but with a difference. They have been brought out more distinctly, but at the same time with a careful avoidance of anything like caricature. 
The outline has been filled in where filling in was necessary, and vivified by a few touches of the master's hand. Sancho stands before us as he might in a character portrait by Velazquez. He is a much more important and prominent figure in the second part than in the first. Indeed, it is his matchless mendacity about Dulcinea that to a great extent supplies the action of the story. His development in this respect is as remarkable as any other. In the first part he displays a great natural gift of lying. His lies are not of the highly imaginable sort that liars in fiction commonly indulge in, like Falstaff's. They resemble the father that begets them. They are simple, homely, plump lies, plain working lies, in short. But in the service of such a master as Don Quixote he develops rapidly, as we see when he comes to palm off the three country wenches as Dulcinea and her ladies-in-waiting. It is worth noticing how, flushed by his success in this instance, he is tempted afterwards to try a flight beyond his powers in his account of the journey on Clavinello. In the second part it is the spirit, rather than the incidence of the chivalry romances, that is the subject of the burlesque. Enchantments of the sort travestied in those of Dulcinea and the Trafaldi, and the cave of Montesinos, play a leading part in the later and inferior romances, and another distinguishing feature is caricatured in Don Quixote's blind adoration of Dulcinea. In the romances of chivalry, love is either a mere animalism or a fantastic idolatry. Only a coarse-minded man would care to make merry with the former, but to one of Cervantes' humor, the latter was naturally an attractive subject for ridicule. Like everything else in these romances, it is a gross exaggeration of the real sentiment of chivalry, but its peculiar extravagance is probably due to the influence of those masters of hyperbole, the Provencal poets. When a troubadour professed his readiness to obey his lady in all things, he made it incumbent upon the next comer, if he wished to avoid the imputation of tameness and commonplace, to declare himself the slave of her will, which the next was compelled to cap by some still stronger declaration. And so expressions of devotion went on rising one above the other like biddings at an auction, and a conventional language of gallantry and theory of love came into being that in time permeated the literature of southern Europe and bore fruit in one direction in the transcendental worship of Beatrice and Laura, and in another on the grotesque idolatry which found exponents in writers like Feliciano de Silva. This is what Cervantes deals with in Don Quixote's passion for Dulcinea, and in no instance has he carried out the burlesque more happily. By keeping Dulcinea in the background, and making her a vague, shadowy being, of whose very existence we are left in doubt, he invests Don Quixote's worship of her virtues and charms with an additional extravagance, and gives still more point to the caricature of the sentiment and language of the romances. One of the great merits of Don Quixote, and one of the qualities that have secured its acceptance by all classes of readers, and made it the most cosmopolitan of books, is its simplicity. There are, of course, points obvious enough to a Spanish seventeenth-century audience which do not immediately strike a reader nowadays, and Cervantes often takes it for granted that an illusion will be generally understood, which is only intelligible to a few. For example, on many of his readers in Spain, and most of his readers out of it, the significance of his choice of a country for his hero is completely lost. It would be going too far to say that no one could thoroughly comprehend Don Quixote without having seen La Mancha. But undoubtedly even a glimpse of La Mancha will give an insight into the meaning of Cervantes, such as no commentator can give. Of all the regions in Spain, it is the last that would suggest the idea of romance. Of all the dull central plateau of the peninsula, it is the dullest tract. 
There is something impressive about the grim solitudes of Estremadura, and if the plains of Leon and the old Castile are bald and dreary, they are studded with old cities renowned in history and rich in landscape. It has all the sameness of the desert without its dignity. The few towns and villages that break its monotony are mean and commonplace. There is nothing venerable about them. They have not even the picturesqueness of poverty, indeed. Don Quixote's own village, Agramasia, has a sort of oppressive respectability in the prim regularity of its streets and houses. Everything is ignoble. The very windmills are the ugliest and shabbiest of all the windmill kind. To any one who knows the country well, the mere style and title of Don Quixote of La Mancha gave the key to the author's meaning at once. La Mancha, as the knight's country and scene of his chivalries, is a piece with the pasteboard helmet, the farm laborer on assback for a squire, knighthood conferred by a rascally ventero, convicts taken for victims of oppression, and the rest of the incongruities between Don Quixote's world and the world he lived in, between things as he saw them and things as they were. It is strange that this element of incongruity underlying the whole humor and purpose of the book should have been so little heeded by the majority of those who have undertaken to interpret Don Quixote. It has been completely overlooked, for example, by the illustrators. To be sure, the great majority of the artists who illustrated Don Quixote knew nothing whatever of Spain. To them, a venta conveyed no idea but the abstract one of a roadside inn, and they could not, therefore, do full justice to the humor of Don Quixote's misconception in taking it for a castle, or perceive the remoteness of all its realities from his ideal. But even when better informed, they seem to have no apprehension of the full force of the discrepancy. Take, for instance, Gustave Doré's drawing of Don Quixote watching his armor in the inn-yard. Whether or not the Vente de Caseda on the Seville road is, as tradition maintains, the inn described in Don Quixote beyond all question it was just such an inn-yard as the one behind it that Cervantes had in his mind's eye, and it was on just such a rude stone trough as that beside the primitive draw-well in the corner that he meant Don Quixote to deposit his armor. Gustave Doré makes an elaborate fountain, which, as no arriero ever watered his mules at the corral of any venta in Spain, and thereby entirely misses the point aimed at by Cervantes. It is the mean, prosaic, commonplace character of all the surroundings and circumstances that gives a significance to Don Quixote's vigil and the ceremony that follows. Cervantes' humor is, for the most part, of that broader and simpler sort, the strength of which lies in the perception of the incongruous. It is the incongruity of Sancho in all his ways, works, and words, with the ideas and aims of his master, quite as much as the wonderful vitality and truth to nature of the character, that makes him the most humorous creation in the whole range of fiction. That unsmiling gravity of which Cervantes was the first great master, Cervantes' serious air, which sits naturally on Swift alone, perhaps, of later humorists, is essential to this kind of humor, and here again Cervantes has suffered at the hands of his interpreters. Nothing, unless, indeed, the coarse buffoonery of Phillips, could be more out of place in an attempt to represent Cervantes than a flippant, would-be facetious style like that of Motteux's version, for example, or the sprightly, jaunty air French translators sometimes adopt. It is the grave matter-of-factness of the narrative, and the apparent unconsciousness of the author that he is saying anything ludicrous, anything but the merest commonplace, that give its peculiar flavor to the humor of Cervantes. His, in fact, is the exact opposite of the humor of Stern, and the self-conscious humorists. Even when Uncle Toby is at his best, you were always aware of the man Stern behind him, 
watching you over his shoulder to see what effect he is producing. Cervantes always leaves you alone with Don Quixote and Sancho. He and Swift and the great humorists have always kept themselves out of sight, or, more literally speaking, never think about themselves at all, unlike our latter-day school of humorists, who seem to have revived the old horse-collar method, and try to raise a laugh by some grotesque assumption of ignorance, imbecility, or bad taste. It is true that to do full justice to Spanish humor in any other language is well-nigh an impossibility. There is a natural gravity and a sonorous stateliness about Spanish, be it ever so colloquial, that make an absurdity doubly absurd, and give plausibility to the most preposterous statement. This is what makes Sancho Panza's drollery the despair of the conscientious translator. Sancho's curt comments can never fall flat, but they lose half their flavor when transferred from their native Castilian into any other medium. But if foreigners have failed to do justice to the humor of Cervantes, they are no worse than his own countrymen. Indeed, were it not for the Spanish peasant's relish of Don Quixote, one might be tempted to think that the great humorist was not looked upon as a humorist at all in his own country. The craze of Don Quixote seems, in some instances, to have communicated itself to his critics, making them see things that are not in the book, and run full tilt at phantoms that have no existence save in their own imaginations. Like a good many critics nowadays, they forget that screams are not criticism, and that it is only vulgar tastes that are influenced by strings and superlatives, three piled hyperboles, and while they deal in extravagant eulogies, and ascribe all manner of imaginary ideas and qualities to Cervantes, they show no perception of the quality that ninety-nine out of a hundred of his readers would rate highest about him, and hold to be the one that raises him above all rivalry. To speak of Don Quixote as if it were merely a humorous book would be a manifest misdescription. Cervantes at times makes it a kind of commonplace book for occasional essays and criticisms, or for the observations and reflections and gathered wisdom of a long and stirring life. It is a mine of shrewd observation on mankind and human nature. Among modern novels there may be, here and there, more elaborate studies of character, but there is no book richer in individualized character. Whatever Coleridge said of Shakespeare in Minimus is true of Cervantes. He never, even for the most temporary purpose, puts forward a lay figure. There is life and individuality in all his characters, however little they may have to do, or however short a time they may be before the reader. Samson Carrasco, the curate, Teresa Panza, Altisidora, even the two students met on the road in the cave to Montesinos, all live and move and have their being, and it is characteristic of the broad humanity of Cervantes that there is not a hateful one among them all. Even poor Maritornes, with her deplorable morals, has a kind heart of her own, and some faint and distant resemblance to a Christian about her. And, as for Sancho, though on dissection we fail to find a lovable trait in him, unless it be a sort of dog-like affection for his master, who is there that in his heart does not love him? But it is, after all, the humor of Don Quixote that distinguishes it from all other books of the romance kind. It is this that makes it, as one of the most judicial-minded of modern critics calls it, the best novel in the world beyond all comparison. It is its varied humor, ranging from broad farce to comedy as subtle as Shakespeare's or Moliere's, that has naturalized it in every country where there are readers, and made it a classic in every language that has a literature. So ends the translator's preface. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Part number one. Some commendatory verses. Urganda the Unknown. To the Book of Don Quixote of La Mancha. If to be welcomed by the good, O book, thou make thy steady aim, no empty chatterer will dare to question or dispute thy claim. But if perchance thou hast a mind to win of idiots approbation, lost labor will be thy reward, though they'll pretend appreciation. They say a goodly shade he finds, who shelters neath a goodly tree, and such a one thy kindly star in beige or bath provided thee, a royal tree whose spreading boughs a show of princely fruit display, a tree that bears a noble duke, the Alexander of his day. Of a Manchigan gentleman thy purpose is to tell the story, relating how he lost his wits o oh, idle tales of love and glory of ladies, arms, and cavaliers, a new Orlando Furioso, enamorato rather who, one Dulcinea del Toboso. Put no vain emblems on thy shield, all figures that is bragging play. A modest dedication make, and give no scoffer room to say. What Alvaro de Luna here, or is it Hannibal again, or does King Francis at Madrid, once more of destiny complain? Since heaven it hath not pleased on thee deep erudition to bestow, or black Latino's gift of tongues, no Latin let thy pages show. Ape not philosophy or wit, lest one who cannot comprehend make a wry face at thee and ask, Why offer flowers to me, my friend? Be not a meddler, no affair, of thine the life thy neighbors led. Be prudent, oft the random jest recoils upon the jester's head. Thy constant labor let it be to earn thyself an honest name, for fooleries preserved in print are perpetuity of shame. A further counsel bear in mind, if that thy roof be made of glass, it shows small wit to pick up stones and pelt the people as they pass. Win the attention of the wise and give the thinker food for thought, who so indites frivolities will by but simpletons be sought. Amadi of Gaul to Don Quixote of La Mancha. Sonnet Thou that didst imitate that life of mine, when I in lonely sadness on the great rock pena pobre sat disconsolate, in self-imposed penance there to pine, thou whose sole beverage was the bitter brine of thine own tears, and who withouten plate of silver, copper, tin in lowly state, off the bare earth and on earth's fruits didst dine, Live thou of thine eternal glory sure. So long as on the round of the fourth sphere The bright Apollo shall his courses steer. In thy renown thou shalt remain secure, Thy country's name in story shall endure, And thy sage author stand without a peer. Don Meliani of Greece To Don Quixote of La Mancha Sonnet in slashing, hewing, cleaving, word and deed, I was the foremost knight of chivalry, Stout, bold, expert as e'er the world did see, Thousands from the oppressor's wrong I freed. Great were my feats, eternal fame their meed, In love I proved my truth and loyalty, The hugest giant was a dwarf for me. Ever to knighthood's laws gave I good heed, My mastery the fickle goddess owned, and even chance submitting to control, grasped by the forelock, yielded to my will. Yet, though above yon horned moon enthroned, my fortune seems to sit. Great Quixote still, envy of thy achievements fills my soul. The Lady of Oriana to Dulcinea del Toboso Sonnet O oh, fairest Dulcinea, could it be? It were a pleasant fancy to suppose so. Could Miraflores change to El Toboso, And London's town to that which shelters thee? O oh, could mine but acquire that livery, Of countless charms thy mind and body show so, Or him, now famous grown, thou madest him grow so, Thy knight in some dread combat could I see. O oh, could I be released from Amadi, By exercise of such coy chastity, As led thee gentle Quixote to dismiss, Then would my heavy sorrow turn to joy. None would I envy, 
all would envy me, and happiness be mine without alloy. Gandolin, Squire of Amadi of Gaul, to Sancho Panza, Squire of Don Quixote. Sonnet All hail, illustrious man, fortune when she bound the apprentice to the esquire trade, her care and tenderness of thee displayed, shaping thy course from misadventure free. No longer now doth proud knight-errantry regard with scorn the sickle and the spade, of towering arrogance less count is made than of plain esquire-like simplicity. I envy thee thy dapple and thy name, and those alforjas thou wast wont to stuff, with comforts that thy providence proclaim. Excellent, Sancho, hail to thee again. To thee alone the Ovid of our Spain does homage with the rustic kiss and cuff. From El Donoso, the motley poet, on Sancho Panza and Rocinante. On Sancho. I am the esquire Sancho Pan, who served Don Quixote of La Man. But from his service I retreat, resolved to pass my life discreet. For Villa Diego, called La C, maintained that only in Riti was found the secret of well be, according to the Celesti a book divine except for sin, by speech too plain, in my opin. On Rocinante I am that Rocinante Fay, great-grandson of the baby, who all for being lean and bone, had one Don Quixote for an own. But if I matched him well in weak, I never took short commons meek, but kept myself in corn by steel, a trick I learned from Lazareel. When with a piece of straw so neat, the blind man of his wine he cheat. Orlando Furioso to Don Quixote of La Mancha Sonnet If thou art not a peer, peer thou hast none. Among a thousand peers thou art a peer, nor is there room for one when thou art near. Unvanquished victor, great unconquered one, Orlando by Angelica undone am I or distant seas condemned to steer, and to fame's altars as an offering bear, valor respected by oblivion. I cannot be thy rival, for thy fame and prowess rise above all rivalry, albeit both bereft of wits we go. But though the Scythian or the more to tame was not thy lot, still thou dost rival me, love binds us in a fellowship of woe. The Knight of Phoebus to Don Quixote of La Mancha. My sword was not to be compared with thine, Phoebus of Spain, marvel of courtesy, nor with thy famous arm this hand of mine, that smote from east to west as lightnings fly. I scorned all empire and that monarchy, the rosy east held out did I resign, for one glance of Clary Diana's eye, the bright aurora for whose love I pine, a miracle of constancy, my love and banished by her ruthless cruelty. This arm had might the rage of hell to tame, but gothic Quixote, happier thou dost prove, for thou dost live in Dulcinea's name, and famous, honored, wise, she lives in thee. From Sol Sidon to Don Quixote of La Mancha Sonnet Your fantasies, Sir Quixote, it is true, that crazy brain of yours have quite upset, but aught of base or mean hath never yet been charged by any in reproach to you. Your deeds are open proof in all men's view, for you went forth in justice to abate. And for your pains, sword rubbings did you get from many a rascally and ruffian crew. If the fair Dulcinea, your heart's queen, be unrelenting in her cruelty, if still your woe be powerless to move her, in such hard case your comfort let it be that Sancho was a sorry go-between. A booby he, hard-hearted she, and you no lover. Dialogue between Babieca and Rocinante Sonnet How comes it, Rocinante, you're so lean? I'm underfed, with overwork I'm worn. But what becomes of all the hay and corn? My master gives me none, he's much too mean. Come, come, you show ill-breeding, sir, I ween. Tis like an ass your master thus to scorn. He is an ass, will die an ass, an ass was born. Why, he's in love, what's plainer to be seen? To be in love is folly? No, great sense. You're metaphysical. 
from want of food. Rail at the squire, then. Why, what's the good? I might indeed complain of him, I grant ye. But squire or master, what's the difference? They're both as sorry hacks as Rocinante. End of part number two. Some commendatory verses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by A. R. Dobbs, San Francisco, May 2006. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. The Author's Preface. Idle reader, thou mayst believe me without any oath that I would this book, as it is the child of my brain, were the fairest, gayest, and cleverest that could be imagined. But I could not counteract nature's law, that everything shall beget its like, and what then could this sterile, ill-tilled wit of mine beget but the story of a dry, shriveled, whimsical offspring, full of thoughts of all sorts and such as never came into any other imagination, just what might be begotten in a prison, where every misery is lodged, and every doleful sound makes its dwelling. Tranquillity, a cheerful retreat, pleasant fields, bright skies, murmuring brooks, peace of mind, these are the things that go far to make even the most barren muses fertile, and bring into the world births that fill it with wonder and delight. Sometimes when a father has an ugly, loutish son, the love he bears him so blindfolds his eyes that he does not see his defects, or, rather, takes them for gifts and charms of mind and body, and talks of them to his friends as wit and grace. I, however, for though I pass for the father, I am but the stepfather to Don Quixote, have no desire to go with the current of custom, or to implore the dearest reader almost with tears in my eyes, as others do, to pardon or excuse the defects thou wilt perceive in this child of mine. Thou art neither its kinsman nor its friend. Thy soul is thy own, and thy will as free as any man's, whate'er he be, Thou art in thine own house, and master of it as much as the king of his taxes, and thou knowest the common saying, Under my cloak I kill the king, all which exempts and frees thee from every consideration and obligation, and thou canst say what thou wilt of the story, without fear of being abused for any ill, or rewarded for any good thou mayst say of it. My wish would be simply to present it to thee, plain and unadorned, without any embellishment or preface or uncountable muster of customary sonnets, epigrams, and eulogies, such as are commonly put at the beginnings of books. For I can tell thee, though composing it cost me some labor, I found none greater than the making of this preface thou art now reading. Many times did I take up my pen to write it, and many did I lay it down again, not knowing what to say. One of these times, as I was pondering with the paper before me, a pen in my ear, my elbow on the desk, and my cheek in my hand, thinking of what I should say, there came in, unexpectedly, a certain lively, clever friend of mine, who, seeing me so deep in thought, asked the reason, to which I, making no mystery of it, answered that I was thinking of the preface I had to make for the story of Don Quixote, which so troubled me that I had a mind not to make any at all nor even publish the achievements of so noble a knight. For how could you expect me not to feel uneasy about what that ancient lawgiver they call the public will say when it sees me, after slumbering so many years in the silence of oblivion, coming out now with all my years upon my back, and with a book as dry as a rush, devoid of invention, meager in style, poor in thoughts, wholly wanting in learning and wisdom, without quotations in the margin, or annotations at the end, after the fashion of other books I see, which, though all fables and profanity, are so full of maxims from Aristotle and Plato, and the whole herd of philosophers, that they fill the readers with amazement, and convince them that the authors are men of learning, erudition, and eloquence. And then, when they quote the Holy Scriptures, any one would say they are St. Thomas's or other doctors of the Church, observing as they do a decorum so ingenious that in one sentence they describe a distracted lover, and in the next deliver a devout little sermon that it is a pleasure and a treat to hear and read. 
Of all this there will be nothing in my book, for I have nothing to quote in the margin, or to note at the end, and still less do I know what authors I follow in it, to place them at the beginning, as all do, under the letters A, B, C, beginning with Aristotle and ending with Xenophon, or Zoilus, or Zeusus, though one was a slanderer and the other a painter. Also my book must do without sonnets at the beginning, at least sonnets whose authors are dukes and marquises, counts, bishops, ladies, or famous poets. Though if I were to ask two or three obliging friends, I know they would give me them, and such as the productions of those that have the highest reputation in our Spain could not equal. In short, my friend, I continued, I am determined that Señor Don Quixote shall remain buried in the archives of his own La Mancha, until heaven provide some one to garnish him with all those things he stands in need of, because I find myself, through my shallowness and want of learning, unequal to supplying them, and because I am by nature shy and careless about hunting for authors to say what I myself can say without them. Hence the cogitation and abstraction you found me in, and reason enough that you have heard from me. Hearing this, my friend giving himself a slap on the forehead and breaking into a hearty laugh, exclaimed, Before God, brother, now I am disabused of an error in which I had been living all this long time I have known you, all through which I have taken you to be shrewd and sensible in all you do. But now I see you are as far from that as the heaven is from the earth. Is it possible that things of so little moment and so easy to set right can occupy and perplex a ripe wit like yours? fit to break through and crush far greater obstacles. By my faith, this comes not of any want of ability, but of too much indolence and too little knowledge of life. Do you want to know if I am telling the truth? Well, then, attend to me, and you will see how, in the opening and shutting of an eye, I sweep away all your difficulties and supply all those deficiencies which you say check and discourage you from bringing before the world the story of your famous Don Quixote, the light and mirror of all night errantry. Say on, said I, listening to his talk. How do you propose to make up for my diffidence, and reduce to order this chaos of perplexity I am in? To which he made answer, Your first difficulty, about the sonnets, epigrams, or complimentary verses, which you want for the beginning, and which ought to be by persons of importance and rank, can be removed if you yourself take a little trouble to make them. You can afterwards baptize them and put any name you like to them, fathering them on Prester John of the Indies, or the Emperor of Trebizond, who, to my knowledge, were said to have been famous poets. And even if they were not, and any pedants or bachelors should attack you and question the fact, never care to Maravedis for that. For even if they prove a lie against you, they cannot cut off the hand you wrote it with. As for references in the margin to the books and authors from whom you take the aphorisms and sayings that you put into your story, it is only contriving to fit in nicely any sentences or scraps of Latin you may happen to have by heart, or at any rate that will not give you much trouble to look up, so as, when you speak of freedom and captivity, to insert, Non bene pro toto libertas venditur auro, and then, refer in the margin to Horace, or whoever said it. Or, if you allude to the power of death, to come in with Pallida mors equo pulsat pede pauperum tabernas regum ketures. If it be friendship and the love God bids us bear to our enemy, go at once to the Holy Scriptures which you can do with a very small amount of research, and quote no less than the words of God himself. Ego autum dico vobis diligite inimicos vestros. If you speak of evil thoughts, turn to the gospel. Decorde exeunt cogitationes male. If of the fickleness of friends there is Cato, who will give you his distich. Donec eris Felix multos numerabis amicos, tempora si fuerint nubila solus eris. With these and such like bits of Latin, they will take you for a grammarian at all events, and that nowadays is no small honor and profit. 
With regards to adding annotations at the end of the book, you may safely do it this way. If you mention any giant in your book, contrive that it shall be the giant Goliath, and with this alone, which will cost you almost nothing, you have a grand note, for you can put, The giant Goliath, or Goliath, was a Philistine whom the shepherd David slew by a mighty stone, cast in the Terebinth Valley, as is related in the Book of Kings, in the chapter where you find it written. Next, to prove yourself a man of erudition in polite literature and cosmography, manage that the river Tagus shall be named in your story, and there you are at once with another famous annotation, setting forth, The river Tagus was so called after a king of Spain. It has its source in such and such a place, and falls into the ocean, kissing the walls of the famous city of Lisbon, and it is a common belief that it has golden sands, etc., if you should have anything to do with robbers, I will give you the story of Cacus, for I have it by heart. If with loose women, there is the Bishop of Mondonedo, who will give you the loans of Lamia, Laida, and Flora, any reference to whom will bring you great credit. If with hard-hearted ones, Ovid will furnish you with Medea. If with witches or enchantresses, Homer has Calypso and Virgil Circe. If with valiant captains, Julius Caesar himself will lend you himself in his own commentaries, and Plutarch will give you a thousand Alexanders. If you should deal with love, with two ounces you may know of Tuscan, you can go to Leon the Hebrew, who will supply you to your heart's content. Or, if you should not care to go to foreign countries, you have at home Fonseca's Of the Love of God, in which is condensed all that you or the most imaginative mind can want on the subject. In short, all you have to do is to manage to quote these names or refer to these stories I have mentioned, and leave it to me to insert the annotations and quotations, and I swear by all that's good to fill up your margins and use up four sheets at the end of the book. Now, let us come to those references to authors which other books have and you want for yours. The remedy for this is very simple. You have only to look out for some book that quotes them all, from A to Z, as you say yourself, and then insert the very same alphabet in your book. And though the imposition may be plain to see, because you have so little need to borrow from them, that is no matter. There will probably be some simple enough to believe that you have made use of all of them in this plain, artless story of yours. At any rate, if it answers no other purpose, this long catalogue of authors will serve to give a surprising look of authority to your book. Besides, no one will trouble himself to verify whether you have followed them or whether you have not, being no way concerned in it. Especially as, if I mistake not, this book of yours has no need of any one of those things you say at once, for it is, from beginning to end, an attack upon the books of chivalry, of which Aristotle never dreamt, nor St. Basil said a word, nor Cicero had any knowledge, nor do the niceties of truth, nor the observations of astrology come within the range of its fanciful vagaries, nor have geometrical measurements or refutations of the arguments used in rhetoric anything to do with it, nor does it mean to preach to anybody, mixing up things human and divine, a sort of motley in which no Christian understanding should dress itself. It has only to avail itself of truth to nature in its composition." and the more perfect the imitation, the better the work will be. And as this piece of yours aims at nothing more than to destroy the authority and influence which books of chivalry have in the world with the public, there is no need for you to go a-begging for aphorisms from philosophers, precepts from holy scripture, fables from poets, speeches from orators, or miracles from saints but merely to take care that your style and diction run musically, pleasantly, and plainly, with clear, proper, and well-placed words, setting forth your purpose to the best of your power, and putting your ideas intelligibly, without confusion or obscurity. Strive, too, that in reading your story the melancholy may be moved to laughter, and the merry made merrier still, that the simple shall not be wearied, that the judicious shall admire the invention, that the grave shall not despise it, nor the wise fail to praise it. Finally, 
keep your aim fixed on the destruction of that ill-founded edifice of the books of chivalry, hated by some and praised by many more. For if you succeed in this, you will have achieved no small success. In profound silence I listened to what my friend said, and his observations made such an impression on me that, without attempting to question them, I admitted their soundness, and out of them I determined to make this preface. Wherein, gentle reader, thou wilt perceive my friend's good sense, my good fortune in finding such an adviser in such a time of need, and what thou hast gained in receiving, without addition or alteration, the story of the famous Don Quixote of La Mancha, who is held by all the inhabitants of the district of the Campo de Montiel to have been the chastest lover and the bravest knight that has, for many years, been seen in that neighborhood. I have no desire to magnify the service I render thee in making thee acquainted with so renowned and honored a knight, but I do desire thy thanks for the acquaintance thou wilt make with the famous Sancho Panza, his squire, in whom, to my thinking, I have given thee, condensed, all the squirely drolleries that are scattered throughout the swarm of the vain books of chivalry. And so may God give thee health and not forget me. Vale. End of author's preface. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by A. R. Dobbs, San Francisco, May 2006. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Dedication and Chapters 1, 2, and 3. Dedication of Volume 1. To the Duke of Bejar, Marquis of Gibralion, Count of Benalcazar and Banares, Viscount of the Puebla de Alcocer, Master of the towns of Capilla, Curiel, and Burguillos. In belief of the good reception and honours that Your Excellency bestows on all sorts of books, as prince, so inclined to favour good arts, chiefly those who by their nobleness do not submit to the service and bribery of the vulgar, I have determined bringing to light the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha, in shelter of Your Excellency's glamorous name, to whom, with the obeisance I owe to such grandeur, I pray to receive it agreeably under his protection, so that in this shadow, though deprived of that pernicious ornament of elegance and erudition that clothe the works composed in the houses of those who know, it dares appear with assurance in the judgment of some who, trespassing the bounds of their own ignorance, use to condemn with more rigor and less justice the writings of others. It is my earnest hope that Your Excellency's good counsel in regard to my honorable purpose will not disdain the littleness of so humble a service. Miguel de Cervantes Volume 1, Chapter 1 Which treats of the character and pursuits of the famous gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha. In a village of La Mancha, the name of which I have no desire to call to mind, there lived, not long since, one of those gentlemen that keep a lance in the lance-rack, an old buckler, a lean hack, and a greyhound for coursing, an olla of rather more beef than mutton, a salad on most nights, scraps on Saturdays, lentils on Fridays, and a pigeon or so extra on Sundays, made away with three-quarters of his income. The rest of it went in a doublet of fine cloth and velvet breeches and shoes to match for holidays while on weekdays he made a brave figure in his best homespun. He had in his house a housekeeper past forty, a niece under twenty, and a lad for the field and marketplace, who used to saddle the hack as well as handle the bill-hook. The age of this gentleman of ours was bordering on fifty. He was of a hardy habit, spare, gaunt-featured, a very early riser, and a great sportsman. They will have it his surname was Quijada, or Quesada, for here there is some difference of opinion among the authors who write on the subject, although from reasonable conjectures it seems plain 
that he was called Kichana. This, however, is of but little importance to our tale. It will be enough not to stray a hair's breadth from the truth in the telling of it. You must know, then, that the above-named gentleman, whenever he was at leisure, which was mostly all the year round, gave himself up to reading books of chivalry with such ardour and avidity that he almost entirely neglected the pursuits of his field sports, and even the management of his property. And to such a pitch did his eagerness and infatuation go that he sold many an acre of tillage land to buy books of chivalry to read, and brought home as many of them as he could get. But of all there were none he liked so well as those of the famous Feliciano de Silva's composition, for their lucidity of style and complicated conceits were as pearls in his sight, particularly when in his reading he came upon courtships and cartels, where he often found passages like, The reason of the unreason with which my reason is afflicted so weakens my reason that with reason I murmur at your beauty. Or again, The high heavens that of your divinity divinely fortify you with the stars, render you deserving of the desert your greatness deserves. Over conceits of this sort the poor gentleman lost his wits, and used to lie awake, striving to understand them, and worm the meaning out of them. What Aristotle himself could not have made out or extracted, had he come to life again for that special purpose. He was not at all easy about the wounds which Don Belianis gave and took, because it seemed to him that, great as were the surgeons who had cured him, he must have had his face and body covered all over with seams and scars. He commended, however, the author's way of ending his book with the promise of that interminable adventure, and many a time was he tempted to take up his pen and finish it properly, as is there proposed, which no doubt he would have done, and made a successful piece of work of it too, had not greater and more absorbing thoughts prevented him. Many an argument did he have with the curate of his village, a learned man, and a graduate of Siguenza, as to which had been the better knight, Palmerin of England, or Amadis of Gaul. Master Nicholas, the village barber, however, used to say that neither of them came up to the knight of Phoebus, and that if there was any that could compare with him, it was Don Galior, the brother of Amadis of Gaul, because he had a spirit that was equal to every occasion, and was no finikin knight, nor lachrymose like his brother, while in the matter of valour he was not a whit behind him. In short, he became so absorbed in his books, that he spent his nights from sunset to sunrise, and his days from dawn to dark, poring over them. And what with little sleep and much reading, his brains got so dry that he lost his wits. His fancy grew full of what he used to read about in his books, enchantments, quarrels, battles, challenges, wounds, wooings, loves, agonies, and all sorts of impossible nonsense. And it so possessed his mind that the whole fabric of invention and fancy he read of was true, that to him no history in the world had more reality in it. He used to say, the Cid of Roy Diaz was a very good knight, but that he was not to be compared with the knight of the burning sword, who with one backstroke cut in half two fierce and monstrous giants. He thought more of Bernardo del Carpio, because at Roncesvalles he slew Roland in spite of enchantments, availing himself of the artifice of Hercules when he strangled Anteus, the son of Terra, in his arms. He approved highly of the giant Morgante, because although of the giant breed, which is always arrogant and ill-conditioned, he alone was affable and well-bred. But, above all, he admired Reynaldos of Montalban, especially when he saw him sallying forth from his castle and robbing everyone he met, and when beyond the seas he stole that image of Mahomet, which, as his history says, was entirely of gold. To have a bout of kicking at that traitor of a genelon, he would have given his housekeeper and his niece into the bargain. In short, his wits being quite gone, he hit upon the strangest notion that ever madman in this world hit upon, and that was that he fancied it was right and requisite 
as well for the support of his own honour as for the service of his country, that he should make a knight-errant of himself, roaming the world over in full armour and on horseback in quest of adventures, and putting in practice himself all that he had read of as being the usual practices of knights-errant, righting every kind of wrong, and exposing himself to peril and danger from which, in the issue, he was to reap eternal renown and fame. Already the poor man saw himself crowned by the might of his arm, Emperor of Trebizond, at least. And so, led away by the intense enjoyment he found in these pleasant fancies, he set himself forthwith to put his scheme into execution. The first thing he did was to clean up some armour that had belonged to his great-grandfather, and had been for ages lying forgotten in a corner, eaten with rust and covered with mildew. He scoured and polished it as best he could, but he perceived one great deficit in it, that it had no closed helmet, nothing but a simple morion. This deficiency, however, his ingenuity supplied, for he contrived a kind of half-helmet of pasteboard, which, fitted on to the morion, looked like a whole one. It is true that, in order to see if it was strong and fit to stand a cut, he drew his sword and gave it a couple of slashes, the first of which undid in an instant what had taken him a week to do. The ease with which he had knocked it to pieces disconcerted him somewhat, and to guard against that danger he set to work again fixing bars of iron on the inside until he was satisfied with its strength, and then, not caring to try any more experiments with it, he passed it and adopted it as a helmet of the most perfect construction. He next proceeded to inspect his hack, which, with more quartos than a real, and more blemishes than the steed of Chonela, that uh, tantum pelus et ossa fuit, surpassed in his eyes the Bucephalus of Alexander or the Babieca of the Cid. Four days were spent in thinking what name to give him, because, as he said to himself, it was not right that a horse belonging to a knight so famous, and one with such merits of his own, should be without some distinctive name, and he strove to adapt it so as to indicate what he had been before belonging to a knight-errant, and what he then was, for it was only reasonable that, his master taking a new character, he should take a new name, and that it should be a distinguished and full-sounding one, befitting the new order and calling he was about to follow. And so, after having composed, struck out, rejected, added to, unmade and remade, a multitude of names out of his memory and fancy, he decided upon calling him Rosanante, a name to his thinking lofty, sonorous, and significant of his condition as a hack before he became what he now was, the first and foremost of all the hacks in the world. Having got a name for his horse so much to his taste, he was anxious to get one for himself, and he was eight days more pondering over this point, till at last he made up his mind to call himself Don Quixote, whence, as has been already said, the authors of this veracious history have inferred that his name must have been beyond a doubt Quijada, and not Quesada, as others would have it. Recollecting, however, that the valiant Amadis was not content to call himself curtly Amadis, and nothing more, but added the name of his kingdom and country to make it famous, and called himself Amadis of Gaul, he, like a good knight, resolved to add on the name of his, and to style himself Don Quixote of La Mancha, whereby he considered, he described accurately his origin and country, and did honour to it in taking his surname from it. So then, his armour being furbished, his morion turned into a helmet, his hack christened, and he himself confirmed, he came to the conclusion that nothing more was needed now but to look out for a lady to be in love with. For a knight-errant without love is like a tree without leaves or fruit, or a body without a soul. As he said to himself, If for my sins, or by my good fortune, I come across some giant hereabouts, a common occurrence with knights-errant, 
and overthrow him in one onslaught, or cleave him asunder to the waist, or, in short, vanquish and subdue him. Will it not be well to have someone I may send him to as a present, that he may come in and fall on his knees before my sweet lady, and in a humble, submissive voice say, I am the giant Caraculiambro, lord of the island of Malindrania, vanquished in single combat by the never-sufficiently extolled knight Don Quixote of La Mancha, who has commanded me to present myself before your grace, that your highness dispose of me at your pleasure. Oh, how our good gentleman enjoyed the delivery of this speech! especially when he had thought of someone to call his lady. There was, so the story goes, in a village near his own, a very good-looking farm girl, with whom he had been at one time in love, though, as far as is known, she never knew it, nor gave a thought to the matter. Her name was Aldonza Lorenzo, and upon her he thought fit to confer the title of Lady of His Thoughts and after some search for a name which should not be out of harmony with her own, and should suggest and indicate that of a princess and great lady, he decided upon calling her Dulcinea del Toboso, she being of El Toboso, a name to his mind musical, uncommon, and significant, like all those he had already bestowed upon himself and the things belonging to him. Chapter 2 which treats of the first sally the ingenious Don Quixote made from home. These preliminaries settled, he did not care to put off any longer the execution of his design, urged on to it by the thought of all the world was losing by his delay, seeing what wrongs he intended to right, grievances to redress, injustices to repair, abuses to remove, and duties to discharge. So, without giving notice of his intention to any one, and without anybody seeing him, one morning before the dawning of the day, which was one of the hottest of the month of July, he donned his suit of armor, mounted Rocinante with his patched-up helmet on, braced his buckler, took his lance, and by the back door of the yard sallied forth upon the plain in the highest contentment and satisfaction at seeing with what ease he had made a beginning of his grand purpose. But scarcely did he find himself upon the open plain, when a terrible thought struck him, one all but enough to make him abandon the enterprise at the very outset. It occurred to him that he had not been dubbed a knight, and that according to the law of chivalry he neither could nor ought to bear arms against any knight, and that even if he had been still he ought, as a novice knight, to wear white armor, without a device upon the shield until by his prowess he had earned one. These reflections made him waver in his purpose, but his craze being stronger than any reasoning, he made up his mind to have himself dubbed a knight by the first one he came across, following the example of others in the same case, as he had read in the books that brought him to this pass. As for white armor, he resolved on the first opportunity to scour his until it was whiter than an ermine. And so comforting himself, he pursued his way, taking that which his horse chose for in this, he believed, lay the essence of adventures. Thus setting out, our new-fledged adventurer paced along, talking to himself, and saying, Who knows, but that in time to come, when the voracious history of my famous deeds is made known, the sage who writes it, when he has to set forth my first sally in the early morning, will do it after this fashion. Scarce had the rubicund Apollo spread o'er the face of the broad spacious earth the golden threads of his bright hair. Scarce had the little birds of painted plumage attuned their notes to hail with dulcet and mellifluous harmony the coming of the rosy dawn, that, 
deserting the soft couch of her jealous spouse, was appearing to mortals at the gates and balconies of the Manchugan horizon. When the renowned knight, Don Quixote of La Mancha, quitting the lazy down, mounted his celebrated steed Rocinante, and began to traverse the ancient and famous Campo de Montiel, which, in fact, he was actually traversing. Happy the age, happy the time, he continued, in which shall be made known my deeds of fame, worthy to be molded in brass, carved in marble, limed in pictures for a memorial for ever. And thou, O sage magician, whoever thou art, to whom it shall fall to be the chronicler of this wondrous history, forget not, I entreat thee, my good Rocinante, the constant companion of my ways and wanderings. Presently he broke out again as if he were love-stricken in earnest. Oh, Princess Dulcinea, lady of this captive heart, a grievous wrong hast thou done me to drive me forth with scorn and with inexorable obduracy banish me from the presence of thy beauty. O oh, lady, deign to hold in remembrance this heart, thy vassal, that thus in anguish pines for love of thee. So he went on stringing together these and other absurdities, all in the style of those his books had taught him, imitating their language as well as he could, and all the while... He rode so slowly, and the sun mounted so rapidly and with such fervor, that it was enough to melt his brains, if he had any. Nearly all day he traveled without anything remarkable happening to him, at which he was in despair, for he was anxious to encounter some one at once upon whom to try the might of his strong arm. Writers there are who say the first adventure he met with was that of Puerta la Pisa. Others say it was that of the windmills, but what I have ascertained on this point, and what I have found written in the annals of La Mancha, is that he was on the road all day, and towards nightfall his hack and he found themselves dead tired and hungry, when, looking all around to see if he could discover any castle or shepherd's shanty, where he might refresh himself and relieve his sore once, he perceived not far out of his road an inn, which was as welcome as a star guiding him to the portals, if not the palaces, of his redemption, and quickening his pace he reached it just as night was setting in. At the door were standing two young women, girls of the district as they call them, on their way to Seville, with some carriers who had chanced to halt that night at the inn. And as, happened what might to our adventurer, everything he saw or imagined seemed to him to be and to happen after the fashion of what he read of, the moment he saw the inn, he pictured it to himself as a castle, with its four turrets and pinnacles of shining silver, not forgetting the drawbridge and moat, and all the belongings usually ascribed to castles of the sort. To this inn, which to him seemed a castle, he advanced, and at a short distance from it he checked Rocinante, hoping that some dwarf would show himself upon the battlements, and by sound of trumpet give notice that a knight was approaching the castle. But seeing that they were slow about it, and that Rocinante was in a hurry to reach the stable, he made for the inn door, and perceived the two gay damsels who were standing there, and who seemed to him to be two fair maidens, or lovely ladies, taking their ease, at the castle gate. At this moment it so happened that a swineherd who was going through the stubbles, collecting a drove of pigs, for without any apology that is what they are called, gave a blast of his horn to bring them together, and forthwith it seemed to Don Quixote to be what he was expecting, the signal of some dwarf announcing his arrival. And so, 
with prodigious satisfaction, he rode up to the inn and to the ladies, who, seeing a man of this sort, approaching in full armor and with lance and buckler, were turning in dismay into the inn, when Don Quixote, guessing their fear by their flight, raising his pasteboard visor, disclosed his dry, dusty visage, and with courteous bearing and gentle voice addressed them. "'Your ladyships need not fly or fear any rudeness, for that it belongs not to the order of knighthood which I profess to offer to any one, much less to high-born maidens, as your appearance proclaims you to be.' The girls were looking at him, and straining their eyes to make out the features which the clumsy visor obscured. But when they heard themselves called maidens, a thing so much out of their line, they could not restrain their laughter, which made Don Quixote wax indignant, and say, "'Modesty becomes the fair, and moreover laughter that has little cause is great silliness. This, however, I say not to pain or anger you, for my desire is none other than to serve you.' The incomprehensible language and the unpromising looks of our cavalier only increased the lady's laughter, and that increased his irritation, and matters might have gone farther if, at that moment, the landlord had not come out, who, being a very fat man, was a very peaceful one. He, seeing this grotesque figure clad in armor that did not match any more than his saddle, bridle, lance, buckler, or corselet, was not at all indisposed to join the damsels in their manifestations of amusement, but, in truth, standing in awe of such a complicated armament, he thought it best to speak him fairly, so he said, "'Signor Caballero, if your worship wants lodging, baiting the bed, for there is not one in the inn, there is plenty of everything else here.' Don Quixote, observing the respectful bearing of the Alcaide of the fortress, for so the innkeeper and inn seemed in his eyes, made answer, "'Sir Castellon, for me, anything will suffice, for my armour is my only wear, my only rest the fray.' The host fancied he called him Castellon, because he took him for a worthy of Castile, though he was in fact an Andalusian and one from the strand of San Lucar, as crafty a thief as Cacus, and as full of tricks as a student or a page. In that case, he said, your bed is on the flinty rock, your sleep to watch alway, and if so, you may dismount, and safely reckon upon any quantity of sleeplessness under this roof for a twelvemonth, not to say for a single night. So saying, he advanced to hold the stirrup for Don Quixote, who got down with great difficulty and exertion, for he had not broken his fast all day, and then charged the host to take great care of his horse, as he was the best bit of flesh that ever ate bread in this world. The landlord eyed him over, but did not find him as good as Don Quixote said, nor even half as good, and putting him up in the stable, he returned to see what might be wanted by his guest, whom the damsels, who had by this time made their peace with him, were now relieving of his armor. They had taken off his breastplate and back piece, but they neither knew nor saw how to open his gorget or remove his makeshift helmet, for he had fastened it with green ribbons, which, as there was no untying the knots, required to be cut. This, however, he would not by any means consent to, so he remained all the evening with his helmet on, the drollest and oddest figure that can be imagined, and while they were removing his armor, taking the baggages who were about it for ladies of high degree belonging to the castle, he said to them, with great sprightliness, "'Oh, never surely was there knight so served by hand of dame, as served was he Don Quixote height, when from his town he came, with maidens waiting on himself, princesses on his hack, or Rocinante, for that, ladies mine, is my horse's name, and Don Quixote of La Mancha is my own. For though I had no intention of declaring myself until my achievements in your service and honour had made me known, the necessity of adapting that old ballad of Lancelot to the present occasion has given you the knowledge of my name altogether prematurely. A time, however, will come 
for your ladyships to command and me to obey, and then the might of my arm will show my desire to serve you. The girls, who were not used to hearing rhetoric of this sort, had nothing to say in reply. They only asked him if he wanted anything to eat. I would gladly eat a bit of something, said Don Quixote, for I feel it would come very seasonably. The day happened to be a Friday, and in the whole inn there was nothing but some pieces of the fish they call in Castile abedejo, in Andalusia bacallao, and in some places curadillo, and in others troutlet. So they asked him if he thought he could eat troutlet, for there was no other fish to give him. If there be troutlets enough, said Don Quixote, they will be the same thing as a trout, for it is all one to me whether I am given eight reals in small change or a piece of eight. Moreover, it may be that these troutlets are like veal, which is better than beef, or kid, which is better than goat. But whatever it be, let it come quickly, for the burden and pressure of arms cannot be borne without support to the inside. They laid a table for him at the door of the inn for the sake of the air, and the host brought him a portion of ill-soaked and worse-cooked stockfish, and a piece of bread as black and mouldy as his own armour. But a laughable sight it was to see him eating, for having his helmet on and the beaver up, he could not with his own hands put anything into his mouth unless someone else placed it there, and this service one of the ladies rendered him. But to give him anything to drink was impossible, or would have been so had not the landlord bored a reed, and putting one end in his mouth poured the wine into him through the other, all which he bore with patience rather than sever the ribbons of his helmet. While this was going on there came up to the inn a sow-gelder, who, as he approached, sounded his reed pipe four or five times, and thereby completely convinced Don Quixote that he was in some famous castle, and that they were regaling him with music, and that the stockfish was trout, the bread the whitest, the wenches ladies, and the landlord the castellon of the castle, and consequently he held that his enterprise and Sally had been to some purpose. But still it distressed him to think he had not been dubbed a knight, for it was plain to him that he could not lawfully engage in any adventure without receiving the order of knighthood. Chapter 3 Wherein is related the droll way in which Don Quixote had himself dubbed a knight. Harassed by this reflection, he made haste with his scanty pot-house supper, and having finished it, called the landlord, and shutting himself into the stable with him, fell on his knees before him, saying, from this spot I rise not, valiant knight, until your courtesy grants me the boon I seek, one that will redound to your praise and the benefit of the human race. The landlord, seeing his guest at his feet, and hearing a speech of this kind, stood staring at him in bewilderment, not knowing what to do or say, and entreating him to rise, but all to no purpose until he had agreed to grant the boon demanded of him. I looked for no less, my lord, from your high magnificence, replied Don Quixote, and I have to tell you that the boon I have asked and your liberality has granted is that you shall dub me knight to-morrow morning, and that to-night I shall watch my arms in the chapel of this your castle. Thus to-morrow, as I have said, will be accomplished what I so much desire, enabling me lawfully to roam through all the four quarters of the world, seeking adventures on behalf of those in distress, as is the duty of chivalry and of knights-errant like myself, whose ambition is directed to such deeds. The landlord, who, as has been mentioned, was something of a wag, and had already some suspicion of his guest's want of wits, was quite convinced of it on hearing talk of this kind from him, and to make sport for the night he determined to fall in with his humour. So he told him he was quite right in pursuing the object he had in view, and that such a motive was natural and becoming in cavaliers as distinguished as he seemed and his gallant bearing showed him to be, 
and that he himself in his younger days had followed the same honorable calling. Roaming in quest of adventures in various parts of the world, among others the curing grounds of Malaga, the isles of Riaran, the precinct of Saville, the little market of Segovia, the Oliveira of Valencia, and the Rondilla of Granada, the strand of San Lucar, the cult of Cordova, the taverns of Toledo, and divers other quarters, where he had proved the nimbleness of his feet and the lightness of his fingers, doing many wrongs, cheating many widows, ruining maids, and swindling minors, and, in short, bringing himself under the notice of almost every tribunal and court of justice in Spain, until at last he had retired to this castle of his, where he was living upon his property and that of others, and where he received all knights errant of whatever rank or condition they might be, all for the great love he bore them, and that they might share their substance with him. He told him, moreover, that in this castle of his there was no chapel in which he could watch his armor, as it had been pulled down in order to be rebuilt, and that in a case of necessity it might, he knew, be watched anywhere, and he might watch it that night in a courtyard of the castle, and in the morning God willing, the requisite ceremonies might be performed so as to have him dubbed a knight, and so thoroughly dubbed that nobody could be more so. He asked if he had any money with him, to which Don Quixote replied that he had not a farthing, as in the histories of knights errant he had never read of any of them carrying any. On this point, the landlord told him he was mistaken. For, though not recorded in the histories, because in the author's opinion there was no need to mention anything so obvious and necessary as money and clean shirts, it was not to be supposed, therefore, that they did not carry them, and he might regard it as certain and established that all knights errant, about whom there were so many full and unimpeachable books, carried well-furnished purses in case of emergency, and likewise carried shirts and a little box of ointment to cure the wounds they received. For in those plains and deserts where they engaged in combat and came out wounded, it was not always that there was someone to cure them, unless indeed they had for a friend some sage magician to succor them at once, by fetching through the air upon a cloud some damsel or dwarf with a vial of water of such virtue that by tasting one drop of it they were cured of their hurts and wounds in an instant, and left a sound as if they had not received any damage, whatever. But in case this should not occur, the knights of old took care to see that their squires were provided with money and other requisites, such as lint and ointments for healing purposes. And when it happened that knights had no squires, which was rarely and seldom the case, they themselves carried everything in cunning saddle-bags that were hardly to be seen on the horse's croup, as if it were something else of more importance, because, unless for some such reason, carrying saddle-bags was not very favorably regarded among knights-errant. He therefore advised him, and as his godson, so soon to be, he might even command him, never from that time forth to travel without money and the usual requirements, and he would find the advantage of them when he least expected it. Don Quixote promised to follow his advice scrupulously, and it was arranged forthwith that he should watch his armor in a large yard at one side of the inn. So, collecting it all together, Don Quixote placed it on a trough that stood by the side of a well, and, bracing his buckler on his arm, he grasped his lance, and began, with a stately air, to march up and down in front of the trough. And as he began his march, night began to fall. The landlord told all the people who were in the inn about the craze of his guest the watching of the armor, and the dubbing ceremony he contemplated. Full of wonder at so strange a form of madness, they flocked to see it from a distance, and observed with what composure he sometimes paced up and down, or sometimes, leaning on his lance, gazed on his armor without taking his eyes off it for ever so long. And as the night closed in, with a light from the moon so brilliant that it might vie with his that lent it, Everything the novice knight did was plainly seen by all. 
Meanwhile, one of the carriers who were in the inn thought fit to water his team, and it was necessary to remove Don Quixote's armor as it lay on the trough. But he, seeing the other approach, hailed him in a loud voice, O thou, whoever thou art, rash knight that comest to lay hands on the armor of the most valorous errant that ever girt on sword, have a care what thou dost. Touch it not unless thou wouldst lay down thy life as the penalty of thy rashness. The carrier gave no heed to these words, and he would have done better to heed them if he had been heedful of his health, but, seizing it by the straps, flung the armor some distance from him. Seeing this, Don Quixote raised his eyes to heaven, and fixing his thoughts, apparently, upon his lady Dulcinea, exclaimed, "'Aid me, lady mine, in this, the first encounter that presents itself to this breast which thou holdest in subjection.' Let not thy favor and protection fail me in this first jeopardy. And with these words, and others to the same purpose, dropping his buckler, he lifted his lance with both hands, and with it smote such a blow on the carrier's head that he stretched him on the ground, so stunned that had he followed it up with a second, there would have been no need of a surgeon to cure him. This done, he picked up his armor and returned to his beat with the same serenity as before. Shortly after this, another, not knowing what had happened, for the carrier still lay senseless, came with the same object of giving water to his mules, and was proceeding to remove the armor in order to clear the trough, when Don Quixote, without uttering a word or imploring aid from anyone, once more dropped his buckler and once more lifted his lance and without actually breaking the second carrier's head into pieces, made more than three of it, for he laid it open in four. At the noise all the people of the inn ran to the spot, and among them the landlord. Seeing this, Don Quixote braced his buckler on his arm, and with his hand on his sword exclaimed, O oh, lady of beauty, strength, and support of my faint heart! It is time for thee to turn the eyes of thy greatness on this thy captive knight on the brink of so mighty an adventure. By this he felt himself so inspired that he would not have flinched if all the carriers in the world had assailed him. The comrades of the wounded, perceiving the plight they were in, began from a distance to shower stones on Don Quixote, who screened himself as best he could with his buckler, not daring to quit the trough and leave his armor unprotected. The landlord shouted to them to leave him alone, for he had already told them he was mad, and as a madman he would not be accountable, even if he killed them all. Still louder shouted Don Quixote, calling them knaves and traitors, and the lord of the castle, who allowed knights errant to be treated in this fashion, a villain and a low-born knight, whom, had he received the order of knighthood, he would call to account for his treachery. But of you, he cried, base and vile rabble, I make no account. Fling, strike, come on, do all ye can against me, ye shall see what the reward of your folly and insolence will be. This he uttered with so much spirit and boldness that he filled his assailants with a terrible fear, and as much for this reason as at the persuasion of the landlord they left off stoning him, and he allowed them to carry off the wounded, and with the same calmness and composure as before resumed the watch over his armor. But these freaks of his guest were not much to the liking of the landlord, so he determined to cut matters short, and confer upon him at once the unlucky order of knighthood before any further misadventure could occur. So going up to him, he apologized for the rudeness which, without his knowledge, had been offered to him by these low people, who, however, had been well punished for their audacity. As he had already told him, he said, there was no chapel in the castle, nor was it needed for what remained to be done, for, as he understood the ceremonial of the order, the whole point of being dubbed a knight lay in the accolade and in the slap on the shoulder, and that could be administered in the middle of a field. 
and that he had now done all that was needful as to watching the armor, for all requirements were satisfied by a watch of two hours only, while he had been more than four about it. Don Quixote believed it all, and told him he stood there ready to obey him, and to make an end of it with as much despatch as possible. For if he were again attacked, and felt himself to be dubbed a knight, he would not, he thought, leave a soul alive in the castle, except such as out of respect he might spare at his bidding. Thus warned and menaced, the Castillon forthwith brought out a book in which he used to enter the straw and barley he served out to the carriers, and, with the lad carrying a candle-end, and the two damsels already mentioned, he turned to where Don Quixote stood, and bade him kneel down. Then, reading from his account-book, as if he were repeating some devout prayer, in the middle of his delivery he raised his hand and gave him a sturdy blow on the neck, and then, with his own sword, a smart slap on the shoulder, all the while muttering between his teeth as if he was saying his prayers. Having done this, he directed one of the ladies to gird on his sword, which she did with great self-possession and gravity, and not a little was required to prevent a burst of laughter at each stage of the ceremony. But what they had already seen of the novice knight's prowess kept their laughter within bounds. In girding him with the sword, the worthy lady said to him, May God make your worship a very fortunate knight, and grant you success in battle. Don Quixote asked her her name, in order that he might from that time forward know to whom he was beholden for the favor he had received, as he meant to confer upon her some portion of the honor he acquired by the might of his arm. She answered with great humility that she was called La Talosa, and that she was the daughter of a cobbler of Toledo, who lived in the stalls of Sancho Biennaya, and that wherever she might be she would serve and esteem him as her lord. Don Quixote said in reply that she would do him a favor if thenceforward she assumed the Don, and called herself Dona Talosa. She promised she would, and then the other buckled on his spur and with her followed almost the same conversation as with the Lady of the Sword. He asked her name, and she said it was La Molinera, and that she was the daughter of a respectable miller of Antequera. And of her likewise, Don Quixote requested that she would adopt the Don, and call herself Dona Molinera, making offers to her further services and favors. Having thus, with hot haste and speed, brought to a conclusion these never-till-now-seen ceremonies, Don Quixote was on thorns until he saw himself on horseback sallying forth in quest of adventures, and saddling Rocinante at once he mounted, and, embracing his host, as he returned thanks for his kindness in knighting him, he addressed him in language so extraordinary that it is impossible to convey an idea of it or report it. The landlord, to get him out of the inn, replied with no less rhetoric, though with shorter words, and without calling upon him to pay the reckoning, let him go with a godspeed. End of chapter 3, volume 1
and the instant he heard them, he exclaimed, "'Thanks be to heaven for the favour it accords me, that it so soon offers me an opportunity of fulfilling the obligation I have undertaken, and gathering the fruit of my ambition. These cries, no doubt, come from some man or woman in want of help, and needing my aid and protection.' And wheeling, he turned Rosinant in the direction where the cries seemed to proceed. He had gone but a few paces into the wood when he saw a mare tied to an oak, and tied to another, and stripped from the waist upwards a youth of about fifteen years of age, from whom the cries came. Nor were they without cause, for a lusty farmer was flogging him with a belt and following up every blow with scoldings and commands, repeating, "'Your mouth shut and your eyes open!' while the youth made answer, "'I won't do it again, master mine! "'My God's passion, I won't do it again, "'and I'll take more care of the flock another time.' Seeing what was going on, Don Quixote said in an angry voice, "'Discourteous knight, it ill becomes you to assail one who cannot defend himself. "'Mount your steed and take your lance.' "'For there was a lance leaning against the oak to which the mare was tied. "'And I will make you know that you are behaving as a coward.' The farmer, seeing before him this figure in full armor, brandishing a lance over his head, gave himself up for dead, and made answer meekly, "'Sir Knight, this youth that I am chastising is my servant, employed by me to watch a flock of sheep that I have hard by, and he is so careless that I lose one every day, and when I punish him for his carelessness and knavery, he says I do it out of niggardliness, to escape paying him the wages I owe him, and before God and on my soul he lies.' "'Lies before me, base clown,' said Don Quixote. "'By the sun that shines on us, I have a mind to run you through with this lance. "'Pay him at once without another word. "'If not, by the God that rules us, I will make an end of you and annihilate you on the spot. "'Release him instantly.' "'The farmer hung his head and, without a word, untied his servant, "'of whom Don Quixote asked how much his master owed him. "'He replied, nine months at seven reels a month.' Don Quixote added it up, found that it came to sixty-three reels, and told the farmer to pay it down immediately, if he did not want to die for it. The trembling clown replied that as he lived, and by the oath he had sworn, though he had not sworn any, it was not so much, for there were to be taken into account and deducted three pairs of shoes he had given him, and a reel for two bloodlettings when he was sick. All that is very well, said Don Quixote. But let the shoes and the bloodlettings stand as a set-off against the blows you have given him without any cause. For if he spoiled the leather of the shoes you paid for, you have damaged that of his body, and if the barber took blood from him when he was sick, you have drawn it when he was sound. So on that score he owes you nothing. The difficulty is, Sir Knight, that I have no money here. Let Andres come home with me, and I will pay him all, reel by reel. I go with him, said the youth. Nay, God forbid! "'No, senor, not for the world, for once alone with me he would ray me like a St. Bartholomew.' "'He will do nothing of the kind,' said Don Quixote. "'I have only to command, and he will obey me. "'And as he has sworn to me by the order of knighthood which he has received, "'I leave him free, and I guarantee the payment.' "'Consider what you are saying, senor,' said the youth. "'This master of mine is not a knight, nor has he received any order of knighthood, "'for he is Juan Haldudo, the rich, of Quintanar.' "'That matters little,' replied Don Quixote. "'There may be Haldudo's knights. "'Moreover, every one is the son of his works.' "'That is true,' said Andres. "'But this master of mine, of what works is he the son, "'when he refuses me the wages of my sweat and labor? "'I do not refuse, brother Andres,' said the farmer. "'Be good enough to come along with me, "'and I swear by all the orders of knighthood there are in the world "'to pay you as I have agreed, real by real and perfumed.' "'For the perfumery I excuse you,' said Don Quixote, "'but give it to him in reels, and I shall be satisfied, "'and see that you do as you have sworn. "'If not, by the same oath I swear to come back "'and hunt you out and punish you. "'And I shall find you, though you should lie closer than a lizard. "'And if you desire to know who it is lays this command upon you, "'that you be more firmly bound to obey it, "'know that I am the valorous Don Quixote of La Mancha.' the undoer of wrongs and injustices, and so God be with you, and keep in mind what you have promised and sworn under those penalties that have already been declared to you. So saying, he gave Rosinant the spur, and was soon out of reach. The farmer followed him with his eyes, and when he saw that he had cleared the wood and was no longer in sight, 
He turned to his boy Andres and said, "'Come here, my son. I want to pay you what I owe you, as that undoer of wrongs has commanded me.' "'My oath on it,' said Andres, "'your worship will be well advised to obey the command of that good knight. May he live a thousand years, for, as he is a valiant and just judge by rock, if you do not pay me, he will come back and do as he said.' "'My oath on it, too,' said the farmer, "'but as I have a strong affection for you, "'I want to add to the debt in order to add to the payment.' "'And seizing him by the arm, he tied him up again, "'and gave him such a flogging that he left him for dead. "'Now, Master Andres,' said the farmer, "'call on the undoer of wrongs. "'You will find he won't undo that, "'though I am not sure that I have quite done with you, for I have a good mind to flay you alive. But at last he untied him and gave him leave to look for his judge in order to put the sentence pronounced into execution. Andres went off rather down in the mouth, swearing he would go look for the valiant Don Quixote of La Mancha and tell him exactly what had happened, and that all would have to be repaid him sevenfold. But for all that he went off weeping while his master stood laughing. Thus did the valiant Don Quixote right that wrong and thoroughly satisfied with what had taken place, as he considered he had made a very happy and noble beginning with this knighthood, he took the road towards his village in perfect self-content, saying in a low voice, "'Well mayest thou this day call thyself fortunate above all on earth, O Dulcinea del Toboso, fairest of the fair, since it has fallen to thy lot to hold subject and submissive to thy full will and pleasure, a knight so renowned as is and will be Don Quixote of La Mancha, who, as all the world knows, yesterday received the order of knighthood, and hath to-day righted the greatest wrong and grievance that ever injustice conceived and cruelty perpetrated, who hath to-day plucked the rod from the hand of yonder ruthless oppressor, so wantonly lashing that tender child. He now came to a road branching in four directions, and immediately he was reminded of those crossroads where knight errants used to stop to consider which road they should take. In imitation of them he halted for a while, and, after having deeply considered it, he gave Rosinant his head, submitting his own will to that of his hack, who followed out his first intention, which was to make straight for his own stable. After he had gone about two miles, Don Quixote perceived a large party of people who, as afterwards appeared, were some Toledo traders, on their way to buy silk at Murcia. There were six of them coming along under their sunshades, with four servants mounted and three muleteers on foot. Scarcely had Don Quixote described them when the fancy possessed him that this must be some new adventure, and to help him to imitate as far as he could those passages he had read in his books, here seemed to come one made on purpose, which he resolved to attempt. So, with a lofty bearing and determination, he fixed himself firmly in his stirrups got his lance ready, brought his buckler before his breast, and, planting himself in the middle of the road, stood waiting the approach of these knight errants, for such he now considered and held them to be. And when they had come near enough to see and hear, he exclaimed with a haughty gesture, "'All the world stand, unless all the world confess, that in all the world there is no maiden fairer than the Empress of La Mancha, the peerless Dulcinea del Toboso.' The traders halted at the sound of his language and the sight of the strange figure that uttered it, and from both figure and language at once guessed the craze of their owner. They wished, however, to learn quietly what was the object of this confession that was demanded of them, and one of them, who was rather fond of a joke, and was very sharp-witted, said to him, "'Sir Knight, we do not know who this good lady is that you speak of. "'Show her to us, for if she be of such beauty as you suggest, "'with all our hearts and without any pressure, "'we will confess the truth that is on your part required of us.' "'If I were to show her to you,' replied Don Quixote, "'what merit would you have in confessing a truth so manifest? "'The essential point is that without seeing her "'you must believe, confess, affirm, swear, and defend it, "'else ye have to do with me in battle ill-conditioned arrogant rabble that ye are, and come ye on, one by one, as the order of knighthood requires, or all together, as is the custom and vile usage of your breed. Here do I bide, and await your relying on the justice of the cause I maintain. Sir Knight, replied the traitor, 
I entreat your worship, in the name of this present company of princes, that to save us from charging our consciences with the confession of a thing we have neither seen nor heard of, and one moreover so much to the prejudice of the empresses and queens of the Alcarian Estremadura, your worship will be pleased to show us some portrait of this lady, though it be no bigger than a grain of wheat, for by the thread one gets at the ball, and in this way we shall be satisfied and easy, and you will be content and pleased. Nay, I believe we are already so far agreed with you that even though her portrait should show her blind of one eye and distilling vermilion and sulphur from the other, we would nevertheless, to gratify your worship, say all in her favour that you desire. She distills nothing of the kind, vile rabble, said Don Quixote, burning with rage. Nothing of the kind. I say only amergies and civet and cotton. Nor is she one-eyed or humpbacked, but straighter than a Gadarama spindle. But ye must pay for the blasphemy ye have uttered against beauty like that of my lady. And so saying, he charged with levelled lance against the one who had spoken, with such fury and fierceness that, if luck had not contrived that Rosinant should stumble midway and come down, it would have gone hard with the rash traitor. Down went Rosinant, and over went his master, rolling along the ground for some distance, and when he tried to rise, he was unable, so encumbered was he with lance, buckler, spurs, helmets, and the weight of his old armor. And all the while he was struggling to get up. He kept saying, Fly not, cowards and caitiffs, stay, for not by my fault, but my horses am I stretched here. One of the muleteers in attendance, who could not have had much good nature in him, hearing the poor prostrated man blustering in this style, was unable to refrain from giving him an answer on his ribs, and, coming up to him, he seized his lance, and, having broken it in pieces, with one of them he began so to belabor our Don Quixote that, notwithstanding, and in spite of his armor, he milled him like a measure of wheat. His masters called out not to lay on so hard, and to leave him alone, but the muleteer's blood was up, and he did not care to drop the game until he had vented the rest of his wrath and gathering up the remaining fragments of the lands, he finished with a discharge upon the unhappy victim, who all through the storm of six that rained on him never ceased threatening heaven and earth, and the brigands, for such they seemed to him. At last the muleteer was tired, and the traders continued their journey, taking with them matter for talk about the poor fellow who had been cudgelled. He, when he found himself alone, made another effort to rise, but if he was unable and whole and sound, how was he to rise after having been thrashed and well-nigh knocked to pieces? And yet he esteemed himself fortunate, as it seemed to him that this was a regular knight-errant's mishap, and entirely he considered the fault of his horse. However, battered in body as he was, to rise was beyond his power. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 In which the narrative of our knight's mishap is continued Finding, then, that, in fact, he could not move, he thought himself of having recourse to his usual remedy, which was to think of some passage in his books, and his craze brought to his mind that about Baldwin and the Marquis of Mantua, when Carlotto left him wounded on the mountainside, a story known by heart by the children, not forgotten by the young man, and lauded, and even believed by the old folks, and, for all that, not a whit truer than the miracles of Mohammed. This seemed to him to fit exactly the case in which he found himself, so, making a show of severe suffering, he began to roll on the ground, and with feeble breath repeated the very words which the wounded knight of the wood is said to have uttered. Where art thou, lady mine? Art thou? My sorrow does not rue. Thou canst not know it, lady mine, or else thou art untrue. And so he went on with the ballad, as far as the lines... O oh, noble Marquis of Matantua, my uncle and liege lord. As chance would have it, when he got to this line, there happened to come a peasant from his own village, a neighbor of his, who had been the load of wheat to the mill, and seeing the man stretched there, came up to him and asked him who he was and what was the matter of him that he complained so dolefully. Don Quixote was firmly persuaded that this was the Marquis of Mantua, his uncle, so the only answer he made was to go on with his ballad, in which he told the tale of his misfortune, and the, and the loves of the emperor's son, and his wife, all exactly as the ballad sings it. 
The peasant stood amazed at hearing such nonsense, and, relieving him of the visor, already battered to pieces by blows, he wiped his face, which was covered with dust, and as soon as he had done so he recognized him, and said, "'Senor Quijada!' for so he appears to have been called when he was in his senses, and had not changed from a quiet country gentleman into a knight-errant. "'Who has brought your worship to this pass?' But to all questions the other only went on with his ballad. Seeing this, the good man removed as well as he could his breastplate and bagpiece, to see if he had any wound, but he could perceive no blood nor any mark anywhere. He then contrived to raise him from the ground, and with no little difficulty hoisted him upon his ass, which seemed to him to be the easiest mount for him, and, collecting the arms even to the splinters of the lance, he tied them on to Rossinant, and, leading him by the bridle and the ass by the halter, he took the road for the village, very sad to hear what absurd stuff Don Quixote was talking. Nor was Don Quixote less so, for what with blows and bruises he could not sit upright on the ass, and from time to time he sent up sighs to heaven, so that once more he drove the peasant to ask what ailed him. And it could have been only the devil himself that put into his head tales to match his own adventures, for now, forgetting Baldwin, he bethought himself of the Moor Abendares, when the Alcade of Anticura, Rodrigo de Narave, took him prisoner and carried him away to his castle, so that when the peasant asked him again how he was and what ailed him, he gave him for reply the same words and phrases that the, that the captive Ambindarare gave to Rodrigo de Narave, just as he had read the story in Diana of George de Montemayor, where it is applying it to his own case so aptly that the peasant went along cursing his fate that he had to listen to such a lot of nonsense, from which, however, he came to the conclusion that his neighbor was mad, and so made all haste to reach the village to escape the wearisomeness of this harangue of Don Quixote's, who, at the end of it, said, Senor Don Rodrigo de Narave, your worship must know that this fair Zarifa I have mentioned is now the lovely Dulcinea del Toboso, for whom I have done and doing and will do the most famous deeds of chivalry that in this world have been seen, are to be seen, or ever shall be seen. To this the peasant answered, Senor, sinner that I am, cannot your worship see that I am not Don R Rodrigo de Narave, nor the Marquis of Manchua, but Pedro Alonso, your neighbor, and that your worship is neither Baldwin nor Abendare, but the worthy gentleman, Senor Quijada? I know who I am, replied Don Quixote, and I know that I may be not only those I have named, but all the twelve peers of France, and even all the nine worthies, since my achievements surpass all they have done altogether, and each of them on his own account. With this talk and more of the same kind, they reached the village just as night was beginning to fall, and the peasant waited until it was a little later, that the belabored gentleman might not be seen riding in such a miserable trim. When it was what seemed to him the proper time, he entered the village and went to Don Quixote's house, which he found all in confusion, and there were the curate and the village barber who were great friends of Don Quixote, and his housekeeper was saying to them in a loud voice, What does your worship think can have befallen my master, Senor Licentiate Pero Pere? For, so the curate was called, It is three days now since anything has been seen of him or hack, or the buckler, lance, or armor. Miserable me, I am certain of it, and it is as true as that I was born to die, that these accursed books of chivalry he has, and has got into the way of reading so constantly, have upset his reason. For now I remember having often heard him say to himself that he would turn knight-errant, and go all over the world in quest of adventures, to the devil and Baraba with such books that have brought to ruin in this way the finest understanding there was in all of La Mancha. The niece said the same and more. You must know, Master Nicholas, for that was the name of the barber. It was often my uncle's way to stay two days and nights together, poring over those unholy books of misadventures, for which he would fling the book away and snatch up his sword and fall to slashing the walls, and when he was tired out he would say he had killed four giants, like four towers, and the sweat that flowed from him when he was weary, he said, was the blood of the wounds he had received in battle, and then he would drink a great jug of cold water become calm and quiet, saying that this water was a most precious potion which the sage Esquife, a great magician and friend of his, had brought him. But I take all the blame upon myself for never having told you of my uncle's vagaries, that you might put a stop to them before things had come to pass, and burn all these accursed books, for he has a great number, that richly deserve to be burned like heretics. So say I, too, said the curate, but... My faith to-morrow shall not pass without public judgment upon them, and may they be condemned to the flames, lest they lead those that read to behave as my good friend seems to have behaved. All this the peasant heard, and from it he understood what was the matter with his neighbor. So he began calling aloud, <coughs> Open your worships to Signor Baldwin and to Signor the Marquis of Mantua, who comes badly wounded, and to Signor Abindare the Moor, 
whom the valiant Rodrigo de Navarre, the alcaide of Anticura, brings captive. At these words they hurried out, and when they recognized their friend, master, and uncle, who had not yet dismounted from the ass because he could not, they ran to embrace him. Hold, said he, for I am badly wounded through my horse's fault. Carry me to bed, and if possible send for the wise Organda to cure and see to my wounds. See there, plague on it, said the housekeeper at this. Did not my heart tell the truth as to which foot my master went lame of? To bed with your worship at once, and we will contrive to cure you here without fetching that Hurganda. I a curse, I say, once more, and a hundred times more, on those books of chivalry that have brought your worship to such a pass. They carried him to bed at once, and after searching for his wounds could find none, but he said they were all bruises from having had a severe fall with his horse Rosinet when in combat with ten giants, the biggest and the boldest to be found on the earth. So, so, said the curate, are there, di are there giants in the dance? By the sign of the cross I will burn them to-morrow before the day over. They put a host of questions to Don Quixote, but his only answer to all was, Give him something to eat, and leave him to sleep, for that was what he needed most. They did so, and the curate questioned the peasant at great length as to how he found Don Quixote. He told him, and the nonsense he had talked when found, and on the way home, all which made the licentiate the more eager to do what he did the next day, which was to summon his friend the barber, Master Nicholas, and go with him to Don Quixote's house. End of chapter 5 End of part 5「This LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Part 6, Chapters 6 to eight. Chapter six of the diverting and important scrutiny which the curate and the barber made in the library of our ingenious gentleman. He was still sleeping, so the curate asked the niece for the keys of the rooms where the books, the authors of all the mischief, were, and right willingly she gave them. They all went in, the housekeeper with them, and found more than a hundred volumes of big books very well bound, and some other small ones. The moment the housekeeper saw them, she turned about and ran out of the room, and came back immediately with a saucer of holy water, and a sprinkler, saying, Here, your worship, Senor Licenciate, sprinkle this room. Don't leave any magician of the many there are in these books to bewitch us, in revenge for our design of banishing them from the world. The simplicity of the housekeeper made the licentiate laugh, and he directed the barber to give him the books one by one to see what they were about, as there might be some to be found among them that did not deserve the penalty of fire. No, said the niece, there is no reason for showing mercy to any of them, they have every one of them done mischief. Better fling them out of the window into the court, and make a pile of them, and set fire to them. Or else carry them into the yard, and there a bonfire can be made without the smoke giving any annoyance. The housekeeper said the same. So eager were they, both for the slaughter of those innocents, but the curate would not agree to it without first reading, at any rate, the titles. The first that Master Nicholas put into his hand was the four books of Amadis of Gaul. This seems a mysterious thing, says the curate, for, as I have heard say, this was the first book of chivalry printed in Spain, and from this all the others derived their birth and origin. So it seems to me that we ought inexorably to condemn it to the flames, as the founder of so vile a sect. Nay, sir, said the barber, I too have heard say that this is the best of all the books of this kind that have been written, and so as something singular in its line, it ought to be pardoned. True, said the curate, and for that reason let its life be spared for the present. Let us see that 
other which is next to it. It is, said the barber, the Sergas de Espladian, the lawful son of Amadis of Gaul. Then verily, said the curate, the merit of the father must not be put down to the account of the son. Take it, mistress housekeeper, open the window and fling it into the yard, and lay the foundation of the pile of the bonfire we are to make. The housekeeper obeyed with great satisfaction, and the worthy Esplandian went flying into the yard to await with all patience the fire that was in store for him. Proceed, said the curate. This that comes next, said the barber, is Amadis of Greece, and indeed I believe all those on this side are of the same Amadis lineage. Then to the yard with the whole of them, said the curate, for to have the burning of Queen Pintiquinestra, and the shepherd Darniel, and his eclogues too, and the bedeviled and involved discourses of his author, I would burn with them the father who begot me, if he were going about in the guise of a knight-errant. I am of the same mind, said the barber. And so am I, added the niece. In that case, said the housekeeper, here, into the yard with them. They were handed to her, and as there were many of them, she spared herself the staircase, and flung them out of the window. Who is that tub there? said the curate. This, said the barber, is Don Olivante de Laura. The author of that book, said the curate, was the same that wrote The Garden of Flowers, and truly there is no deciding which of the two books is the more truthful, or, to put it better, the less lying. All I can say is, send this one into the yard for a swaggering fool. This that follows is Flores Marte of Ircaña, said the barber. Señor Flores Marte here, said the curate, then by my faith he must take up his quarters in the yard, in spite of his marvelous birth and visionary adventures, for the stiffness and dryness of his style deserve nothing else. Into the yard with him and the other, mistress housekeeper. With all my heart, senor, said she, and executed the order with great delight. This, said the barber, is the night platier. An old book, that, said the curate, but I find no reason for clemency in it. Send it after the others without appeal, which was done. Another book was opened, and they saw it was entitled The Knight of the Cross. For the sake of the holy name this book has, said the curate, its ignorance might be excused. But then, they say, behind the cross there's the devil, to the fire with it. Taking down another book, the barber said, This is the mirror of chivalry. Hmm, I know his worship, said the curate. That is where Señor Reynaldos of Montalvan figures with his friends and comrades, greater thieves than Cacus and the twelve peers of France with the voracious historian Turpin. However, I am not for condemning them to more than perpetual banishment, because, at any rate, they have some share in the invention of the famous Matteo Boiardo, whence, too, the Christian poet Ludovico Ariosto wove his web, to whom, if I find him here, and speaking any language but his own, I shall show no respect whatever. But, if he speaks his own tongue, I will put him upon my head. Well, I have him in Italian, said the barber, but I do not understand him. Nor would it be well that you should understand him, said the curate. And on that score, we might have excused the captain, if he had not brought him into Spain and turned him into Castilian. He robbed him of a great deal of his natural force, and so do all those who try to turn books written in verse into another language. For with all the pains they take, and all the cleverness they show, 
they never can reach the level of the originals as they were first produced. In short, I say, that this book, and all that may be found treating of those French affairs, should be thrown into or deposited in some dry well until, after more consideration, it is settled what is to be done with them. Excepting always one Bernardo del Carpio, that is going about, and, and another called Roncevales, for these, if they come into my hands, shall pass at once into those of the housekeeper, and from hers into the fire, without any reprieve. To all this the barber gave assent, and looked upon it as right and proper, being persuaded that the curate was so staunch to the faith and loyal to the truth, that he would not for the world say anything opposed to them. Opening another book, he saw it was Pomerine de Oliva, and beside it was another one called Pomerine of England, seeing which the licentiate said, Let the olive be made firewood of at once, and burned until no ashes even are left, and let that palm of England be kept and preserved as a thing that stands alone, and let such another case be made for it, as that which Alexander found among the spoils of Darius, and set aside for the safekeeping of the works of the poet Homer. This book, Gossip, is of authority for two reasons. First, because it is very good, and second, because it is said to have been written by a wise and witty king of Portugal. All the adventures of the castle of Miraguarda are excellent and of admirable contrivance, and the language is polished and clear, studying and observing the style befitting the speaker with propriety and judgment. So then, provided it seems good to you, Master Nicholas, I say, let this and Amadis of Gaul be remitted without the penalty of fire, and, as for all the rest, let them perish without further question or query. Nay, gossip, said the barber, for this that I have here is the famous Don Bilianis. Well, said the curate, that and the second, third, and fourth parts of all stand in need of a little rhubarb to purge their excess of bile, and they must be cleared of all that stuff about the castle of fame and other greater affectations, to which end let them be allowed the overseas term, and, according as they mend, so shall mercy or justice be meted out to them, and in the meantime, gossip, do you keep them in your house, and let no one read them? With all my heart, said the barber, and not caring to tire himself with reading more books of chivalry, he told the housekeeper to take all the big ones and throw them into the yard. It was not said to one dull or deaf, but to one who enjoyed burning them more than weaving the broadest and finest web that could be. And seizing about eight at a time, she flung them out of the window. In carrying so many together, she let one fall at the feet of the barber, who took it up, curious to know what it was, and found it said, History of the famous knight, Tirante el Blanco. God bless me, said the curate. Tirante el Blanco here? Hand it over, gossip, for in it I reckon I have found a treasury of enjoyment and a mine of recreation. Here is Don Qui Rialesen of Montalvan, a valiant knight, and his brother Thomas of Montalvan, and the knight Fonseca, with the battle the bold Tirante fought with the Mastiff, and the witticism of the damsel Placer de mi Vida, and the loves and wiles of the widow Reposada, and the empress in love with the squire Hippolito. In truth, gossip, by right of its style, it is the best book in the world. Here knights eat and sleep, and die in their beds, and make their wills before dying, and a great deal of more of which there are not in the other books. 
Nevertheless, I say, he who wrote it, for deliberately composing such fooleries, deserves to be sent to the galleys for life. Take it home with you, and read it, and you will see that what I have said is true. As you will, said the barber, but what are we to do with these little books that are left? They must be not chivalry, but poetry, said the curate, and opening up one he saw it was the Diana of Jorge de Montemayor, and supposing all the others to be of the same sort, he said, These do not deserve to be burned like the others, for they neither do nor can do the mischief the books of chivalry have done, being books of entertainment that can hurt no one. Ah, senor, said the niece, your worship had better order these to be burned as well as the others, for it would be no wonder if, after being cured of his chivalry disorder, my uncle, by reading these, took a fancy to turn shepherd, and range the woods and fields, singing and piping, or what would be still worse, to turn poet, which they say is an incurable and infectious malady. Mm, the damsel is right, said the curate, and it will be well to put this stumbling block and temptation out of our friend's way. To begin, then, with the Diana of Montemayor, I am of the opinion it should not be burned, but that it should be cleared of all that about the sage Felicia, and the magic water, and of almost all the longer pieces of verse. Let it keep, and welcome, its prose, and the honor of being the first of books of the kind. Hmm. This that comes next, said the barber, is the Diana, entitled The Second Part, by the Salamancan, and this other has the same title, and its author is Hil Polo. Hmm. As for the Salamancan, replied the curate, let it go to swell the number of the condemned in the yard, and let Hil Polos be preserved, as if it came from Apollo himself. But get on, gossip, and make haste, for it is growing late. This book, said the barber, opening another, is the ten books of the fortune of love written by Antonio de Lofraso, a Sardinian poet. By the orders I have received, said the curate, since Apollo has been Apollo, and the muses have been muses, and poets have been poets, so droll and absurd a book as this has never been written, and in its way it is the best and the most singular of all of this species that have as yet appeared. And he who has not read it may be sure that he has never read what is delightful. Give it here, gossip, for I make more account of having found it than if they had given me a cossack of Florence stuff. He put it aside with extreme satisfaction, and the barber went on. These that come next are the Shepherd of Iberia, Nymphs of Enares, and the Enlightenment of Jealousy. Hmm. Then all we have to do, said the curate, is to hand them over to the secular arm of the housekeeper, and ask me not why, or we shall never have done. The next is the Pastor of Philida. Hmm. No pastor that, said the curate, but a highly polished courtier. Let it be preserved as a precious jewel. This large one here, said the barber, is called the Treasury of Poems. If there were not so many of them, said the curate, they would be more relished. This book must be weeded and cleansed of certain vulgarities, which it has with its excellences. Let it be preserved, because the author is a friend of mine, and out of respect for other more heroic and loftier works that he has written. This, continued the barber, is the Cancionero of Lopez de Maldonado. Hmm, the author of that book, too, said the curate, is a great friend of mine, and his verses from his own mouth are the admiration of all who hear them, for such is the sweetness of his voice that he enchants when he chants them. It gives rather too much of its eclogues, but what is good was never yet plentiful. Let it be kept with those that have been set apart. But what book is next with it? 
The Galatea of Miguel de Cervantes, said the barber. Hmm. That Cervantes has been for many years a great friend of mine, and to my knowledge he has had more experience in reverses than in verses. His book has some good invention in it. It presents us with something, but brings nothing to a conclusion. We must wait for the second part, it promises. Perhaps with amendment it may succeed in winning the full measure of grace that is now denied it. And in the meantime, do you, Senor Gossip, keep it shut in your own quarters? Very good, said the barber. And here come another three, together. The Araucana of Don Alonso de Ercilla, the Austriada of Juan Rufo, Justice of Cordova, and the Montserrate of Cristobal de Virues, the Valencian poet. These three books, said the curate, are the best that have been written in Castilian in heroic verse, and they may compare with the most famous of Italy. Let them be preserved as the richest treasures of poetry that Spain possesses. The curate was tired and would not look into any more books, and so he decided that contents uncertified, all the rest should be burned. But just then the barber held open one called The Tears of Angelica. Oh, I should have shed tears myself, said the curate when he heard the title, had I ordered that book to be burned, for its author was one of the famous poets of the world, not to say of Spain, and was very happy in the translation of some of Ovid's fables. Chapter 7 Of the Second Sally of Our Worthy Knight Don Quixote of La Mancha At this instant Don Quixote began shouting out, Hear, hear, valiant knights! Here is need for you to put forth the might of your strong arms, for they of the court are gaining the mastery in the tourney. Called away by this noise and outcry, they proceeded no farther with the scrutiny of the remaining books, and so it is thought that the Carolea, the Lion of Spain, and the deeds of the Emperor, written by Don Luis de Avila, went to the fire unseen and unheard, for, no doubt, they were among those that remained, and perhaps if the curate had seen them, they would not have undergone so severe a sentence. When they reached Don Quixote, he was already out of bed, and was still shouting and raving and slashing and cutting all around, as wide awake as if he had never slept. They closed with him, and by force got him back into the bed, and when he had become a little calm, addressing the curate, he said to him, Of a truth, Senor Archbishop Turpin, it is a great disgrace for us who call ourselves the Twelve Peers, so carelessly to allow the knights of the court to gain the victory in this tourney. We, the adventurers, having carried off the honor on the three former days. Hush, gossip, said the curate. Please, God, the luck may turn, and what is lost today may be won tomorrow. For the present let your worship have a care to your health, for it seems to me that you are over-fatigued, if not badly wounded. Wounded? No, said Don Quixote, but bruised and battered, no doubt, for that bastard Don Roland has cudgelled me with the trunk of an oak tree, and all for envy, because he sees that I alone rival him in his achievements. But I should not call myself Reynaldos of Montovan, did he not pay me for it, in spite of all his enchantments, as soon as I rise from this bed. For the present, let them bring me something to eat, for, for that, I feel, is what will be more to my purpose, and leave it to me to avenge myself. They did as he wished, they gave him something to eat, and once more he fell asleep, leaving them marveling at his madness. That night the housekeeper burned to ashes all the books that were in the yard and in the whole house, and some must have been consumed that deserved preservation in everlasting archives, but their fate and the laziness of the examiner did not permit it, 
and so in them was verified the proverb that the innocent suffer for the guilty. One of the remedies which the curate and the barber immediately applied to their friend's disorder was to wall up and plaster the room where the books were, so that when he got up he should not find them, possibly the cause being removed, the effect might cease, and they might say that a magician had carried them off, room and all, and this was done with all dispatch. Two days later Don Quixote got up, and the first thing he did was to go and look for his books, and not finding the room where he had left it, he wandered from side to side looking for it. He came to the place where the door used to be, and tried it with his hands, and turned and twisted his eyes in every direction without saying a word. But after a good while he asked his housekeeper whereabouts was the room that held his books. The housekeeper, who had been already well instructed in what she was to answer, said, What room or what nothing is it that your worship is looking for? There are neither room nor books in this house now, for the devil has carried all away. It was not the devil, said the niece, but a magician who came on a cloud one night, after the day your worship left us, and, dismounting from a serpent that he rode, he entered the room, and what he did there I know not, but after a little while he made off, flying through the roof, and left the house full of smoke, and when we went to see what he had done, we saw neither book nor room, but we remember very well, the housekeeper and I, that on leaving, the old villain said in a loud voice, that, for a private grudge he owed the owner of the books in the room, he had done mischief in that house that would be discovered by and by. He said, too, that his name was the Sage Munaton. Hmm. He must have said Friston, said Don Quixote. I don't know whether he called himself Friston or Friton, said the housekeeper. I only know that his name ended with Ton. So it does, said Don Quixote, and he is a sage magician, a great enemy of mine, who has a spite against me, because he knows by his arts and lore that, in process of time, I am to engage in single combat with a knight whom he befriends, and that I am to conquer, and he will be unable to prevent it, and for this reason he endeavors to do me all the ill turns that he can. But I promise him it will be hard for him to oppose or avoid what is decreed by heaven. Who doubts that? said the niece. But, uncle, who mixes you up in these quarrels? Would it not be better to remain at peace in your own house, instead of roaming the world, looking for better bread than ever came of wheat, never reflecting that many go for wool, and come back shorn? Oh, niece of mine, replied Don Quixote, how much astray art thou in thy reckoning? Ere there sure me, I shall have plucked away and stripped off the beards of all who dare to touch only the tip of a hair of mine. The two were unwilling to make any further answer, as they saw that his anger was kindling. In short, then, he remained at home fifteen days, very quietly, without showing any signs of a desire to take up with his former delusions, and during this time he held lively discussions with his two gossips, the curate and the barber, on the point he maintained, that knights errant were what the world stood most in need of, and that in him was to be accomplished the revival of knight errantry. The curate sometimes contradicted him, sometimes agreed with him, for if he had not observed this precaution, he would have been unable to bring him to reason. Meanwhile, Don Quixote worked upon a farm laborer, a neighbor of his, an honest man, if indeed that title can be given to him who is poor, but with very little wit in his pate. In a word, he so talked him over, and with such persuasions and promises, that the poor clown made up his mind to sally forth with him, and serve him as esquire. Don Quixote, among other things, told him 
he ought to be ready to go with him gladly, because any moment an adventure might occur that might win an island in the twinkling of an eye and leave him governor of it. On these and like promises, Sancho Panza, for so the laborer was called, left wife and children, and engaged himself as esquire to his neighbor. Don Quixote next set about getting some money, and selling one thing and pawning another, and making a bad bargain in every case, he got together a fair sum. He provided himself with a buckler, which he begged as a loan from a friend, and, restoring his battered helmet as best he could, he warned his squire Sancho of the day and hour he meant to set out, that he might provide himself with what he thought most needful. Above all, he charged him to take Alforjas with him. The other said he would, and that he meant to take also a very good ass he had, as he was not much given to going on foot. About the ass, Don Quixote hesitated a little, trying whether he could call to mind any knight-errant taking with him an esquire mounted on ass-back. But no instance occurred to his memory. For all that, however, he determined to take him, intending to furnish him with a more honorable mount when a chance of it presented itself, by appropriating the horse of the first discourteous knight he encountered. Himself he provided with shirts and such other things as he could, according to the advice the host had given him. All which being done, without taking leave, Sancho Panza, of his wife and children, or Don Quixote, of his housekeeper and niece, they sallied forth, unseen by anybody from the village one night, and made such good way in the course of it, that by daylight they held themselves safe from discovery, even should search be made for them. Sancho rode on his ass like a patriarch, with his alforjas and bota, and longing to see himself soon governor of the island his master had promised him. Don Quixote decided upon taking the same route and road he had taken on his first journey, that over the Campo de Montiel, which he travelled with less discomfort than on the last occasion, for, as it was early morning and the rays of the sun fell on them obliquely, the heat did not distress them. And now, said Sancho Panzo to his master, your worship will take care, Senor Knight-errant, not to forget about the island you promised me, for, be it ever so big, I'll be equal to governing it. To which Don Quixote replied, Thou must know, friend Sancho Panza, that it was a practice very much in vogue with the knights-errant of old to make their squires governors of the islands or kingdoms they won, and I am determined that there shall be no failure on my part in so liberal a custom. Well, on the contrary, I mean to improve upon it, for they sometimes, and perhaps most frequently, waited until their squires were old, and then, when they had enough of their service in hard days and worse nights, they gave them some title or other of count, or at the most, marquis, of some valley or province, more or less. But if thou livest, and I live, it may well be that before six days are over, I may have won some kingdom that has others depended upon it, which will be just the thing to enable thee to be crowned king of one of them. Nor needst thou count this wonderful, for things and chances fall to the lot of such knights in ways so unexampled and unexpected that I might easily give thee even more than I promised thee. In that case, said Sancho Panza, if I should become a king by one of those miracles your worship speaks of, even Juana Gutierrez, my, my old woman, would come to be queen, and my children infantes. Well, who doubts it? said Don Quixote. Oh, I doubt it, replied Sancho Panza, because for my part I am persuaded that though God should shower down kingdoms upon earth, not one of them would fit the head of Mari Gutierrez. Let me tell you, senor, she is not worth two maravedis for a queen, 
Countess will fit her better, and that only with God's help. Leave it to God, Sancho, returned Don Quixote, for he will give her what suits her best. But do not undervalue thyself so much as to come to be content with anything less than being governor of a province. I will not, senor, answered Sancho, especially as I have a man of such quality for a master in your worship, who will know how to give me all that will be suitable for me, and that I can bear. Chapter 8 Of the good fortune which the valiant Don Quixote had in the terrible and undreamt-of adventure of the windmills, with other occurrences worthy to be fitly recorded. At this point they came in sight of thirty or forty windmills that there are on plain, and as soon as Don Quixote saw them, he said to his squire, Fortune is arranging matters for us better than we could have shaped our desires ourselves. For look here, friend Sancho Panza, where thirty or more monstrous giants present themselves, all of which I mean to engage in battle and slay, and with whose spoils we shall begin to make our fortunes. For this is the righteous warfare, and it is God's service to sweep so evil a breed from the face of the earth. What giants? said Sancho Panza. Those thou seest there, answered his master, with the long arms, and some have them nearly two leagues long. Look, your worship, said Sancho, what we see there are not giants, but windmills, and what seem to be their arms are the sails that, turned by the wind, make the millstones go. It is easy to see, replied Don Quixote, that thou art not used to this business of adventure. Those are giants, and if thou art afraid, away with thee, out of this, and betake thyself to prayer, while I engage them in fierce and unequal combat. So saying, he gave the spur to his steed Rocinante. Heedless of the cries of his squire, Sancho sent after him, warning him that most certainly they were windmills and not giants he was going to attack. He, however, was so positive that they were giants, that he neither heard the cries of Sancho, nor perceived near as he was what they were, but made at them shouting, Fly not, cowards and vile beings, for a single knight attacks you. A slight breeze at this moment sprang up, and the great sails began to move, seeing which Don Quixote exclaimed, Though ye flourish more arms than the giant Briarius, ye have to reckon with me. So saying, and committing himself with all his heart to his lady Dulcinea, imploring her to support him in such apparel, with lance in rest, and covered by his buckler, he charged at Rocinante's fullest gallop, and fell upon the first mill that stood in front of him. But as he drove his lance point into the sail, the wind whirled it round with such force that it shivered the lance to pieces, sweeping with it horse and rider, who went rolling over on the plain, in a sorry condition. Sancho hastened to his assistance as fast as his ass could go, and when he came up found him unable to move, with such a shock had Rocinante fallen with him. "'God bless me,' said Sancho. "'Did I not tell your worship to mind what you were about, for they were only windmills?' and no one could have made any mistake about it but one who had something of the same kind in his head. Hush, friend Sancho, replied Don Quixote, the fortunes of war, more than any other, are liable to frequent fluctuations, and moreover, I think, and it is the truth, that that same sage Friston, who carried off my study and books, has turned these giants into mills in order to rob me of the glory of vanquishing them. Such is the enmity he bears toward me. But in the end his wicked arts will avail but little against my good sword. Oh, God order it as he may, said Sancho Panza, and helping him to rise got him up again on Rocinante, whose shoulder was half out. And then, discussing the late adventure, 
They followed the road to Puerto Lapice, for there, said Don Quixote, they could not fail to find adventures in abundance and variety, as it was a great thoroughfare. For all that, he was much grieved at the loss of his lance, and saying so to his squire, he added, I remember having read how a Spanish knight, Diego Perez de Vargas by name, having broken his sword in battle, tore from an oak a ponderous branch or bough, and with it did such things that day, and pounded so many moors, that he got the surname of Machuca, and he and his descendants from that day forth were called Vargas y Machuca. I mention this because from the first oak I see I mean to rend such another branch, large and stout like that, with which I am determined and resolved to such deeds that thou mayst deem thyself very fortunate in being found worthy to come and see them, and be an eyewitness of things that will with difficulty be believed. Be that as it will, said Sancho, I believe it is all as your worship says it, but straighten yourself a little, for you seem all on one side, maybe from the shaking in the fall. That is the truth, said Don Quixote, and if I make no complaint of the pain, it is because knight errants are not permitted to complain of any wound, even though their bowels be coming out through it. If so, said Sancho, I have nothing to say, but God knows I would rather your worship complained when anything ailed you, for my part. I confess I must complain, however small the ache may be, unless this rule about not complaining extends to the squires of knight-errants also. Don Quixote could not help laughing at his squire's simplicity, and he assured him he might complain whenever and however he chose, just as he liked, for, so far, he had never read of anything to the contrary in the order of knighthood. Sancho bade him remember it was dinner-time, to which his master answered that he wanted nothing himself just then, but that he might eat when he had a mind. With this permission, Sancho settled himself as comfortably as he could on his beast, and taking out of the alforjas what he had stowed away in them, he jogged along behind his master, munching deliberately, and from time to time taking a pull at the bota, with a relish that the thirstiest tapster in Malaga might have envied. And while he went on in this way, gulping down draft after draft, he never gave a thought to any of the promises his master had made him, nor did he rate it as hardship, but rather as recreation going in quest of adventures, however dangerous they might be. Finally, they passed the night among some trees, from one of which Don Quixote plucked a dry branch to serve him after a fashion as a lance, and fixed on it the head he had removed from the broken one. All that night Don Quixote lay awake thinking of his lady Dulcinea, in order to conform to what he had read in his books. How many nights in the forest and deserts nights used to lie sleepless, supported by the memory of their mistresses. Not so did Sancho Panza spend it, for having a stomach full of something stronger than chicory water, he made but one sleep of it, and if his master had not called him, neither the rays of the sun beating on his face, nor all the cheery notes of the birds welcoming the approach of day, would have had power to waken him. On getting up, he tried the bota, and found it somewhat less full than the night before, which grieved his heart, because they did not seem to be on the way to remedy the deficiency readily. Don Quixote did not care to break his fast, for, as has been already said, he confined himself to savory recollections for nourishment. They returned to the road that they had set out with, leading to Puerto Lapice, and at three in the afternoon they came in sight of it. Here, brother Sancho Panza, said Don Quixote when he saw it, we may plunge our hands up to the elbows in what they call adventures. But observe, 
even shouldst thou see me in the greatest danger in the world, thou must not put a hand to thy sword in my defence, unless indeed thou perceivest that those who assail me are rabble or base folk, for in that case thou mayst very properly aid me. But if they be knights, it is on no account permitted or allowed thee by the laws of knighthood to help me, until thou hast been dubbed a knight. Most certainly, senor, replied Sancho, your worship shall be fully obeyed in this manner, all the more as of myself I am peaceful and no friend to mixing in strife and quarrels. It is true that, as regards the defence of my own person, I shall not give much heed to those laws, for laws human and divine allow each one to defend himself against any assailant whatever. That I grant, said Don Quixote, but in this matter of aiding me against knights, thou must put a restraint upon thy natural impetuosity. I will do so, I promise you, answered Sancho, and will keep this precept as carefully as Sunday. While they were thus talking, there appeared on the road two friars of the order of St. Benedict, mounted on two dromedaries, for not less tall were the two mules they rode on. They wore travelling spectacles and carried sunshades, and behind them came a coach attended by four or five persons on horseback and two muleteers on foot. In the coach there was, as afterwards appeared, a Biscay lady on her way to Seville, where her husband was about to take passage for the Indies with an appointment of high honour. The friars, though going the same road, were not in her company, but the moment Don Quixote perceived them, he said to his squire, Either I am mistaken, or this is going to be the most famous adventure that has ever been seen, for those black bodies we see there must be, and doubtless are, magicians who are carrying off some stolen princess in that coach and with all my might I must undo this wrong. This will be worse than the windmill, said Sancho. Look, senor, those are friars of St. Benedict, and the coach plainly belongs to some travellers. I tell you, mind well what you are about, and don't let the devil mislead you. I have told thee already, Sancho, replied Don Quixote, that on the subject of adventures thou knowst little. What I say is the truth, as thou shalt presently see. So saying, he advanced and posted himself in the middle of the road along which the friars were coming, and as soon as he thought they had come near enough to hear what he said, he cried aloud, Devilish and unnatural beings, release instantly the high-born princesses whom you are carrying off by force in this coach. Else... Prepare to meet a speedy death as the just punishment of your evil deeds. The friars drew rein and stood wondering at the appearance of Don Quixote, as well as at his words, to which they replied, Señor Caballero, we are not devilish or unnatural, but two brothers of St. Benedict following our road, nor do we know whether or not there are any captive princesses coming in this coach. No soft words with me, for I know you, lying rabble, said Don Quixote, and without waiting for a reply, he spurred Rocinante, and with leveled lance, charged the first friar with such fury and determination, that if the friar had not flung himself off the mule, he would have brought him to the ground against his will, and sore wounded, if not killed him outright. The second brother, seeing how his comrade was treated, drove his heels into his castle of a mule, and made off across the country faster than the wind. Sancho Panza, when he saw the friar on the ground, dismounting briskly from his ass, rushed towards him and began to strip off his gown. At that instant the friar's muleteers came up and asked what he was stripping him for. Sancho answered them that this fell to him lawfully as spoil of the battle, which his lord Don Quixote had won. 
The muleteers, who had no idea of a joke and did not understand all this about battles and spoils, seeing that Don Quixote was some distance off talking to the travelers in the coach, fell upon Sancho, knocked him down, and leaving hardly a hair in his beard, belabored him with kicks, and left him stretched breathless and senseless on the ground, and without any more delay helped the friar to mount, who, trembling, terrified, and pale, as soon as he found himself in the saddle, spurred after his companion, who was standing at a distance, looking on, watching the result of the onslaught. Then, not caring to wait for the end of the affair just begun, they pursued their journey, making more crosses than if they had the devil after them. Don Quixote was, as has been said, speaking to the lady in the coach. Your beauty, lady mine, said he, may now dispose of your person as may be most in accordance with your pleasure, for the pride of your ravishers lies prostrate on the ground through this strong arm of mine, and lest you should be pining to know the name of your deliverer, know that I am called Don Quixote of La Mancha, knight-errant and adventurer, and captive to the peerless and beautiful lady Dulcinea del Toboso. And in return for the service you have received of me, I ask no more than that you should return to El Toboso, and on my behalf present yourself before that lady, and tell her what I have done to set you free. One of the squires in attendance upon the coach, a Biscayan, was listening to all Don Quixote was saying, and perceiving that he would not allow the coach to go on, but was saying it must return at once to El Toboso, he made at him, and seizing his lance, addressed him in bad Castilian and worse Biscayan, after his fashion, Be gone, caballero, and ill go with thee, by the God that made thee, unless thou quittest coach, slayest thee as art here a Biscayan. Don Quixote understood him quite well, and answered him very quietly, If thou wert a knight, and as thou art none, I should have already chastised thy folly and rashness, miserable creature. To which the Biscayan returned, I am no gentleman, I swear to God thou liest, as I am a Christian. If thou droppest lance and drawst sword, soon shalt thou see thou art carrying water to the cat. Biscayan on land, Hidalgo at sea, Hidalgo at the devil. And look, if thou sayest otherwise, thou liest. You will see presently, said Aguares, replied Don Quixote, and throwing his lance on the ground, he drew his sword, braced his buckler on his arm, and attacked the Biscayan, bent upon taking his life. The Biscayan, when he saw him coming on, though he wished to dismount from his mule, in which, being one of those sorry ones let out for hire, he had no confidence, had no choice but to draw his sword. It was lucky for him, however, that he was near the coach, from which he was able to snatch a cushion that served him for a shield, and they went at one another as if they had been two mortal enemies. The others strove to make peace between them, but could not. For the Biscayan declared in his disjointed phrases that if they did not let him finish his battle, he would kill his mistress and every one that strove to prevent him. The lady in the coach, amazed and terrified at what she saw, ordered the coachman to draw aside a little and set herself to watch this severe struggle, in the course of which the Biscayan smote Don Quixote a mighty stroke on the shoulder over the top of his buckler which, given to one without armor, would have cleft him to the waist. Don Quixote, feeling the weight of this prodigious blow, cried aloud, saying, O lady of my soul, Dulcinea, flower of beauty, come to the aid of this your knight, who, in fulfilling his obligations to your beauty, finds himself in this extreme peril. To say this, to lift his sword, to shelter himself well behind his buckler, 
and to assail the Biscayan was the work of an instant, determined as he was to venture all upon a single blow. The Biscayan, seeing him come on in this way, was convinced of his courage by his spirited bearing, and resolved to follow his example, so he waited for him, keeping well under cover of his cushion, being unable to execute any sort of maneuver with his mule, which, dead tired, and never meant for this kind of game, could not stir a step. On then, as aforesaid, came Don Quixote, against the wary Biscayan, with uplifted sword and a firm intention of splitting him in half, and while on his side the Biscayan waited for him, sword in hand, and under the protection of his cushion, and all present stood trembling, waiting in the suspense, the result of blows such as threatened to fall, and the lady in the coach and the rest of her following were making a thousand vows and offerings to all the images and shrines of Spain, that God might deliver her squire, and all of them, from this great peril in which they found themselves. But it spoils all, that at this point and crisis, the author of the history leaves this battle impending, giving as excuse that he could find nothing more written about those achievements of Don Quixote than what has been already set forth. It is true the second author of this work was unwilling to believe that a history so curious could have been allowed to fall under the sentence of oblivion, or that the wits of La Mancha could have been so undiscerning as not to preserve in their archives or registries some documents referring to this famous knight, and this being his persuasion, he did not despair of finding the conclusion of this pleasant history, which, heaven favoring him, he did find in a way that shall be related in the second part. End of Part 6 Recorded by Denny Sayers in Modesto, California, Spring, 2006This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Part 4, Chapters 9-13. through 13. Chapter 9, in which is concluded and finished the terrific battle between the gallant Biscayan and the valiant Manchegan. In the first part of this history we left the valiant Biscayan and the renowned Don Quixote with drawn swords uplifted, ready to deliver two such furious slashing blows, that if they had fallen full and fair, they would at least have split, and cleft them asunder from top to toe, and laid them open like a pomegranate, and at this so critical point the delightful history came to a stop, and stood cut short without any intimation from the author where what was missing was to be found. This distressed me greatly, because the pleasure derived from having read such a small portion turned to vexation at the thought of the poor chance that presented itself of finding the large part that, so it seemed to me, was missing of such an interesting tale. It appeared to me to be a thing impossible and contrary to all precedent that so good a knight should have been without some sage to undertake the task of writing his marvellous achievements, a thing that was never wanting to any of those knights-errant who, they say, went after adventures for every one of them had one or two sages as if made on purpose, who not only recorded their deeds, but described their most trifling thoughts and follies, however secret they might be, and such a good knight could not have been so unfortunate as not to have what Platier and others like him had in abundance. And so I could not bring myself to believe that such a gallant tale had been left maimed and mutilated, and I laid the blame on time, the devourer and destroyer of all things, that had either concealed or consumed it. On the other hand, it struck me that, inasmuch as among his books there had been found such modern ones as The Enlightenment of Jealousy and The Nymphs and Shepherds of Henares, his story must likewise be modern, and that though it might not be written, it might exist in the memory of the people of his village and of those in the neighbourhood. 
This reflection kept me perplexed, and longing to know really and truly the whole life and wondrous deeds of our famous Spaniard, Don Quixote of La Mancha, light and mirror of Manchegan chivalry, and the first that in our age and in these so evil days devoted himself to the labour and exercise of the arms of knight-errantry, righting wrongs, succouring widows, and protecting damsels of that sort that used to ride about, whip in hand, on their palfreys, with all their virginity about them, from mountain to mountain and valley to valley. For if it were not some ruffian, or boor with a hood and hatchet, or monstrous giant that forced them, there were in days of yore damsels that at the end of eighty years, in all which time they had never slept a day under a roof, went to their graves as much maids as the mothers that bore them. I say, then, that in these and other respects our gallant Don Quixote is worthy of everlasting and notable praise, nor should it be withheld even from me for the labour and pains spent in searching for the conclusion of this delightful history, though I know well that if heaven, chance, and good fortune had not helped me, the world would have remained deprived of an entertainment and pleasure, that for a couple of hours or so may well occupy him who shall read it attentively. The discovery of it occurred in this way. One day, as I was in the Alcana of Toledo, a boy came up to sell some pamphlets and old papers to a silk mercer, and as I am fond of reading even the very scraps of paper in the streets, led by this natural bent of mine, I took up one of the pamphlets the boy had for sale, and saw that it was in characters which I recognized as Arabic, and as I was unable to read them, though I could recognize them, I looked about to see if there were any Spanish-speaking Morisco at hand to read them for me, nor was there any great difficulty in finding such an interpreter, for even had I sought one for an older and better language I should have found him. In short, chance provided me with one, who, when I told him what I wanted, and put the book in his hands, opened it in the middle, and after reading a little in it, began to laugh. I asked him what he was laughing at, and he replied that it was something the book had written in the margin by way of a note. I bade him tell it to me, and he, still laughing, said, In the margin, as I told you, this is written. This Dulcinea de Toboso, so often mentioned in this history, had, they say, the best hand of any woman in all of La Mancha for salting pigs. When I heard Dulcinea de Toboso named, I was struck with surprise and amazement, for it occurred to me at once that these pamphlets contained the history of Don Quixote. With this idea I pressed him to read the beginning, and doing so, turning the Arabic offhand into Castilian, he told me it meant, History of Don Quixote of La Mancha, written by Cide Hamete ben Engeli, an Arab historian. It required great caution to hide the joy I felt when the title of the book reached my ears, and snatching it from the silk mercer, I bought all the papers and pamphlets from the boy for half a real, and if he had had his wits about him, and had known how eager I was for them, he might safely have calculated on making more than six rails by the bargain. I withdrew at once with the Morisco into the cloister of the cathedral, and begged him to turn all these pamphlets that related to Don Quixote into the Castilian tongue, without omitting or adding anything to them, offering him whatever payment he pleased. He was satisfied with two arrobas of raisins and two bushels of wheat, and promised to translate them faithfully and with all dispatch, but to make the matter easier, and not to let such a precious find out of my hands, I took him to my house, where in little more than a month and a half he translated the whole just as it is set down here. In the first pamphlet, the battle between Don Quixote and the Biscayne was drawn to the very life. They planted in the same attitude as the history describes, their swords raised, and the one protected by his buckler, the other by his cushion, and the Biscayne's mule so true to nature that it could be seen to be a hired one, a bow shot off. The Biscayne had an inscription under his feet which said, Don Sancho de Aspeta, which no doubt must have been his name, and at the feet of Rocinante was another that said, Don Quixote. Rocinante was marvellously portrayed, so long and thin, so lank and lean, with so much backbone, and so far gone in consumption, that he had showed plainly with what judgment and propriety the name of Rocinante had been bestowed upon him. Near him was Sancho Panza, holding the halter of his ass, at whose feet was another label that said, Sancho Sancas, and according to the picture he must have had a big belly, a short body, and long shanks, for which reason, no doubt, the names of Pancha and Sancas were given to him, for by these two surnames the history several times calls him. Some other trifling particulars might be mentioned, but they are all of slight importance, and have nothing to do with the true relation of the history, and no history can be bad, so long as it is true. If against the present one any objection be raised on the score of its truth, it can only be that its author was an Arab, as lying is a very common propensity with those of that nation, though as they are such enemies of ours, it is conceivable that there were omissions rather than additions made in the course of it. And this is my own opinion, 
for where he could and should give freedom to his pen in praise of so worthy a knight, he seems to me deliberately to pass it over in silence, which is ill done, and worse contrived, for it is the business and duty of historians to be exact, truthful, and wholly free from passion, and neither interest nor fear, hatred nor love, should make them swerve from the path of truth, whose mother is history, rival of time, storehouse of deeds, witness for the past, example and counsel for the present, and warning for the future. In this I know will be found all that can be desired in the pleasantest, and if it be wanting in any good quality, I maintain it is the fault of its hound of an author, and not the fault of the subject. To be brief, its second part, according to the translation, began in this way. With trenchant swords upraised and poised on high, it seemed as though the two valiant and wrathful combatants stood threatening heaven and earth and hell, with such resolution and determination did they bear themselves. The fiery Biscayne was the first to strike a blow, which was delivered with such force and fury, that had not the sword turned in its course, that single stroke would have sufficed to put an end to the bitter struggle and to all the adventures of our knight. But that good fortune which reserved him for greater things turned aside the sword of his adversary, so that although it smote him upon the left shoulder, it did him no more harm than to strip all that side of its armour, carrying away a great part of his helmet with half his ear all which, with fearful ruin, fell to the ground, leaving him in a sorry plight. Good God, who is there that could properly describe the rage that filled the heart of our Manchegan when he saw himself dealt with in this fashion? All that can be said is, it was such that he again raised himself in his stirrups, and grasping his sword more firmly with both hands, he came down upon the Biscayne with such fury, smiting him full over the cushion and over the head, that even so good a shield proving useless, as if a mountain had fallen on him, he began to bleed from his nose, mouth, and ears, reeling as if about to fall backwards from his mule, as no doubt he would have done, had he not flung his arms about its neck. At the same time, however, he slipped his feet out of the stirrups and unclasped his arms, and the mule, taking fright at the terrible blow, made off across the plain, and with a few plunges flung its master to the ground. Don Quixote stood looking on very calmly and when he saw him fall, leaped from his horse, and with great briskness ran to him, and presenting the point of his sword to his eyes, bade him surrender, or he would cut his head off. The Biscayan was so bewildered that he was unable to answer a word, and it would have gone hard with him, so blind was Don Quixote, had not the ladies in the coach, who had hitherto been watching with earnest entreaties to grant them the great grace and favour of sparing their squire's life, to which Don Quixote replied with much gravity and dignity, in truth, fair ladies, I am well content to do what you ask of me, but it must be on one condition and understanding, which is, that this knight promise me to go to the village of El Toboso, and on my behalf present himself to the peerless lady Dulcinea, that she deal with him as shall be most pleasing to her. The terrified and disconsolate ladies, without discussing Don Quixote's demand, or asking who Dulcinea might be, promised that their squire should do all that had been commanded. Then on the faith of that promise, said Don Quixote, I shall do him no further harm, though he well deserves it of me. CHAPTER X OF THE PLEASANT DISCOURSE THAT PASSED BETWEEN DON Quixote AND HIS SQUIRE SANCHO PANZA Now by this time Sancho had risen, rather the worse for the handling of the friar's muleteers, and stood watching the battle of his master Don Quixote, and praying to God in his heart that it might be his will to grant him the victory, and that he might thereby win some island to make him governor of, as he had promised. Seeing, therefore, that the struggle was now over, and that his master was returning to Mount Rocinante, he approached to hold the stirrup for him, and before he could mount he went on his knees before him, and taking his hand kissed it, saying, May it please your worship, Signor Don Quixote, to give me the government of that island which has been won in this hard fight, for be it ever so big, I feel myself in sufficient force to be able to govern it as much and as well as any one in the world who has ever governed islands. To which Don Quixote replied, Thou must take notice, brother Sancho, that this adventure, and those like it, are not adventures of islands, but of cross-roads, in which nothing is got except a broken head or an ear the less. Have patience, for adventures will present themselves from which I may make you not only a governor, but something more. Sancho gave him many thanks, and again kissing his hand and the skirt of his hauberk, helped him to mount Rocinante, and mounting his ass himself, proceeded to follow his master, who at a brisk pace, without taking leave or saying anything further to the ladies belonging to the coach, turned into a wood that was hard by. Sancho followed him at his ass's best trot, but Rocinante stepped out so that, seeing himself left behind, he was forced to call to his master to wait for him. Don Quixote did so, 
reining in Rocinante until his weary squire came up, who on reaching him said, "'It seems to me, senor, it would be prudent in us to go and take refuge in some church, for seeing how mauled he with whom you fought has been left, it will be no wonder if they gave information of the affair to the Holy Brotherhood, and arrest us, and faith, if they do, before we come out of jail we shall have to sweat for it.' "'Peace,' said Don Quixote. Where hast thou ever seen or heard that a knight-errant has been arraigned before a court of justice, however many homicides he may have committed? "'I know nothing about homicides,' answered Sancho, "'nor in my life have had anything to do with one. I only know that the Holy Brotherhood looks after those who fight in the fields, and in that other matter I do not meddle.' "'Then thou needest have no uneasiness, my friend,' said Don Quixote, "'for I will deliver thee out of the hands of the Chaldeans, much more out of those of the Brotherhood.' but tell me as thou livest hast thou seen a more valiant knight than i in all the known world hast thou read it in the history of any who has or had higher mettle in attack more spirit in maintaining it more dexterity in wounding or skill in overthrowing the truth is said sancho that i have never read any history for i can neither read nor write but what i will venture to bet is that a more daring master than your worship i have never served in all the days of my life and god grant that this daring be not paid for where i have said what I beg of your worship is to dress your wound, for a great deal of blood flows from that ear, and I have here some lint and a little white ointment in the alforas. All that might be well dispensed with, said Don Quixote, if I had remembered to make a vial of the balsam of Fierabras, for time and medicine are saved by one single drop. What vial and what balsam is that? said Sancho Panza. It is a balsam, answered Don Quixote, the receipt of which I have in my memory with which one need have no fear of death, or dread dying of any wound. And so when I make it and give it to thee, thou hast nothing to do when in some battle thou seest they have cut me in half through the middle of the body, as is wont to happen frequently, but neatly, and with great nicety, ere the blood congeal, to place that portion of the body which shall have fallen to the ground upon the other half which remains in the saddle, taking care to fit it on evenly and exactly. Then thou shalt give me to drink but two drops of the balsam I have mentioned, and thou shalt see me become sounder than an apple. If that be so, said Panza, I renounce henceforth the government of the promised island, and desire nothing more in payment of my many and faithful services than that your worship give me the receipt of this supreme liquor, for I am persuaded that it will be worth more than two reals an ounce anywhere, and I want no more to pass the rest of my life in ease and honour, but it remains to be told if it costs much to make it. With less than three reals, six quarts of it may be made, said Don Quixote. Sinner that I am, said Sancho, why does your worship put off making it and teaching it to me? Peace, friend, answered Don Quixote. Greater secrets I mean to teach thee, and greater favours to bestow upon me. And for the present, let us see to the dressing, for my ear pains me more than I could wish. Sancho took out some lint and ointment from the alforas, but when Don Quixote came to see his helmet shattered, he was like to lose his senses, and clapping his hand upon his sword and raising his eyes to heaven, he said, I swear by the Creator of all things and the four Gospels in their fullest extent, to do as the great Marquis of Mantua did when he swore to avenge the death of his nephew Baldwin, and that was not to eat bread from a tablecloth, nor embrace his wife, and other points which, though I cannot now call them to mind, I hear Grant has expressed, until I take complete vengeance upon him who has committed such an offence against me. Hearing this, Sancho said to him, "'Your worship should bear in mind, Signor Don Quixote, that if the knight has done what was commanded him in going to present himself before my lady Dulcinea del Toboso, he will have done all that he was bound to do, and does not deserve further punishment until he commits some new offence.' "'Thou hast said well, and hit the point,' answered Don Quixote, "'and so I recall the oath in so far as it relates to taking fresh vengeance on him, but I make and confirm it anew to lead the life I have said until such time as I take by force from some knight another helmet such as this, and as good. And think not, Sancho, that I am raising smoke with straw in doing so, for I have one to imitate in this matter, since the very same thing to a hair happened in the case of Mambrino's helmet, which cost Sacripante so dear. Signor, replied Sancho, let your worship send all such oaths to the devil, for they are very pernicious to salvation and prejudicial to the conscience. Just tell me now, if for several days to come we fall in with no man armed with a helmet, what are we to do? Is the oath to be observed, in spite of all the inconvenience and discomfort it will be to sleep in your clothes, and not to sleep in a house, and a thousand other mortifications contained in the oath of that old fool the Marquis of Mantua, whom your worship is now wanting to revive? 
let your worship observe that there are no men in armour travelling on any of these roads, nothing but carriers and carters, who do not only not wear helmets, but perhaps have never heard of them all their lives. "'Thou art wrong there,' said Don Quixote, "'for we shall not have been above two hours among these cross-roads before we see more men in armour than came to Albraca to win the fair Angelica.' Enough, said Sancho, so be it then, and God grant us success, and that the time for winning that island which is costing me so dear may soon come, and then let me die. I have already told thee, Sancho, said Don Quixote, not to give thyself any uneasiness on that score, for if an island should fail there is the kingdom of Denmark, or of Sobradisa, which will fit thee as a ring fits the finger, and all the more that, being on terra firma, thou wilt all the better enjoy thyself. But let us leave that to its own time. See if thou hast anything for us to eat in those alforas, because we must presently go in quest of some castle where we may lodge to-night, and make the balsam I told thee of. For I swear to thee by God, this ear is giving me great pain. I have here an onion, and a little cheese, and a few scraps of bread, said Sancho, but they are not victuals fit for a valiant knight like your worship. How little thou knowest about it, answered Don Quixote. I would have thee to know, Sancho, that it is the glory of knights-errant to go without eating for a month, and even when they do eat, that it should be of what first comes to hand. And this would have been clear to thee, had thou read as many histories as I have, for though they are very many, among them all I have found no mention made of knights-errant eating, unless by accident or at some sumptuous banquets prepared for them, and the rest of the time they passed in dalliance. And though it is plain they could not do without eating and performing all the other natural functions, because, in fact, they were men like ourselves, it is plain, too, that, wandering as they did the most part of their lives through woods and wilds without a cook, their most usual fare would be rustic viands such as those thou now offer me. So that, friend Sancho, let not that distress thee which pleases me, and do not seek to make a new world, or pervert knight-errantry. "'Pardon me, your worship,' said Sancho. For as I cannot read or write, as I said just now, I neither know nor comprehend the rules of the profession of chivalry. Henceforward I will stock the alforjas with every kind of dry fruit for your worship, as you are a knight. As for myself, as I am not one, I will furnish them with poultry, and other things more substantial. I, I do not say, Sancho, replied Don Quixote, that it is imperative on knights errant not to eat anything else but the fruits thou speakest of, only that their more usual diet must be these, and certain herbs they found in the fields which they knew, and I know too. A good thing it is, answered Sancho, to know these herbs, for to my thinking it will be needful some day to put that knowledge into practice. And here, taking out what he said he had brought, the pair made their repast peaceably and sociably. But anxious to find quarters for the night, they, with all dispatch, made an end of their poor dry fare, mounted at once, and made haste to reach some habitation before night set in. But daylight, and the hope of succeeding in their object, failed them close by the huts of some goat-herds, so they determined to pass the night there. And it was as much to Sancho's discontent not to have reached a house, as it was to his master's satisfaction to sleep under the open heaven for he fancied that each time this happened to him he performed an act of ownership that helped to prove his chivalry. CHAPTER Eleven, WHAT BEFELL DON QUIXOTE WITH CERTAIN GOAT-HERDS He was cordially welcomed by the goat-herds, and Sancho, having as best as he could put up Rocinante and the ass, drew toward the fragrance that came from some pieces of salted goat simmering in a pot on the fire, and though he would have liked at once to try if they were ready to be transferred from the pot to the stomach, he refrained from doing so as the goat-herds removed them from the fire, and laying sheepskins on the ground, quickly spread their rude table, and with signs of hearty good will invited them both to share what they had. Round the skins six of the men belonging to the fold seated themselves, having first, with rough politeness, pressed Don Quixote to take a seat upon a trough, which they placed for him upside down. Don Quixote seated himself, and Sancho Panza remained standing to serve the cup, which was made of horn. Seeing him standing, his master said to him, "'That thou mayest see, Sancho, the good that knight-errantry contains in itself, and how those who fill any office in it are on the high road to be speedily honoured and esteemed by the world, I desire that thou seat thyself here at my side, and in the company of these worthy people, and that thou be one with me who am thy master and natural lord, and that thou eat from my plate, and drink from whatever I drink from. For the same may be said of knight-errantry as of love, that it levels all.' "'Great thanks,' said Sancho. But I may tell your worship that, provided I have enough to eat, I can eat it as well or better standing, and by myself, than seated alongside an emperor. 
and indeed, if the truth is to be told, what I eat in my corner without form or fuss has much more relish for me, even though it be bread and onions, than the turkeys of those other tables where I am forced to chew slowly, drink little, wipe my mouth every minute, and cannot sneeze or cough if I want, or do other things that are the privileges of liberty and solitude. So, Signor, as for those honours which your worship would put upon me as a servant and follower of knight-errantry, exchange them for other things which may be of more use and advantage to me. For these, though I fully acknowledge them as received, I renounce from this moment to the end of the world. For all that, said Don Quixote, thou must seat thyself, because him who humbleth himself God exalteth. And seizing him by the arm, he forced him to sit down beside himself. The goat-herds did not understand this jargon about squires and knights-errant, and all they did was to eat in silence and stare at their guests, who with great elegance and appetite were stowing away pieces as big as one's fist. The course of meat finished, they spread upon the sheepskins a great heap of parched acorns, and with them they put down a half-cheese harder than if it had been made of mortar. All this while the horn was not idle, for it went round so constantly, now full, now empty, like the bucket of a water-wheel, that it soon drained one of the two wine-skins that were in sight. When Don Quixote had quite appeased his appetite, he took up a handful of the acorns, and contemplating them attentively, delivered himself somewhat in this fashion. Happy the age, happy the time, to which the ancients gave the name of golden not because in that fortunate age the gold so coveted in this iron one was gained without toil, but because they that lived in it knew not the two words mine and thine. In that blessed age all things were in common. To win the daily food no labour was required of any, save to stretch forth his hand and gather it from the sturdy oaks that stood generously inviting him with their sweet ripe fruit. The clear streams and running brooks yielded their savoury limpid waters in noble abundance. The busy and sagacious bees fixed their republic in the clefts of the rocks and hollows of the trees, offering without usance the plenteous produce of their fragrant toil to every hand. The mighty cork-trees, unenforced save of their own courtesy, shed the broad light bark that it served at first to roof the houses supported by rude stakes, a protection against the inclemency of heaven alone. Then all was peace, all friendship, all concord, as yet the dull share of the crooked plough had not yet dared to rend and pierce the tender bowels of our first mother, that without compulsion yielded from every portion of her broad fertile bosom all that could satisfy, sustain, and delight the children that then possessed her. Then it was that the innocent and fair young shepherdess roamed from vale to vale and hill to hill, with flowing locks, and no more garments than were needful modestly to cover what modesty seeks and ever sought to hide. Nor were their ornaments like those in use to-day, set off by Tyrian purple, and silk tortured in endless fashions, but the wreathed leaves of the green dock and ivy, wherewith they went as bravely and becomingly decked as our court dames, with all the rare and far-fetched artifices that idle curiosity has taught them. Then the love-thoughts of the heart clothed themselves simply and naturally as the heart conceived them, nor sought to commend themselves by forced and rambling verbiage. Fraud, deceit, or malice had then not yet mingled with truth and sincerity. Justice held her ground, undisturbed and unassailed by the efforts of favour and of interest that now so much impair, pervert, and beset her. Arbitrary law had not yet established itself in the mind of the judge, for then there was no cause to judge, and no one to be judged. Maidens and modesty, as I have said, wandered at will, alone and unattended, without fear of insult from lawlessness or libertine assault, and if they were undone, it was of their own will and pleasure. But now, in this hateful age of ours, no one is safe, not though some new labyrinth like that of Crete conceal and surround her. Even there the pestilence of gallantry will make its way to them through chinks or on the air by the zeal of its accursed importunity, and despite of all seclusion, lead them to ruin." In defence of these, as time advanced and wickedness increased, the order of knights-errant was instituted, to defend maidens, to protect widows, and to succour the orphans and the needy. To this order I belong, brother goatherds, to whom I return thanks for the hospitality, and kindly welcome ye offer me and my squire. For though by natural law all living are bound to show favour to knights-errant, yet seeing that without knowing this obligation you have welcomed and feasted me, it is right that with all the good will in my power I should thank you for yours. All this long harangue, which might very well have been spared, our knight delivered because the acorns they gave him reminded him of the golden age, and the whim seized him to address all this unnecessary argument to the goat-herds, who listened to him gaping in amazement without saying a word in reply. 
Sancho likewise held his peace and ate acorns, and paid repeated visits to the second wineskin, which they had hung up on a cork-tree to keep the wine cool. Don Quixote was longer in talking than the supper in finishing, at the end of which one of the goatherds said, "'That your worship, Signor Knight-errant, may say with more truth that we show you hospitality with ready good will, we will give you amusement and pleasure by making one of our comrades sing. He will be here before long, and he is a very intelligent youth and deep in love, and what is more, he can read and write and play on the rebec to perfection.' The goatherd had hardly done speaking, when the notes of the rebec reached their ears, and shortly after the player came up, a very good-looking young man of about two-and-twenty. His comrades asked him if he had supped, and on his replying that he had, he who had already made the offer said to him, "'In that case, Antonio, thou mayst as well do us the pleasure of singing a little, that the gentleman, our guest, may see that even the mountains and woods there are musicians. We have told him of thy accomplishments, and we want thee to show them and prove that we say true. So as thou livest, pray sit down, and sing that ballad about thy love that thy uncle the prebendary made thee, and that was so much liked in the town.' "'With all my heart,' said the young man, and without waiting for more pressing he seated himself on the trunk of a felled oak, and tuning his rebeck, presently began to sing these words. Antonio's Ballad Thou dost love me well, O Lala, well I know it, even though love's mute tongues, thine eyes, have never, by thy glances, told me so. For I know my love thou knowest, therefore thine to claim I dare, once it ceases to be secret, love need never feel despair.' True it is, Olaya, sometimes thou hast all too plainly shown, That thy heart is brass in hardness, and thy snowy bosom stone. Yet for all that, in thy coyness, and thy fickle fits between, Hope is there, at least the border of her garment may be seen. Lures to faith are they, those glimpses, and to faith in thee I hold. Kindness cannot make it stronger, coldness cannot make it cold. If it be that love is gentle, in thy gentleness I see, something holding out assurance, to the hopes of winning thee. If it be that in devotion lies a power hearts to move, that which every day I show thee helpful to my suit should prove. Many a time thou must have noticed, if to notice thou dost care, how I go about on Monday, dressed in all my Sunday wear. Love's eyes love to look on brightness, love loves what is gaily dressed. Sunday, Monday, all I care is thou should see me in my best. No account I make of dances, or of strains that please thee so, keeping thee awake from midnight till the cocks began to crow, or of how I roundly swore it that there's none so fair as thou. True it is, but as I said it, by the girls I'm hated now. For Teresa of the hillside at my praise of thee was sore, said, You think you love an angel, it's a monkey you adore, caught by all her glittering trinkets and her borrowed braids of hair, and a host of made-up beauties that would love himself in snare. "'Twas a lie, and so I told her, and her cousin at the word gave me his defiance for it, and what followed thou hast heard. Mine is no high-flown affection, mine no passion par amours. As they call it, what I offer is an honest love and pure. Cunning cords the holy church has, cords of softest silk they be. Put thy neck beneath the yoke, dear, mine will follow, thou wilt see. Else, and once for all I swear it, by a saint of most renown, if I ever quit the mountains, twill be in a friar's gown." Here the goatherd brought his song to an end, and though Don Quixote entreated him to sing more, Sancho had no mind that way, being more inclined for sleep than for listening to songs. So said he to his master, "'Your worship will do well to settle at once where you mean to pass the night, for the labour these good men are at all day does not allow them to spend the night in singing.' "'I understand thee, Sancho,' replied Don Quixote. "'I perceive clearly that those visits to the wineskin demand compensation in sleep rather than in music.' "'It's sweet to us all, blessed be God,' said Sancho. "'I do not deny it,' replied Don Quixote, "'but settle thyself while thou wilt. "'Those of my calling are more becomingly employed "'in watching than in sleeping. "'Still it would be as well if thou wert to dress this ear for me again, "'for it is giving me more pain than it need.' "'Sancho did as he bade him, "'but one of the goatherds, seeing the wound, "'told him not to be uneasy, "'as he would apply a remedy with which it would soon be healed, "'and gathering some leaves of rosemary, "'of which there was a great quantity there, "'he chewed them and mixed them with a little salt, "'and applying them to the ear he secured them firmly with a bandage, "'assuring him that no other treatment would be required. "'And so it proved. CHAPTER Twelve, OF WHAT A GOAT HERD RELATED TO THOSE WITH DON Quixote. "'Just then another young man, one of those who fetched their provisions from the village, came up and said, 
do you know what is going on in the village, comrades?' "'How could we know it?' replied one of them. "'Well, then you must know,' continued the young man, "'this morning, that the famous student shepherd called Chrysostom died, "'and it is rumoured that he died of love for that devil of a village girl, "'the daughter of Guillermo the Rich, "'she that wanders about the walls here in the dress of a shepherdess.' "'Do you mean Marcella?' said one. "'Her, I mean,' answered the goatherd. "'And the best of it is, he has directed in his will "'that he is to be buried in the fields like a moor, "'and at the foot of the rock where the cork-tree spring is, "'because, as the story goes, and they say he himself said so, "'that was the place where he first saw her. "'And he has also left other directions "'which the clergy of the village say should not and must not be obeyed, "'because they savour of paganism. "'To all which his great friend Ambrosio the student, "'he who, like him, also went about dressed as a shepherd, "'replies that everything must be done without any omission "'according to the directions left by Chrysostom, "'and about this the village is all in commotion. "'However, report says that, after all, "'what Ambrosio and all the shepherds his friends desire will be done, "'and to-morrow they are coming to bury him with great ceremony where I said. "'I am sure it will be something worth seeing. "'At least I will not fail to go and see it, "'even if I know I should not return to the village to-morrow. "'We will do the same,' answered the goatherds, "'and cast lots to see who must stay to mind the goats of all. "'Thou sayest well, Pedro,' said one, "'though there will be no need of taking that trouble, "'for I will stay behind for all. "'And don't suppose it is virtue or want of curiosity in me. "'It is the splinter that ran into my foot the other day "'that will not let me walk.' "'For all that we thank thee,' answered Pedro. Don Quixote asked Pedro to tell him who the dead man was, and who the shepherd is, to which Pedro replied that all he knew was that the dead man was a wealthy gentleman belonging to a village in those mountains, who had been a student at Salamanca for many years, at the end of which he returned to his village with the reputation of being very learned and deeply read. Above all, they said, he was learned in the science of the stars, and of what went on yonder in the heavens and the sun and the moon, for he told us of the Christ of the sun and the moon to the exact time. Eclipse, it is called friend, not Christ, the darkening of those two luminaries, said Don Quixote. But Pedro, not troubling himself with trifles, went on with his story, saying, Also he foretold when the year was going to be one of abundance or estility. Sterility, you mean, said Don Quixote. Sterility or estility, answered Pedro, it is all the same in the end, and I can tell you that by this his father and friends who believed him grew very rich because they did as he advised them, bidding them sow barley this year, not wheat, this year you may sow pulse and not barley, the next there will be a full oil crop, and the three following not a drop will be got. That science is called astrology, said Don Quixote. I do not know what it is called, replied Pedro, but I know that he knew all this and more besides. But to make an end, not many months had passed after he returned from Salamanca, when one day he appeared dressed as a shepherd with his crook and sheepskin, having put off the long gown he wore as a scholar, and at the same time his great friend, Ambrosio by name, who had been his companion in his studies, took to the shepherd's dress with him. I forgot to say that Chrysostom, who is dead, was a great man for writing verses, so much so that he made carols for Christmas Eve, and plays for Corpus Christi, which the young men of our village acted, and all said they were excellent. When the villagers saw the two scholars so unexpectedly appearing in shepherd's dress, they were lost in wonder, and could not guess what had led them to make so extraordinary a change. About this time the father of our Chrysostom died, and he was left heir to a large amount of property in chattels as well as in land, no small number of cattle and sheep, and a large sum of money, of all of which the young man was left dissolute owner, and indeed he was deserving of it all, for he was a very good comrade, and kind-hearted, and a friend of worthy folk, and had a countenance like a benediction. Presently it came to be known that he had changed his dress with no other object than to wander about these wastes after that shepherdess Marcella our lad mentioned a while ago, with whom the deceased Chrysostom had fallen in love. And I must tell you now, for it is well you should know it, who this girl is, perhaps, and even without any perhaps, you will not have heard anything like it in all the days of your life, though you should live more days than Sarna. Say Sara, said Don Quixote, unable to endure the goatherd's confusion of words. "'The Sarna lives long enough,' answered Pedro, "'and if, Senor, you must go finding fault with words at every step, "'we shall not make an end of it this twelve-month.' "'Pardon me, friend,' said Don Quixote, "'but as there is such a difference between Sarna and Sara, I told you of it. "'However, you have answered very rightly, "'for Sarna lives longer than Sara. "'So continue your story, and I will not object any more to anything.' 
"'I will say then, my dear sir,' said the goatherd, "'that in our village there was a farmer even richer than the father of Chrysostom, "'who was named Guillermo, and upon whom God bestowed, over and above great wealth, "'a daughter, at whose birth her mother died, the most respected woman there was in this neighbourhood. "'I fancy I can see her now with that countenance which had the sun on one side and the moon on the other, "'and moreover active, and kind to the poor, for which I trust that at the present moment her soul is in bliss with God in the other world.' Her husband Guillermo died of grief at the death of so good a wife, leaving his daughter Marcella, a child and rich, to the care of an uncle of hers, a priest and prebendary in our village. The girl grew up with such beauty that it reminded us of her mother's, which was very great, and yet it was thought that the daughter would exceed it, and so when she reached the age of fourteen to fifteen years old, nobody beheld her but blessed God that he had made her so beautiful, and the greater number were in love with her past redemption." Her uncle kept her in great seclusion and retirement, but for all that the fame of her great beauty spread, so that, as well for it as for her great wealth, her uncle was asked, solicited, and importuned to give her in marriage not only by those of our town, but of those many leagues round, and by the persons of highest quality in them. But he, being a good Christian man, though he desired to give her in marriage at once, seeing her to be old enough, was unwilling to do so without her consent. Not that he had any eye to the gain and profit which the custody of the girl's property brought him while he put off her marriage, and faith, this was said in praise of the good priest in more than one set in town. For I would have you know, Sir Errant, that in these little villages everything is talked about, and everything is carped at, and rest assured as I am, that the priest must be over and above good who forces his parishioners to speak well of him, especially in villages. That is the truth, said Don Quixote. But go on, for the story is very good, and you, good Pedro, tell it with very good grace. May that of the Lord not be wanting to me, said Pedro, that is the one to have. To proceed, you must know that though the uncle put before his niece and described to her the qualities of each one in particular of the many who had asked her in marriage, begging her to marry and to make a choice according to her own taste, she never gave any other answer than that she had no desire to marry just yet, and that being so young she did not think herself fit to bear the burden of matrimony. At these, to all appearance, reasonable excuses that she made, her uncle ceased to urge her, and waited till she was somewhat more advanced in age, and could mate herself to her own liking. For, said he, and he said quite right, parents are not to settle children in life against their will. But when one least looked for it, lo and behold, one day the demure Marcella makes her appearance turn shepherdess, and in spite of her uncle and all those of the town that strove to dissuade her, took to going afield with the other shepherd lasses of the village, and tending her own flock. And so, since she appeared in public, and her beauty came to be seen openly, I could not well tell you how many rich youths, gentlemen, and peasants have adopted the costume of Chrysostom, and go about these fields making love to her. One of these, as has already been said, was our deceased friend, of whom they say that he did not love but adore her. But you must not suppose, because Marcella chose a life of such liberty and independence, and of so little or rather no retirement, that she has given any occasion, or even the semblance of one, for disparagement of her purity and modesty. On the contrary, such and so great is the vigilance with which she watches over her honour, that all of those who court and woo her not one is boasted, or can with truth boast, that she has given him any hope, however small, of obtaining his desire. For although she does not avoid or shun the society and conversation of the shepherds, and treats them courteously and kindly, should any one of them come to declare his intention to her, though it be one as proper and holy as that of matrimony, she flings him from her like a catapult. And with this kind of disposition, she does more harm in this country than if the plague had gotten into it. For her affability and her beauty draw on the hearts of those that associate with her to love and court her. But her scorn and her frankness bring them to the brink of despair, and so they know not what to say say, save to proclaim her aloud cruel and hard-hearted, and other names of the same sort, which well describe the nature of her character. And if you should remain here any time, Signor, you would hear these hills and valleys resounding with the laments of the rejected ones who pursue her. Not far from this there is a spot where there are a couple of dozen tall beeches, and there is not one of them but has carved and written on its smooth bark the name of Marcella, and above some a crown carved on the same tree, as though her lover would say more plainly that Marcella wore and deserved that of all human beauty. Here one shepherd is sighing, there another is lamenting, there love-songs are heard, here despairing elegies. 
one will pass all the hours of the night seated at the front of some oak or rock, and there, without having closed his weeping eyes, the sun finds him in the morning, bemused and bereft of senses, and another, without relief or respite to his sighs, stretched on the burning sand in the full heat of the sultry summer noontide, makes his appeal to the compassionate heavens, and over one and the other, over these and all, the beautiful Marcella triumphs free and careless." and all of us that know her are waiting to see what her pride will come to, and who is to be the happy man that will succeed in taming a nature so formidable, and gaining possession of a beauty so supreme. All that I have told you being such well-established truth, I am persuaded that what they say of the cause of Chrysostom's death, as our lad told us, is the same. And so I advise you, Signor, fail not to be present at his burial, which will be well worth seeing, for Chrysostom had many friends, and it is not half a league from this place to where he directed he should be buried. "'I will make a point of it,' said Don Quixote, "'and I thank you for the pleasure you have given me by relating so interesting a tale.' "'Oh,' said the goatherd, "'I do not even know the half of what has happened to the lovers of Marcella, but perhaps to-morrow we may fall in with some shepherd on the road who can tell us, and now it will be well for you to go and sleep under cover, for the night air may hurt your wound, though with the remedy I have applied to you there is no fear of an untoward result.' Sancho Panza, who was wishing the goatherd's loquacity at the devil, on his part begged his master to go into Pedro's hut to sleep. He did so and passed all the rest of the night in thinking of his lady Dulcinea, in imitation of the lovers of Marcella. Sancho Panza settled himself between Rocinante and his ass, and slept, not like a lover who had been discarded, but like a man who had been soundly kicked. CHAPTER Thirteen, IN WHICH IS ENDED THE STORY OF THE SHEPHERDESS MARCELLA, WITH OTHER INCIDENTS. But hardly had day begun to show itself through the balconies of the east, when five of the six goatherds came to rouse Don Quixote, and tell him that if he was still of a mind to go and see the famous burial of Chrysostom, they would bear him company. Don Quixote, who desired nothing better, rose and ordered Sancho to saddle and panel at once, which he did with all dispatch, and with the same they all set out forthwith. They had not gone a quarter of a league when at the meeting of two paths they saw coming towards them some six shepherds dressed in black sheepskins, and with their heads crowned with garlands of cypress and bitter oleander. Each of them carried a stout holly staff in his hand, and along with them there came two men of quality on horseback in handsome travelling dress, with three servants on foot accompanying them. Courteous salutations were exchanged on meeting, and inquiring one of the other which way each party was going, they learned that all were bound for the scene of the burial, so they all went on together. One of those on horseback addressing his companion said to him, "'It seems to me, Signor Vivaldo, that we may reckon as well spent the delay we shall incur in seeing this remarkable funeral, for remarkable it cannot but be, judging by the strange things these shepherds have told us, of both the dead shepherd and the homicide shepherdess.' "'So I think, too,' replied Vivaldo, "'and I would delay not to say a day, but four, for the sake of seeing it.' Don Quixote asked them what it was they had heard of Marcella and Chrysostom. The traveller answered that the same morning they had met these shepherds, and seen them dressed in this mournful fashion, they had asked them the reason of their appearing in such a guise, which one of them gave, describing the strange behaviour and beauty of a shepherdess called Marcella, and the loves of many who courted her, together with the death of that Chrysostom to whose burial they were going.' In short, he repeated all that Pedro had related to Don Quixote. This conversation dropped, and another was commenced by him who was called Vivaldo, asking Don Quixote what was the reason that led him to go armed in that fashion in a country so peaceful, to which Don Quixote replied, "'The pursuit of my calling does not allow or permit me to go in any other fashion. Easy life, enjoyment, and repose were invented for soft courtiers, but toil, unrest, and arms were invented and made for those alone whom the world calls knight-errant, of whom I, though unworthy, am the least of all.' The instant they heard this, all set him down as mad, and the better to settle the point and discover what kind of madness his was, Vivaldo proceeded to ask him what knights-errant meant. "'Have not your worships,' replied Don Quixote, "'read the annals and histories of England, "'in which are recorded the famous deeds of King Arthur, "'whom we, in our proper Castilian, "'invariably call King Artus, "'with regard to whom it is an ancient tradition, "'and commonly received all over that kingdom of Great Britain, "'that this king did not die, "'but was changed by magic art into a raven, "'and that in process of time "'he is to return to reign and recover his kingdom and sceptre, "'for which reason it cannot be proved "'that from that time to this any Englishman ever killed a raven. 
Well, then, in the time of this good king, that famous order of chivalry of the Knights of the Round Table was instituted, and the amour of Don Lancelot of the Lake with the Queen Guinevere occurred, precisely as there is related, the go-between and confidant therein being the highly honourable Dame Quintanona, whence came that ballad so well known and widely spread in our Spain. O oh, never surely was there knight so served by hand of dame, as served was he Sir Lancelot hight, when he from Britain came, with all the sweet and delectable course of his achievements in love and war. Handed down from that time, then, this order of chivalry went on extending and spreading itself over many and various parts of the world, and in it, famous and renowned for their deeds, were the mighty Amadis of Gaul, with all his sons and descendants to the fifth generation, and the valiant Felix Marte of Hircania, and the never sufficiently praised Tirante el Blanco, and in our own days, almost, we have seen and heard and talked with the invincible knight Don Belianis of Greece. This, then, sirs, is to be a knight's errant, and what I have spoken of is the order of his chivalry, of which, as I have already said, I, though a sinner, have made profession, and what the aforesaid knights professed, that same I do profess, and so I go through these solitudes and wilds seeking adventures, resolved in soul to oppose my arm and person to the most perilous that fortune may offer me, in aid of the weak and needy. By these words of his, the travellers were able to satisfy themselves of Don Quixote's being out of his senses, and of the form of madness that overmastered him, at which they felt the same astonishment that all felt on first becoming acquainted with it. And Vivaldo, who was a person of great shrewdness and of a lively temperament, in order to beguile the short journey which they said was required to reach the mountain, the scene of the burial, sought to give him an opportunity of going on with his absurdities. So he said to him, It seems to me, Signor Knight-errant, that your worship has made choice of one of the most austere professions in the world, and I imagine even that of the Carthusian monks is not so austere. As austere it may perhaps be, replied our Don Quixote, but so necessary for the world I am very much inclined to doubt. For if the truth is to be told, the soldier who executes what his captain orders does no less than the captain himself who gives the order. My meaning is, that churchmen, in peace and quiet, pray to heaven for the welfare of the world, but we soldiers and knights carry into effect what they pray for, defending it with the might of our arms and the edge of our swords, not under shelter but in the open air, a target for the intolerable rays of the sun in summer and the piercing frosts of winter. Thus are we God's ministers on earth, and the arms by which his justice is done therein. And as the business of war, and all that relates and belongs to it, cannot be conducted without exceeding great sweat, toil, and exertion, it follows that those who make it their profession have undoubtedly more labour than those who in tranquil peace and quiet are engaged in praying to God to help the weak. I do not mean to say, nor does it enter into my thoughts, that the knight's errant calling is as good as that of the monk in his cell. I would merely infer from what I endure myself that it is beyond a doubt a more laborious and a more belaboured one, a hungrier and thirstier, a wretcheder, raggeder, and lousier. For there is no reason to doubt that the knights errant of yore endured much hardship in the course of their lives, and if some of them, by the might of their arms, did rise to be emperors, in faith it cost them dear in the matter of blood and sweat, and if those who attained to that rank had not had magicians and sages to help them, they would have been completely balked in their ambition, and disappointed in their hopes. "'That is my own opinion,' replied the traveller. But one thing among many others seems to me very wrong in knights errant, and that is that when they find themselves about to engage in some mighty and perilous adventure in which there is manifest danger of losing their lives, they never, at the moment of engaging in it, think of commending themselves to God, as is the duty of every good Christian in like peril, instead of which they commend themselves to their ladies with as much devotion as if they were their gods, a thing which seems to me to savour somewhat of heathenism. Sir, answered Don Quixote, that cannot on any account be admitted, and the knight-errant would be disgraced who acted otherwise, for it is usual and customary in knight-errantry that the knight-errant, who on engaging in any great feat of arms has his lady before him, should turn his eyes toward her softly and lovingly, as though with them entreating her to favour and protect him in the hazardous venture he is about to undertake, and even though no one hear him, he is bound to say certain words between his teeth, commending himself to her with all his heart, and of this we have innumerable instances in the histories, nor is it to be supposed from this that they are to omit commending themselves to God, for there will be time and opportunity for doing so while they are engaged in their task. For all that, answered the traveller, I feel some doubt still. 
because often I have read how words will arise between two knights errant, and from one thing to another it comes about that their anger kindles, and they wheel their horses round and take a good stretch of field, and then, without any more ado, at the top of their speed they come to the charge, and in mid-career they are wont to commend themselves to their ladies. And what commonly comes of the encounter is that one falls over the haunches of his horse, pierced through and through by his antagonist's lance, and for the other it is only by holding on to the mane of his horse that he can help falling to the ground but i know not how the dead man had time to commend himself to god in the course of such rapid work as this it would have been better if those words which he spent in commending himself to his lady in the midst of his career had been devoted to his duty and obligation as a christian moreover it is my belief that all knights errant have not ladies to commend themselves to for they are not all in love that is impossible said don quixote i say it is impossible that there could be a knight-errant without a lady because to such it is as natural and proper to be in love as to the heavens to have stars most certainly no history has been seen in which there is to be found a knight-errant without an amour and for the simple reason that without one he would be held no legitimate knight but a bastard and one who had gained entrance into the stronghold of the said knighthood not by the door but over the wall like a thief and a robber Nevertheless, said the traveller, if I remember rightly, I think I have read that Don Galaor, the brother of the valiant Amadis of Gaul, never had any special lady to whom he might commend himself, and yet he was not the less esteemed, and was a very stout and famous knight. To which our Don Quixote made answer, Sir, one solitary swallow does not make summer. Moreover, I know that knight was in secret very deeply in love. Besides which, that way of falling in love with all that took his fancy was a natural propensity which he could not control. But in short, it is very manifest that he had one alone whom he made mistress of his will, to whom he commended himself very frequently and very secretly, for he prided himself on being a reticent knight. "'Then if it be essential that every knight-errant should be in love,' said the traveller, "'it may be fairly supposed that your worship is so, as you are of the order. "'And if you do not pride yourself on being as reticent as Don Galaur, "'I entreat you as earnestly as I can, in the name of all this company and in my own, "'to inform us of the name, country, rank, and beauty of your lady, "'for she will esteem herself fortunate if all the world knows "'that she is loved and served by such a knight as your worship seems to be.' "'At this,' Don Quixote heaved a deep sigh, and said, "'I cannot say positively whether my sweet enemy is pleased or not that the world should know I serve her. I can only say, in answer to what has been so courteously asked of me, that her name is Dulcinea, her country El Toboso, a village of La Mancha. Her rank must be at least that of a princess, since she is my queen and lady, and her beauty superhuman, since all the impossible and fanciful attributes of beauty which the poets apply to their ladies are verified in her.' For her hairs are gold, her forehead Elysian fields, her eyebrows rainbows, her eyes suns, her cheeks roses, her lips coral, her teeth pearls, her neck alabaster, her bosom marble, her hands ivory, her fairness snow, and what modesty conceals from sight such I think and imagine, as rational reflection can only extol, not compare. We should like to know her lineage, race, and ancestry, said Vivaldo, to which Don Quixote replied, she is not of the ancient Roman Curti, Cai or Scipios, nor of the modern Colonas or Orsini, nor the Moncadas or Riskenias of Catalonia, nor yet of the Rebellas or Villanovas of Valencia, Palafoxes, Nusas, Rocabertis, Corellas, Lunas, Alagones, Oreas, Foces or Goreas of Aragon, Cerdas, Manriques, Mendozas or Guzmans of Castile, Alencastros, Palas or Menceses of Portugal. But she is of those of El Toboso of La Mancha, a lineage that, though modern, may furnish a source of gentle blood for the most illustrious families of the ages that are to come, and let none dispute with me save on the condition that Serbino placed at the foot of the trophy of Orlando's arms, saying, These let none move who dareth not his might with Roland prove. Although mine is of the Cachopins of Laredo, said the traveller, I will not venture to compare it with that of El Toboso of La Mancha, though to tell the truth no such surname has until now ever reached my ears." What? said Don Quixote. Has that never reached them? The rest of the party went along listening with great attention to the conversation of the pair, and even the very goatherds and shepherds perceived how exceedingly out of his wits our Don Quixote was. Sancho Panza alone thought that what his master said was the truth, knowing who he was and having known him from his birth, and all that he felt any difficulty in believing was that about the fair Dulcinea del Toboso, because neither any such name nor any such princess had ever come to his knowledge, though he lived so close to El Toboso. 
They were going along conversing in this way, when they saw descending a gap between two high mountains some twenty shepherds, all clad in sheepskins of black wool, and crowned with garlands which, as afterwards appeared, were some of them of yew, some of cypress. Six of the number were carrying a bier covered with a great variety of flowers and branches, on seeing which one of the goatherds said, Those who come there are the bearers of Chrysostom's body, and the foot of that mountain is the place where he ordered them to bury him. They therefore made haste to reach the spot, and did so by the time those who came had laid the bier upon the ground, and four of them, with sharp pickaxes, were digging a grave by the side of a hard rock. They greeted each other courteously, and then Don Quixote and those who accompanied him turned to examine the bier, and on it, covered with flowers, they saw a dead body in the dress of a shepherd, to all appearance of one thirty years of age, and showing even in death that in life he had been of comely features and gallant bearing. Around him, on the bier itself, were laid some books, and several papers opened and folded, and those who were looking on, as well as those who were opening the grave, and all the others who were there, preserved a strange silence, until one of those who had borne the body said to another, Observe carefully, Ambrosia, if this is the place Chrysostom spoke of, since you are anxious that what he directed in his will should be so strictly complied with. "'This is the place,' answered Ambrosia, "'for in it many a time did my poor friend tell me the story of his hard fortune. "'Here it was, he told me, that for the first time he saw the mortal enemy of the human race, "'and here, too, for the first time, he declared to her his passion, as honourable as it was devoted, "'and here it was that at last Marcella ended by scorning and rejecting him, "'so as to bring the tragedy of his wretched life to a close. "'Here, in memory of misfortune so great, he desired to be laid in the bowels of eternal oblivion.' Then, turning to Don Quixote and the travellers, he went on to say, "'That body, sirs, on which you are looking with compassionate eyes, was the abode of a soul on which heaven bestowed a vast share of its riches. That is the body of Chrysostom, who was unrivalled in wit, unequalled in courtesy, unapproached in gentle bearing, a phoenix in friendship, generous without limit, grave without arrogance, gay without vulgarity, and, in short, first in all that constitutes goodness, and second to none in all that makes up misfortune. He loved deeply, he was hated, he adored, he was scorned. He wooed a wild beast, he pleaded with marble, he pursued the wind, he cried to the wilderness, he served in gratitude, and for reward was made the prey of death in the mid-course of life, cut short by a shepherdess whom he sought to immortalize in the memory of man, as these papers which you see could fully prove, had he not commanded me to consign them to the fire after having consigned his body to the earth. "'You would deal with them more harshly and cruelly than their owner himself,' said Vivaldo, "'for it is neither right nor proper to do the will of one who enjoins what is wholly unreasonable. "'It would not have been reasonable in Augustus Caesar, "'had he permitted the directions left by the divine Mantuan in his will to be carried into effect. "'So that, Signor Ambrosia, while you consign your friend's body to the earth, "'you should not consign his writings to oblivion.' For if he gave the order in bitterness of heart, it is not right that you should irrationally obey it. On the contrary, by granting life to these papers, let the cruelty of Marcella live for ever, to serve as a warning in ages to come to all men who shun and avoid falling into like a danger. Or I, and all of us who have come here, know already the story of this your love-stricken and heart-broken friend, and we know too your friendship, and the cause of his death, and the directions he gave at the close of his life, from which sad story may be gathered how great was the cruelty of Marcella, the love of Chrysostom, and the loyalty of your friendship, together with the end awaiting those who pursue rashly the path that insane passion opens to their eyes. Last night we learned of the death of Chrysostom, and that he was to be buried here, and out of curiosity and pity we left our direct road, and resolved to come and see with our eyes that which when heard of had so moved our compassion, and in consideration of that compassion, and our desire to prove it, if we might by condolence, we beg of you, excellent Ambrosia, or at least I on my own account entreat you, that instead of burning these papers you allow me to carry away some of them. And without waiting for the shepherd's answer, he stretched out his hand, and took up some of those that were nearest to him, seeing which Ambrosio said, out of courtesy, Signor, I will grant your request as to those you have taken, but it is idle to expect me to abstain from burning the remainder. Vivaldo, who was eager to see what the papers contained, opened one of them at once, and saw that its title was Lay of Despair. Ambrosio, hearing it, said, That is the last paper the unhappy man wrote, and that you may see, Signor, to what an end his misfortunes brought him. Read it so that you may be heard. 
for you will have time enough for that while we are waiting for the grave to be dug. I will do so very willingly, said Vivaldo, and as all the bystanders were equally eager they gathered around him, and he, reading in a loud voice, found that it ran as follows. End of Part 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Lyons, Naperville, Illinois. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Part 5. Chapter 14. To 15. Chapter 14. Wherein are inserted the despairing verses of the dead shepherd, together with other incidents not looked for. The Lay of Chrysostom. Since thou dost in thy cruelty desire the ruthless rigor of thy tyranny, from tongue to tongue, from land to land proclaimed, the very hell will I constrain to lend this stricken breast of mine deep notes of woe to serve my need of fitting utterance and as i strive to body forth the tale of all i suffer all that thou hast done forth shall the dread voice roll and bear along shreds from my vitals torn for greater pain then listen not to dulcet harmony but to a discord wrung by mad despair out of this bosom's depths of bitterness to ease my heart and plant a sting in thine the lion's roar the fierce wolf's savage howl the horrid hissing of the scaly snake the awesome cries of monsters yet unnamed the crow's ill-boding croak the hollow moan of wild winds wrestling with the restless sea the wrathful bellow of the vanquished bull the plaintive sobbing of the widowed dove the envied owl's sad note the wail of woe that rises from the dreary choir of hell commingled in one sound confusing sense let all these come to aid my soul's complaint for pain like mine demands new modes of song no echoes of that discord shall be heard where father tagus rolls or on the banks of ollard bordered betis to the rocks or in deep caverns shall my plaint be told and by a lifeless tongue in living words or in dark valleys or on lonely shores where neither foot of man nor sunbeam falls or in among the poison breathing swarms of monsters nourished by the sluggish nile for though it be to solitudes remote the hoarse vague echoes of my sorrows sound thy matchless cruelty my dismal fate shall carry them to all the spacious world disdain hath power to kill and patience dies slain by suspicion be it false or true and deadly is the force of jealousy long absence make makes of life a dreary void no hope or happiness can give repose to him that ever fears to be forgot and death inevitable waits in hall but i by some strange miracle live on a prey to absence jealousy disdain racked by suspicion as by certainty forgotten left to feed my flame alone and while i suffer thus there comes no ray of hope to gladden me athwart the gloom nor do i look for it in my despair but rather clinging to a cureless woe all hope do i abjure for evermore can there be hope where fear is were it well when far more certain are the grounds of fear 
Ought I to shut mine eyes to jealousy, if through a thousand heart wounds it appears? Who would not give free access to distrust, seeing disdain unveiled, and bitter change, all his suspicions turn to certainties, and the fair truth transformed in, into a lie? O oh, thou fierce tyrant of the realms of love! O oh, jealousy, put chains upon these hands, and bind me with thy strongest cord, disdain! But woe is me, triumphant over all, my sufferings drown the memory of you. And now I die, and since there is no hope of happiness for me in life or death, still to my fantasy I'll fondly cling, I'll say that he is wise who loveth well, and that the soul most free is that most bound in thraldom to the ancient tyrant love. I'll say that she who is mine enemy in that fair body hath as fair a mind, and that her coldness is but my desert, and that by virtue of the pain he sends love rules his kingdom with a gentle sway. Thus self-deluding, and in bondage sore, and wearing out the wretched shred of life to which I am reduced by her disdain. I'll give this soul and body to the winds, all hopeless of a crown of bliss in store. Thou, whose injustice hath supplied the cause that makes me quit the weary life I loathe, as by this wounded bosom thou canst see, how willingly thy victim I become. Let not my death, if haply worth a tear, cloud the clear heaven that dwells in thy bright eyes. I would not have thee expiate in aught the crime of having made my heart thy prey, but rather let thy laughter gaily ring and prove my death to be thy festival. Fool that I am to bid thee, well I know thy glory gains by my untimely end. And now it is the time from hell's abyss come thirsting Tantalus, come Sisyphus, heaving the cruel stone, come Tityus with vulture and with wheel Ixion come, and come the sisters of the ceaseless toil, and all into this breast transfer their pains, and, if such tribute to despair be due, chant in their deepest tones a doleful dirge over a course unworthy of a shroud. Let the three-headed guardian of the gate, and all the monstrous progeny of hell, the doleful concert join, a lover dead, methinks can have no fitter obsequies. Lay of despair, grieve not, when thou art gone, forth from this sorrowing heart, my misery brings fortune to the cause that gave thee birth. Then banish sadness even in the tomb. The lay of Chrysostom met with the approbation of the listeners, though the reader said it did not seem to him to agree with what he had heard of Marcella's reserve and propriety. For Chrysostom complained in it of jealousy, suspicion, and absence, all to the prejudice of the good name and fame of Marcella, to which Ambrosio replied, as one who knew well his friend's most secret thoughts, Senor, to remove that doubt, I should tell you that when the unhappy man wrote this lay, he was away from Marcella, from whom he had voluntarily separated himself, to try if absence would act with him as it is wont, and as everything distresses and every fear haunts the banished lover, so imaginary jealousies and suspicions dreaded as if they were true, tormented Chrysostom, and thus the truth of what report declares of the virtue of Marcella remains unshaken, and with her envy itself 
should not and cannot find any fault save that of being cruel, somewhat haughty, and very scornful. "'That is true,' said Vivaldo, and as he was about to read another paper of those he had preserved from the fire, he was stopped by a marvellous vision, for such it seemed, that unexpectedly presented itself to their eyes. For on the summit of the rock where they were digging the grave there appeared the shepherdess Marcella, so beautiful that her beauty exceeded its reputation. Those who had never till then beheld her gazed upon her in wonder and silence, and those who were accustomed to see her were not less amazed than those who had never seen her before. But the instant Ambrosio saw her, he addressed her with manifest indignation. Art thou come, by chance, cruel basilisk of these mountains, to see if in thy presence blood will flow from the wounds of this wretched being thy cruelty has robbed of life? Or is it to exult over the cruel work of thy humours that thou art come? Or like another pitiless Nero, to look down from that height upon the ruin of his Rome in embers? Or in thy arrogance to trample on this ill-fated corpse, as the ungrateful daughter trampled on her father Tarkins? Tell us quickly, for what thou art come, or what it is thou wouldst have, for, as I know the thoughts of Chrysostom never fail to obey thee in life, I will make all these who call themselves his friends obey thee, though he be dead. I come not, Ambrosia, for any of the purposes thou hast named, replied Marcella, but to defend myself and to prove how unreasonable are all those who blame me for their sorrow and for Chrysostom's death, and therefore I ask all of you that are here to give me your attention, for will not take much time or many words to bring the truth home to persons of sense. Heaven has made me, so you say, beautiful, and so much so that in spite of yourselves my beauty leads you to love me. And for the love you show me, you say, and even urge, that I am bound to love you. By that natural understanding which God has given me, I know that everything beautiful attracts love, but I cannot see how, by reason of being loved, that which is loved for its beauty is bound to love that which loves it. Besides, it may happen that the lover of that which is beautiful may be ugly, and ugliness being detestable, it is very absurd to say, I love thee because thou art beautiful, thou must love me though I be ugly. But supposing the beauty equal on both sides, it does not follow that the inclinations must be therefore alike, for it is not every beauty that excites love, some but pleasing the eye without winning the affection. And if every sort of beauty excited love and won the heart, the will would wander vaguely to and fro, unable to make choice of any, for as there is an infinity of beautiful objects, there must be an infinity of inclinations. And true love, I have heard it said, is indivisible, and must be voluntary and not compelled. If this be so, as I believe it to be, why do you desire me to bend my will by force, for no other reason but that you say you love me? Nay, tell me, had heaven made me ugly, as it has made me beautiful, could I with justice complain of you for not loving me? Moreover, you must remember that the beauty I possess was no choice of mine, for, be it what it may, heaven of its bounty gave it me without my asking or choosing it, and as the viper, though it kills with it, does not deserve to be blamed for the poison it carries, as it is a gift of nature. Neither do I deserve reproach for being beautiful, 
for beauty in a modest woman is like fire at a distance or a sharp sword the one does not burn the other does not cut those who do not come too near honor and virtue are the ornaments of the mind without which the body though it be so has no right to pass for beautiful but if modesty is one of the virtues that specially lend a grace and charm to mind and body why should she who is loved for her beauty part with it to gratify one who for his pleasure alone strives with all his might and energy to rob her of it i was born free and that i might live in freedom i chose the solitude of the fields in the trees of the mountains i find society the clear waters of the brooks are my mirrors and to the trees and waters i make known my thoughts and charms i am a fire afar off a sword laid aside those whom i have inspired with love by letting them see me i have by words undeceived and if their longings live on hope and i have given none to chrysostom or to any other it cannot justly be said that the death of any is my doing for it was rather his own obstinacy than my cruelty that killed him and if it be made a charge against me that his wishes were honourable and that therefore i was bound to yield to them i answer that when on this very spot where now his grave is made he declared to me his purity of purpose i told him that mine was to live in perpetual solitude and that the earth alone should enjoy the fruits of my retirement and the spoils of my beauty and if after this open avowal he chose to persist against hope and steer against the wind what wonder is it that he should sink in the depths of his infatuation if i had encouraged him i should be false if i had gratified him i should have acted against my own better resolution and purpose he was persistent in spite of warning he despaired without being hated but think you now if it be reasonable that his suffering should be laid to my charge let him who has been deceived complain let him give way to despair whose encouraged hopes have proved vain let him flatter himself whom i shall entice let him boast whom i shall receive but let not him call me cruel or homicide to whom i make no promise upon whom i practice no deception whom i neither entice nor receive it has not been so far the will of heaven that i should love by fate and to expect me to love by choice is idle let this general declaration serve for each of my suitors on his own account and let it be understood from this time forth that if any one dies for me it is not of jealousy or misery he dies for she who loves no one can give no cause for jealousy to any and candor is not to be confounded with scorn let him who calls me wild beast and basilisk leave me alone as something noxious and evil let him who calls me ungrateful withhold his service who calls me wayward seek not my acquaintance who calls me cruel pursue me not for this wild beast this basilisk this ungrateful cruel wayward being has no kind of desire to seek serve know or follow them if chrysostom's impatience and violent passion killed him why should my modest behavior and circumspection be blamed if i preserve my purity in the society of the trees why should he who would have me preserve it among men seek to rob me of it i have as you know wealth of my own and i covet not that of others my taste is for freedom 
and I have no relish for constraint. I neither love nor hate any one. I do not deceive this one or court that, or trifle with one or play with another. The modest converse of the shepherd girls of these hamlets and the care of my goats are my recreations. My desires are bounded by these mountains, and if they ever wander hence it is to contemplate the beauty of the heavens, steps by which the soul travels to its primeval abode. With these words, and not waiting to hear a reply, she turned and passed into the thickest part of a wood that was hard by, leaving all who were there lost in admiration as much of her good sense as of her beauty. Some, those wounded by the irresistible shafts launched by her bright eyes, made as though they would follow her heedless of the frank declaration they had heard, seeing which, and deeming this a fitting occasion for the exercise of his chivalry in aid of distressed damsels, Don Quixote, laying his hand on the hilt of his sword, exclaimed in a loud and distinct voice, Let no one, whatever his rank or condition, dare to follow the beautiful Marcella, under pain of incurring my fierce indignation, she has shown by clear and satisfactory arguments that little or no fault is to be found with her for the death of Chrysostom, and also how far she is from yielding to the wishes of any of her lovers, for which reason, instead of being followed and persecuted, she should in justice be honored and esteemed by all the good people of the world, for she shows that she is the only woman in it that holds to such a virtuous resolution. Whether it was because of the threats of Don Quixote, or because Ambrosio told them to fulfill their duty to their good friend, none of the shepherds moved or stirred from the spot, until, having finished the grave and burned Chrysostom's papers, they laid his body in it, not without many tears from those who stood by. They closed the grave with a heavy stone until a slab was ready, which Ambrosio said he meant to have prepared, with an epitaph which was to be to this effect. Beneath the stone before your eyes the body of a lover lies. In life he was a shepherd swain, in death a victim to disdain. Ungrateful, cruel, coy, and fair was she that drove him to despair, and love hath made her his ally, for spreading wide his tyranny. They then strewed upon the grave a profusion of flowers and branches, and all expressing their condolence with his friend Ambrosio, took their Vivaldo, and his companion did the same. And Don Quixote bade farewell to his hosts and to the travellers, who pressed him to come with them to Seville, as being such a convenient place for finding adventures for they presented themselves in every street and round every corner oftener than anywhere else. Don Quixote thanked them for their advice and for the disposition they showed to do him a favor, and said that for the present he would not and must not go to Seville until he had cleared all these mountains of highwaymen and robbers, of whom report said they were full. Seeing his good intention, the travellers were unwilling to press him further, and once more bidding him farewell, they left him and pursued their journey, in the course of which they did not fail to discuss the story of Marcella and Chrysostom, as well as the madness of Don Quixote. He, on his part, resolved to go in quest of the shepherdess Marcella, and make offer to her of all the service he could render her. But things did not fall out with him as he expected, according to what is related in the course of this veracious history, 
of which the second part ends here. Ch chapter 15, in which is related the unfortunate adventure that Don Quixote fell in with when he fell out with certain heartless Yanguesans. The sage Sidi Hamete Benengele relates that as soon as Don Quixote took leave of his hosts and all who had been present at the burial of Chrysostom, he and his squire passed into the same wood which they had seen the shepherdess Marcella enter, and after having wandered for more than two hours in all directions in search of her without finding her, they came to a halt in a glade covered with tender grass, besides which ran a pleasant cool stream that invited and compelled them to pass there the hours of the noontide heat, which by this time was beginning to come on oppressively. Don Quixote and Sancho dismounted, and turning Rocinante and the ass loose to feed on the grass that there was there in abundance, they ransacked the alforjas, and without any ceremony very peacefully and sociably master and man made their repast on what they found in them. Sancho had not thought it worth while to hobble Rosinante, feeling sure from what he knew of his staidness and freedom from incontinence that all the mares in the Cordova pastures would not lead him into an impropriety. Chance, however, and the devil, who is not always asleep, so ordained it that feeding in this valley there was a drove of Galician ponies belonging to certain Yanguesan carriers, whose way it is to take their midday rest with their teams in places and spots where grass and water abound, and that where Don Quixote chanced to be suited the Yanguesan's purpose very well. It so happened, then, that Rosinante took a fancy to disport himself with their ladyships the ponies, and abandoning his usual gait and demeanour as he scented them, he, without asking leave of his master, got up a briskish little trot, and hastened to make known his wishes to them. They, however, it seemed, preferred their pasture to him, and received him with their heels and teeth to such effect that they soon broke his girths and left him naked without a saddle to cover him. But what must have been worse to him was that the carriers, seeing the violence he was offering to their mares, came running up armed with stakes, and so belabored him that they brought him sorely battered to the ground. By this time Don Quixote and Sancho, who had witnessed the drubbing of Rosinante, came up panting and said Don Quixote to Sancho, As far as I can see, friend Sancho, these are not knights but base folk of low birth. I mention it because thou canst lawfully aid me in taking due vengeance for the insult offered to Rosinante before our eyes. "'What the devil vengeance can we take?' answered Sancho. "'If they are more than twenty, and we no more than two, or indeed, perhaps, not more than one and a half. "'I count for a hundred, replied Don Quixote, and without more words he drew his sword and attacked the Anguazans, and excited and impelled by the example of his master, Sancho did the same. And to begin with, Don Quixote delivered a slash at one of them that laid open the leather jerkin he wore, together with a great portion of his shoulder. The Anguazans, seeing themselves assaulted by only two men, while they were so many, betook themselves to their stakes, and driving the two into the middle, they began to lay on with great zeal and energy. 
In fact, at the second blow they brought Sancho to the ground, and Don Quixote fared the same way, all his skill and high mettle availing him nothing, and fate willed it that he should fall at the feet of Rocinante, who had not yet risen, whereby it may seem how furiously stakes can pound in angry boorish hands. Then, seeing the mischief they had done, the Anguazans, with all the haste they could, loaded their team and pursued their journey, leaving the two adventurers a sorry sight and in sorrier mood. Sancho was the first to come to, and finding himself close to his master, he called to him in a weak and doleful voice, Señor Don Quixote, ah, Señor Don Quixote! What wouldst thou, brother Sancho? answered Don Quixote in the same feeble, suffering tone as Sancho. I would like, if it were possible, answered Sancho Panza, your worship to give me a couple of sups of that potion of the fiery blast, if it be that you have any to hand there. Perhaps it will serve for broken bones as well as for wounds. If I only had it here, wretch that I am, what more should we want? said Don Quixote. But I swear to thee, Sancho Panza, on the faith of a knight errant, ere two days are over, unless fortune orders otherwise, I mean to have it in my possession, or my hand will have lost its cunning. But in how many does your worship think we shall have the use of our feet? answered Sancho Panza. For myself, I must say I cannot guess how many, said the battered knight Don Quixote, but I take all the blame upon myself, for I had no business to put hand to sword against men who were not dubbed knights like myself, and so I believe that in punishment for having transgressed the laws of chivalry, the god of battles has permitted this chastisement to be administered to me. For which reason, brother Sancho, it is well thou shouldst receive a hint on the matter which I am now about to mention to thee, for it is of much importance to the welfare of both of us. It is when thou shalt see rabble of this sort offering us insult, thou art not to wait till I draw sword against them, for I shall not do so at all. But do thou draw sword and chastise them to thy heart's content, and if any knights come to their aid and defense, I will take care to defend thee and assail them with all my might. And thou hast already seen by a thousand signs and proofs what the might of this strong arm of mine is equal to. So uplifted had the poor gentleman become th through the victory over the stout Biscayan. But Sancho did not so fully approve of his master's admonition as to let it pass without saying in reply, Senor, I am a man of peace, meek and quiet, and I can put up with any affront, because I have a wife of children to support and bring up. So let it be likewise a hint to your worship, as it cannot be a mandate, that on no account will I draw sword either against clown or against knight, and that here before God I forgive the insults that have been offered me, whether they have been are or shall be offered me by high or low, rich or poor, noble or commoner, not accepting any rank or condition whatsoever. To all which his master said in reply, I wish I had breath enough to speak somewhat easily, and that the pain I feel on this side would abate so as to let me explain to thee, Panza, the mistake thou makest. Come now, sinner, suppose the winds of fortune, hitherto so adverse, should turn in our favor, filling the sails of our desires, so that safely and without impediment we put into port in some one of those islands I have promised thee. 
how would it be with thee if on winning it i made thee lord of it why thou wilt make it well-nigh impossible through not being a knight nor having any desire to be one nor possessing the courage nor the will to avenge insults or defend thy lordship for thou must know that in newly conquered kingdoms and provinces the minds of the inhabitants are never so quiet nor so well disposed to the new lord that there is no fear of their making some move to change matters once more and try as they say what chance may do for them so it is essential that the new possessor should have good sense to enable him to govern and valour to attack and defend himself whatever may befall him in what has now befallen us answered sancho i'd have been well pleased to have that good sense and that valour your worship speaks of but i swear on the faith of a poor man I am more fit for plasters than for arguments. See if your worship can get up, and let us help Rosinante, though he does not deserve it, for he was the main cause of all this thrashing. I never thought it of Rosinante, for I took him to be a virtuous person and as quiet as myself. After all, they say right that it takes a long time to come to know people and that there is nothing sure in this life. Who would have said it, after such mighty slashes as your worship gave that unlucky knight errant, there was coming, travelling post, and at the very heels of them such a great storm of sticks as has fallen upon our shoulders. And yet thine, Sancho, replied Don Quixote, ought to be used to such squalls but mine reared in soft cloth and fine linen it is plain they must feel more keenly the pain of this mishap and if it were not that i imagine why do i say imagine know of a certainty that all these annoyances are very n necessary accompaniments of the calling of arms i would lay me down here to die of pure vexation to this the squire replied senor as these mishaps are what one reaps of chivalry tell me if they happen very often or if they have their own fixed time for coming to pass because it seems to me that after two harvests we shall be no good for the third unless god in his infinite mercy helps us no friend sancho answered don quixote that the life of knight errant is subject to a thousand dangers and reverses and neither more nor less is it within immediate possibility for knights errant to become kings and emperors as experience has shown in the case of many different knights with whose histories I am thoroughly acquainted, and I could tell thee now, if the pain would let me, of some who simply, by might of arm, have risen to the high stations I have mentioned, and those same, both before and after, experienced diverse misfortunes and miseries. For the valiant Amadis of Gaul found himself in the power of his mortal enemy Archelaus, the magician, who, it is positively asserted, holding him captive, gave him more than two hundred lashes with the reins of his horse while tied to one of the pillars of a court. And moreover, there is a certain recondite author of no small authority who says that the knight of Phoebus, being caught in a certain pitfall which opened under his feet in a certain castle, on falling found himself bound hand and foot in a deep pit underground, where they administered to him one of those things they call clysters of sand and snow water that well nigh finished him, and if he had not been succored in that sore extremity by a sage a great friend of his it would have gone very hard with the poor knight 
so I may well suffer in company with such worthy folk, for greater were the indignities which they had to suffer than those which we suffer. For I would have thee know, Sancho, that wounds caused by any instruments which happen by chance to be in hand inflict no indignity. And this is laid down in the law of the duel in express words. If, for instance, the cobbler strikes another with the last which he has in his hand, though it be in fact a, a piece of wood, it cannot be said for that reason that he whom he struck with it has been cudgelled. I say this lest thou shouldst imagine that because we have been drubbed in this affray, we have therefore suffered any indignity. For the arms those men carried, with which they pounded us, were nothing more than their stakes, and not one of them, so far as I remember, carried rapier, sword, or dagger. They gave me no time to see that much, answered Sancho, for hardly had I lay hand on my tizona when they signed the cross on my shoulders with their sticks in such style that they took the sight out of my eyes and the strength out of my feet, stretching me where I now lie, and where thinking of whether all those stake strokes were an indignity or not gives me no uneasiness which the pain of the blow does, for they will remain as deeply impressed on my memory as on my shoulders. For all that, let me tell thee, brother Panza, said Don Quixote, that there is no recollection which time does not put an end to, and no pain which death does not remove. And what greater misfortune can there be, replied Panza, than the one that waits for time to put an end to it and death remove it. If our mishap were not one of those that are cured with a couple of plasters, it would not be so bad. But I am beginning to think that all the plasters in a hospital almost won't be enough to put us right. No more of that plunk strength out of weakness, Sancho, as I mean to do, returned Don Quixote and let us see how Rosinante is, for it seems to me that not the least share of this mishap has fallen to the lot of the poor beast. There is nothing wonderful of in that, replied Sancho, since he is a knight-errant too. What I wonder at is that my beast should have come off scot-free where we came out scotched. Fortune always leaves a door open in adversity, in order to bring relief to it, said Don Quixote. I say so because this little beast may now supply the want of Rosinante, carrying me hence to some castle where I may be cured of my wounds, and moreover I shall not hold it any dishonor to be so mounted, for I remember having read how the good old Salinas, the tutor an instructor of the gay god of laughter, when he entered the city of the hundred gates, went very contentedly mounted on a handsome ass. It may be true that he went mounted, as your worship says, answered Sancho, but there is a great difference between going mounted and going slung like a sack of manure. To which Don Quixote replied, Wounds received in battle confer honor instead of taking it away. And so, friend Panza, say no more. But, as I told thee before, get up as well as thou canst, and put me on top of thy beast in whatever fashion pleases thee best. And let us go hence, ere night comes on, and surprise us in these wilds. And yet I have heard your worship say, observed Panza, that it is very meet for knights errant to sleep in wastes and deserts, and that they esteem it very good fortune. That is, said Don Quixote, when they cannot help it, or when they are in love. And so true is this, 
that there have been knights who have remained two years on rocks, in sunshine and shade and all the inclemencies of heaven, without their ladies knowing anything of it. And one of these was Amadis, when, under the name of Beltenebras, he took up his abode on the Penapobra, for I know not if it was eight years or eight months, for I am not very sure of the reckoning. At any rate, he stayed there doing penance, for I know not what pique the Princess Oriana had against him. But no more of this now, Sancho, and make haste before a mishap like Rosinante's befalls the ass. The very devil would be in it in that case, said Sancho, and letting off thirty o's and sixty sighs and a hundred and twenty maledictions and execrations on whomsoever it was that had brought him there, he raised himself, stopping halfway bent like a Turkish bow without power to bring himself upright. But with all his pains he saddled his ass, who too had gone astray somewhat, yielding to the excessive license of the day. He next raised up Rosinante, and as for him, had he possessed a tongue to complain with, most assuredly neither Sancho nor his master would have been behind him. To be brief, Sancho fixed Don Quixote on the ass and secured Rosinante with a leading rein, and taking the ass by the halter, he proceeded more or less in the direction in which it seemed to him the high road might be, and as chance was conducting their affairs for them from good to better, he had not gone a short league when the road came in sight, and on it he perceived an inn, which to his annoyance and to the delight of Don Quixote must needs be a castle. Sancho insisted that it was an inn, and his master that it was not one, but a castle, and the dispute lasted so long that before the point was settled they had time to reach it, and into it Sancho entered with all his team without any further controversy. End of chapter 15 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gesine. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Part 6, Chapter 16, of what happened to the ingenious gentleman in the inn, which he took to be a castle. The innkeeper, seeing Don Quixote slung across the ass, asked Sancho what was amiss with him. Sancho answered that it was nothing, only that he had fallen down from a rock and had his ribs a little bruised. The innkeeper had a wife, whose disposition was not such as those of her calling commonly have, for she was by nature kind-hearted and felt for the sufferings of her neighbours. So she at once set about tending Don Quixote, and made her young daughter, a very comely girl, help her in taking care of her guest. There was besides in the inn, as servant, an Asturian lass with a broad face, flat pole, and snub nose, blind of one eye and not very sound in the other. The elegance of her shape, to be sure, made up for all her defects. She did not measure seven palms from head to foot, and her shoulders, which overweighted her somewhat, made her contemplate the ground more than she liked. This graceful lass, then, helped the young girl, and the two made up a very bad bed for Don Quixote in a garret that showed evident signs of having formerly served for many years as a straw loft, in which there was also quartered a carrier, whose bed was placed a little beyond our Don Quixote's, and though only made of the pack saddles and cloths of his mules, had much the advantage of it, as Don Quixote's consisted simply of four rough boards on two not very even trestles, a mattress that for thinness might have passed for a quilt, full of pellets which, 
were they not seen through the rents to be wool, would to the touch have seemed pebbles in hardness. Two sheets made of buckler leather, and a coverlet, the threads of which any one that chose might have counted without missing one in the reckoning. On this accursed bed Don Quixote stretched himself, and the hostess and her daughter soon covered him with plasters from top to toe, while Maritornes, for that was the name of the Asturian, held the light for them, and while plastering him, the hostess, observing how full of wheels Don Quixote was in some places, remarked that this had more the look of blows than of a fall. It was not blows, Sancho said, but that the rock had many points and projections, and that each of them had left its mark. Pray, Signora, he added, manage to save some toe, as there will be no want of someone to use it, for my loins too are rather sore. Then you must have fallen too, said the hostess. I did not fall, said Sancho Panza, but from shock I got at seeing my master fall that I feel as if I had a thousand thwacks. That may well be, said the young girl, for it has many a time happened to me to dream that I was falling down from a tower and never coming to the ground, and when I awoke from the dream to find myself as weak and shaken as if I had really fallen. There is the point, Signora, replied Sancho Panza, that I, without dreaming at all, but being more awake than I am now, find myself with scarcely less wheels than my master Don Quixote. How is the gentleman called? asked Maritornes, the Asturian. Don Quixote of La Mancha, answered Sancho Panza, and he is a knight adventurer, and one of the best and stoutest that have seen the world this long time past. What is a knight adventurer? said the lass. Are you so new in the world as not to know? answered Sancho Panza. Well then, you must know, sister, that a knight adventurer is a thing that in two words is seen drubbed and emperor. That is today the most miserable and needy being in the world, and tomorrow will have two or three crowns of kingdom to give his squire. Then how is it, said the hostess, that belonging to so good a master as this, you have not, to judge by appearances, even so much as a county? It is too soon yet, answered Sancho, for we have only been a month going in quest of adventures, and so far we have met with nothing that can be called one, that when one thing is looked for, another thing is found. However, if my master Don Quixote gets well of this wound, or fall, and I am left none the worse of it, I would not change my hopes for the best title in Spain. To all this conversation Don Quixote was listening very attentively, and sitting in bed as well as he could, and taking the hostess by the hand, he said to her, Believe me, fair lady, you may call yourself fortunate in having in this castle of yours sheltered my person, which is such that if I do not myself praise it, it is because of what is commonly said that self-praise debaseth. But my squire will inform you who I am. I only tell you that I shall preserve forever inscribed on my memory the service you have rendered me in order to tender you my gratitude while life shall last me, and would to heaven love held me not so enthralled and subject to its laws and to the eyes of that fair ingrate whom I name between my teeth, but that those of this lovely damsel might be the masters of my liberty. The hostess, her daughter, and the worthy Maritornes listened in bewilderment, listened in bewilderment to the words of the knight-errant, for they understood about as much of them as if he had been talking Greek, though they could perceive they were all meant for expressions of goodwill and blandishments, and not being accustomed to this kind of language, they stared at him and wondered to themselves for he seemed to them a man of a different sort from those they were used to, and thanking him in pothouse phrase for his civility, they left him, while the Asturian gave her attention to Sancho, who needed it no less than his master. The carrier had made an arrangement with her for recreation that night, and she had given him her word that when the guests were quiet and the family asleep, she would come in search of him and meet his wishes unreservedly. And it is said of this good lass that she never made promises of the kind without fulfilling them, even though she made them in a forest and without any witness present, for she plumed herself greatly on being a lady, 
and held it no disgrace to be in such an employment as servant in an inn, because, she said, misfortunes and ill luck had brought her to that position. The hard, narrow, wretched, rickety bed of Don Quixote stood first in the middle of this starlit stable, and close beside it Sancho made his, which merely consisted of a rush mat and a blanket that looked as if it was of threadbare canvas rather than of wool. Next to these two beds was that of the carrier, made up, as has been said, and all the trappings of the two best mules he had, though there were twelve of them, sleek, plump, and in prime condition, for he was one of the rich carriers of Arevalo, according to the author of this history, who particularly mentions this carrier because he knew him very well, and they even say was in some degree a relation of his. Besides which, Chidi Harnete Benengeli was a historian of great research and accuracy in all things, as is very evident, since he would not pass over in silence those that have been already mentioned, however trifling and insignificant they might be, an example that might be followed by those grave historians who relate transactions so curtly and briefly that we hardly get a taste of them, all the substance of the work being left in the inkstand from carelessness, perverseness, or ignorance. A thousand blessings on the author of Tablante de Ricamonte and that of the other book in which the deeds of the Conde Tomillas are recounted. With what minuteness they describe everything. To proceed, then, after having paid a visit to his team and given them their second feed, the carrier stretched himself on his pack saddles and lay waiting for his conscientious maritornes. Sancho was by this time plastered and had laid down, and though he strove to sleep, the pain of his ribs would not let him, while Don Quixote, with the pain of his, had his eyes as wide open as a hare's. The inn was all in silence, and in the whole of it there was no light except that given by a lantern that hung burning in the middle of the gateway. This strange stillness, and the thoughts always present to our knight's mind, of the incidents described at every turn in the books that were the cause of his misfortune, conjured up to his imagination as extraordinary a delusion as can well be conceived, which was that he fancied himself to have reached a famous castle, for, as has been said, all the inns he lodged in were castles to his eyes, and that the daughter of the innkeeper was daughter of the lord of the castle, and that she, won by his high-bred bearing, had fallen in love with him, and had promised to come to his bed for a while that night without the knowledge of her parents, and holding all this fantasy that he had constructed as solid fact, he began to feel uneasy and to consider the perilous risk which his virtue was about to encounter, and he resolved in his heart to commit no treason to his lady Dulcinea del Toboso, even though the Queen Guinevere herself and the Dame Quintanona should present themselves before him. While he was taken up with these vagaries, then, the time and the hour, and a lucky one for him, arrived for the Asturian to come, who in her smock, with bare feet, and her hair gathered into a fustian coif, with noiseless and cautious steps entered the chamber where the three were quartered, in quest of the carrier. But scarcely had she gained the door, when Don Quixote perceived her, and sitting up in his bed, in spite of his plasters and the pain of his ribs, he stretched out his arms to receive his beauteous damsel. The Asturian, who went all doubled up, and in silence with her hands before her, feeling for her lover, encountered the arms of Don Quixote, who grasped her tightly by the wrist, and drawing her towards him, while she dared not utter a word, made her sit down on the bed. He then felt her smock, and, although it was of sackcloth, it appeared to him to be of the finest and softest silk. On her wrists she wore some glass beads, but to him they had the sheen of precious orient pearls. Her hair, which in some measure resembled a horse's mane, he rated as threads of the brightest golds of Araby, whose refulgence dimmed the sun himself. Her breath, which no doubt smelt of yesterday's stale salad, seemed to him to diffuse a sweet aromatic fragrance from her mouth, and in short, he drew her portrait in his imagination, with the same features and in the same style as that which he had seen 
in his books of the other princesses who, smitten by love, came with all the adornments that are here set down to see the sorely wounded knight, and so great was the poor gentleman's blindness that neither touch nor smell nor anything else about the good lass that would have made any but a carrier vomit were enough to undeceive him. On the contrary, he was persuaded that he had the goddess of beauty in his arms, and holding her firmly in his grasp, he went on to say in a low, tender voice, Would that found myself, lovely and exalted lady, in a position to repay such a favour as that which you, by the sight of your great beauty, have granted me. But fortune, which is never weary of persecuting the good, has chosen to place me upon this bed, where I lie so bruised and broken, that though my inclination would gladly comply with yours, it is impossible. Besides, to this impossibility another yet greater is to be added, which is the faith that I have pledged to the peerless Dulcinea del Toboso, sole lady of my most secret thoughts, and were it not that this stood in the way, I should not be so insensible a knight as to miss the happy opportunity which your great goodness has offered me. Maritornes was fretting and sweating at finding herself held so fast by Don Quixote, and not understanding or heeding the words he addressed to her, she strove without speaking to free herself. The worthy carrier, whose unholy thoughts kept him awake, was aware of his doxy the moment she entered the door, and was listening attentively to all Don Quixote said, and jealous that the Asturian should have broken her word with him for another, drew nearer to Don Quixote's bed, and stood still to see what would come of this talk which he could not understand. But when he perceived the wench struggling to get free, and Don Quixote striving to hold her, not relishing the joke, he raised his arm and delivered such a terrible cuff on the lank jaws of the amorous knight, that he bathed all his mouth in blood, and not content with this, he mounted on his ribs, and with his feet tramped all over them at a pace rather smarter than a trot. The bed, which was somewhat crazy and not very firm on its feet, unable to support the additional weight of the carrier, came to the ground, and at the mighty crash of this the innkeeper awoke, and at once concluded that it must be some brawl of Maritornes, because after calling loudly to her he got no answer. With this suspicion he got up, and lighting a lamp, hastened to the quarter where he had heard the disturbance. The wench, seeing that her master was coming, and knowing that his temper was terrible, frightened and panic-stricken, made for the bed of Sancho Panza, who still slept, and crouching upon it, made a ball of herself. The innkeeper came in, exclaiming, "'Where art thou, strumpet? Of course this is some of thy work.' At this Sancho awoke, and feeling this mass almost on top of him, fancied he had a nightmare, and began to distribute fisticuffs all around, of which a certain share fell upon Maritornes, who, irritated by the pain and flinging modesty aside, paid back so many in return to Sancho that she woke him up in spite of himself. He then, finding himself so handled, by whom he knew not, raising himself up as well as he could, grappled with Maritornes, and he and she between them began the bitterest and drollest scrimmage in the world. The carrier, however, perceiving by the light of the innkeeper candle how it fared with his lady love, quitting Don Quixote, ran to bring her the help she needed, and the innkeeper did the same, but with a different intention, for his was to chastise the lass, as he believed that beyond a doubt she alone was the cause of all the harmony. And so, as the saying is, Catch to rat, rat to rope, rope to stick. The carrier pounded Sancho, Sancho the lass, she him, and the innkeeper her, and all worked away so briskly that they did not give themselves a moment's rest, and the best of it was that the innkeeper's lamp went out, and as they were left in the dark, they all laid on one upon the other in a mass so unmercifully that there was not a sound spot left where a hand could light. It so happened that there was lodging that night in the inn a quadrillo of what they call the old holy brotherhood of Toledo, who also hearing the extraordinary noise of the conflict, seized his staff and the tin case with his warrants, and made his way in the dark into the room, crying, Hold! In the name of jurisdiction! Hold! In the name of the holy brotherhood! The first that he came upon 
was the pummeled Don Quixote, who lay stretched senseless on his back upon his broken-down bed, and his hand falling on the beard as he felt about. He continued to cry, Help for the jurisdiction! But perceiving that he whom he had laid hold of did not move or stir, he concluded that he was dead, and that those in the room were his murderers, and with this suspicion he raised his voice still higher, calling out, Shut the ingate! See that no one goes out! They have killed a man here! This cry startled them all, and each dropped the contest at the point at which the voice reached him. The innkeeper retreated to his room, the carrier to his pack-saddles, the lass to her crib. The unlucky Don Quixote and Sancho alone were unable to move from where they were. The quadrillero on this let go Don Quixote's beard, and went out to look for a light to search for, and apprehend the culprits, but not finding one, as the innkeeper had purposely extinguished the lantern on retreating to his room, he was compelled to have recourse to the hearth, where after much time and trouble he lit another lamp. End of chapter 16 Recorded by Gesine in April 2007「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen Dang. Don Quixote, Volume 1 by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Part 9, Chapter 17, in which are contained the innumerable troubles which the brave Don Quixote and his good squire Sancho Panza endured in the inn, which to his misfortune he took to be a castle. By this time Don Quixote had recovered from his swoon, and in the same tone of voice in which he had called to his squire the day before, when he lay stretched in the vale of the stakes, he began calling to him now, Sancho, my friend, art thou asleep? Sleepest thou, friend Sancho? How can I sleep? Curses on it, returned Sancho discontently and bitterly, when it is plain that all the devils have been at me this night. Thou mayest well believe that, answered Don Quixote, because either I know little, or this castle is enchanted, for thou must know, but this that I am now about to tell thee thou must swear to keep secret until after my death. I swear it, answered Sancho. I say so, continued Don Quixote, because I hate taking away anyone's good name. I say, replied Sancho, that I swear to hold my tongue about it till the end of your worship's days, and gone grat, I may be able to let it out tomorrow. Do I do thee such injuries, Sancho? said Don Quixote that thou wouldst see me dead so soon. It is not for that, replied Sancho, but because I hate keeping things long, and I don't want them to grow rotten with me from over-keeping. At any rate, said Don Quixote, I have more confidence in thy affection and good nature, and so I would have thee know that this night there befall me one of the strangest adventures that I could describe, and to relate to it, thou briefly thou must know that a little while ago the daughter of the lord of this castle came to me and she is the most elegant and beautiful damsel that could be found in the wide world what i could tell thee of the charms of her person her lovely wit of her secret matters which to preserve the filthy i owe to my lady dulcinea del toboso i shall pass over unnoticed and in silence i will only tell thee that either fate being envious of so great a boon placed in my hands of my good fortune or perhaps and this is more probable this castle being as i have already said enchanted at the time when i was engaged in the sweetest and most amorous discourse with her there came without me seeing or knowing whence it came a hand attached to some arm of some huge giant that planted some such a cup on my jaws that i have them all bathed in blood and then pummeled me in such a way that i am worse plight than yesterday when the carriers on account of Rigonante's misbehavior inflicted on us the injury thou knowest of whence conjecture that there must be some enchanted moor guarding the treasure of this damsel's beauty and that it is not for me not for me either said sancho for more than four hundred moors have so thrashed me that the drubbing of the stakes was cakes and fancy bread to it but tell me senor what do you call this excellent and rare adventure that has left us as we are left now though your worship was not so badly off having in your arms the incomparable beauty you spoke of but i what did i have except the heaviest wax that i think i had in all my life unlucky me and the mother that bore me for i am not a knight errant and never expect to be one and all the mishaps the greater part falls to my share then thou hast been stashed too said don quixote didn't i say so worse luck to my line said sancho 
Be not distressed, friend, said Don Quixote, for I will now make the precious balsam which we shall cure ourselves in the twinkling of an eye. By this time the quadrero had succeeded in lighting the lamp, and came in to see the men that he had thought been killed, and as Sancho caught sight of him at the door, seeing him coming in a shirt with a cloth on his head and a lamp in his hand, and a very forbidden countenance, he said to his master, Senor, can it be that this the enchanted moor coming back to give us more castination if there anything still left in the ink bottle? It cannot be the moor, answered Don Quixote, for those under enchantment do not let themselves be seen by any one. If they do not let themselves be seen, they let themselves be felt, said Sancho. If not, let my shoulder speak to the point. Mine could speak too, said Don Quixote, but that is not a sufficient reason for believing that what we see is the enchanted moor. The officer came up, and finding them engaged in such a peaceful conversation, stood amazed, though Don Quixote, to be sure, still lay on his back, unable to move from pure pummeling and plasters. The officer turned to him and said, Well, how goes it, good man? I would speak more politely if I were you, replied Don Quixote. Is it the way of this country to address knight errands in that style, you booby? The quadrulero, finding himself so disrespectfully treated by such a sorry-looking individual, lost his temper, and raising the lamp full of oil, smote Don Quixote with such a blow with it on the head that he gave him a badly broken pate. Then, all being in darkness, he went out, and Sancho Panza said, That is certainly the enchanted moor, senor, and he keeps the treasure for others, and for us only the cuffs and lamp-wax. That is the truth, answered Don Quixote, and there is no use of troubling oneself about these matters of enchantment or being angry or vexed at them, for as they are as invisible and visionary, we shall find no one on whom to avenge ourselves. Do what we may, rise, Sancho, if thou canst, and call the alcade of this forest, and get him to give me a little oil, wine, salt, and rosemary to make the sorcerer's balsam, for indeed I believe that I have great need of it now, because I am losing much blood from the wound that Phantom gave me. Sancho got up with pain enough in his bones, and went after the innkeeper in the dark, and meeting the officer, who was looking to see what had become of his enemy, he said to him, Senor, whoever you are, do us the favor and kindness to give us a little rosemary, oil, salt, and wine, for it is wanted to cure one of our best knights errant on earth, who lies on yonder bed, wounded by the hands of the enchanted moor that is in this inn. When the officer heard him talk in this way, he took him for a man out of his senses, and as day was now beginning to break, he opened the inn gate, and calling the host, he told him what this good man wanted. The host furnished him with what he required, and Sancho brought it to Don Quixote, who, with his hand to his head, was bewailing the pain of the blow of the lamp, which had done him no more than raising a couple of rather large lumps, and what he fancied blood was only the sweat that flowed from him in his sufferings during the late storm. To be brief, he took the materials of which he made a compound, mixing them all and boiling them a good while it until it seemed to him they had come to perfection he then asked for some vial to pour it into and there was not one in the inn he decided on putting it into a tin oil bottle or flask of which the host made him a free gift and over the flask he repeated more than eighty paternosters and as many more ave marias salves and credos accompanying each word with a cross by the way of benediction at all which there were present sancho the innkeeper and the quadrunero for the carrier was now peacefully engaged in attending to the comfort of his mules this being accomplished he felt anxious to make trial himself on the spot of the virtue of this precious balsam and as he considered it and so he drank near a quart of what could not be put into the flask and remained in the pigskin in which it had been boiled but scarcely had he done drinking when he began to vomit in such a way that nothing was left in his stomach and with the pangs and spasms of vomiting he broke into a profuse sweat on account of which he bade them cover him up and leave him alone they did so and he lay sleeping more than three hours at the end of which he awoke and felt great bodily relief and so much ease from his bruises that he thought himself quite cured and verily believed that he had hit upon the balsam of fair brass and that with this remedy he might thenceforward without any fear face any kind of destruction battle or combat however perilous it might be sancho panza who also regarded the amendment of his master as miraculous begged him to give him what was left in the pigskin which was no small quantity Don Quixote consented, and he, taking it with both hands, in good faith, and with a better will, gulped it down and drained off very little less than his master. But the fact is that the stomach of poor Sancho was of necessity not so delicate as that of his master, and so, before vomiting, he was seized with such gripings and retchings and such sweats and faintness that verily and truly be believed his last hour had come, and finding himself so racked and tormented, he cursed the balls and the thief that had given it to him. 
Don Quixote, seeing him in this state, said, It is my belief, Sancho, that this mischief comes not of thy being dubbed a knight, for I am persuaded this liquor cannot be good for those who are not so. If your worship knew that, returned Sancho, woe betide me and all my kindred, why did you let me taste it? At this moment the draught took effect, and the poor squire began to discharge both ways at such a rate that the rush mat on which he had thrown himself and the canvas blanket he had covering him were fit for nothing afterwards. He sweated and perspired with such paroxysms and convulsions that not only he himself, but all the present thought his end had come. This tempest and tribulation lasted about two hours, at the end of which he was left, not like his master, but so weak and exhausted that he could not stand. Don Quixote, however, was, as has been said, felt himself relieved and well, and was eager to take his departure at once in quest of adventures, as it seemed to him that all the time he loitered there was a fraud upon the world and those in it who stood in need of his help and protection, all the more when he had the security and confidence in Balsam afforded him. And so, urged by this impulse, he saddled Riconante himself and put the pack saddle on his squire's breast, whom likewise he helped to dress and mount the ass, after which he mounted his horse, and turning to a corner of the inn, he laid hold of a pike that stood there, to serve him by way of a lance. All that were in the inn, who were more than twenty persons, stood watching him. The innkeeper's daughter was likewise observing him, and he too never took his eyes off her, and from time to time fetched a sigh that he seemed to pluck up from the dust of his bowels, but they all thought it must be from the pain he felt in his ribs, and at any rate they who had seen him plastered the night before thought so. As soon as they both mounted at the gate of the inn, he called to the host and said in a very grave and measured voice, Many and great are the favors, Signor Alcade, and that I have received in this castle of yours and I remain under the deepest obligation to be grateful to you for them all the days of my life. If I can repay them in avenging you of any arrogant foe who may have wronged you, know that my calling is no other than to aid the weak, to avenge those who suffer wrong, and to chastise perfidy. Search your memory, and if you find anything of this kind, you need only tell me of it, and I promise you by the order of knighthood which I have received to procure you satisfaction and reparation to the utmost of your desire. The innkeeper boy to him with equal calmness sir knight i do not want your worship to avenge me of any wrong because when any is done me i can take what vengeance seems good to me the only thing i want is that you pay me the score that you have run up in the inn last night as well for the straw and barley of your two beasts as for supper and beds then this is an inn said don quixote and a very respectable one said the innkeeper i have been under a mistake all this time answered don quixote for in truth I thought this was a castle, and not a bad one, but since it appears that it is not a castle but an inn, all that can be done now is that you should excuse the payment, for I cannot contravene the rules of knight errant, of whom I know as a fact, and up to the present I have read nothing to the contrary, that they never paid for lodging or anything else in the inn where they might be, for any hospitality that might be offered them is their due by law, and right in return for the insufferable toil they endure in seeking adventures by night and by day, in summer and in winter, on foot and on horseback, in hunger and thirst, cold and heat, exposed to all the inclemencies of heaven and the hardships of earth. I have little to do with that, replied the innkeeper. Pay me what you owe me, and let us have no more talk of chivalry, for all I care about is to get my money. You are a stupid, scurvy innkeeper, said Don Quixote, and putting spurs to Riconante and bringing his pike to the slope, he rode out of the inn before anyone could stop him, and pushed on some distance without looking to see if his squire was following him. The innkeeper, when he saw him go without paying him, ran to get payment of Sancho, who said that as his master would not pay, neither would he because, being as he was squire to a knight errant, the same rule and reason how good for him as for his master with regard to not paying anything in inns and holsteries. And at this the innkeeper waxed very wroth and threatened if he did not pay to compel him in a way that he would not like, to which Sancho made answer that by the law of chivalry his master had received he would not pay a rap, though it cost him his life, for the excellent and ancient usage of nice errands was not going to be violated by him, nor should the squires of such as were yet to come into the world ever complain of him or reproach him without breaking so just a privilege. The ill luck of the unfortunate Sancho so ordered that among the company in the inn there are four wool carters from Segovia, three needle makers from the colts of Cordoba, and two lodgers from this fair Seville, lively fellows, tender hearted, fond of a joke, and playful who, almost as if instigated and moved by a common impulse, made up to Sancho and dismounted him from his ass, while one of them went in for the blanket of the host's bed. But on flinging him into they looked up, 
and seeing that the ceiling was somewhat lower than what they required for their work, they decided upon going out into the yard, which was bounded by the sky, and there, putting Sancho in the middle of the blanket, they began to raise him high, making sport with him as they would with the dog at strove time. The cries of the poor blanketed wretch were so loud that they reached the ears of his master, who, halting to listen attentively, was persuaded that some new adventure was coming, until he clearly perceived that it was his squire who uttered them. Wheeling about, he came up to the inn with a laborious gallop, and finding it shut, went round to see if he could find some way of getting in. But as soon as he came to the wall of the yard, which was not very high, he discovered the game that was being played with his squire. He saw him rising and falling in the air with such grace and nimbleness that had his rage allowed him, it is my belief he would have laughed. He tried to climb from his horse onto the top of the wall, but he was so bruised and battered that he could not even dismount. And so, from the back of his horse, he began to utter such maledictions and objurgations against those who were blanketing Sancho as it would be impossible to write down accurately. They, however, did not stay their laughter or their work for this, nor did the flying Sancho seize his lamentations, mingled now with threats, now the entreaties, but all to little purpose, or none at all, until from pure weariness they left off. They then brought him his ass, and mounting him on top of it, they put his jacket round him, and the compassionate Maritone, seeing him so exhausted, thought fit to refresh him with a jug of water, and that it might be all the cooler she fetched it from the well. Sancho took it, and as he was raising it to his mouth, he was stopped by the cries of his master, exclaiming, Sancho, my son, drink not water, drink it not, my son, for it will kill thee. See, here I have the blessed balsam, and he held up the flask of liquor, and with drinking two drops of it thou wilt certainly be restored. At these words, Sancho turned his eyes a squint, and in a still louder voice said, Can it be your worship has forgotten that I am not a knight, or do you want me to end up by vomiting what bowels I have left after last night? Keep your liquor in the name of all the devils, and leave me to myself. And at one and the same instant he left off talking and began drinking. But as the first sup he proceeded to his water, he did not care to go on with it, and begged Meritornius to fetch him some wine, which she did with a right good will and paid for it with her own money. For indeed they say of her that, though she was in that line of life, there is some faint and distant resemblance to a Christian about her. When Sancho had done drinking, he dug his heels into his ass, and the gate of the inn being thrown open, he passed up very well pleased at having paid nothing and carried his point, though it had been at the expense of his usual sureties his shoulders. It is true that the innkeeper detained his alforges in payment of what was owing to him, but Sancho took his departure in such a flurry that he never missed him. The innkeeper, as soon as he saw him off, wanted to bar the gate close, but the blanketers would not agree to it, for they were fellows who would not have cared two farthings for Don Quixote, even had he been really one of the knight-errants of the round table. End of Part 9 Chapter 17This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marion Brown, Toronto, Canada. Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Volume 1. Part 7. Chapter 18. In which is related the discourse Sancho Panza held with his master Don Quixote and other adventures worth relating. Sancho reached his master so limp and faint that he could not urge on his beast. When Don Quixote saw the state he was in, he said, I have now come to the conclusion, good Sancho, that this castle or inn is beyond a doubt enchanted, because those who have so atrociously diverted themselves with thee, what can they be but phantoms or beings of another world? And I hold this confirmed by having noticed that when I was by the wall of the yard witnessing the acts of thy sad tragedy, it was out of my power to mount upon it, nor could I even dismount from Rosinant, because they no doubt had me enchanted. For I swear to thee by the faith of what I am, that if I had been able to climb up or dismount, I would have avenged thee in such a way that those braggart thieves would have remembered their freak forever." even though in so doing I knew that I contravened the laws of chivalry, which, as I have often told thee, do not permit a knight to lay hands on him who is not one, save in case of urgent and great necessity, in defense of his own life and person. I would have avenged myself too if I could, said Sancho, whether I had been dubbed knight or not, 
but I could not, though for my part I am persuaded those who amused themselves with me were not phantoms or enchanted men, as your worship says, but men of flesh and bone like ourselves. And they all had their names, for I heard them name them when they were tossing me, and one was called Pedro Martinez, and another Tenorio Hernandez, and the innkeeper, I heard, was called Juan Palamique, the left-handed, so that, Signor, your not being able to leap over the wall of the yard or dismount from your horse came of something else besides enchantments. And what I make clearly from all of this is that these adventures we go seeking will in the end lead us into such misadventures that we shall not know what is our right foot, and that the best and wisest thing, according to my small wits, would be for us to return home, now that it is harvest time, and attend to our business, and give over wandering from Zecca to Mecca, and from pail to bucket, as the saying is. How little thou knowest about chivalry, Sancho, replied Don Quixote, hold thy peace and have patience, the day will come when thou shalt see with thine own eyes what an honourable thing it is to wander in the pursuit of this calling. Nay, tell me, what greater pleasure can there be in the world, or what delight can equal that of winning a battle, and triumphing over one's enemy? None beyond all doubt. Very likely, answered Sancho, though I do not know it. All I know is that since we have been knights errant, or since your worship has been one, for I have no right to reckon myself one of so honourable a number. We have never won any battle except the one with the Biscayne, and even that out of your worship came with half an ear and half a helmet the less, and from that till now it has been all cudgelings and more cudgelings, cuffs and more cuffs, I getting the blanketing over and above, and falling in with enchanted persons on whom I cannot avenge myself, so as to know what the delight, as your worship calls it, of conquering an enemy is like. That is what vexes me, and what ought to vex thee, Sancho, replied Don Quixote, but henceforward I will endeavour to have at hand some sword made by such craft, that no kind of enchantments can take effect upon him who carries it, and it is even possible that fortune may procure for me that which belonged to the Amadas when he was called the Knight of the Burning Sword which was one of the best swords that ever knight in the world possessed. For, besides having the said virtue, it cut like a razor, and there was no armor, however strong and enchanted it might be, that could resist it. Such is my luck, said Sancho, that even if that happened, and your worship found some such sword, it would, like the balsam, turn out serviceable and good for dubbed knights only, and as for the squires, they might sup sorrow." Fear not that, Sancho, said Don Quixote. Heaven will deal better by thee. Thus talking, Don Quixote and his squire were going along. When, on the road they were following, Don Quixote perceived approaching them a large and thick cloud of dust, on seeing which he turned to Sancho and said, This is the day, Sancho, on which will be seen the boon of my fortune is reserving for me, this, I say, is the day on which as much as on any other shall be displayed the might of my arm, and on which I shall do deeds that shall remain written in the book of fame for all ages to come. Seest thou that cloud of dust which rises yonder? Well then, all that is churned up by a vast army composed of various and countless nations that comes marching there. According to that there must be too, said Sancho, for on this opposite side also there rises just such another cloud of dust. Don Quixote turned to look, and found that it was true, and rejoicing exceedingly, he concluded that there were two armies about to engage and encounter in the midst of that broad plain, for at all times and seasons his fancy was full of the battles, enchantments, adventures, crazy feats, loves, and defiances that are recorded in the books of chivalry, and everything he said, thought, or did, had reference to such things. Now the cloud of dust he had seen was raised by two great droves of sheep, coming along the same road in opposite directions, which, because of the dust, did not become visible until they drew near. But Don Quixote asserted so positively that they were armies that Sancho was led to believe it and say, Well, what are we to do, senor? What, said Don Quixote? Give aid and assistance to the weak, 
and those who need it. And thou must know, Sancho, that this which comes opposite to us is conducted and led by the mighty emperor Alephanfaron, lord of the great isle of Trapobana. This other that marches behind me is that of his enemy, the king of the Garamantas, Pentapolin of the bare arm, for he always goes into battle with his right arm bare. But why are these two lords such enemies? They are at enmity, replied Don Quixote, because this Alifanfaron is a furious pagan and is in love with the daughter of Pentapolin, who is a very beautiful and moreover gracious lady and a Christian, and her father is unwilling to bestow her upon the pagan king unless he first abandons the religion of his false prophet Mahomet and adopts his own. By my beard, said Sancho, but Pentapolin does quite right, and I will help him as much as I can. In that thou wilt do what is thy duty, Sancho, said Don Quixote, for to engage in battles of this sort it is not requisite to be a dubbed knight. That I can well understand, answered Sancho, but where shall we put this ass where we may be sure to find him after the fray is over? For I believe it has not been the custom so far to go into battle on a beast of this kind. That is true, said Don Quixote, and what you had best do with him is to leave him to take his chances whether he be lost or not, for the horses we shall have when we come out victors will be so many that even Rosinant will run a risk of being changed for another. But attend to me and observe, for I wish to give thee some account of the chief knights who accompany these two armies, and that thou mayest the better see and mark, let us withdraw to that hillock which rises yonder, whence both armies may be seen. They did so, and placed themselves on a rising ground, from which the two droves that Don Quixote made armies of might have been plainly seen if the clouds of dust they raised had not obscured them and blinded the sight. Nevertheless, seeing in his imagination what he did not see, and what did not exist, he began thus in a loud voice. That knight whom thou seest yonder in yellow armor, who bears upon his shield a lion crowned crouching at the feet of a damsel, is the valiant Lorcalco, lord of the silver bridge, that one in armor with flowers of gold, who bears on his shield three crowns argent on an azure field, is the dreaded Mocolembo, Grand Duke of Curacia. That other of gigantic frame on his right hand is the ever dauntless Branda Barbaran de Boliche, Lord of the Three Arabias, who for armor wears that serpent skin, and has for shield a gate which, according to tradition, is one of those of the temple that Samson brought to the ground when by his death he revenged himself upon his enemies. But turn thine eyes to the other side, and thou shalt see in front, and in the van of this other army, the ever-victorious and never-vanquished Timonol of Carciona, prince of New Biscay, who comes in armor with arms quartered azure, vert, white, and yellow, and bears on his shield a cat, or on a field tawny, with a motto that says, Mayu, which is the beginning of the name of his lady who according to report is the peerless Maiolina, daughter of the Archduke Alfenequen of the Algarve. The other, who burdens and presses the loins of that powerful charger, and bears arms white as snow, and a shield blank and without any device, is a novice knight, a Frenchman by birth, Pierre Papin by name, lord of the baronies of Utrecht, that other, who with iron-shod heels strikes the flanks of that nimble parti-colored zebra, and for arms bears azure ver, is the mighty duke of Nerbia, Esparta Filardo del Bosque, who bears for device on his shield an asparagus plant, with a motto in Castilian that says, Rastria mi suerte. And so he went on, naming a number of knights of one squadron or the other, out of his imagination, and to all he assigned offhand their arms, colors, devices, and mottoes, carried away by the illusions of his unheard-of craze, and without a pause he continued, People of diverse nations compose this squadron in front. Here are those that drink of the sweet waters of the famous Xanthus, those that scour the woody Massilian plains, 
those that sift the pure fine gold of Arabia Felix, those that enjoy the famed cool banks of the crystal Thermodon, those that in many and various ways divert the streams of the golden Pactolus, the Numidians, faithless in their promises, the Persians, renowned in archery, the Parthians and the Medes, that fight as they fly, the Arabs that ever shift their dwellings, the Scythians as cruel as they are fair, the Ethiopians with pierced lips, and an infinity of other nations whose features I recognize and descry, though I cannot recall their names. In this other squadron there come those that drink of the crystal streams of the olive-bearing Betes, those that make smooth their countenance with the water of the ever-rich and golden Tagus, those that rejoice in the fertilizing flow of the divine Genile, those that roam the Tartesian plains abounding in pasture, those that take their pleasure in the Elysian meadows of Jerez, the rich Mangigans crowned with ruddy ears of corn, the wearers of iron, old relics of the Gothic race, those that bathe in the Pasquirga, known for its gentle current, those that feed their herds along the spreading pastures of the winding Guadinia, famed for its hidden course, those that tremble with the cold of the pine-clad Pyrenees, or the dazzling snow of the lofty Apennine, in a word, as many as all Europe includes and contains. Good God! What a number of countries and nations he named, giving to each its proper attributes with marvellous readiness, brimful and saturated with what he had read in his lying books. Sancho Panza hung upon his words without speaking, and from time to time turned to try if he could see the knights and giants his master was describing, and as he could not make out one of them, he said to him, Signor, devil take it if there's a sign of any man you talk of, knight or giant, in the whole thing. Maybe it's all enchantment, like the phantoms last night. How canst thou say that? answered Don Quixote. Dost thou not hear the neighing of the steeds, the braying of the trumpets, the roll of the drums? I hear nothing but a great bleeding of ewes and sheep, said Sancho, which was true, for by this time the two flocks had come close. The fear thou art in, Sancho, said Don Quixote, prevents thee from seeing or hearing correctly, for one of the effects of fear is to derange the senses and make things appear different from what they are. If thou art in such fear, withdraw to one side and leave me to myself, for alone I suffice to bring victory to that side to which I shall give my aid. And in so saying, he gave Roxinant the spur, and putting the lance in rest, shot down the slope like a thunderbolt. Sancho shouted after him, crying, Come back, Signor Don Quixote. I vow to God they are sheep and ewes you are charging. Come back. Unlucky the father that begot me. What madness is this? Look, there is no giant, nor knight, nor cats, nor arms, nor shields quartered or whole, nor ver azure or bedeviled. What are you about? Sinner that I am before God. But not for all these entreaties did Don Quixote turn back. On the contrary, he went on shouting out, Ho, knights, ye who follow and fight under the banners of the valiant Emperor Pentapolin of the bare arm, follow me all. Ye shall see how easily I shall give him his revenge over his enemy Ali Fanfaron of the Trapobana. So saying, he dashed into the midst of the squadron of ewes and began spearing them with as much spirit and intrepidity as if he were transfixing mortal enemies in earnest. The shepherds and drovers accompanying the flock shouted to him to desist. Seeing it was no use, they ungirt their slings and began to salute his ears with stones as big as one's fist. Don Quixote gave no heed to the stones, but letting drive right and left kept saying, where art thou, proud Ali Fanfaron? Come before me, I am a single knight who would fain prove thy prowess hand to hand, and make thee yield thy life a penalty for the wrong thou dost to the valiant Pentapolin Garamanta. Here came a sugar plum from the brook that struck him on the side and buried a couple of ribs in his body. 
Feeling himself so smitten, he imagined himself slain or badly wounded for certain, and recollecting his liquor, he drew out his flask, and putting it to his mouth, began to pour the contents into his stomach. But ere he had succeeded in swallowing what seemed to him enough, there came another almond, which struck him on the hand and on the flask so fairly that it smashed it to pieces, knocking three or four teeth and grinders out of his mouth in its course, and sorely crushing two fingers of his hand. Such was the force of the first blow and of the second, that the poor knight, in spite of himself, came down backwards off his horse. The shepherds came up and felt sure they had killed him. So in all haste they collected their flock together, took up the dead beasts, of which there were more than seven, and made off without waiting to ascertain anything further. All this time Sancho stood on the hill, watching the crazy feats his master was performing, and tearing his beard and cursing the hour and the occasion when fortune had made him acquainted with him. Seeing him then brought to the ground, and that the shepherds had taken themselves off, he ran to him and found him in very bad case, though not unconscious, and said he, Did I not tell you to come back, Signor Don Quixote, and that what you were going to attack were not armies but droves of sheep? That's how that thief of a sage, my enemy, can alter and falsify things, answered Don Quixote. Thou must know, Sancho, that it is a very easy matter for those of his sort to make us believe what they choose, and this malignant being who persecutes me envious of the glory he knew I was to win in this battle, has turned the squadrons of the enemy into droves of sheep. At any rate, do this much, I beg of thee, Sancho, to undeceive thyself, and see that what I say is true. Mount thy ass, and follow them quietly, and thou shalt see that when they have gone some little distance from this, they will return to their original shape, and ceasing to be sheep, become men in all respects, as I described them to thee at first. But go not just yet, for I want thy help and assistance. Come hither, and see how many of my teeth and grinders are missing, for I feel as if there was not one left in my mouth. Sancho came so close that he almost put his eyes into his mouth. Now just at that moment the balsam had acted on the stomach of Don Quixote, so at the very instant when Sancho came to examine his mouth, he discharged all its contents with more force than a musket, and full onto the beard of the compassionate squire. Holy Mary, cried Sancho, what is this that has happened to me? Clearly this sinner is mortally wounded, for he vomits blood from the mouth. But considering the matter a little more closely, he perceived by the color, taste, and smell that it was not blood, but the balsam from the flask which he had seen him drink, and was taken with such a loathing that his stomach turned, and he vomited up his insides over his very master, and both were left in a precious state. Sancho ran to his ass to get something wherewith to clean himself and relieve his master out of his alforias, but not finding them, he well nigh took leave of his senses and cursed himself anew, and in his heart resolved to quit his master and return home, even though he forfeited the wages of his service and all hopes of the promised land. Don Quixote now rose, and putting his left hand to his mouth to keep his teeth from falling out altogether, with the other he laid hold of the bridle of Rosinant, who had never stirred from his master's side. So loyal and well-behaved was he, and betook himself to where the squire stood leaning over his ass with his hand to his cheek like one in deep dejection. Seeing him in this mood, looking so sad, Don Quixote said to him, "'Bear in mind, Sancho, that one man is no more than another, unless he does more than another. All these tempests that fall upon us are signs that fair weather is coming shortly, and that things will go well with us, for it is impossible for good or evil to last forever, and hence it follows that the evil having lasted long, the good must be now nigh at hand. So thou must not distress thyself at the misfortunes which happen to me, since thou hast no share in them." How have I not? replied Sancho. Was he whom they blanketed yesterday perchance any other than my father's son? And the alforias that are missing today with all my treasures, did they belong to any other but myself? What? 
"'Are the Alfayoras missing, Sancho?' said Don Quixote. "'Yes, they are missing,' answered Sancho. "'In that case we have nothing to eat today,' replied Don Quixote. "'It would be so,' answered Sancho, "'if there were none of the herbs your worship says you know in these meadows, "'those with which knights errant, as unlucky as your worship, "'are wont to supply such like shortcomings.' "'For all that,' answered Don Quixote, "'I would rather have just now a quarter of bread "'or a loaf and a couple of pilchards' heads "'than all the herbs described by Deus Corides, "'even with Dr. Laguna's notes. "'Nevertheless, Sancho the Good, "'mount thy beast and come along with me, "'for God, who provides for all things, "'will not fail us, "'more especially when we are so active in his service as we are.' since he fails not the midges of the air, nor the grubs of the earth, nor the tadpoles of the water, and is so merciful that he maketh his sun to rise on the good and on the evil, and sendeth rain on the unjust and on the just. Your worship would make a better preacher than a knight-errant, said Sancho. Knights-errant knew and ought to know everything, Sancho, said Don Quixote, for there were knights-errant in former times, as well qualified to deliver a sermon or discourse in the middle of the encampment, as if they had graduated in the University of Paris, whereby we may see that the lance has never blunted the pen, nor the pen the lance. Well, be it as your worship says, replied Sancho, let us be off now, and find some place of shelter for the night, and God grant it may be somewhere where there are no blankets, nor blanketeers, nor phantoms, nor enchanted moors, for if there are, may the devil take the whole concern. Ask that of God, my son, said Don Quixote, and do thou lead on where thou wilt. For this time I leave our lodgings to thy choice, but reach me here thy hand, and feel with thy finger, and find out how many of my teeth and grinders are missing from this right side of the upper jaw, for it is there I feel the pain." Sancho put in his fingers, and feeling about, asked him, How many grinders used your worship have on this side? Four, replied Don Quixote, besides the back tooth, all whole and quite sound. Mind what you are saying, Signor. I say four, if not five, answered Don Quixote, for never in my life have I had tooth or grinder drawn, nor has any fallen out or been destroyed by any decay or room. Well then, said Sancho, in this lower side your worship has no more than two grinders and a half. In the upper neither a half nor any at all, for it is as smooth as the palm of my hand. Luckless that I am, said Don Quixote, hearing the sad news his squire gave him. I had rather they despoiled me of an arm, so it were not the sword arm. For I tell thee, Sancho, a mouth without teeth is like a mill without a millstone and a tooth is much more to be prized than a diamond. But we who profess the austere order of chivalry are liable to all this. Mount, friend, and lead the way, and I will follow thee at whatever pace thou wilt. Sancho did as he bade him, and proceeded in the direction in which he thought he might find refuge without quitting the high road, which was there very much frequented. As they went along then, at a slow pace, for the pain in Don Quixote's jaws kept him uneasy and ill-disposed for speed, Sancho thought it well to amuse and divert him by talk of some kind, and among the things he said to him was that which will be told in the following chapter. End of chapter 18 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marion Brown, Toronto, Canada. Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Volume 1, Chapter 19. Of the shrewd discourse which Sancho held with his master, and of the adventure that befell him with a dead body, together with other notable occurrences. It seems to me, Signor, that all these mishaps that have befallen us of late have been without any doubt a punishment for the offence committed by your worship against the order of chivalry in not keeping the oath you made not to eat bread off a tablecloth or embrace the queen, 
and all the rest of it that your worship swore to observe until you had taken that helmet of malandrinos, or whatever the moor is called, for I do not very well remember. Thou art very right, Sancho, said Don Quixote, but to tell the truth, it had escaped my memory, and likewise thou mayest rely upon it that the affair of the blanket happened to thee because of thy fault in not reminding me of it in time. But I will make amends, for there are ways of compounding for everything in the order of chivalry. Why, have I taken an oath of some sort then, said Sancho? It makes no matter that thou hast not taken an oath, said Don Quixote. Suffice it that I see thou art not quite clear of complicity, and whether or no, it will not be ill done to provide ourselves with a remedy. In that case, said Sancho, mind that your worship does not forget this, as you did the oath, Perhaps the phantoms may take it into their heads to amuse themselves once more with me, or even with your worship, if they see you so obstinate. While engaged in this and other talk, night overtook them on the road, before they had reached or discovered any place of shelter, and what made it still worse was that they were dying of hunger. For with the loss of the Alfayoras they had lost their entire larder and commissariat, and to complete the misfortune they met with an adventure which without any invention had really the appearance of one. It so happened that the night closed in somewhat darkly, but for all that they pushed on. Sancho, feeling sure that the road was the king's highway, they might reasonably expect to find some inn within a league or two. Going along then, in this way, the night dark, the squire hungry, the master sharp set, they saw coming towards them on the road, they were travelling, a great number of lights, which looked exactly like stars in motion. Sancho was taken aback at the sight of them, nor did Don Quixote altogether relish them. The one pulled up his ass by the halter, the other his hack by the bridle, and they stood still, watching anxiously to see what all this would turn out to be, and found that the lights were approaching them and the nearer they came, the greater they seemed. At which spectacle Sancho began to shake like a man, dosed with mercury, and Don Quixote's hair stood on end. He, however, plucking up spirit a little, said, This, no doubt, Sancho, will be the most mighty and perilous adventure, in which it will be needful for me to put forth all my valour and resolution. Unlucky me, answered Sancho, if this adventure happens to be one of phantoms, as I am beginning to think it is, where shall I find the ribs to bear it? Be they phantoms ever so much, said Don Quixote, I will not permit them to touch a thread of thy garments, for if they played tricks with thee the time before, it was because I was unable to leap the walls of the yard. But now we are on a wide plain, where I shall be able to wield my sword as I please." "'And if they enchant and cripple you as they did the last time?' said Sancho. "'What difference will it make being on the open plain or not?' "'For all that,' replied Don Quixote, "'I entreat thee, Sancho, to keep a good heart, "'for experience will tell thee what mine is.' "'I will, please God,' answered Sancho, "'and the two, retiring to one side of the road, "'set themselves to observe closely "'what all these moving lights might be.' and very soon afterwards they made out some twenty encamisados, all on horseback, with lighted torches in their hands, the awe-inspiring aspect of whom completely extinguished the courage of Sancho, who began to chatter with his teeth like one in the cold fit of an ague, and his heart sank and his teeth chattered still more when they perceived distinctly that behind them there came a litter covered over with black, and followed by six more mounted figures, in mourning down to the very feet of their mules, for they could perceive plainly they were not horses by the easy pace at which they went, and at the M. Camisados came along they muttered to themselves in a low plaintive tone. This strange spectacle at such an hour, and in such a solitary place, was quite enough to strike terror into Sancho's heart, and even into his master's. And save in Don Quixote's case, did so, for all Sancho's resolution had now broken down. It was just the opposite with his master, whose imagination immediately conjured all this to him vividly as one of the adventures of his books. He took it into his head that the litter was a bier on which was borne some sorely wounded or slain knight, 
to avenge whom was a task reserved for him alone, and without any further reasoning he laid his lance in rest, fixed himself firmly in his saddle, and with gallant spirit and bearing took up his position in the middle of the road, where the encamisados must of necessity pass, and as soon as he saw them near at hand, he raised his voice and said, Halt, knights, or whosoever ye may be, and render me account of who ye are, whence ye come, where ye go. What is it ye carry upon that bier? For to judge by appearances, either ye have done something wrong, or some wrong has been done to you. And it is fitting and necessary that I should know, either that I may chastise you for the evil ye have done, or else that I may avenge you for the injury that has been inflicted upon you. We are in haste, answered one of the encamisados, and the inn is far off, and we cannot stop to render you such an account as you demand, and spurring his mule he moved on. Don Quixote was mightily provoked by this answer, and seizing the mule by the bridle he said, Halt, and be more mannerly, and render an account of what I have asked of you, else take my defiance to combat all of you. The mule was shy, and was so frightened at her bridle being seized, that rearing up she flung her rider to the ground over her haunches. An attendant, who was on foot, seeing the encamisado fall, began to abuse Don Quixote, who now moved to anger, without any more ado, laying his lance in rest, charged one of the men in mourning, and brought him badly wounded to the ground. And as he wheeled around, upon the others, the agility with which he attacked and routed them was a sight to see, for it seemed just as if wings had that instant grown upon Rocinante, so lightly and proudly did he bear himself. The encamisados were all timid folk and unarmed, so they speedily made their escape from the fray, and set off at a run across the plain with their lighted torches, looking exactly like maskers running on some gala or festive night. The mourners, too, enveloped and swathed in their skirts and gowns, were unable to bestir themselves, and so with entire safety to himself, Don Quixote belabored them all and drove them off against their will, for they all thought it was no man but a devil from hell come to carry away the dead body they had in the litter. Sancho beheld all this in astonishment at the intrepidity of his lord, and said to himself, Clearly this master of mine is as bold and valiant as he says he is. A burning torch lay on the ground near the first man whom the mule had thrown, by the light of which Don Quixote perceived him, and coming up to him he presented the point of his lance to his face, calling on him to yield himself prisoner, or else he would kill him, to which the prostrate man replied, I am prisoner enough as it is. I cannot stir, for one of my legs is broken. I entreat you, if you be a Christian gentleman, not to kill me, which will be committing grave sacrilege, for I am a licentiate, and I hold first orders. Then what the devil brought you here, being a churchman? said Don Quixote. What, senor? said the other. My bad luck. Then still worse awaits you, said Don Quixote, if you do not satisfy me as to all I asked you at first. You shall be soon satisfied, said the licentiate, you must know, then, that though just now I said I was a licentiate, I am only a bachelor, and my name is Alonzo Lopez. I am a native of Alcobendas. I come from the city of Baeza, with eleven others, priests the same who fled with the torches, and we are going to the city of Segovia, accompanying a dead body which is in that litter, and is that of a gentleman who died in Baeza, where he was interred. And now, as I said, we are taking his bones to their burial place, which is in Segovia, where he was born. And who killed him? asked Don Quixote. God, by means of a malignant fever that took him, answered the bachelor. In that case, said Don Quixote, the Lord has relieved me of the task of avenging his death had any other slain him. But he who slew him, having slain him, there is nothing for it but to be silent and shrug one's shoulders. I should do the same were he to slay myself, and I would have your reverence know 
that I am a knight of La Mancha, Don Quixote by name, and it is my business and calling to roam the world, righting wrongs and redressing injuries. I do not know how that about righting wrongs can be, said the bachelor, for from straight you have made me crooked, leaving me with a broken leg that will never see itself straight again all the days of its life, and the injury you have redressed in my case has been to leave me injured in such a way that I shall remain injured forever, and the height of misadventure it was to fall in with you who go in search of adventures. Things do not all happen in the same way, answered Don Quixote. It all came, Sir Bachelor Alonso Lopez, of your going as it did by night, dressed in those surplices with lighted torches, praying, covered with mourning, so that naturally you looked like something evil and of the other world, and so I could not avoid doing my duty in attacking you, and I should have attacked you even had I known positively that you were the very devils of hell, for such I certainly believed and took you to be. As my fate has so willed it, said the bachelor, I entreat you, Sir Knight Errant, whose errand has been such an evil one for me, to help me to get from under this mule that holds one of my legs caught between the stirrup and the saddle. I would have talked on till tomorrow, said Don Quixote. How long were you going to wait before telling me of your distress? He at once called to Sancho, who, however, had no mind to come, as he was just then engaged in unloading a sumpter mule, well laden with provender, which these worthy gentlemen had brought with them. Sancho made a bag of his coat, and getting together as much as he could, and as the bag would hold, he loaded his beast, and then hastened to obey his master's call, and helped him to remove the bachelor from under the mule. Then putting him on her back, he gave him the torch, and Don Quixote bade him follow the track of his companions, and beg pardon of them on his part for the wrong which he could not help doing them. And that, Sancho, if by chance these gentlemen should want to know who was the hero that served them so, your worship may tell them that he is the famous Don Quixote of La Mancha, otherwise called the Knight of the Rueful Countenance. The bachelor then took his departure. I forgot to mention that before he did so, he said to Don Quixote, Remember that you stand excommunicated for having laid violent hands on a holy thing, juxta illud, si quies, Suadente Diablolo. I do not understand that Latin, answered Don Quixote, but I know well I did not lay hands, only this pike. Besides, I did not think I was committing an assault upon priests or things of the church, which like a Catholic and faithful Christian as I am, I respect and revere, but upon phantoms and spectres of the other world. But even so, I remember how it fared with Cid Roya Diaz, when he broke the chair of the ambassador of the king before his holiness the pope, who excommunicated him for the same, and yet the good Roderick of Vivar bore himself that day like a very noble and valiant knight. On hearing this, the bachelor took his departure, as has been said, and without making any reply, and Don Quixote asked Sancho what had induced him to call him the knight of the rueful countenance, more then than at any other time. I will tell you, answered Sancho, it was because I have been looking at you for some time by the light of the torch held by that unfortunate, and verily your worship has got of late the most ill-favored countenance I ever saw. It must be either owing to the fatigue of this combat, or else to the want of teeth and grinders. It is not that, replied Don Quixote, but because the sage, whose duty it will be to write the history of my achievements, must have thought it proper that I should take some distinctive name, as all knights of yore did, one being he of the burning sword, another he of the unicorn, this one he of the damsels, and he of the phoenix, another the knight of the griffin, and another he of the death, and by these names and designations they were known all the world round. And so I say that the sage aforesaid must have put it into your mouth and mine just now to call me the Knight of the Rueful Countenance, as I intend to call myself from this day forward, and that the said name may fit me better, I mean, when the opportunity offers, to have a very rueful countenance painted on my shield. 
There is no occasion, senor, for wasting time or money on making that countenance, said Sancho, for all that need be done is for your worship to show your own face to face to those who look at you, and without anything more, either image or shield, they will call you him of the rueful countenance, and believe me, I am telling you the truth. For I assure you, senor, and in good part be it said, hunger and the loss of your grinders have given you such an ill-favoured face that, as I say, the rueful picture may be very well spared. Don Quixote laughed at Sancho's pleasantry. Nevertheless, he resolved to call himself by that name, and have his shield or buckler painted as he had devised. Don Quixote would have looked to see whether the body and the litter were bones or not, but Sancho would not have it, saying, Signor, you have ended this perilous adventure more safely for yourself than any of those I have seen. Perhaps these people, though beaten and routed, may bethink themselves that it is a single man that has beaten them, and feeling sore and ashamed of it, may take heart and come in search of us, and give us trouble enough. The ass is in proper trim, the mountains are near at hand, hunger presses, we have nothing more to do but make good our retreat, and as the saying is, the dead to the grave and the living to the loaf. And driving his ass before him, he begged his master to follow, who, feeling that Sancho was right, did so without replying, and after proceeding some little distance between two hills, they found themselves in a wide and retired valley, where they alighted, and Sancho unloaded his beast, and stretched upon the green grass with hunger for sauce, they breakfasted, dined, lunched, and supped all at once, satisfying their appetites with more than one store of cold meat, which the dead man's clerical gentlemen, who seldom put themselves on short allowance, had brought with them on their sumpter mule. But another piece of ill luck befell them, which Sancho held the worst of all, and that was that they had no wine to drink, not even water to moisten their lips, and as thirst tormented them, Sancho, observing that the meadow where they were was full of green and tender grass, said what will be told in the following chapter. End of chapter 19 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marion Brown, Toronto, Canada. Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Volume 1 Chapter 20 Of the Unexampled and Unheard of Adventure Which Was Achieved by the Valiant Don Quixote of La Mancha With Less Peril Than Any Ever Achieved By Any Famous Knight in the World. It cannot be, Signor, that this grass is a proof that there must be hard by some spring or brook to give it moisture, so it would be well to move a little farther on that we may find some place where we may quench this terrible thirst that plagues us, which beyond a doubt is more distressing than hunger. The advice seemed good to Don Quixote, and he, leading Rocasinant by the bridle and Sancho the ass by the halter, after he had packed away upon him the remains of the supper, they advanced the meadow feeling their way, for the darkness of the night made it impossible to see anything, but they had not gone two hundred paces when a loud noise of water, as if falling from great rocks, struck their ears. The sound cheered them greatly, but halting to make out by listening from what quarter it came, they heard unseasonably another noise which spoiled the satisfaction the sound of the water gave them, especially for Sancho, who was by nature timid and faint-hearted. They heard, I say, strokes falling with a measured beat, and a certain rattling of iron and chains that, together with the furious din of the water, would have struck terror into any heart but Don Quixote's. The night was, as has been said, dark, and they had happened to reach a spot in among some tall trees, whose leaves stirred by a gentle breeze made a low ominous sound, so that, what with the solitude, the place, the darkness, 
the noise of the water, and the rustling of the leaves, everything inspired awe and dread, more especially as they perceived that the strokes did not cease, nor the wind lull, nor morning approach, to all which might be added their ignorance as to where they were. But Don Quixote, supported by his intrepid heart, leaped on Rosinant, and bracing his buckler on his arm, brought his pike to the slope, and said, Friend Sancho, knowing that I, by heaven's will, have been born in this our iron age, to revive in it the age of gold, or the golden, as it is called, I am he for whom perils, mighty achievements, and valiant deeds are reserved. I am, I say again, he who is to revive the knights of the round table, the twelve of France, and the nine worthies, and he who is to consign to oblivion the platiers, the tablants, the oliviants, and the tyrantes, the phoebuses, and the bellianuses, with the whole herd of famous knight-errant of days gone by, performing in these in which I live such exploits, marvels, and feats of arms, as shall obscure their brightest deeds. Thou dost mark well, faithful and trusty squire, the gloom of this night, its strange silence, the dull, confused murmur of those trees, the awful sound of that water in quest of which we came, that seems as though it were precipitating and dashing itself down from the lofty mountains of the moon, and that incessant hammering that wounds and pains our ears, which things altogether and each of itself are enough to instill fear, dread, and dismay into the breast of Mars himself, much more into one not used to hazards and adventures of the kind. Well then, all this that I put before thee is but an incentive and stimulant to my spirit, making my heart burst in my bosom through eagerness to engage in this adventure, arduous as it promises to be. Therefore, tighten Rosinant's girths a little, and God be with thee. Wait for me here three days and no more. And if in that time I come not back, thou canst return to our village, and thence to do me a favor and a service. Thou wilt go to El Tobazo, where thou shalt say to my incomparable lady Dulcinea that her captive knight hath died in attempting things that might make him worthy of being called hers. When Sancho heard his master's words, he began to weep in the most pathetic way, saying, Senor, I know not why your worship wants to attempt this so dreadful adventure. It is night now. No one sees us here. We can easily turn about and take ourselves out of danger, even if we don't drink for three days to come. And as there is no one to see us, all the less will there be any one to set us down as cowards. Besides, I have many a time heard the curate of our village, whom your worship knows well, preach that he who seeks danger perishes in it. So it is not right to tempt God by trying so tremendous a feat, from which there can be no escape save by a miracle. And heaven has performed enough of them for your worship in delivering you from being blanketed as I was, and bringing you out victorious and safe and sound from among all those enemies that were with the dead man. And if all this does not move or soften that hard heart, let this thought and reflection move it, that you have hardly quitted this spot, when from pure fear I shall yield my soul up to any one that will take it. I left home and wife and children to come and serve your worship, trusting to do better and not worse. But as covetousness bursts the bag, it has rent my hopes asunder, for just as I had them highest about getting that wretched unlucky island your worship has so often promised me, I see that instead, and in lieu of it, you mean to desert me now in a place so far from human reach. For God's sake, master mine, deal not so unjustly by me, and if your worship will not entirely give up attempting this feat, at least put it off till morning. For by what the lore I learned when I was shepherd tells me it cannot want three hours of dawn now, because the mouth of the horn is overhead and makes midnight in the line of the left arm. How canst thou see, Sancho, said Don Quixote, where it makes that line, or where this mouth, or this occiput, is that thou talkest of? 
when the night is so dark that there is not a star to be seen in the whole heaven. That's true, said Sancho, but fear has sharp eyes and sees things underground. Much more above in heavens besides, there is good reason to show that it now wants but little of day. Let it want what it may, replied Don Quixote. It shall not be said of me now or at any time that tears or entreaties turned me aside from doing what was in accordance with knightly usage, and so I beg of thee, Sancho, to hold thy peace, for God, who has put it into my heart to undertake now this so unexampled and terrible adventure, will take care to watch over my safety and console thy sorrow. What thou hast to do is to tighten Rosinant's girths well and wait here, for I shall come back shortly, alive or dead." Sancho, perceiving it his master's final resolve, and how little his tears, counsels, and entreaties prevailed with him, determined to have recourse to his own ingenuity and compel him, if he could, to wait till daylight. And so, while tightening the girths of the horse, he quietly and without being felt, with his ass's halter, tied both Rosinant's legs, so that when Don Quixote strove to go, he was unable as the horse could only move by jumps. Seeing the success of his trick, Sancho Panza said, See there, senor, heaven, moved by my tears and prayers, has so ordered it that Rosinant cannot stir, and if you will be obstinate and spur and strike him, you will only provoke fortune and kick, as they say, against the pricks. Don Quixote at this grew desperate, but the more he drove his heels into the horse, the less he stirred him, and not having any suspicion of the tying, he was fain to resign himself and wait till daybreak or until Rosinant could move, firmly persuaded that all this came of something other than Sancho's ingenuity. So he said to him, As it is so, Sancho, and as Rosinant cannot move, I am content to wait till dawn smiles upon us, even though I weep while it delays its coming. There is no need to weep, answered Sancho, for I will amuse your worship by telling stories from this till daylight, unless indeed you like to dismount and lie down to sleep a little on the green grass after the fashion of night's errand, so as to be fresher when day comes and the moment arrives for attempting this extraordinary adventure you are looking forward to. What art thou talking about, dismounting or sleeping for? said Don Quixote. Am I, thinkest thou, one of those knights that take their rest in the presence of danger? Sleep thou who art born to sleep, or do as thou wilt, for I will act as I think most consistent with my character. Be not angry, master mine, replied Sancho. I did not mean to say that. And coming close to him, he laid one hand on the pommel of the saddle, and the other on the cantle, so that he held his master's left thigh in his embrace, not daring to separate a finger's width from him. So much afraid was he of the strokes, which still resounded with a regular beat. Don Quixote bade him tell some story to amuse him, as he had proposed, to which Sancho replied that he would if his dread of what he heard would let him. Still, said he, I will strive to tell a story which, if I can manage to relate it, and nobody interferes with the telling, is the best of stories. And let your worship give me your attention, for here I begin." What was, was, and may the good that is to come be for all, and the evil for him that goes to look for it, your worship must know that the beginning of the old folk used to put to their tales was not just as each one pleased. It was a maxim of Cato Zorzorino the Roman that says the evil for him that goes to look for it, and it comes as pat to the purpose now as ring to finger, to show that your worship should keep quiet and not go looking for evil in any quarter, and that we should go back by some other road, since nobody forces us to follow this in which so many terrors affront us. Go on with thy story, Sancho, said Don Quixote, and leave the choice of our road to my care. I say then, continued Sancho, that in a village of Estremadura there was a goat shepherd, that is to say, one who tended goats, which shepherd or goat herd, as my story goes, was called Lope Ruez, 
and this Lope Ruez was in love with a shepherdess called Toralva, which shepherdesses called Toralva was the daughter of a rich grazier, and this rich grazier. If that is the way thou tellest thy tale, Sancho, said Don Quixote, repeating twice all thou hast to say, thou wilt not have done these two days. Go straight on with it, and tell it like a reasonable man, or else say nothing. Tales are always told in my country, in the very way I am telling this, answered Sancho, and I cannot tell it in any other, nor is it right of your worship to ask me to make new customs. Tell it as thou wilt, replied Don Quixote, and as fate will have it, that I cannot help listening to thee, go on. And so, lord of my soul, continued Sancho, as I have said, this shepherd was in love with Toraval the shepherdess, who was a wild, buxom lass, with something of the look of a man about her, for she had little moustaches. I fancy I see her now. Then you knew her? said Don Quixote. I did not know her, said Sancho, but he who told me the story said it was so true and certain that when I told it to another I might safely declare and swear I had seen it all myself. And so in course of time the devil, who never sleeps and puts everything in confusion, contrived that the love the shepherd bore the shepherdess turned into hatred and ill will, and the reason, according to evil tongues, was some little jealousy she caused him that crossed the line and trespassed on forbidden ground, and so much did the shepherd hate her from that time forward, in order to escape from her, he determined to quit the country and go where he should never set eyes on her again. Toralva, when she found herself spurned by Lope, was immediately smitten with love for him, though she had never loved him before. That is the natural way of women, said Don Quixote, to scorn the one that loves them and love the one that hates them. Go on, Sancho. It came to pass, said Sancho, that the shepherd carried out his intention and, driving his goats before him, took his way across the plains of Estremadura to pass over into the kingdom of Portugal. Toralva, who knew of it, went after him, and on foot and barefoot followed him at a distance, with a pilgrim's staff in her hand and a scrip round her neck, in which she carried, it is said, a bit of looking-glass and a piece of a comb and some little pot or other of paint for her face. But let her carry what she said. I'm not going to trouble myself to prove it. All I say is that the shepherd, they say, came with his flock to cross over the river Guadiana, which was at that time swollen and almost overflowing its banks. And at the spot he came to, there was neither ferry nor boat, nor any one to carry him or his flock to the other side, at which he was much vexed, for he perceived that Toralva was approaching, and would give him great annoyance with her tears and entreaties. However, he went looking about so closely that he discovered a fisherman who had alongside of him a boat so small that it could hold only one person and one goat. But for all that he spoke to him and agreed with him to carry himself and the three hundred goats across. The fisherman got into the boat and carried one goat over. He came back and carried another over. He came back again and again brought over another. Let your worship keep count of the goats the fisherman is taking across. For if one escapes the memory, there will be an end of the story, and it will be impossible to tell another word of it. To proceed, I must tell you the landing place on the other side was miry and slippery, and the fisherman lost a great deal of time in going and coming. Still he returned for another goat, and another, and another. Take it for granted he brought them all across, said Don Quixote, and don't keep going and coming in this way, or thou wilt not make an end of bringing them over this twelve month. How many have gone across so far, said Sancho. How the devil do I know, replied Don Quixote. There it is, said Sancho, what I told you, that you must keep a good count. Well then, by God, there is an end of the story, for there is no going any further. How can that be, said Don Quixote? Is it so essential to the story to know to a nicety the goats that have crossed over, that if there be a mistake of one in the reckoning thou canst not go on with it? No, senor, not a bit, 
replied Sancho, for when I asked your worship to tell me how many goats had crossed, and you answered you did not know, at that very instant all I had to say passed away out of memory and faith there was much virtue in it and entertainment. So then, said Don Quixote, the story has come to an end? As much as my mother has, said Sancho. In truth, said Don Quixote, thou hast told one of the rarest stories, tales, or histories that any one in the world could have imagined, and such a way of telling it and ending it was never seen, nor will be in a lifetime, though I expected nothing else from thy excellent understanding. But I do not wonder, for perhaps those ceaseless strokes may have confused thy wits. All that may be, replied Sancho, but I know that, as to my story, all that can be said is that it ends there, where the mistake in the count of the passage of the goats begins. Let it end where it will, well and good, said Don Quixote, and let us see if Rosinant can go. And again he spurred him, and again Rosinant made jumps and remained where he was. So well tied was he. Just then, whether it was the cold of the morning that was now approaching, or that he had eaten something laxative at supper, or that it was only natural, as is most likely, Sancho felt a desire to do what no one could do for him. But so great was the fear that had penetrated his heart, he dared not separate himself from his master by as much as the black of his nail. To escape doing what he wanted was, however, also impossible. So what he did for peace's sake was to remove his right hand, which held the back of the saddle, and with it to untie gently and silently the running string which alone held up his breeches, so that on loosening it they at once fell down round his feet like fetters. He then raised his shirt as well as he could, and bared his hind quarters, no slim ones. But this accomplished, which he fancied was all he had to do to get out of this terrible strait and embarrassment, Another still greater difficulty presented itself, for it seemed to him impossible to relieve himself without making some noise, and he ground his teeth and squeezed his shoulders together, holding his breath as much as he could, and in spite of his precautions, he was unlucky enough after all to make a little noise, very different from that which was causing him so much fear. Don Quixote, hearing it, said, "'What noise is that, Sancho?' I don't know, senor, he said. It must be something new, for adventures and misadventures never begin with a trifle. Once more he tried his luck and succeeded so well that without any further noise or disturbance he found himself relieved of the burden that had given him so much discomfort. But as Don Quixote's sense of smell was as acute as his hearing, and as Sancho was so closely linked with him that the fumes rose almost in a straight line, it could not be but that some should reach his nose, and as soon as they did he came to its relief by compressing it between his fingers, saying in a rather snuffing tone, Sancho, it strikes me thou art in great fear. I am, answered Sancho, but how does your worship perceive it now more than ever? Because just now thou smellst stronger than ever, and not of ambergris, answered Don Quixote. Very likely, said Sancho, but that's not my fault, but your worship's, for leading me about at unseasonable hours and at such unwanted paces. Then go back three or four, my friend, said Don Quixote, all the time with his fingers to his nose, and for the future pay more attention to thy person and to what thou owest to mine, for it is my great familiarity with thee that has bred this contempt. I'll bet, replied Sancho, that your worship thinks I have done something I ought not with my person. It makes it worse to stir it, friend Sancho, returned Don Quixote. With this and other talk of the same sort, master and man passed the night, till Sancho, perceiving that daybreak was coming on apace, very cautiously untied Rosinant and tied up his breeches. As soon as Rosinant found himself free, though by nature he was not at all meddlesome, he seemed to feel lively and began pawing, for as to capering, begging his pardon, he knew not what it meant. Don Quixote then, observing that Rosinant could move, took it as a good sign and a signal that he should attempt the dread adventure. 
By this time day had fully broken, and everything showed distinctly, and Don Quixote saw that he was among some tall trees, chestnuts, which cast a very deep shade. He perceived likewise that the sound of the strokes did not cease, but could not discover what caused it, and so, without any further delay, he let Rosinant feel the spur, and once more taking leave of Sancho, he told him to wait for him there three days at most, and as he had said before, if he should not have returned by that time, he might feel sure it was God's will that he should end his days in that perilous adventure. He again repeated the message and commission with which he was to go on his behalf to his lady Dulcina, and said he was not to be uneasy as to the payment of his services, for before leaving home he had made his will, in which he would find himself fully recompensed in the matter of wages in due proportion to that time he had served. But if God delivered him safe, sound, and unhurt out of that danger, he might look upon the promised island as much more than certain. Sancho began to weep afresh, on again hearing the affecting words of his good master, and resolved to stay with him until the final issue and end of the business. From these tears and this honourable resolve of Sancho Panza's, the author of this history infers that he must have been of good birth, and at least an old Christian, and the feeling he displayed touched his, but not so much as to make him show any weakness. On the contrary, hiding what he felt as well as he could, he began to move towards that quarter whence the sound of the water and of the strokes seemed to come. Sancho followed him on foot, leading by the halter, as his custom was, his ass, his constant comrade in prosperity or adversity, and advancing some distance through the shady chestnut trees, they came upon a little meadow at the foot of some high rocks, down which a mighty rush of water flung itself. At the foot of the rocks were some rudely constructed houses, looking more like ruins than houses, from among which came, they perceived, the din and clatter of blows, which still continued without intermission. Rosinant took fright at the noise of the water and of the blows, but quieting him, Don Quixote advanced step by step towards the houses, commending himself with all his heart to his lady, imploring her support in that dread pass and enterprise, and on the way commending himself to God, too, not to forget him. Sancho, who never quitted his side, stretched his neck as far as he could and peered between the legs of Rosinant to see if he could discover which it was that caused him such fear and apprehension. They went it might be a hundred paces farther, when on turning a corner the true cause, beyond the possibility of any mistake, of that dread-sounding and to them awe-inspiring noise that had kept them all the night in such fear and perplexity, appeared plain and obvious. And it was, if, reader, thou art not disgusted and disappointed, six fulling hammers, which by their alternate strokes made all the din. When Don Quixote perceived what it was, he was struck dumb and rigid from head to foot. Sancho glanced at him and saw him with his head bent down upon his breast in manifest mortification. And Don Quixote glanced at Sancho, and saw him with his cheeks puffed out and his mouth full of laughter, and evidently ready to explode with it, and in spite of his vexation he could not help laughing at the sight of him, and when Sancho saw his master begin, he let go so heartily he had to hold his sides with both hands to keep himself from bursting with laughter. Four times he stopped, and as many times did his laughter break out afresh with the same violence as at first whereat Don Quixote grew furious above all when he heard him say mockingly, Thou must know, friend Sancho, that of heaven's will I was born in this our iron age, to revive in it the golden and age of gold. I am he for whom are reserved perils, mighty achievements, valiant deeds. And here he went on repeating the words that Don Quixote uttered the first time they'd heard the awful strokes. Don Quixote then, seeing that Sancho was turning him into ridicule, was so mortified and vexed that he lifted up his pike and smote him two such blows that if instead of catching them on his shoulders he had caught them on his head, there would have been no wages to pay, unless indeed to his heirs. 
Sancho, seeing that he was getting an awkward return in earnest for his jest, and fearing his master might carry it still further, said to him very humbly, "'Calm yourself, sir, for by God I am only joking.' "'Well, then, if you are joking, I am not,' replied Don Quixote. "'Look here, my lively gentleman. "'If these, instead of being fulling hammers, "'had been some perilous adventure, "'have I not, think you, shown the courage required "'for the attempt and achievement? "'Am I, perchance, being, as I am a gentleman, "'bound to know and distinguish sounds "'and tell whether they come from fulling mills or not, "'and that, when perhaps, as is the case, "'I have never in my life seen any as you have, "'low boor as you are, "'that have been born and bred among them. "'But turn me these six hammers into six giants, "'and bring them to beard me, "'one by one or all together, "'and if I do not knock them head over heels, "'then make what mockery you like of me.' "'No more of that, signor,' returned Sancho. "'I own I went a little too far with the joke. "'But tell me, your worship, "'now that peace is made between us, "'and may God bring you out of all the adventures "'that may befall you as safe and sound "'as he has brought you out of this one, "'was it not a thing to laugh at? "'And is it not a good story, "'the great fear we were in, "'at least that I was in, for as to your worship, I see now that you neither know nor understand what either fear or dismay is. I do not deny it, said Don Quixote, that what happened to us may be worth laughing at, but it is not worth making a story about, for it is not every one that is shrewd enough to hit the right point of a thing. At any rate, said Sancho, your worship knew how to hit the right point with your pike, aiming at my head and hitting me on the shoulders, "'Thanks be to God and my own smartness in dodging it. "'But let that pass. "'All will come out in the scouring. "'For I have heard say, "'He loves thee well that makes thee weep. "'And moreover, that it is the way with great lords, "'after any hard words, "'they give a servant to give him a pair of breeches, "'though I do not know what they give after blows, "'unless it be that knights errant after blows "'give islands or kingdoms on the mainland.' It may be on the dice, said Don Quixote, that all thou sayest will come true. Overlook the past, for thou art shrewd enough to know that our first movements are not in our own control. And one thing for the future bear in mind, that thou curb and restrain thy loquacity in my company, for in all the books of chivalry that I have read, and they are innumerable, I never met a squire who talked so much to his lord as thou dost to thine, and in fact I feel it to be a great fault of thine and of mine, of thine that thou hast so little respect for me, of mine that I do not make myself more respected. There was Gandolin, the squire of Amadis of Gaul, that was count of the Insula firm, and we read of him that he always addressed his lord with his cap in his hand, his head bowed down and his body bent double, more to Quesco, and then, what shall we say to Gazabal, the squire of Galor, who was so silent that in order to indicate to us the greatness of his marvellous taciturnity, his name is only once mentioned in the whole of that history, as long as it is truthful. From all I have said, thou wilt gather, Sancho, that there must be a difference between master and man, between lord and lackey, between knight and squire, so that from this day forward, in our intercourse we must observe more respect and take less liberties, for in whatever way I may be provoked with you it will be bad for the pitcher. The favors and benefits that I have promised you will come in due time, and if they do not, your wages at least will not be lost, as I have already told you. All that your worship says is very well, said Sancho, but I should like to know, in case the time of favor should not come, and it might be necessary to fall back upon wages. How much did the squire of a knight-errant get in those days, and did they agree by the month or by the day like bricklayers? I do not believe, replied Don Quixote, that such squires were ever on wages, but were dependent on favor. And if I have now mentioned thine in the sealed will I have left at home, it was with a view to what may happen, for as yet... I know not how chivalry will turn out in these wretched times of ours. 
and I do not wish my soul to suffer for trifles in the other world. For I would have thee know, Sancho, that in this there is no condition more hazardous than that of adventurers. That is true, said Sancho, since the mere noise of the hammers of a fulling mill can disturb and disquiet the heart of such a valiant errant adventurer as your worship. But you may be sure I will not open my lips henceforward to make light of anything of your worship's, but only to honor you as my master and natural lord. By so doing, replied Don Quixote, shalt thou live long on the face of the earth, for next to parents, masters are to be respected as though they were parents. End of chapter 20 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marion Brown, Toronto, Canada. Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Volume 1, Chapter 21. Which treats of the exalted adventure and rich prize of Mambrino's helmet, together with other things, that happened to our invincible knight. It now began to rain a little, and Sancho was for going into the fueling mills, but Don Quixote had taken such an abhorrence to them on account of the late joke that he would not enter them on any account. So turning aside to right, they came before another road, different from that which they had taken the night before. Shortly afterwards Don Quixote perceived a man on horseback who wore on his head something that shone like gold, and the moment he saw him he turned to Sancho and said, I think, Sancho, there is no proverb that is not true, all being maxims drawn from experience itself, the mother of all the sciences, especially that one that says, where one door shuts, another opens. I say so because if last night fortune shut the door of the adventure we were looking for against us, cheating us with the fulling mills, it now opens wide another one for another better and more certain adventure. And if I do not contrive to enter it, it will be my own fault, and I cannot lay it to my ignorance of fulling mills or the darkness of the night. I say this because if I mistake not, there comes toward us one who wears on his head the helmet of Mambrino, concerning which I took the oath thou rememberest. Mind what you say, your worship, and still more what you do, said Sancho, for I don't want any more fulling mills to finish off fulling and knocking our senses out. The devil take thee, man, said Don Quixote. What has a helmet to do with fulling mills? I don't know, replied Sancho, but faith, if I might speak as I used, perhaps I could give such reasons that your worship would see you were mistaken in what you say. How can I be mistaken in what I say, unbelieving traitor? returned Don Quixote. Tell me, seest thou not yonder knight coming towards us on a dappled grey steed, who has upon his head a helmet of gold? What I see and make out, answered Sancho, is only a man on a grey ass like my own, who has something that shines on his head. Well, that is the helmet of Mambrino, said Don Quixote, Stand to one side, and leave me alone with him. Thou shalt see how, without saying a word, to save time, I shall bring this adventure to an issue, and possess myself of the helmet I have so longed for. I will take care to stand aside, said Sancho, but God grant, I say once more, that it may be marjoram and not fulling mills. I have told thee, brother, on no account to mention those fulling mills to me again, said Don Quixote, or I vow, and I say no more, I'll full the soul out of you. Sancho held his peace in dread, lest his master should carry out the vow he had hurled like a bowl at him. The fact of the matter, as regards the helmet, steed, and knight that Don Quixote saw, was this. In that neighborhood there were two villages, one of them so small that it had neither apothecary's shop nor barber, which the other that was close to it had. So the barber of the larger served the smaller. 
and in it there was a sick man who required to be bled and another man who wanted to be shaved, and on this errand the barber was going, carrying with him a brass basin, which as luck would have it, as he was on the way it began to rain, and not to spoil his hat, which probably was a new one, he put the basin on his head, and being clean it glittered at half a league's distance. He rode upon a grey ass, as Sancho said, and this was what made it seem to Don Quixote to be a dapple grey steed and a knight and a golden helmet, for everything he saw he was made to fall in with his crazy chivalry and ill-errant notions, and when he saw the poor knight draw near, without entering into any parley with him, at Rosinant's top speed he bore down upon him with the pike pointed low, fully determined to run him through and through, and as he reached him, without checking the fury of his charge, he cried to him, Defend thyself, miserable being, or yield me of thine own accord that which is so reasonably my due. The barber, who without any expectation or apprehension of it, saw this apparition coming down upon him, had no other way of saving himself from the stroke of the lance but to let himself fall off his ass, and no sooner had he touched the ground than he sprang up more nimbly than a deer, and sped away across the plain faster than the wind. He left the basin on the ground, with which Don Quixote contented himself, saying that the pagan had shown his discretion and imitated the beaver, which, finding itself pressed by the hunters, bites and cuts off with its teeth that for which, by its natural instinct, it knows it is pursued." He told Sancho to pick up the helmet, and he, taking it in his hand, said, By God, the basin is a good one, and worth a reel of eight if it is worth a maravedis, and handed it to his master, who immediately put it on his head, turning it round, now this way, now that, in search of fitment, and not finding it, he said, Clearly the pagan to whose measure this famous headpiece was first forged must have had a very large head, but the worst of it is half of it is wanting. When Sancho heard him call the basin a headpiece, he was unable to restrain his laughter, but remembering his master's wrath, he checked himself in the midst of it. "'What art thou laughing at, Sancho?' said Don Quixote. "'I am laughing,' said he, "'to think of the great head the pagan must have had who owned this helmet, for it looks exactly like a regular barber's basin.' "'Dost thou know what I suspect, Sancho?' said Don Quixote, that this wonderful piece of this enchanted helmet must be by some strange accident have come into the hands of someone who was unable to recognize or realize its value, and who, not knowing what he did, and seeing it to be of the purest gold, must have melted down one half for the sake of what it might be worth, and of the other made this which is like a barber's basin, as thou sayest. But be it as it may, to me who recognize it, its transformation makes no difference, for I will set it to rights at the first village where there is a blacksmith, and in such style that that helmet the god of smithies forged for the god of battles shall not surpass it or even come up to it, and in the meantime I will wear it as well as I can, for something is better than nothing, all the more as it will be quite enough to protect me from any chance blow of a stone. That is, said Sancho, if it is not shot with a sling, as they were in the battle of the two armies, when they signed the cross on your worshippers' grinders, and smashed the flask with that blessed draught that made me vomit my bowels up. It does not grieve me much to have lost it, said Don Quixote, for thou knowest, Sancho, that I have the receipt in my memory. So have I, answered Sancho, but if ever I make it, or try it again as long as I live, May this be my last hour. Moreover, I have no intention of putting myself in the way of wanting it, for I mean, with all my five senses, to keep myself from being wounded or from wounding any one. As to being blanketed again, I say nothing, for it is hard to prevent mishaps of that sort, and if they come there is nothing for it but to squeeze our shoulders together, hold our breath, shut our eyes, and let ourselves go where luck in the blanket may send us. Thou art a bad Christian, Sancho, said Don Quixote on hearing this, for once an injury has been done thee, 
thou never forgest it. But know that it is the part of noble and generous hearts not to attach importance to trifles. What lame leg hast thou got by it? What broken rib? What cracked head that thou canst not forget that jest? For jest and sport it was, properly regarded, and had I not seen it in that light, I would have returned and done more mischief in revenging thee than the Greeks did for the rape of Helen, who, if she were alive now, or if my Dulcina had lived then, might depend upon it she would not be so famous for her beauty as she is. And here he heaved a sigh and sent it aloft, and said Sancho, Let it pass for a jest, as it cannot be revenged in earnest. But I know what sort of jest and earnest it was and I know it will never be rubbed out of my memory any more than off my shoulders. But putting that aside, will your worship tell me what are we to do with this dapple grey steed that looks like a grey ass, which that Martino that your worship overthrew has left deserted here? For from the way he took to his heels and bolted, he is not likely ever to come back for it, and by my beard but the grey is a good one. I have never been in the habit, said Don Quixote, of taking spoil of those whom I vanquish, nor is it the practice of chivalry to take away their horses and leave them to go on foot, unless indeed it be that the victor have lost his own in the combat, in which case it is lawful to take that of the vanquished as a thing won in lawful war. Therefore, Sancho, leave this horse or ass, or whatever thou wilt have it to be, for when its owner sees us gone, hence he will come back for it. God knows I should like to take it, returned Sancho, or at least to change it for my own, which does not seem to me as good a one. Verily the laws of chivalry are strict, since they cannot be stretched to let one ass be changed for another. I should like to know if I might at least change trappings. On that head I am not quite certain, answered Don Quixote, and the matter being doubtful, pending better information, I say thou mayest change them, if so be thou hast urgent need of them. So urgent is it, answered Sancho, that if they were for my own person, I could not want them more. And forthwith, fortified by this license, he effected the mutatio caparum, rigging out his beast in the ninety-nines, and making quite another thing of it. This done, they broke their fast on the remains of the spoils of war, plundered from the sumpter mule, and drank of the brook that flowed from the fulling mills, without casting a look in that direction. In such loathing did they hold them for the alarm they had caused them, and all anger and gloom removed, they mounted, and without taking any fixed road, not to fix upon any being the proper thing for true knight's errand, they set out, guided by Rosinant's will, which carried along with it that of his master, not to say that of the ass, which always followed him wherever he led, lovingly and sociably. Nevertheless, they returned to the high road, and pursued it at a venture without any other aim. As they went along then, in this way, Sancho said to his master, Signor, would your worship give me leave to speak a little to you? For since you laid that hard injunction of silence on me, Several things have gone to rot in my stomach, and I have now just one on the tip of my tongue that I don't want to be spoiled. Say on, Sancho, said Don Quixote, and be brief in thy discourse, for there is no pleasure in one that is long. Well then, Signor, returned Sancho, I say that for some days past I have been considering how little is got or gained by going in search of these adventures that your worship seeks in these wilds and crossroads, where even if the most perilous are victoriously achieved, there is no one to see or know of them, and so they must be left untold forever to the loss of your worship's object and the credit they deserve. Therefore it seems to me it would be better, saving your worship's better judgment, if we were to go and serve some emperor or other great prince, who may have some war on hand, in whose service your worship may prove the worth of your person, your great might and understanding, on perceiving which the Lord in whose service we may be, will perforce have it to reward us, each according to his merits, and there you will not be at a loss for someone to set down your achievements in writing, so as to preserve their memory forever. 
Of my own I say nothing, as they will not go beyond squirely limits, though I make bold to say that, if it be the practice in chivalry to write the achievements of squires, I think mine must not be left out. Thou speakest not amiss, Sancho, answered Don Quixote, but before that point is reached, it is requisite to roam the world, as it were on probation, seeking adventures, in order that, by achieving some, name and fame may be acquired, such that when he betakes himself to the court of some great monarch, the king may be already known by his deeds, and that the boys, the instant they see him enter the gate of the city, may all follow him and surround him, crying, This is the knight of the sun or the serpent, or any other title under which he may have achieved great deeds. This, they will say, is he who vanquished in single combat the gigantic Brocabruno of mighty strength, he who delivered the great Mameluke of Persia out of the long enchantment under which he had been for almost nine hundred years. So from one to another they will go proclaiming his achievements, and presently at the tumult of the boys and the others the king of that kingdom will appear at the windows of his royal palace, and as soon as he beholds the knight, recognizing him by his arms and the device on his shield, he will as a matter of course say, What ho! Forth all ye, the knights of my court, to receive the flower of chivalry who cometh hither. At which command all will issue forth, and he himself, advancing halfway down the stairs, will embrace him closely and salute him, kissing him on the cheek, and will then lead him to the queen's chamber, where the knight will find her with the princess her daughter, who will be one of the most beautiful and accomplished damsels that could with the utmost pains be discovered anywhere in the known world. Straightway it will come to pass that she will fix her eyes upon the knight, and he his upon her, and each will seem to the other something more divine than human, and without knowing how or why, they will be taken and entangled in the inextricable toils of love, and sorely distressed in their hearts not to see any way of making their pains and sufferings known by speech. Thence they will lead him, no doubt, to some richly adorned chamber of the palace, where having removed his armor, they will bring him a rich mantle of scarlet wherewith to robe himself, and if he looked noble in his armor, he will look still more so in a doublet. When night comes he will sup with the king, queen, and princess, and all the time he will never take his eyes off her, stealing stealthy glances, unnoticed by those present, and so will she do the same, and with equal cautiousness, being, as I have said, a damsel of great discretion. The tables being removed, suddenly through the door of the hall there will enter a hideous and diminutive dwarf, followed by a fair dame, between two giants, who comes with a certain adventure, the work of an ancient sage, and he who shall achieve it shall be deemed the best knight in the world. The king will then command all those present to assay it, and none will bring it to an end and conclusion save the stranger knight, to the great enhancement of his fame, whereat the princess will be overjoyed and will esteem herself happy and fortunate in having fixed and placed her thought so high, and the best of it is that this king or prince, or whatever he is, is engaged in a very bitter war with another as powerful as himself, and the stranger knight, after having been some days at his court, requests leave from him to go and serve him in the said war. The king will grant it very readily, and the knight will courteously kiss his hands for the favor done to him, and that night he will take leave of his lady the princess at the grating of the chamber where she sleeps, which looks upon a garden, and at which he has already many times conversed with her, the go-between and confidant in the matter being a damsel much trusted by the princess. He will sigh, she will swoon, the damsel will fetch water, much distressed because morning approaches, and for the honor of her lady he would not that they were discovered, at last the princess will come to herself, and will present her white hands through the grating to the knight, who will then kiss them a thousand and a thousand times, bathing them with his tears. 
it will be arranged between them how they are to inform each other of their good or evil fortunes, and the princess will entreat him to make his absence as short as possible, which he will promise to do with many oaths. Once more he kisses her hands and takes his leave in such grief that he is well nigh ready to die. He betakes him thence to his chamber, flings himself on his bed, cannot sleep for sorrow at parting, rises early in the morning, goes to take leave of the king, queen, and princess, and as he takes his leave of the pair, it is told him that the princess is indisposed and cannot receive a visit. The knight thinks it is from grief at his departure. His heart is pierced, and he is hardly able to keep from showing his pain. The confidant is present, observes all, goes to tell her mistress, who listens with tears, and says that one of her greatest distresses is not knowing who this knight is, and whether he is of kingly lineage or not. The damsel assures her that so much courtesy, gentleness, and gallantry of bearing as her knight possesses could not exist in any save one who was royal and illustrious. Her anxiety is thus relieved, and she strives to be of good cheer, lest she should excite suspicion in her parents, and at the end of two days she appears in public. Meanwhile the knight has taken his departure. He fights in the war, conquers the king's enemy, wins many cities, triumphs in many battles, returns to the court, sees his lady where he was wont to see her, and it is agreed that he shall demand her in marriage of her parents as the reward of his services. The king is unwilling to give her, as he knows not who he is. But nevertheless, whether carried off, or in whatever other way it may be, the princess comes to be his bride, and her father comes to regard it as very good fortune. For it so happens that this knight is proved to be the son of a valiant king of some kingdom. I know not what, for I fancy it is not likely to be on the map. The father dies, the princess inherits, and in two words the knight becomes king. And here comes in at once the bestowal of rewards upon his squire, and all who have aided him in rising to so exalted a rank. He marries his squire to a damsel of the princesses, who will be, no doubt, the one who is confident in their armour, and is daughter of a very great duke. "'That's what I want, and no mistake about it,' said Sancho. "'That's what I'm waiting for. For all this, word for word, is in store for your worship under the title of the Knight of the Rueful Countenance.' "'Thou needst not doubt it, Sancho,' replied Don Quixote, "'for in the same manner, and by the same steps as I have described here, Knights errant rise, and have risen to be kings and emperors. All we want now is to find out what king, Christian or pagan, is at war, and has a beautiful daughter. And there will be time enough to think of that, for as I have told thee, fame must be won in other quarters before repairing to the court. There is another thing, too, that is wanting, for supposing we find a king who is at war, and has a beautiful daughter, and that I have won incredible fame throughout the universe. I know not how it can be made out that I am of royal lineage, or even second cousin to an emperor. For the king will not be willing to give me his daughter in marriage, unless he is first thoroughly satisfied on this point, however much my famous deeds may deserve it, so that by this deficiency I fear I shall lose what my arm has fairly earned. True, it is I am a student of known house, of estate and property, and entitled to the five hundred sueldos mulched. It may be that the sage who shall write my history will so clear up my ancestry and pedigree that I may find myself fifth or sixth in descent from a king. For I would have thee know, Sancho, that there are two kinds of lineages in the world, some there be tracing and deriving their descent from kings and princes, whom time has reduced little by little until they end in a point like a pyramid upside down, and others who spring from the common herd and go on rising step by step until they come to be great lords, so that the difference is that the one were what they no longer are, and the others are what they formerly were not, and I may be of such that after investigation my origin may prove great and famous, 
with which the king, my father-in-law that is to be, ought to be satisfied, and should he not be, the princess will so love me that even though she well knew me to be the son of a water-carrier, she will take me for her lord and husband in spite of her father. If not, then it comes to seizing her and carrying her off where I please, for time or death will put an end to the wrath of her parents. It comes to this too, said Sancho, what some naughty people say, never ask as a favor what thou canst take by force, though it would be fit better to say, a clear escape is better than good men's prayers. I say so because if my lord the king, your worship's father-in-law, will not condescend to give you my lady the princess, there is nothing for it but, as your worship says, to seize her and transport her. But the mischief is that until peace is made, and you come into the peaceful enjoyment of your kingdom, the poor squire is famishing as far as rewards go, unless it be that the confidant damsel that is to be his wife comes with the princess, and that with her he tides over his bad luck until heaven otherwise orders things, for his master, I suppose, may as well give her to him at once for a lawful wife. Nobody can object to that, said Don Quixote. Then since that may be, said Sancho, there is nothing for it but to commend ourselves to God, and let fortune take what course it will. God guided according to my wishes and thy wants, said Don Quixote, and mean be he who thinks himself mean. In God's name let him be so, said Sancho. I am an old Christian, and to fit me for a count that's enough. And more than enough for thee, said Don Quixote, and even wert thou not, it would make no difference, because I, being the king, can easily give thee nobility without purchase or service rendered by thee. For when I make thee a count, then thou art at once a gentleman, and they may say what they will, but by my faith they will have to call thee your lordship, whether they like it or not. Not a doubt of it, and all know how to support the tittle, said Sancho. Title thou shouldst say, not tittle said the master. So be it, answered Sancho. I say I will know how to behave, for once in my life I was beetle of a brotherhood, and the beetle's gown sat so well on me that all said I looked as if I were to be steward of the same brotherhood. What will it be, then, when I put a duke's robe on my back, or dress myself in gold and pearls like a count? I believe they'll come a hundred leagues to see me. Thou wilt look well, said Don Quixote, but thou must shave thy beard often, for thou hast it so thick and rough and unkempt, that if thou dost not shave it every second day at least, they will see what thou art at the distance of a musket shot. What more will it be, said Sancho, than having a barber, and keeping him at wages in the house? Even if it be necessary, I will make him go behind me like a nobleman's equerry. "'Why, how dost thou know that noblemen have equeries behind them?' asked Don Quixote. "'I will tell you,' answered Sancho. "'Years ago I was for a month at the capital, "'and there I saw taking the air a very small gentleman, "'who they said was a very great man, "'and a man following him on horseback in every turn he took, "'just as if he was his tail. "'I asked why this man did not join the other man "'instead of always going behind him.' They answered me that he was his equerry, and that it was the custom with nobles to have such persons behind them, and ever since then I know it, for I have never forgotten it. Thou art right, said Don Quixote, and in the same way thou mayest carry thy barber with thee, for customs did not come into use altogether, nor were they all invented at once, and thou mayest be the first count to have a barber to follow him, and indeed, "'Shaving one's beard is a greater trust than saddling one's horse. "'Let the barber business be my lookout,' said Sancho, "'and your worships be it to strive to become a king and make me a count.' "'So it shall be,' answered Don Quixote, "'and raising his eyes he saw what will be told in the following chapter. "'End of chapter 21「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information and to find out how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marion Brown, Toronto, Canada. Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Volume 1, Chapter 22. Of the freedom Don Quixote conferred on several unfortunates who against their will were being carried where they had no wish to go. Sidi Hamet Benengeli, the Arab and Manchugan author, relates in this most grave, high-sounding, minute, delightful, and original history that after the discussion between the famous Don Quixote of La Mancha and his squire Sancho Panza, which is set down at the end of chapter 21, Don Quixote raised his eyes and saw coming along the road he was following some dozen men on foot strung together by the neck like beads on a great iron chain and all the manacles on their hands. With them there came also two men on horseback and two on foot, those on horseback with wheel-lock muskets, those on foot with javelins and swords. And as soon as Sancho saw them, he said, that is the chain of galley slaves on the way to the galleys by force of the king's orders. How by force? asked Don Quixote. Is it possible that the king uses force against anyone? I do not say that, answered Sancho, but that these are people condemned for their crimes to serve by force in the king's galleys. In fact, replied Don Quixote, however it may be, these people are going where they are taking them by force and not of their own will. Just so, said Sancho. Then if so, said Don Quixote, here is a case for the exercise of my office, to put down force and to succour and help the wretched. Recollect your worship, said Sancho. Justice, which is the king himself, is not using force or doing wrong to such persons, but punishing them for their crimes. The chain of galley slaves had by this time come up, and Don Quixote, in very courteous language, asked those who were in custody of it to be good enough to tell him the reason or reasons for which they were conducting these people in this manner. One of the guards on horseback answered that they were galley slaves belonging to his majesty, that they were going to the galleys, and that was all that was to be said and all he had any business to know. Nevertheless, replied Don Quixote, I should like to know from each of them separately the reason of his misfortune. To this he added more to the same effect to induce them to tell him what he wanted so civilly that the other mounted guard said to him, Though we have here the register and certificate of the sentence of every one of these wretches, there is no time to take them out or read them. Come and ask themselves. They can tell if they choose." And they will, for these fellows take a pleasure in doing and talking about rascalities. With this permission, which Don Quixote would have taken even if they had not granted it, he approached the chain and asked the first for what offences he was now in such a sorry case. He made answer that it was for being a lover. For that only, replied Don Quixote, why, if for being lovers they send people to the galleys, I might have been rowing in them long ago. The love is not the sort your worship is thinking of, said the galley slave. Mine was that I loved a washerwoman's basket of clean linen so well and held it so close in my embrace that if the arm of the law had not forced it from me, I should never have let it go of my own will to this moment. I was caught in the act. There was no occasion for torture. The case was settled. They treated me to a hundred lashes on the back and three years of gurapas beside and that was the end of it. "'What are gurapas?' asked Don Quixote. "'Gurapas are galleys,' answered the galley slave, who was a young man of about four and twenty, and said he was a native of Pedrahida. Don Quixote asked the same question of the second, who made no reply. So downcast and melancholy was he, but the first answered for him, and said he, sir, goes as a canary.' I mean as a musician and a singer. What? said Don Quixote, for being musicians and singers, are people sent to the galleys too? Yes, sir, answered the galley slave, 
for there is nothing worse than singing under suffering. On the contrary, I have heard say, said Don Quixote, that he who sings scares away his woes. Here it is the reverse, said the galley slave, for he who sings once weeps all his life. I do not understand it, said Don Quixote, but one of the guards said to him, Sir, to sing under suffering means with the non-sancta fraternity to confess under torture. They put this sinner to the torture, and he confessed his crime, which was being a quatrero, that is a cattle-stealer, and on his confession they sentenced him to six years in the galleys, besides two hundred lashes that he has already had on the back, and he is always dejected and downcast, because the other thieves that were left behind, and that march here ill-treat, and snub, and jeer, and despise him, for confessing, and not having spirit enough to say nay. For, say they, nay has no more letters in it than yea, and a culprit is well off when life or death with him depends on his own tongue, and not on that of witnesses or evidence, and to my thinking they are not very far out. And I think so too, answered Don Quixote. Then passing on to the third, he asked him what he had asked the others, and the man answered very readily and unconcernedly, I am going for five years to their lady ships, the Garapas, for the want of ten ducats. I will give twenty with pleasure to get you out of that trouble, said Don Quixote. That, said the galley slave, is like a man having money at sea when he is dying of hunger, and has no way of buying what he wants. I say so, because if at the right time I had had those twenty ducats that your worship now offers me, I would have greased the notary's pen and freshened up the attorney's wit with them, so that today I should be in the middle of the plaza of Zocodover at Toledo, and not on this road coupled like a greyhound. But God is great. Patience, there, that's enough of it. Don Quixote passed on to the fourth, a man of venerable aspect, with a white beard falling below his breast, who on hearing himself ask the reason of his being there, began to weep without answering a word. But the fifth acted as his tongue, and said, this worthy man is going to the galleys for four years, after having gone the rounds in ceremony and on horseback. That means, said Sancho Panza, as I take it, to have been exposed to shame in public. Just so, replied the galley slave, and the offence for which they gave him that punishment was having been an ear-broker, nay, body-broker. I mean, in short, that this gentleman goes as a pimp, and for having besides a certain touch of the sorcerer about him. If that touch had not been thrown in, said Don Quixote, he would not deserve for mere pimping to row in the galleys, but rather to command and be admiral of them. For the offence of pimp is no ordinary one, being the office of persons of discretion, one very necessary in a well-ordered state, and only to be exercised by persons of good birth, Nay, there ought to be an inspector and overseer of them, as in other offices, and recognize number as with the brokers on change. In this way, many of the evils would be avoided, which are caused by this office, and calling being in the hands of stupid and ignorant people, such as women more or less silly, and pages and jesters of little standing and experience, who on the most urgent occasions, and when ingenuity of contrivance is needed, let the crumbs freeze on the way to their mouths, and know not which is their right hand. I should like to go farther and give reasons to show that it is advisable to choose those who are to hold so necessary an office in the state, but this is not the fit place for it. Some day I will expound the matter to someone able to see and rectify it. All I say now is that the additional fact of his being a sorcerer has removed the sorrow it gave me, to see these white hairs and this venerable countenance in so painful a position on account of his being a pimp, though I know well there are no sorceries in the world that can move or compel the will as some simple folk fancy. For our will is free, nor is there herb or charm that can force it. All that certain silly women and quacks do to turn men mad with potions and poisons, pretending that they have power to cause love, for I say, it is an impossibility to compel the will. It is true, said the good old man, 
and indeed, sir, as far as the charge of sorcery goes, I was not guilty. As to that of being a pimp, I cannot deny it. But I never thought I was doing any harm by it, for my only object was that all the world should enjoy itself and live in peace and quiet without quarrels or troubles. But my good intentions were unavailing to save me from going where I never expect to come back from, with this weight of years upon me and a urinary ailment that never gives me a moment's ease. And again he fell to weeping as before. And such compassion did Sancho feel for him that he took out a reel of four from his bosom and gave it to him in alms. Don Quixote went on and asked another what his crime was, and the man answered with no less but rather much more sprightliness than the last one. I am here because I carried the joke too far with a couple of cousins of mine and with a couple of other cousins who were none of mine. In short, I carried the joke so far with them all that it ended in such a complicated increase of kindred that no accountant could make it clear it was all proved against me. I got no favor. I had no money. I was near having my neck stretched. They sentenced me to the galleys for six years. I accepted my fate. It is the punishment of my fault. I am a young man. Let life only last, and with that all will come right. If you, sir, have anything wherewith to help the poor, God will repay it to you in heaven, and we on earth will take care in our petitions to him to pray for a life and health of your worship, that they may be as long and as good as your amiable appearance deserves. This one was in the dress of a student, and one of the guards said he was a great talker and a very elegant Latin scholar. Behind all these there came a man of thirty, a very personable fellow, except that when he looked, his eyes turned in a little one towards the other. He was bound differently from the rest, for he had to his leg a chain so long that it was wound all round his body and two rings on his neck, one attached to the chain, the other to what they call a keep friend or friend's foot, from which hung two irons reaching to his waist, with two manacles fixed to them in which his hands were secured by a big padlock, so that he could neither raise his hands to his mouth nor lower his head to his hands. Don Quixote asked why this man carried so many more chains than the others. The guard replied that it was because he alone had committed more crimes than all the rest put together, and was so daring and such a villain, that though they marched him in that fashion, they did not feel sure of him, but were in dread of his making his escape. What crimes can he have committed, said Don Quixote, if they have not deserved a heavier punishment than being sent to the galleys? He goes for ten years, replied the guard, which is the same thing as civil death, and all that need be said is that this good fellow is the famous Guines de Passamont, otherwise called Ginasillo de Parapilla. Gently, senior commissary, said the galley slave at this, let us have no fixing of names or surnames. My name is Ginas, not Ginasillo, and my family name is Passamonte not Parapilla, as you say. Let each one mind his own business, and he will be doing enough. Speak with less impertinence, master thief of extra measure, replied the commissary, if you don't want me to make you hold your tongue in spite of your teeth. It is easy to see, returned the galley slave, that man goes as God pleases, but someone shall know some day whether I am called Ginasillo de Parapilla or not. "'Don't they call you so, you liar?' said the guard. "'They do,' returned Ginnis. "'But I will make them give over calling me so, or I will be shaved, "'where I only say behind my teeth, "'If you, sir, have anything to give us, give it to us at once, "'and God speed you, for you are becoming tiresome "'with all this inquisitiveness about the lives of others. "'If you want to know about mine, let me tell you, "'I am Ginnis de Passamonte,' whose life is written by these fingers. He says true, said the commissary, for he has himself written his story as grand as you please, and has left the book in the prison in pawn for two hundred reals. And I mean to take it out of pawn, said Ginnis, though it were in for two hundred ducats. Is it so good? said Don Quixote. So good is it, replied Ginnis, 
that a fig for Lazarillo de Tormes, and all of that kind that have been written, or shall be written, compared with it. All I will say about it is that it deals with facts, and facts so neat and diverting that no lies could match them. And how is the book entitled? asked Don Quixote. The Life of Ginis de Passamonte, replied the subject of it. And is it finished? asked Don Quixote. How can it be finished, said the other, when my life is not yet finished? All that is written is from my birth down to the point when they sent me to the galleys this last time. Then you have been there before, said Don Quixote. In the service of God and the king, I have been there for four years before now, and I know by this time what the biscuit and coor bash are like, replied Guinness, so it is no great grievance to me to go back to them, for there I shall have time to finish my book. I have still many things left to say, and in the galleys of Spain there is more than enough leisure, though I do not want much for what I have to write, for I have it by heart. You seem a clever fellow, said Don Quixote, an unfortunate one, replied Ginnis, for misfortune always persecutes good wit. It persecutes rogues, said the commissary. I told you already to go gently, master commissary, said Passamonte. Their lordships yonder never gave you the staff to ill-treat us wretches here, but to conduct and take us where his majesty orders you. If not, by the life of never mind, it may be that some day the stains made in the inn will come out in the scouring. Let every one hold his tongue and behave well and speak better. And now let us march on, for we have had quite enough of this entertainment. The commissary lifted his staff to strike Passamonte in return for his threats. But Don Quixote came between them and begged him not to ill-use him, as it was not too much to allow one who had his hands tied to have his tongue a trifle free. And turning to the whole chain of them, he said, From all you have told me, dear brethren, Make out clearly that though they have punished you for your faults, the punishments you are about to endure do not give you much pleasure, and that you go to them very much against the grain and against your will, and that perhaps this one's want of courage under torture, that one's want of money, another's want of advocacy, and lastly the perverted judgment of the judge, may have been the cause of your ruin and of your failure to obtain the justice you had on your side." all which presents itself now to my mind, urging, persuading, and even compelling me to demonstrate in your case the purpose for which heaven sent me into the world, and caused me to make profession of the order of chivalry to which I belong, and the vow I took therein to give aid to those in need and under the oppression of the strong. But as I know that, it is a mark of prudence not to do by foul means what may be done by fair." I will ask these gentlemen, the guards and the commissary, to be so good as to release you and let you go in peace, as there will be no lack of others to make the king under more favorable circumstances. For it seems to me a hard case to make slaves of those whom God and nature have made free. Moreover, sirs of the guard, added Don Quixote, these poor fellows have done nothing to you. Let each answer for his own sins yonder, there is a God in heaven who will not forget to punish the wicked or reward the good, and it is not fitting that honest men should be the instruments of punishment to others, they being therein no way concerned. This request I make thus gently and quietly, that if you comply with it I may have reason for thanking you, and if you will not voluntarily this lance and sword together with the might of my arm shall compel you to comply with it by force." "'Nice nonsense,' said the commissary. "'A fine piece of pleasantry he has come out with at last. "'He wants us to let the king's prisoners go, "'as if we had any authority to release them, "'or he to order us to do so. "'Go your way, sir, and good luck to you. "'Put that basin straight that you've got on your head, "'and don't go looking for three feet on a cat.' "'Tis you that are the cat, rat, and rascal,' replied Don Quixote, and acting on the word, he fell upon him so suddenly that without giving him time to defend himself, he brought him to the ground sorely wounded with a lance thrust, and lucky it was for him that it was the one that had the musket. The other guards stood thunderstruck and amazed at this unexpected event, but recovering presence of mind, 
those on horseback seized their swords, and those on foot their javelins, and attacked Don Quixote, who was waiting for them with great calmness, and no doubt it would have gone badly with him if the galley slaves, seeing the chance before them of liberating themselves, had not effected it by contriving to break the chain on which they were strung. Such was the confusion that the guards, now rushing at the galley slaves who were breaking loose, now to attack Don Quixote who was waiting for them, did nothing at all that was of any use. Sancho, on his part, gave a helping hand to release Ginis de Pasamonte, who was the first to leap forth upon the plain free and unfettered, and who, attacking the prostrate commissary, took from him his sword and the musket, with which, aiming at one and leveling at another, he, without ever discharging it, drove every one of the guards off the field, for they took to flight, as well as to escape Passamonte's musket, as the shower of stones the now released galley slaves were raining upon them. Sancho was greatly grieved at the affair, because he anticipated that those who had fled would report the matter to the Holy Brotherhood, who at the summons of the alarm bell would at once sally forth in quest of the offenders, and he said so to his master, and entreated him to leave the place at once and go into hiding in the Sierra that was close by. "'That is all very well,' said Don Quixote, "'but I know what must be done now, "'and calling together all the galley slaves "'who were now running riot "'and had stripped the commissary to the skin, "'he collected them round him to hear what he had to say, "'and addressed them as follows. "'To be grateful for benefits received "'is the part of persons of good birth, "'and one of the sins most offensive to God "'is ingratitude.' I say so because, sirs, ye have already seen by manifest proof the benefit ye have received of me, in return for which I desire, and it is my good pleasure that, laden with that chain which I have taken off your necks, ye at once set out and proceed to the city of El Toboso, and there present yourselves before the lady Dulcinea del Toboso, and say to her that her knight, he of the rueful countenance, sends to commend himself to her and that ye recount to her in full detail all the particulars of this notable adventure, up to the recovery of your longed-for liberty, and this done ye may go where ye will, and good fortune attend you. Genus de Passamonte made answer for all, saying, That which you, sir, our deliverer, demand of us, is of all impossibilities the most impossible to comply with, because we cannot go together along the roads, but only singly and separate, and each one his own way, endeavouring to hide ourselves in the bowels of the earth to escape the holy brotherhood, which, no doubt, will come out in search of us. What your worship may do, and fairly do, is to change this service and tribute, as regards the lady Dulcinea del Tobaso, for a certain quantity of Ave Marias and Credos, which we will say for your worship's intention. And this is a condition that can be complied with by night, as by day running or resting, in peace or in war, but to imagine that we are going now to return to the flesh-pots of Egypt, I mean to take our chain and set out for El Tabasso, is to imagine that it is now night, though it is not yet ten in the morning, and to ask this of us is like asking pears of the elm-tree. Then by all that's good, said Don Quixote, now stirred to wrath, Don son of a bitch, Don Gisilo di Paropillo, or whatever your name is, you will have to go yourself alone, with your tail between your legs and the whole chain on your back. Passamonte, who was anything but meek, being by this time thoroughly convinced that Don Quixote was not quite right in his head, as he had committed such a vagary as to set them free, finding himself abused in this fashion, gave the wink to his companions, and falling back they began to shower stones on Don Quixote at such a rate that he was quite unable to protect himself with his buckler, and poor Rosinant no more heeded the spur than if he had been made of brass. Sancho planted himself behind his ass, and with him sheltered himself from the hailstorm that poured on both of them. Don Quixote was unable to shield himself so well, but that more pebbles than I could count struck him full on the body, with such force that they brought him to the ground, and the instant he fell the student pounced upon him, snatched the basin from his head, and with it struck three or four blows on his shoulders, and as many more on the ground, 
knocking it almost to pieces. Then they stripped him of a jacket that he wore over his armor, and they would have stripped off his stockings if his greaves had not prevented them. From Sancho they took his coat, leaving him in his shirt sleeves, and dividing among themselves the remaining spoils of the battle, they went each one his own way, more solicitous about keeping clear of the holy brotherhood they dreaded than about burdening themselves with the chain or going to present themselves before the lady Dulcinea of Toboso. The ass and Rosinant, Sancho and Don Quixote, were all that were left upon the spot. The ass, with drooping head, serious, shaking his ears from time to time, as if he thought the storm of stones that assailed them was not yet over. Rosinant stretched beside his master, for he too had been brought to the ground by a stone. Sancho stripped and trembling with fear of the Holy Brotherhood, and Don Quixote fuming to find himself so served by the very persons for whom he had done so much. End of chapter 22 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zachary Brewster Geis, Greenbelt, Maryland, September 2006. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Part 8, Chapter 23. Of what befell Don Quixote in the Sierra Morena, which was one of the rarest adventures related in this voracious history. Seeing himself served in this way, Don Quixote said to his squire, I have always heard it said, Sancho, that to do good to boors is to throw water into the sea. If I had believed thy words, I should have avoided this trouble. But it is done now. It is only to have patience and take warning for the future. Your worship will take warning as much as I am a Turk, returned Sancho. But, as you say, this mischief might have been avoided if you had believed me, believe me now, and a still greater one will be avoided. For I will tell you chivalry is of no account with the Holy Brotherhood, and they don't care two maravedis for all the knights errant in the world. And I can tell you I fancy I hear their arrows whistling past my ears this minute. Thou art a coward by nature, Sancho, said Don Quixote. But lest thou shouldst say I am obstinate, and that I never do as thou dost advise, this once I will take thy advice and withdraw out of reach of that fury thou so dreadest. But it must be on one condition that never, in life or in death, thou art to say to any one that I retired, or withdrew from this danger out of fear, but only in compliance with thy entreaties. For if thou sayest otherwise thou wilt lie therein, and from this time to that, and from that to this, I give thee lie, and say thou liest, and wilt lie every time thou thinkest or sayest it, and answer me not again, for at the mere thought that I am withdrawing or retiring from any danger, above all from this, which does seem to carry some little shadow of fear with it, I am ready to take my stand here and await alone not only that holy brotherhood you talk of and dread, but the brothers of the twelve tribes of Israel, and the seven Maccabees, and Castor and Pollux, and all the brothers and brotherhoods in the world. Signor, replied Sancho, to retire is not to flee, and there is no wisdom in waiting when danger outweighs hope, and it is the part of wise men to preserve themselves today for tomorrow, and not risk all in one day. And let me tell you, though I am a clown and a boor, I have got some notion of what they call safe conduct. So repent not of having taken my advice, but Mount Rosinate if you can, and if not I will help you. And follow me, for my mother wit tells me we have more need of legs than hands just now. Don Quixote mounted without replying, and, Sancho leading the way on his ass, they entered the side of the Sierra Morena, which was close by as it was Sancho's design to cross it entirely and come out again at El Viso or Almodovar del Campo, and hide for some days among its crags so as to escape the search of the Brotherhood should they come to look for them. He was encouraged in this by perceiving that the stock of provisions carried by the ass had come safe out of the fray with the galley slaves, a circumstance that he regarded as a miracle seeing how they pillaged and ransacked. That night they reached the very heart of the Sierra Morena, where it seemed prudent to Sancho to pass the night and even some days, at least as many as the stores he carried might last, 
and so they encamped between two rocks and among some cork trees. But fatal destiny, which, according to the opinion of those who have not the light of the true faith, directs, arranges, and settles everything in its own way, so ordered it that Ginez de Pasamonte, the famous knave and thief, who by the virtue and madness of Don Quixote had been released from the chain, driven by fear of the Holy Brotherhood, which he had good reason to dread, resolved to take hiding in the mountains, and his fate and fear led him to the same spot which Don Quixote and Sancho Panza had been led by theirs, just in time to recognize them and leave them to fall asleep. And as the wicked are always ungrateful, and necessity leads to evil doing, and immediate advantage overcomes all considerations of the future, Ginez, who was neither grateful nor well-principled, made up his mind to steal Sancho Panza's ass, not troubling himself about Roncinante, as being a prize that was no good either to pledge or sell. While Sancho slept he stole his ass, and before day dawned he was far out of reach. Aurora made her appearance bringing gladness to the earth but sadness to Sancho Panza, for he had found that his dapple was missing, and seeing himself bereft of him he began the saddest and most doleful lament in the world, so loud that Don Quixote awoke at his exclamations and heard him saying, O oh, son of my bowels, born in my very house, my children's plaything, my wife's joy, the envy of my neighbors, relief of my burdens, and lastly half-supporter of myself, for with the six-and-twenty maravedis thou didst earn me daily, I met half my charges. Don Quixote, when he heard the lament and learned the cause, consoled Sancho with the best arguments he could, entreating him to be patient, and promising to give him a letter of exchange, ordering three out of five ass-colts that he had at home to be given to him. Sancho took comfort at this, dried his tears, suppressed his sobs, and returned thanks for the kindness shown him by Don Quixote. He on his part was rejoiced to the heart on entering the mountains, as they seemed to him to be just the place for the adventures he was in quest of. They brought back to his memory the marvellous adventures that had befallen knights errant in like solitudes and wilds, and he went along reflecting on these things, so absorbed and carried away by them that he had no thought for anything else. Nor had Sancho any other care, now that he fancied he was travelling in a safe quarter, than to satisfy his appetite with such remains as were left of the clerical spoils. And so he marched behind his master, laden with what Dapple used to carry, emptying the sack and packing his paunch, and so long as he could go that way, he would not have given a farthing to meet with another adventure. While so engaged, he raised his eyes and saw that his master had halted, and was trying with the point of his pike to lift some bulky object that lay upon the ground, on which he hastened to join him and help him if it were needful, and reached him just as with the point of the pike he was raising a saddle-pad with a valise attached to it, half or rather wholly rotten, and torn. But so heavy were they that Sancho had to help to take them up, and his master directed him to see what the valise contained. Sancho did so with great alacrity, and though the valise was secured by a chain and padlock, from its torn and rotten condition he was able to see its contents, which were four shirts of fine holland, and other articles of linen no less curious than clean. And in a handkerchief he found a good lot of gold crowns, and as soon as he saw them he exclaimed, Blessed be all heaven for sending us an adventure that is good for something. Searching further, he found a little memorandum book, richly bound. This Don Quixote asked of him, telling him to take the money and keep it for himself. Sancho kissed his hands for the favor, and cleared the valise of its linen, which he stowed away in the provision sack. Considering the whole matter, Don Quixote observed, It seems to me, Sancho, and it is impossible it can be otherwise, that some strayed traveller must have crossed this sierra and been attacked and slain by footpads, who brought him to this remote spot to bury him. That cannot be, answered Sancho, because if they had been robbers they would not have left this money. Thou art right, said Don Quixote, and I cannot guess or explain what this may mean, but stay. Let us see if in this memorandum book there is anything written by which we may be able to trace out or discover what we want to know. He opened it, and the first thing he found in it, written roughly but in a very good hand, was a sonnet, and reading it aloud that Sancho might hear it, he found that it ran as follows. Sonnet Or love is lacking in intelligence, or to the height of cruelty attains, 
or else it is my doom to suffer pains beyond the measure due to my offence. But if love be a god, it follows thence that he knows all, and certain it remains no god loves cruelty. Then who ordains this penance that enthralls while it torments? It were a falsehood, Chloe, thee to name. Such evil with such goodness cannot live, and against heaven I dare not charge the blame. I know only it is my fate to die. To him who knows not whence his malady, a miracle alone a cure can give. There is nothing to be learned from that rhyme, said Sancho, unless by that clue there is in it one may draw up the ball of the whole matter. What clue is there? said Don Quixote. I thought your worship spoke of a clue in it, said Sancho. I only said Chloe, replied Don Quixote, and that, no doubt, is the name of the lady of whom the author of the sonnet complains. And faith, he must be a tolerable poet, or I know little of the craft. Then your worship understands rhyming, too? And better than thou thinkest, replied Don Quixote, as thou shalt see when thou carriest a letter written in verse from beginning to end to my lady Dulcinea del Toboso. For I would have thee know, Sancho, that all or most of the knights errant in days of yore were great troubadours and great musicians. For both of these accomplishments, or more properly speaking, gifts, are the peculiar property of lovers errant. True it is that the verses of the knights of old have more spirits than neatness in them. Read more, your worship, said Sancho, and you will find something that will enlighten us. Don Quixote turned the page and said, this is prose, and seems to be a letter. A correspondence letter, senor? From the beginning it seems to be a love letter, replied Don Quixote. Then let your worship read it aloud, said Sancho, for I am very fond of love matters. With all my heart, said Don Quixote, and reading it aloud as Sancho had requested him, he found it ran thus. Thy false promise and my sure misfortune carry me to a place whence the news of my death will reach thy ears before the words of my complaint. Ungrateful one, thou hast rejected me for one more wealthy, but not more worthy. But if virtue were esteemed wealth, I should neither envy the fortunes of others nor weep for misfortunes of my own. What thy beauty raised up, thy deeds have laid low. By it I believed thee to be an angel, by them I know thou art a woman. Peace be with thee who hast sent war to me, and heaven grant that the deceit of thy husband be ever hidden from thee, so that thou repent not of what thou hast done, and I reap not a revenge I would not have. When he had finished the letter, Don Quixote said, There is less to be gathered from this than from the verses, except that he who wrote it is some rejected lover and turning over nearly all of the pages of the book, he found more verses and letters, some of which he could read, while others he could not. But they were all made up of complaints, lament, misgivings, desires, and aversions, favors and rejections, some rapturous, some doleful. While Don Quixote examined the book, Sancho examined the valise, not leaving a corner in the whole of it, or in the pad, that he did not search, peer into, and explore, or seem that he did not rip or tuft of wool that he did not pick to pieces, lest anything should escape for want of care and pains. So keen was the covetousness excited in him by the discovery of the crowns, which amounted to near a hundred. And though he found no more booty, he held the blanket flights, balsam vomits, stake benedictions, carriers, fisticuffs, missing alforges, stolen coat, and all the hunger, thirst, and weariness he had endured in the service of his good master, cheap at the price, as he considered himself more than fully indemnified for all by the payment he received in the gift of the treasure trove. The knight of the rueful countenance was still very anxious to find out who the owner of the valise could be, conjecturing from the sonnet and letter, from the money in gold, and from the fineness of the shirts, that he must be some lover of distinction, whom the scorn and cruelty of his lady had driven to some desperate course. But as in that uninhabited and rugged spot there was no one to be seen of whom he could inquire, he saw nothing else for it but to push on, taking whatever road Rocinante chose, which was where he could make his way, firmly persuaded that among these wilds he could not fail to meet some rare adventure. As he went along then, occupied with these thoughts, 
he perceived on the summit of a height that rose before their eyes a man who went springing from rock to rock and from tussock to tussock with marvellous agility. As well as he could make out, he was unclad, with a thick black beard, long tangled hair, and bare legs and feet. His thighs were covered by breeches apparently of tawny velvet, but so ragged that they showed his skin in several places. He was bareheaded, and notwithstanding the swiftness with which he passed, as has been described, the knight of the rueful countenance observed and noted all these trifles, and though he made the attempt he was unable to follow him, for it was not granted to the feebleness of Rocinante to make way over such rough ground, he being, moreover, slow-paced and sluggish by nature. Don Quixote at once came to the conclusion that this was the owner of the saddle-pad and of the valise, and made up his mind to go in search of him, even though he should have to wander a year in those mountains before he found him. And so he directed Sancho to take a short cut over one side of the mountain, while he himself went by the other, and perhaps by this means they might light upon this man who had passed so quickly out of their sight. "'I could not do that,' said Sancho. For when I separate from your worship, fear at once lays hold of me, and assails me with all sorts of panics and fancies. And let what I now say be a notice, that from this time forth I am not going to stir a finger's width from your presence. It shall be so, said he of the rueful countenance, and I am very glad that thou art willing to rely on my courage, which will never fail thee, even though the soul in thy body fail thee. So come on now behind me slowly as well thou canst, and make lanterns of thine eyes. Let us make the circuit of this ridge. Perhaps we shall light upon this man that we saw, who no doubt is no other than the owner of what we found. To which Sancho made answer, Far better would it be to not look for him, for if we find him and he happens to be the owner of the money, it is plain I must restore it. It would be better, therefore, that without taking this needless trouble I shall keep possession of it until, in some other less meddlesome and officious way, the real owner may be discovered, and perhaps that will be when I have spent it, and then the king will hold me harmless. "'Thou art wrong there, Sancho,' said Don Quixote, "'for now that we have a suspicion who the owner is, and have him almost before us, we are bound to seek him and make restitution.' and if we do not see him, the strong suspicion we have as to his being the owner makes us as guilty as if he were so. And so, friend Sancho, let not our search for him give thee any uneasiness, for if we find him it will relieve mine. And so saying he gave Rocinante the spur, and Sancho followed him on foot and loaded, and after having partly made the circuit of the mountain they found lying in a ravine, dead and half devoured by dogs and pecked by jackdaws, a mule saddled and bridled, all which still further strengthened their suspicion that he who had fled was the owner of the mule and the saddle-pad. As they stood looking at it, they heard a whistle like that of a shepherd watching his flock, and suddenly on their left there appeared a great number of goats, and behind them on the summit of the mountain the goat herd in charge of them, a man advanced in years. Don Quixote called aloud to him and begged him to come down to where they stood. He shouted in return, asking what had brought them to that spot, seldom or never trodden except by the feet of goats, or of the wolves and other wild beasts that roamed around. Sancho in return bade him come down, and they would explain all to him. The goatherd descended, and reaching the place where Don Quixote stood, he said, "'I will wager you are looking at that hack mule that lies dead in the hollow there, and, faith, it has been lying there now these six months. Tell me, have you come upon its master about here? We have come upon nobody, answered Don Quixote, nor on anything except a saddle-pad and a little valise that we found not far from this. I found it too, said the goat-herd, but I would not lift it, nor go near it, for fear of some ill luck or being charged with theft. For the devil is crafty, and things rise up under one's feet to make one fall without knowing why or wherefore. That's exactly what I say, said Sancho. I found it too, and I would not go within a stone's throw of it. There I left it, and there it lies just as it was, for I don't want a dog with a bell. Tell me, good man, said Don Quixote, do you know who is the owner of this property? All I can tell you, said the goatherd, 
is that about six months ago, more or less, there arrived at a shepherd's hut three leagues, perhaps, away from this, a youth of well-bred appearance and manners, mounted on that same mule which lies dead here, and with that same saddle-pad and valise which you say you found and did not touch. He asked us what part of the Sierra was the most rugged and retired. We told him that it was where we now are, and so in truth it is, for if you push on half a league farther, perhaps you will not be able to find your way out. And I am wondering how you managed to come here, for there is no road or path that leads to this spot. I say, then, that on hearing our answer, the youth turned about, and made for the place we pointed out to him, leaving us all charmed with his good looks, and wondering at his question, and the haste with which we saw him depart in the direction of the Sierra. And after that we saw him no more, until some days afterwards he crossed the path of one of our shepherds, and without saying a word to him, came up to him, and gave him several cuffs and kicks, and then turned to the ass with our provisions, and took all the bread and cheese it carried, and having done this made off back again into the Sierra with extraordinary swiftness. When some of us goatherds learned this, we went in search of him for about two days through the most remote portion of the Sierra, and at the end of which we found him lodged in the hollow of a large thick cork tree. He came out to meet us with great gentleness, with his dress now torn and his face so disfigured and burned by the sun, that we hardly recognized him but that his clothes, though torn, convinced us, from the recollection we had of them, that he was the person we were looking for. He saluted us courteously, and in a few well-spoken words told us not to wonder at seeing him going about in this guise, as it was binding upon him in order that he might work out a penance which for his many sins had been imposed upon him. We asked him to tell us who he was, but we were never able to find out from him. We begged of him, too, when he was in want of food, which he could not do without, to tell us where we should find him, as we would bring it to him with all good will and readiness. Or if this were not his taste, at least to come and ask it of us and not take it by force from the shepherds. He thanked us for the offer, begged pardon for the late assault, and promised for the future to ask it in God's name without offering violence to anybody. As for fixed abode, he said he had no other than that which chance offered wherever a knight might overtake him and his words ended in an outburst of weeping so bitter that we who listened to him must have been very stones had we not joined him in it, comparing what we saw of him the first time with what we saw now. For, as I said, he was a graceful and gracious youth, and in his courteous and polished language showed himself to be of good birth and courtly breeding, and rustics as we were that listened to him, even to our rusticity his gentle bearing sufficed to make it plain." but in the midst of his conversation he stopped and became silent keeping his eyes fixed upon the ground for some time during which we stood still waiting anxiously to see what would come of this abstraction and with no little pity for from his behaviour now staring at the ground with fixed gaze and eyes wide open without moving an eyelid again closing them compressing his lips and raising his eyebrows we could perceive plainly that a fit of madness of some kind had come upon him and before long he showed that what we imagined was the truth, for he arose in a fury from the ground where he had thrown himself, and attacked the first he found near him with such rage and fierceness that if we had not dragged him off him he would have beaten or bitten him to death, all the while exclaiming, O oh, faithless Fernando, here, here thou shalt pay the penalty of the wrong thou hast done me. These hands shall tear out that heart of thine, abode and dwelling of all iniquity, but of deceit and fraud above all. And to these he added other words, all in effect upbraiding this Fernando, and charging him with treachery and faithlessness. We forced him to release his hold with no little difficulty, and without another word he left us, and rushing off plunged in among these brakes and brambles, so as to make it impossible for us to follow him. From this we suppose that madness comes upon him from time to time, and that someone called Fernando must have done him a wrong of a grievous nature, such as the condition to which it had brought him seemed to show. All this has been since then confirmed on those occasions, and they have been many, on which he has crossed our path, at one time to beg the shepherds to give him some of the food they carry, at another to take it from them by force. For when there is a fit of madness upon him, even though the shepherds offer it freely, he will not accept it, but snatches it from them by dint of blows. But when he is in his senses, 
He begs it for the love of God, courteously and civilly, and receives it with many thanks and not a few tears. And to tell you the truth, sirs, continued the goatherd, it was yesterday that we resolved, I and four of the lads, two of them our servants, and the other two friends of mine, to go in search of him until we find him, and when we do to take him, whether by force or of his own consent, to the town of Almodovar, which is eight leagues from this, and there strive to cure him, if indeed his malady admits of a cure, or learn when he is in his senses who he is, and if he has relatives, to whom we may give notice of his misfortune. This, sirs, is all I can say in answer to what you have asked me, and be sure that the owner of the articles you found is he whom you saw pass by with such nimbleness and so naked. For Don Quixote had already described how he had seen the man go bounding along the mountainside, and he was now filled with amazement at what he heard from the goatherd, and more eager than ever to discover who the unhappy madman was. And in his heart he resolved, as he had done before, to search for him all over the mountain, not leaving a corner or cave unexamined until he had found him. But chance arranged matters better than he expected or hoped, for at that very moment, in a gorge on the mountain that opened where they stood, the youth he wished to find made his appearance, coming along talking to himself in a way that would have been unintelligible near at hand much more at a distance. His garb was what has been described, save that as he drew near Don Quixote perceived that a tattered doublet which he wore was amber-tanned, from which he concluded that one who wore such garments could not be of very low rank. Approaching them, the youth greeted them in a harsh and hoarse voice, but with great courtesy. Don Quixote returned his salutation with equal politeness, and, dismounting from Rocinante, advanced with well-bred bearing and grace to embrace him, and held him for some time close in his arms, as if he had known him for a long time. The other, whom we may call the ragged one of the sorry countenance, as Don Quixote was of the rueful, after submitting to the embrace pushed him back a little, and, placing his hands on Don Quixote's shoulders, stood gazing at him as if seeking to see whether he knew him, not less amazed, perhaps, at the sight of the face, figure, and armor of Don Quixote than Don Quixote was at the sight of him. To be brief, the first to speak after embracing was the ragged one, and he said what will be told farther on. End of chapter 23 End of part 8「This is a these four chapters uh, are summarized as follows. Chapter 24, in which is continued the adventure of the Sierra Morena. Chapter 25, which treats of the strange things that happened to the stout knight of La Mancha in the Sierra Morena, and of his imitation of the penance of Beltimbros. Chapter 26, in which are continued the refinements wherewith Don Quixote played the part of a lover in the Sierra Morena. Chapter 27 Of how the curate and the barber proceeded with their scheme, together with other matters worthy of record in this great history. Chapter 24 In which is contained and continued the adventure of the Sierra Morena. The history relates that it was with the greatest attention Don Quixote listened to the ragged knight of the Sierra, who began by saying, Of a surety, senor, whoever you are, for I know you not. I thank you for the proofs of kindness and courtesy you have shown me, and what I were in a condition to requite with something more than good will that which you have displayed toward me in the cordial reception you have given me but my feet 
does not afford me any other means of returning kindness has done me save the hearty desire to repay them mine replied don quixote is to be of service to you so much so that i have resolved not to quit these mountains until i had found you and learned of you whether there is any kind of relief to be found for that sorrow under which from the strangeness of your life you seem to labour and to search for you with all possible diligence if search had been necessary and if your misfortune should prove to be one of those that refuse admission to any sort of consolation it was my purpose to join you in lamenting and mourning over it so far as i could for it is still some comfort in misfortune to find one who can feel for it and if my good intentions deserve to be acknowledged with any kind of courtesy i entreat you signor by that which i perceive you possess in so high a degree and likewise conjure you by whatever you love or have loved best in life to tell me who you are and the cause that has brought you to live or die in these solitudes like a brute beast dwelling among them in a manner so foreign to your condition as your garb and appearance show and i swear added don quixote by the order of knighthood which i have received and by my vocation of knight-errant if you gratify me in this to serve you with all the zeal my calling demands of me either in relieving your misfortune if it admits of relief or in joining you in lamenting it as i promised to do the knight of the thicket hearing him of the rueful countenance talk in this strain did nothing but stare at him and stare at him again and again survey him from head to foot and when he had thoroughly examined him he said to him if you have anything to give me to eat for god's sake give it me and after i have eaten i will do all you ask in acknowledgment of the good will you have displayed towards me sancho from his sack and the goatherd from his pouch furnished the ragged one with the means of appeasing his hunger and what they gave him he ate like a half-witted being so hastily that he took no time between mouthfuls gorging rather than swallowing and while he ate neither he nor they who observed him uttered a word as soon as he had done he made signs to them to follow him which they did and he led them to a green plot which lay a little farther off round the corner of a rock on reaching it he stretched himself upon the grass and the others did the same all keeping silence until the ragged one settling himself in his place said if it is your wish sirs that i should disclose in a few words the surpassing extent of my misfortunes you must promise not to break the thread of my sad story with any question or other interruption for the instant you do so the tale i tell will come to an end these words of the ragged one reminded don quixote of the tale his squire had told him when he failed to keep count of the goats that had crossed the river and the story remained unfinished but to return to the ragged one he went on to say i give you this warning because i wish to pass briefly over the story of my misfortunes for recalling them to memory only serves to add fresh ones and the less you question me the sooner shall i make an end of the recital though i shall not omit to relate anything of importance in order fully to satisfy your curiosity don quixote gave the promise for himself and the others and with this assurance he began as follows my name is cardenio my birthplace one of the best cities of this andalusia my family noble my parents rich my misfortune so great that my parents must have wept and my family grieved over it without being able by their wealth to lighten it for the gifts of fortune can do little to relieve reverses sent by heaven in that same country there was a heaven in which love had placed all the glory i could desire such was the beauty of lucinda a damsel as noble and as rich as i but of happier fortunes and of less firmness than was due to so worthy a passion as mine this lucinda i loved worshipped 
and adored from my earliest and tenderest years, and she loved me in all the innocence and sincerity of childhood. Our parents were aware of our feelings, and were not sorry to perceive them, for they saw clearly that as they ripened they must lead at last to a marriage between us, a thing that seemed almost prearranged by the equality of our families and wealth. We grew up, and with our growth grew the love between us, so that the father of Lucinda felt bound for propriety's sake to refuse me admission to his house in this perhaps imitating the parents of that Thisbe so celebrated by the poets, and this refusal, but added love to love and flame to flame. For though they enforced silence upon our tongues, they could not impose it upon our pins, which can make known the heart's secrets to a loved one more freely than tongues. For many a time the presence of the object of love shakes the firmest will and strikes dumb the boldest tongue. Ah, heavens, how many letters did I write her, and how many dainty modest replies did I receive, how many ditties and love songs did I compose, in which my heart declared and made known its feelings, described its ardent longings, reveled in its recollections, and dallied with its desires. At length, growing impatient and feeling my heart languishing with longing to see her, I resolved to put into execution and carry out what seemed to me the best mode of winning my desired and merited reward, to ask her of her father for my lawful wife, which I did. To this his answer was that he thanked me for the disposition I showed to do honour to him, and to regard myself as honoured by the bestowal of his treasure but that as my father <clears throat> was alive it was his by right to make this demand, for if it were not in accordance with his full will and pleasure, Lucinda was not to be taken or given by stealth. I thanked him for his kindness, reflecting that there was reason in what he said, and that my father would assent to it as soon as I should tell him, and with that view I went the very same instant to let him know what my desires were. When I entered the room where he was, I found him with an open letter in his hand, which, before I could utter a word, he gave me, saying, By this letter thou wilt see, Cardinio, the disposition the Duke Ricardo has to serve thee. This Duke Ricardo, as you sirs probably know already, is a grandee of Spain, who has his seat in the best part of this Andalusia. I took and read the letter which was couched in terms so flattering that even I myself felt it would be wrong in my father not to comply with the request the duke made in it, which was that he would send me immediately to him, as he wished me to become the companion, not servant, of his eldest son, and would take upon himself the charge of placing me in a position corresponding to the esteem in which he held me. On reading the letter, my voice failed me, and still more when I heard my father say, Two days hence thou wilt depart, Cardinio, in accordance with the duke's wish, and give thanks to God who is opening a road to thee by which thou mayest attain what I know thou dost deserve. And to these words he added others of fatherly counsel. The time for my departure arrived. I spoke one night to Lucinda, I told her all that had occurred, as I did also to her father, entreating him to allow some delay, and to defer the disposal of her hand until I should see what the Duke Ricardo sought of me. He gave me the promise, and she confirmed it with vows and swoonings unnumbered. Finally I presented myself to the Duke, and was received and treated by him so kindly that very soon envy began to do its work, the old servants growing envious of me, and regarding the duke's inclination to show me favor as an injury to themselves. But the one to whom my arrival gave the greatest pleasure was the duke's second son, Fernando by name, a gallant youth, of noble, generous, and amorous disposition, who very soon made so intimate a friend of me that it was remarked by everybody, for though the elder was attached to me, and showed me kindness, he did not carry his affectionate treatment to the same length as Don Fernando. 
it so happened then that as between friends no secret remains unshared and as the favour i enjoyed with don fernando had grown into friendship he made all his thoughts known to me and in particular a love affair which troubled his mind a little he was deeply in love with a peasant girl a vassal of his father's the daughter of wealthy parents and herself so beautiful modest discreet and virtuous that no one who knew her was able to decide in which of these respects she was most highly gifted or most excelled the attractions of the fair peasant raised the passion of don fernando to such a point that in order to gain his object and overcome her virtuous resolutions he determined to pledge his word to her to become her husband for to attempt it in any other way was to attempt an impossibility bound to him as i was by friendship i strove by the best arguments and the most forcible examples i could think of to restrain and dissuade him from such a course but perceiving i produced no effect i resolved to make the duke ricardo his father acquainted with the matter but don fernando being sharp-witted and shrewd foresaw and apprehended this perceiving that by my duty and as a good servant i was bound not to keep concealed a thing so much opposed to the honour of my lord the duke and so to mislead and deceive me he told me he could find no better way of effacing from his mind the beauty that so enslaved him than by absenting himself for some months and that he wished the absence to be effected by our going both of us to my father's house under the pretense which he would make to the duke of going to see and buy some fine horses that there were in my city which produces the best in the world when i heard him say so even if his resolution had not been so good a one i should have hailed it as one of the happiest that could be imagined prompted by my affection seeing what a favourable chance and opportunity it offered me of returning to see my lucinda with this thought and wish i commended his idea and encouraged his design advising him to put it into execution as quickly as possible as in truth absence produced its effect in spite of the most deeply rooted feelings but as afterwards appeared when he said this to me he had already enjoyed the peasant girl under the title of husband and was waiting for an opportunity of making it known with safety to himself being in dread of what his father the duke would do when he came to know of his folly it happened then that as with young men love is for the most part nothing more than appetite which as its final object is enjoyment comes to an end on obtaining it and that which seemed to be love takes to flight as it cannot pass the limit fixed by nature which fixes no limit to true love what i mean is that after don F fernando had enjoyed this peasant girl his passion subsided and his eagerness cooled and if at first he feigned a wish to absent himself in order to cure his love he was now in reality anxious to go to avoid keeping his promise the duke gave him permission and ordered me to accompany him we arrived at my city and my father gave him the reception due to his rank i saw lucinda without delay and though it had not been uh, dead or deadened my love gathered fresh life to my sorrow i told the story of it to don fernando for i thought that in virtue of the great friendship he bore me i was bound to conceal nothing from him i extolled her beauty her gaiety her wit so warmly that my praises excited in him a desire to see a damsel adorned by such attractions to my misfortune i yielded to it showing her to him one night by the light of a taper at a window where we used to talk to one another as she appeared to him in her dressing-gown she drove all the beauties he had seen until then out of his recollection speech failed him his head turned he was spellbound and in the end love smitten as you will see in the course of the story of my misfortune and to inflame still further his passion which he hid from me and revealed to heaven alone it so happened 
that one day he found a note of hers entreating me to demand her of her father in marriage so delicate so modest and so tender that on reading it he told me that in lucinda alone were combined all the charms of beauty and understanding that were distributed among all the other women in the world it is true and i own it now that though i knew what good cause don fernando had to praise lucinda it gave me uneasiness to hear these praises from his mouth and i began to fear and with reason to feel distrust of him for there was no moment <clears throat> when he was not ready to talk of lucinda and he would start the subject himself even though he dragged it unseasonably a circumstance that aroused in me a certain amount of jealousy not that i feared any change in the constancy or faith of lucinda but still my fate led me to forebode what she assured me against don fernando contrived always to read the letters i sent to lucinda and her answers to me under the pretense that he enjoyed the wit and sense of both it so happened then that lucinda having begged of me a book of chivalry to read one that she was very fond of amadis of gaul don quixote no sooner heard a book of chivalry mentioned than he said uh, had your worship told me at the beginning of your story that the lady lucinda was fond of books of chivalry no other laudation would have been requisite to impress upon me the superiority of her understanding for it could not have been of the excellence you describe had a taste for such delightful reading been wanting so as far as i am concerned you need waste no more words in describing her beauty worth and intelligence for on merely hearing what her taste was i declare her to be the most beautiful and the most intelligent woman in the world and i wish your worship had along with amadis of gaul sent her the worthy don rugel of greece for i know the lady lucinda would greatly relish dereda and garaya and the shrewd sayings of the shepherd derinel and the admirable verses of his bucolics sung and delivered by him with such sprightliness wit and ease but a time may come when this omission can be remedied and to rectify it nothing more is needed than for your worship to be so good as to come with me to my village for there i can give you more than three hundred books which are the delight of my soul and the entertainment of my life though it occurs to me that <clears throat> i have not got one of them now thanks to the spite of wicked and envious enchanters but pardon me for having broken the promise we made not to interrupt your discourse for when i hear chivalry or knights errant mentioned i can no more help talking about them than the rays of the sun can help giving heat or those of the moon moisture pardon me therefore and proceed for that is more to the purpose now while don quixote was saying this Cardinio allowed his head to fall upon his breast, and seemed plunged in deep thought. And though twice Don Quixote bade him go on with his story, he neither looked up nor uttered a word in reply. But after some time he raised his head and said, I cannot get rid of the idea, nor will any one in the world remove it, or make me think otherwise, and he would be a blockhead, who would hold or believe anything else than that that errant knave master elisbad made free with queen madasima that is not true by all that's good said don quixote with high wrath turning upon him angrily as his way was and it is a very great slander or rather villainy queen madasima was a very illustrious lady and it is not to be supposed that so exalted a princess would have made free with a quack and whoever maintains the contrary lies like a great scoundrel and i will give him to know it on foot or on horseback armed or unarmed by night or by day or as he likes best cardinio was looking at him steadily and his mad fit having now come upon him he had no disposition to go on with his story nor would don quixote have listened to it so much had what he had heard about madasima disgusted him strange to say he stood up for her as if she were in earnest his veritable born lady to such a pass and had his unholy books brought him 
Cardinio then, being, as I said, now mad, when he heard himself given the lie, and called a scoundrel and other insulting names, not relishing the jest, snatched up a stone that he found near him, and with it delivered such a blow on Don Quixote's breast that he laid him on his back. Sancho Panza, seeing his master treated in this fashion, attacked the madman with his closed fist. But the ragged one received him in such a way that with a blow of his fist he stretched him at his feet, and then mounting upon him crushed his ribs to his own satisfaction. The goatherd who came to the rescue shared the same fate, and having beaten and pummeled them all he left them and quietly withdrew to his hiding place on the mountain. Sancho rose, and with the rage he felt at finding himself so belabored without deserving it, ran to take vengeance on the goatherd, accusing him of not giving them warning that this man was at times taken with a mad fit. For if they had known it, they would have been on their guard to protect themselves. The goatherd replied that he had said so, and that if he had not hurt him, that was no fault of his. Sancho retorted, and the goatherd rejoined, and the altercation ended in their seizing each other by the beard, and exchanging such fisticuffs, that if Don Quixote had not made peace between them, they would have knocked one another to pieces. "'Leave me alone, sir knight of the rueful countenance,' said Sancho, grappling with the goatherd, "'for of this fellow, who is a clown like myself, and no dub knight, "'I can safely take satisfaction for the affront he has offered me, "'fighting with him hand to hand like an honest man.' "'That is true,' said Don Quixote, "'but I know that he is not to blame for what has happened.' "'With this he pacified them, "'and again asked the goatherd "'if it would be possible to find Cardinio, "'as he felt the greatest anxiety "'to know the end of his story. "'The goatherd told him, as he had told him before, "'that there was no knowing of a certainty "'where his lair was, "'but that if he wondered about much in that neighborhood he could not fail to fall in with him either in or out of his senses and that's the end of part nine chapter twenty four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby, Part 9, Chapter 25, recording by Bob Foster, Montreal, Canada, May thirtieth, two 2006. Chapter 25, which treats of the strange things that happened to the stout knight of La Mancha in the Sierra Morena, and of his imitation of the penance of Beltenbros. Don Quixote took leave of the goatherd, and once more mounting Rocinante, bade Sancho follow him, which he, having no ass, did very discontentedly. They proceeded slowly, making their way into the most rugged part of the mountain, Sancho all the while dying to have a talk with his master, and longing for him to begin, so that there should be no breach of the injunction laid upon him. But unable to keep silence so long, he said to him, Signor Don Quixote, give me your worship's blessing and dismissal, for I'd like to go home at once to my wife and children, with whom I can at any rate talk and converse as much as I like. For to want me to go through these solitudes day and night and not speak to you when I have a mind is burying me alive. If luck would have it that animals spoke as they did in the days of Quisopete, it would not be so bad, because I could talk to Rocinante about whatever came into my head and so put up with my ill fortune. But it is a hard case, and not to be borne with patience, to go seeking adventures all one's life and getting nothing but kicks and blanketings, brickbats and punches, and with all this to have to sew up one's mouth without daring to say what is in one's heart, just as if one were dumb. 
"'I understand thee, Sancho,' replied Don Quixote. "'Thou art dying to have the interdict I placed upon thy tongue removed. "'Consider it removed, and say what thou wilt while we are wandering in these mountains.' "'So be it,' said Sancho. "'Let me speak now, for God knows what will happen by and by, "'and to take advantage of the permit at once. "'I ask, what made your worship stand up so for that queen Majimasa, "'or whatever her name is, or what did it matter "'whether that abbot was a friend of hers or not? "'For if your worship had let that pass, "'and you were not a judge in the matter, "'it is my belief the madman would have gone on with his story.' and the blow of the stone and the kicks and more than half a dozen cuffs would have been escaped. "'In faith, Sancho,' answered Don Quixote, "'if thou knewest, as I do, what an honourable and illustrious lady Queen Madasima was, I know thou wouldst say I had great patience that I did not break in pieces the mouth that uttered such blasphemies, for a very great blasphemy it is to say or imagine that a queen has made free with a surgeon. The truth of the story is that that master Elizabeth, whom the madman mentioned, was a man of great prudence and sound judgment, and served as governor and physician to the queen, but to suppose that she was his mistress is nonsense deserving very severe punishment and as a proof that cardinio did not know what he was saying remember when he said he was out of his wits that is what i say said sancho there was no occasion for minding the words of a madman for if good luck had not helped your worship and he had sent that stone at your head instead of at your breast a fine way we should have been in for standing up for my lady yonder god confound her and then would not cardinio have gone free as a madman "'Against men in their senses, or against madmen,' said Don Quixote, "'every knight-errant is bound to stand up for the honour of women, "'whoever they may be, much more for queens of such high degree and dignity "'as Queen Medicima, for whom I have a particular regard "'on account of her amiable qualities. "'For besides being extremely beautiful, she was very wise "'and very patient under her misfortunes, of which she had many.' and the council and society of the master elizabeth were a great help and support to her in enduring her afflictions with wisdom and resignation hence the ignorant and ill-disposed vulgar took occasion to say and think that she was his mistress and they lie i say it once more and will lie two hundred times more all who think and say so I neither say nor think so, said Sancho. Let them look to it. With their bread, let them eat it. They have rendered account to God whether they misbehaved or not. I come from my vineyard. I know nothing. I am not fond of prying into other men's lives. He who buys and lies feels it in his purse. Moreover, naked was I born. Naked I find myself, and I neither lose nor gain. But if they did, what is that to me? Many think there are flitches where there are no hooks, but who can put gates to the open plain? Moreover, they said of God, God bless me, said Don Quixote, what a set of absurdities thou art stringing together. What has what we are talking about got to do with the proverbs thou art threading one after the other? For God's sake, hold thy tongue. Sancho, and henceforward keep to prodding thy ass, and don't meddle in what does not concern thee, and understand with all thy five senses that everything I have done, am doing, or shall do, is well founded on reason and in conformity with the rules of chivalry, for I understand them better than all the world that profess them. Signor, replied Sancho, it is a good rule of chivalry that we should go astray through these mountains without path or road, looking for a madman who, when he is found, will perhaps take a fancy to finish what he began, not his story, but your worship's head and my ribs, and end by breaking them all together for us. 
peace, I say again, Sancho, said Don Quixote, for let me tell thee it is not so much the desire of finding that madman that leads me into these regions as that which I have of performing among them an achievement wherewith I shall win eternal name and fame throughout the known world, and it shall be such that I shall thereby set the seal on all that can make a knight-errant perfect and famous." And is it very perilous, this achievement? No, replied he of the rueful countenance, though it may be in the dice that we may throw deuce ace instead of sixes, but all will depend on thy diligence. On my diligence, said Sancho? Yes, said Don Quixote, for if thou dost return soon from the place where I mean to send thee, my penance will be soon over, and my glory will soon begin. But as it is not right to keep thee any longer in suspense, waiting to see what comes of my words, I would have thee know, Sancho, that the famous Amadis of Gaul was one of the most perfect knights errant. I am wrong to say he was one. He stood alone, the first, the only one, the lord of all that were in the world in his time, a fig for Dambilianus, and for all who say he equaled him in any respect, for my oath upon it, they are deceiving themselves. I say, too, that when a painter desires to become famous in his art, he endeavors to copy the originals of the rarest painters that he knows, and the same rule holds good for all the most important crafts and callings that serve to adorn a state. Thus must he who would be esteemed prudent and patient imitate Ulysses, in whose person and labours Homer presents to us a lively picture of prudence and patience, as Virgil too shows us in the person of Aeneas, the virtue of a pious son and the sagacity of a brave and skilful captain, not representing or describing them as they were, but as they ought to be so as to leave the example of their virtues to posterity. In the same way Amadis was the pole-star, day-star, son of valiant and devoted knights, whom all we who fight under the banner of love and chivalry are bound to imitate. This, then, being so, I consider, friend Sancho, that the knight-errant who shall imitate him most closely will come nearest to reaching the perfection of chivalry, now one of the instances in which this knight most conspicuously showed his prudence, worth, valor, endurance, fortitude, and love, was when he withdrew, rejected by the Lady Oriana, to do penance upon the Pina Pobre, changing his name into that of Beltimbros, a name assuredly significant and appropriate to the life which he had voluntarily adopted. So, as it is easier for me to imitate him in this than in cleaving giants asunder, cutting off serpents' heads, slaying dragons, routing armies, destroying fleets, and breaking enchantments, and as this place is so well suited for a similar purpose, I must not allow the opportunity to escape which now so conveniently offers me its forelock. What is in it? Reality, said Sancho, that your worship means to do in such an out-of-the-way place as this. Have I not told thee, answered Don Quixote, that I mean to imitate Amadis here, playing the victim of despair, the madman, the maniac, so as at the same time to imitate the valiant Don Roland, when at the fountain he had evidence of the fair Angelica, having disgraced herself with Midoro, and through grief thereat went mad, and plucked up trees, troubled the waters of the clear springs, slew destroyed flocks, burned down huts, leveled houses, dragged mares after him, and perpetrated a hundred thousand other outrages worthy of everlasting renown and record. And though I have no intention of imitating Roland, or Orlando, or Rotolando, for he went by all these names, step by step in all the mad things he did, said, and thought. I will make a rough copy to the best of my power of all that seems to me most essential, but perhaps I shall content myself with the simple imitation of Amadis, who without giving way to any mischievous madness, but merely to tears and sorrow, 
gained as much fame as the most famous. It seems to me, said Sancho, that the knights who behaved in this way had provocation and cause for those follies and penances. But what cause has your worship for going mad? What lady has rejected you, or what evidence have you found to prove that the lady Dulcinea del Toboso has been trifling with Moor or Christian? There is the point, replied Don Quixote, and that is the beauty of this business of mine. No thanks to a knight-errant for going mad when he has cause. The thing is to turn crazy without any provocation, and let my lady know, if I do this in the dry, what I would do in the moist. Moreover, I have abundant cause in the long separation I have, I have endured from my lady till death. Dulcinea del Toboso, for as thou didst hear that shepherd Ambrosio say the other day, in absence all ills are felt and feared, and so, friend Sancho, waste no time in advising me against so rare, so happy, and so unheard of an imitation. Mad I am, and mad I must be, until thou returnest with the answer to a letter that I mean to send by thee to my lady Dulcinea, and if it be such as my constancy deserves, my insanity and penance will come to an end, and if it be to the opposite effect I shall become mad in earnest, and being so I shall suffer no more. Thus in whatever way she may answer, I shall escape from the struggle and affliction in which thou wilt leave me, enjoying in my senses the boon thou bearest me, or as a madman, not feeling the evil thou bringest me. But tell me, Sancho, hast thou got Mambrino's helmet safe? For I saw thee take it up from the ground when that ungrateful wretch tried to break it in pieces, but could not, but which the fineness of its temper may be seen. To which Sancho made answer, By the living God, Sir Knight of the Rueful Countenance, I cannot endure or bear with patience some of the things that your worship says, and from them I begin to suspect that all you tell me about chivalry, and winning kingdoms and empires, and giving islands, and bestowing other rewards and dignities after the custom of knights errant, must be all made up of wind and lies, and all pigments or figments, or whatever we may call them. For what would any one think that heard your worship calling a barber's basin Mambrino's helmet without ever seeing the mistake all this time, but that one who says and maintains such things must have his brains addled? I have the basin in my sack all dented, and I am taking it home to have it mended, to trim my beard in it, if, by God's grace, I am allowed to see my wife and children some day or other. Look here, Sancho, said Don Quixote, by him thou didst swear by just now, I swear thou hast the most limited understanding that any squire in the world has or ever had. It is possible that all this time thou hast been going about with me, thou hast never found out that all things belonging to knights errant seem to be illusions and nonsense and ravings and to go always by contraries, and not because it really is so, but because there is always a swarm of enchanters in attendance upon us that change and alter everything with us, and turn things as they please, and according as they are disposed to aid or destroy us. Thus what seems to thee a barber's basin seems to me Mambrino's helmet, and to another it will seem something else. And rare foresight it was in this age who was on my side to make what is really and truly Mambrino's helmet seem a basin to everybody, for being held in such estimation as it is, all the world would pursue me to rob me of it. But when they see it, it is only a barber's basin. They do not take the trouble to obtain it, as was plainly shown by him who tried to break it, and left it on the ground without taking it, for by my faith had he known it, he would never have left it behind." keep it safe, my friend, for just now I have no need of it. Indeed, I shall have to take off all this armor and remain as naked as I was born, if I have a mind to follow Roland rather than Amadeus in my penance. 
Thus talking, they reached the foot of a high mountain which stood like an isolated peak among the others that surrounded it. Past its base there flowed a gentle brook. All around it spread a meadow so green and luxuriant that it was a delight to the eyes to look upon it, and forest trees in abundance and shrubs and flowers added to the charms of the spot. Upon this place the knight of the rueful countenance fixed his choice for the performance of his penance, and as he beheld it exclaimed in a loud voice as though he were out of his senses. This is the place, O oh, ye heavens, that I select and choose for bewailing the misfortune in which ye yourselves have plunged me. This is the spot where the overflowings of mine eyes shall swell the waters of yon little brook, and my deep and endless sighs shall stir unceasingly the leaves of these mountain trees, in testimony and token of the pain my persecuted heart is suffering. O oh, ye rural deities! whoever ye be that haunt this lone spot give ear to the complaint of a wretched lover whom long absence and brooding jealousy have driven to bewail his fate among these wilds and complain of the hard heart of that fair and ungrateful one the end and limit of all human beauty o oh, ye wood nymphs and dryads that dwell in the thickets of the forest so may the nimble wanton satyrs by whom ye are vainly wooed never disturb your sweet repose help me to lament my hard fate or at least weary not at listening to it o dulcinea del tobaso day of my night glory of my pain guide of my path star of my fortune so may heaven grant thee in full all thou seekest of it bethink thee of the place and condition to which absence from thee has brought me, and make that return in kindness that is due to my fidelity. O lonely trees that from this day forward shall bear me company in my solitude, give me some sign by the gentle movement of your boughs that my presence is not distasteful to you. O thou, my squire, pleasant companion in my prosperous and adverse fortunes, Fix well in thy memory what thou shalt see me do here, so that thou mayest relate and report it to the sole cause of all. And so saying, he dismounted from Rocinante, and in an instant relieved him of saddle and bridle, and giving him a slap on the croup, said, He gives thee freedom who is bereft of it himself. O steed, as excellent indeed as thou art, unfortunate in thy lot, be gone where thou wilt, for thou bearest written on thy forehead that neither Astolfo's hippogriff nor the famed Frontino that cost Bradamante so dear could equal thee in speed. Seeing this, Sancho said, Good luck to him who has saved us the trouble of stripping the pack-saddle off Dapple. By my faith he would not have gone without a slap on the croup, and something said in his praise, though if he were here I would not let any one strip him, for there would be no occasion, as he had nothing of the lover or victim of despair about him, inasmuch as his master, which I was, while it was God's pleasure, was nothing of the sort. And indeed, Sir Knight of the Rueful Countenance, if my departure and your worship's madness are to come off in earnest, it will be as well to saddle Rocinante again, in order that he may supply the want of Dapple, because it will save me time in going and returning, for if I go on foot I don't know when I shall get there or when I shall get back, as I am, in truth, a bad walker. I declare, Sancho, returned Don Quixote, it shall be as thou wilt, for thy plan does not seem to me a bad one, and three days hence thou wilt depart, for I wish thee to observe in the meantime what I do and say for her sake, that thou mayest be able to tell it. But what more have I to see besides what I have seen, said Sancho? Much thou knowest about it, said Don Quixote, I have now got to tear up my garments, to scatter about my armor, knock my head against these rocks, and more of the same sort of thing which thou must witness. 
for the love of god said sancho be careful your worship how you give yourself those knocks on the head for you may come across such a rock and in such a way that the very first may put an end to the whole contrivance of this penance and i should think if indeed knocks on the head seem necessary to you and this business cannot be done without them you might be content as the whole thing is feigned and counterfeit and in joke you might be content i say with giving them to yourself in the water or against something soft like cotton and leave it all to me for i'll tell my lady that your worship knocked your head against a point of rock harder than a diamond i thank thee for thy good intentions friend sancho answered don quixote but i would have thee know that all these things i am doing are not in joke but very much in earnest for anything else would be a transgression of the ordinances of chivalry which forbid us to tell any lie whatever under the penalties due to apostasy and to do one thing instead of another is just the same as lying so my knocks on the head must be real solid and valid without anything sophisticated or fanciful about them and it will be needful to leave me some lint to dress my wounds since fortune has compelled us to do without the balsam we lost it was worse losing the ass replied sancho for with him lint and all were lost but i beg of your worship not to remind me again of that accursed liquor for my soul not to say my stomach turns at hearing the very name of it and i beg of you too to reckon as past the three days you allowed me for seeing the mad things you do for i take them as seen already and pronounced upon and i will tell wonderful stories to my lady so write the letter and send me off at once for i long to return and take your worship out of this purgatory where i am leaving you purgatory dost thou call it sancho said don quixote rather call it hell or even worse if there be anything worse for one who is in hell said sancho nulla est retentio as i have heard say i do not understand what retentio means says don quixote retentio answered sancho means that whoever is in hell never comes nor can come out of it which will be the opposite case with your worship or my legs will be idle that is if i have spurs to enliven rosinante let me once get to el toboso and into the presence of my lady dulcinea and i will tell her such things of the follies and madnesses for it is all one that your worship has done and is still doing that i will manage to make her softer than a glove though i find her harder than a cork tree and with her sweet and honeyed answer i will come back through the air like a witch and take your worship out of this purgatory that seems to be hell but is not as there is hope of getting out of it which as i have said those in hell have not and i believe your worship will not say anything to the contrary that is true said he of the rueful countenance but how shall we manage to write the letter and the ass-colt order too said sancho all shall be included said don quixote and as there is no paper it will be well done to write it on the leaves of trees as the ancients did or on tablets of wax though that would be as hard to find just now as paper but it has just occurred to me how it may be conveniently and even more than conveniently written and that is in the notebook that belonged to cardinio and thou wilt take care to have it copied on paper in a good hand as the first village thou comest to where there is a schoolmaster or if not any sacristan will copy it but see thou give it not to any notary to copy for they write a law hand that satan could not make out but what is to be done about the signature said sancho the letters of amadis were never signed said don quixote that is all very well said sancho but the order must needs be signed and if it is copied they will say the signature is false and i shall be left without ask colts the order shall go signed in the same book said don quixote and on seeing it my niece will make no difficulty about obeying it 
as to the love letter thou canst put by way of signature yours till death the knight to the rueful countenance and it will be no great matter if it is in some other person's hand for as well as i recollect dulcinea can neither read nor write nor in the whole course of her life has she seen handwriting or letter of mine for my love and hers have been always platonic not going beyond a modest look and even that so seldom that i can safely swear i have not seen her four times in all these twelve years i have been loving her more than the light of these eyes that the earth will one day devour and perhaps even of those four times she has not once perceived that i was looking at her such as the retirement and seclusion in which her father lorenzo corchualo and her mother aldonza nogales have brought her up so so said sancho lorenzo corchualo's daughter is the lady dulcineo del tobaso otherwise called aldonza lorenzo she it is said don quixote and she it is that is worthy to be lady of the whole universe i know her well said sancho and let me tell you she can fling a crowbar as well as the lustiest lad in all the town give her of all good but she is a brave lass and a right and stout one and fit to be helpmate to any knight errant that is or is to be who may make her his lady the whoreson wench what sting she has and what a voice i can tell you one day she posted herself on the top of the belfry of the village to call some laborers of theirs that were in a ploughed field of her father's and though they were better than half a league off they heard her as well as if they were at the foot of the tower and the best of her is that she is not a bit prudish for she has plenty of affability and jokes with everybody and has a grin and a jest for everything so sir knight of the rueful countenance i say you not only may and ought to do mad freaks for her sake but you have a good right to give way to despair and hang yourself and no one knows of it but will say you did well though the devil should take you and i wish i were on my road already simply to see her for it is many a day since i saw her and she must be altered by this time for going about the fields always and the sun and the air spoil women's looks greatly but i must own the truth to your worship signor don quixote until now i have been under a great mistake for i believed truly and honestly that the lady dulcinea must be some princess your worship was in love with or some person great enough to deserve the rich presents you have sent her such as the biscayenne and the galley slaves and many more no doubt for your worship must have won many victories in the time when i was not yet your squire but all things considered what good can it do the lady aldonza lorenzo i mean the lady dulcineo del tobaso to have the vanquished your worship sins or will send coming to her and going down on their knees before her because maybe when they came she'd be hackling flax or threshing on the threshing floor and they'd be ashamed to see her and she'd laugh or resent the present end of part nine chapter twenty five part one This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby, Part 9, Chapter 25, Continued. Recording by Bob Foster, Montreal, Canada, May thirtieth, two 2006. I have before now told thee many times, Sancho, said Don Quixote, that thou art a mighty great chatterer, and that with a blunt wit thou art always striving at sharpness. But to show thee what a fool thou art, and how rational I am, I would have thee listen to a short story. Thou must know that a certain widow, fair, young, independent, and rich, and above all free and easy, fell in love with a sturdy, strapping young lay-brother. His superior came to know of it, and one day said to the worthy widow, by way of brotherly remonstrance, 
I am surprised, Signora, and not without good reason, that a woman of such high standing, so fair and so rich as you are, should have fallen in love with such a mean, low, stupid fellow as so-and-so, when in this house there are so many masters, graduates, and divinity students, from among whom you might choose as if they were a lot of pairs, saying, This one I'll take, that I won't take. But she replied to him with great sprightliness and candor, My dear sir, you are very much mistaken, and your ideas are very old-fashioned, if you think that I have made a bad choice in so-and-so, fool as he seems, because for all I want with him he knows as much in more philosophy than Aristotle. In the same way, Sancho, for all I want with Dulcinea del Tobaso, she is just as good as the most exalted princess on earth. It is not to be supposed that all those poets who sang the praises of ladies under the fancy names they give them had any such mistresses. Thinkest thou that the Amarillises, the Phyllises, the Silvias, the Dianas, the Galatias, the Felidas, and all the rest of them, that the books, the ballads, the barber shops, the theatres are full of were really and truly ladies of flesh and blood, and mistresses of those that glorify and have glorified them? Nothing of the kind. They only invent them, for the most part, to furnish a subject for their verses, and that they may pass for lovers, or for men valiant enough to be so. And so it suffices me to think and believe that the good Aldanza Lorenzo is fair and virtuous, and as to her pedigree, it is very little matter, for no one will examine into it for the purpose of conferring any order upon her, and I, for my part, reckon her the most exalted princess in the world. For thou shouldst know, Sancho, if thou dost not know, that two things alone beyond all others are incentives to love, and these are great beauty and a good name, and these two things are to be found in Dulcinea in the highest degree, for in beauty no one equals her, and a good name few approach her, and to put the whole thing in a nutshell, I persuade myself that all I say is as I say, neither more nor less, and I picture her in my imagination as I would have her to be, as well in beauty as in condition. Helen approaches her not, nor does Lucretia come up to her, nor any other of the famous women of times past, Greek, barbarian, or Latin, and let each say what he will, for if in this I am taken to task by the ignorant, I shall not be censured by the critical. I say that your worship is entirely right, said Sancho, and that I am an ass but I know not how the name of ass came into my mouth, for a rope is not to be mentioned in the house of him who has been hanged. But now for the letter, and then, God be with you, I'm off. Don Quixote took out the notebook, and retiring to one side, very deliberately began to write the letter, and when he had finished it, he called to Sancho, saying he wished to read it to him, so that he might commit it to memory. In case of losing it on the road, for with evil fortune, like his, anything might be apprehended. To which Sancho replied, Write it two or three times there in the book, and give it to me, and I will carry it very carefully, because to expect me to keep it in my memory is all nonsense, for I have such a bad one that I often forget my own name. But for all that, repeat it to me, as I shall like to hear it, for surely it will run as if it was in print. Listen, said Don Quixote, this is what it says. Don Quixote's letter to Dulcinea del Tobaso. Sovereign and exalted lady, the pierced by the point of absence, the wounded to the heart's core, sends thee, sweetest Dulcinea del Tobaso, the health that he himself enjoys not. If thy beauty despises me, if thy worth is not for me, if thy scorn is my affliction, though I be sufficiently long-suffering, Hardly shall I endure this anxiety, which, besides being oppressive, is protracted. My good squire, Sancho, will relate to thee in full, fair ingrate, dear enemy, the condition to which I am reduced on thy account, if it be thy pleasure to give me relief. 
I am thine. If not, do as may be pleasing to thee, for by ending my life I shall satisfy thy cruelty and my desire. Thine till death, the night of the rueful countenance. By the life of my father, said Sancho, when he heard the letter, it is the loftiest thing I have ever heard. Body of me, how your worship says everything as you like in it, and how well you fit in the knight of the rueful countenance into the signature. I declare your worship is indeed the very devil, and there is nothing you don't know. Everything is needed for the calling I follow, said Don Quixote. Now then, said Sancho, let your worship put the order for the three ass-colts on the other side, and sign it very plainly, that they may recognize it at first sight. With all my heart, said Don Quixote, and as he had written it, he read it to this effect. Mistress niece, by this first of ass-colts, please pay to Sancho Panza, my squire, three of the five I left at home in your charge said three ass-colts to be paid and delivered for the same number received here in hand which upon this and upon his receipt shall be duly paid done in the heart of the sierra morena the twenty seventh of august of this present year that will do said sancho now let your worship sign it there is no need to sign it said don quixote but merely to put my flourish which is the same as a signature and enough for three asses or even three hundred. I can trust your worship, returned Sancho. Let me go and saddle Rocinante, and be ready to give me your blessing, for I mean to go at once without seeing the fooleries your worship is going to do. I'll say I saw you do so many that she will not want any more. At any rate, Sancho, said Don Quixote, I should like, and there is reason for it, I should like thee, I say, to see me stripped to the skin and performing a dozen or two of insanities, which I can get done in less than half an hour, for having seen them with thine own eyes, thou canst then safely swear to the rest that thou wouldst add, and I promise thee thou wilt not tell of as many as I mean to perform. For the love of God, master mine, said Sancho, let me not see your worship stripped, for it will sorely grieve me, and I shall not be able to keep from tears, and my head aches so with all I shed last night for dapple, that I am not fit to begin any fresh weeping. But if it is your worship's pleasure that I should see some insanities, do them in your clothes, short ones, and such as come readiest to hand for I myself want nothing of the sort, and, as I have said, it will be a saving of time for my return, which will be with the news your worship desires and deserves. If not, let the lady Dulcinea look to it, if she does not answer reasonably. I swear as solemnly as I can that I will fetch a fair answer out of her stomach with kicks and cuffs, for why should it be borne that a knight-errant as famous as your worship should go mad without rhyme or reason for, uh, her ladyship had best not drive me to say it, for, by God, I will speak out and let off everything cheap, even if it doesn't sell. I am pretty good at that. She little knows me, faith. If she knew me, she'd be in awe of me. In faith, Sancho, said Don Quixote, to all appearance thou art no sounder in thy wits than I. I am not so mad, answered Sancho, but I am more peppery, but apart from all this, what has your worship to eat until I come back? Will you sally out on the road like Cardinio to force it from the shepherds? Let not that anxiety trouble thee, replied Don Quixote, for even if I had it I should not eat anything but the herbs and the fruits which this meadow and these trees may yield me. The beauty of this business of mine lies in not eating and in performing other mortifications. Do you know what I am afraid of, said Sancho upon this, that I shall not be able to find my way back to this spot where I am leaving you. It is such an out-of-the-way place. Observe the landmarks well, said Don Quixote, for I will try not to go far from this neighborhood, and I will even take care to mount the highest of these rocks to see if I can discover thee returning. However, not to miss me and lose thyself, the best plan will be to cut some branches of the broom 
that is so abundant about here, and as thou goest to lay them at intervals until thou hast come out upon the plain, these will serve thee, after the fashion of the clue in the labyrinth of Theseus, as marks and signs for finding me on thy return. So I will, said Sancho Panza, and having cut some, he asked his master's blessing, and not without many tears on both sides, took his leave of him, and mounting Rocinante, of whom Don Quixote charged him earnestly to have as much care as of his own person, he set out for the plain, strewing at intervals the branches of broom as his master had recommended him, and so he went his way, though Don Quixote still entreated him to see him do were it only a couple of mad acts. He had not gone a hundred paces, however, when he returned and said, I must say, Signor, your worship said quite right that in order to be able to swear without a weight on my conscience that I had seen you do mad things, it would be well for me to see if it were only one, though in your worship's remaining here I have seen a very great one. Did I not tell thee so? said Don Quixote. Wait, Sancho, and I will do them in the saying of a credo. And pulling off his breeches in all haste, he stripped himself to his skin and his shirt, and then, without more ado, he cut a couple of gambados in the air, and a couple of somersaults, heels overhead, making such a display that, not to see it a second time, Sancho wheeled Rocinante round, and felt easy and satisfied in his mind that he could swear he had left his master mad, and so we will leave him to follow his road until his return, which was a quick one. That's the end of Part 9, Chapter 25, Continued. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joplin Winner. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby, Part 13, Chapter 28, which treats of the strange and delightful adventure that befell the curate and the barber in the same Sierra. Happy and fortunate were the times when that most daring knight Don Quixote of La Mancha was sent into the world, for, by reason of his having formed a resolution so honorable as that of seeking to revive and restore to the world the long-lost and almost defunct order of knight-errantry, we now enjoy in this age of ours so poor and light entertainment not only the charm of his voracious history, but also of the tales and episodes contained in it which are, in a measure no less pleasing, ingenious, and truthful than the history itself, which, resuming its thread, carded, spun, and wound, relates that just as the curate was going to offer a consolation to Cardoneo, he was interrupted by a voice that fell upon his ears, saying in plaintive tones, O oh God, is it possible I have found a place that may serve as a secret grave for the weary load of this body that I support so unwillingly? If the solitude these mountains promise deceives me not, it is so. Ah, woe is me! How much more grateful to my mind will be the society of these rocks and breaks that permit me to complain of my misfortune to heaven than that of a, any human being, for there is none on earth to look to for counsel in doubt, comfort in sorrow, or relief in stress. All this was heard distinctly by the curate and those with him, and as it seemed to them to be uttered close by, as indeed it was, they got up to look for the speaker, and before they had gone twenty paces they discovered, behind a rock, seated at the foot of an ash-tree, a youth in the dress of a peasant, whose face they were unable at the moment to see as he was leaning forward, bathing his feet in the brook that flowed past. They approached so silently that he did not perceive them, being fully occupied in bathing his feet, which were so fair that they looked like two pieces of shining crystal brought forth among the other stones of the brook. The whiteness and beauty of these feet struck them with surprise, for they did not seem to have been made to crush clods or to follow the plough and the oxen as their owner's dress suggested, and so finding they had not been noticed. The curate, who was in front, made a sign to the other two to conceal themselves behind some fragments of rock that lay there, which they did, observing closely what the youth was about. He had on a loose double-skirted dark brown jacket bound tight to his body with a white cloth. He wore beside breeches and gaiters of brown cloth, and on his head a brown montera, and he had the gaiters turned up as far as the middle of the leg, which verily seemed to be of pure alabaster. 
As soon as he had done bathing his beautiful feet, he wiped them with a towel. He took them from under the Montera, on taking off which he raised his face, and those who were watching him had an opportunity of seeing a beauty so exquisite that Cardoneo said to the curate in a whisper, As this is not Lucinda, it is no human creature but a divine being. The youth then took off the Montera, and, shaking his head from side to side there, broke loose and spread out a mass of hair that the beams of the sun might have envied. By this they knew that what had seemed a peasant was a lovely woman, nay, the most beautiful the eyes of two of them had ever beheld, or even Cardoneo's, if they had not seen and known Lucinda, for he afterwards declared that only the beauty of Lucinda could compare with this. The long auburn tresses not only covered her shoulders, but such was their length and abundance concealed her all round beneath their masses, so that except the feet nothing of her form was visible. She now used her hands as a comb, and if her feet had seemed like bits of crystal in the water, her hands looked like pieces of driven snow among her locks, all which increased not only the admiration of the three beholders, but their anxiety to learn who she was. With this object they resolved to show themselves, and at the stir they made in getting upon their feet, the fair damsel raised her head, and, parting her hair from before her eyes with both hands, she looked to see who had made the noise, and the instant she perceived them she started to her feet, and, without waiting to put on her shoes or gather up her hair, hastily snatched up a bundle as though of clothes that she had beside her, and, scared and alarmed, endeavored to take flight. But before she had gone six paces she fell to the ground, her delicate feet being unable to bear the roughness of the stones. Seeing which, the three hastened toward her, and the curate, addressing her, first said, "'Stay, Signora, whoever you may be, for those whom you see here only desire to be of service to you. You have no need to attempt a flight so heedless, for neither can your feet bear it, nor we allow it.' Taken by surprise, and bewildered, she made no reply to these words. They, however, came towards her, and the curate, taking her hand, went on to say, "'What your dress would hide, Signora, is made known to us by your hair, a clear proof that it can be no trifling cause that has disguised your beauty in a garb so unworthy of it, and sent it into solitude like these where we have had the good fortune to find you, if not to relieve your distress, at least to offer you comfort, for no distress so long as life lasts can be so oppressive or reach such a height as to make the sufferer refuse to listen to comfort offered with good intention.' And so, Signora, or Signor, or whatever you prefer to be, dismiss the fears that our appearance has caused you, and make us acquainted with your good or evil fortunes, for from all of us together, or from each one of us, you will receive sympathy in your trouble. While the curate was speaking, the disguised damsel stood as if spellbound, looking at them without opening her lips or uttering a word, just like a village rustic to whom something strange that he has never seen before has been suddenly shown. But on the curate addressing some further words to the same effect to her, sighing deeply, she broke silence and said, Since the solitude of these mountains has been unable to conceal me, and the escape of my disheveled tresses will not allow my tongue to deal in falsehoods, it would be idle for me now to make any further pretense of what, if you were to believe me, you would believe more out of courtesy than for any other reason. This being so, I say, I thank you, sirs, for the offer you have made me, which places me under the obligation of complying with the request you have made of me, though I fear the account I shall give you of my misfortunes will excite in you as much concern as compassion, for you will be unable to suggest anything to remedy them, or any consolation to alleviate them. However, that my honor may not be left a matter of doubt in your minds, now that you have discovered me to be a woman, and see that I am young, alone, and in this dress things that taken together or separately would be enough to destroy any good name, I feel bound to tell what I would willingly keep secret if I could. All this she, who was now seen to be a lovely woman, delivered without any hesitation, with so much ease and in so sweet a voice that they were not less charmed by her intelligence than by her beauty, and as they again repeated their offers and entreaties to her to fulfill her promise, she, without further pressing, first modestly covering her feet and gathering up her hair, seated herself on a stone with the three placed around her, and, after an effort to restrain some tears that came to her eyes in a clear and steady voice, began her story thus. In this Andalusia there is a town from which a duke takes a title from which makes him one of those that are called Grandes of Spain. This nobleman has two sons, the elder heir to his dignity and apparently to his good qualities, the younger heir to I know not what, unless it be the treachery of Veledo and the falsehood of Gandalon. 
My parents are this lord's vassals, lowly in origin, but so wealthy that if birth had conferred as much on them as fortune, they would have had nothing left to desire, nor should I have had reason to fear trouble like that in which I find myself now, for it may be that my ill fortune came of theirs in that having been nobly born. It is true they are not so low that they have any reason to be ashamed of their condition, but neither are they so high as to re remove from my mind the impression that my mishap comes of their humble birth. They are, in short, peasants, plain, humble, humble people, without any taint of disreputable blood, and as the saying is, old rusty critch Christians, but so rich that by their wealth and free-handed way of life they are coming by degrees to be considered gentlefolks by birth and even by position, though the wealth and nobility that they thought most of was having me for their daughter, and as they have no other child to make their heir, and are affectionate parents, I was one of the most indulged daughters that ever parents indulged. It was the mirror in which they befelled themselves, the staff of their old age, and the object in which my submission to heaven, all their wishes centered, and mine were in accordance with theirs, for I knew their worth, and as I was mistress of their hearts, so was I also of their possessions. Through me they engaged or dismissed their servants, through my hands passed the accounts and returns of what was sown and reaped, the oil mills, the wine presses, the count of the flocks and herds, the beehives, all in short that a rich farmer like my father has or can have, I had under my care. And as I acted as steward and mistress with an assiduity on my part and satisfaction on theirs that I cannot well describe to you, the leisure hours left to me after I had given their requisite orders to their head shepherds or overseers and other laborers, I passed in such employment as are not only allowable but necessary for young girls, those that the needle, embroidery, cushion, and spinning wheel usually afford, and, if to refresh my mind I quitted them for a while, I found recreation in reading some devotional books or playing the harp, for experience taught me that music soothes the troubled mind and relieves weariness of spirit. Such was the life I led in my parents' house, and if I had depicted it thus minutely, it is not out of ostentation, or to let you know that I am rich, but that you may see how without any fault of mine I have fallen from the happy condition I have described to the misery I am in at present. The truth is that while I was leading this busy life in a retirement that might compare with that of a monastery, and unseen as I thought by any except the servants of the house, for when I went to Mass it was so early in the morning, and I was so closely attended by my mother and the women of the household, and so thickly veiled and so shy that my eyes scarcely saw more ground than I trod on. In spite of all this, the eyes of love or idleness, more properly speaking, that the lynxes cannot revile, discovered me with the help of and the assiduity of Don Fernando, for that is the name of the younger son of the duke I told of. The moment the speaker mentioned the name of Don Fernando, Cardineo changed color and broke into a sweat, with such signs of emotion that the curate and the barber, who observed it, feared that one of the mad fits which they had attacked him sometimes was coming upon him. But Cardineo showed no further agitation, and remained quiet, regarding the peasant girl with fixed attention, for he began to suspect who she was. She, however, without noticing the excitement of Cardineo, continuing her story, went on to say, and they had hardly discovered me when, as he owned afterwards, he was smitten with a violent love for me as the manner in which it displayed itself plainly showed. But to shorten the long recital of my woes, I will pass over in silence all the artifacts employed by Don Fernando for declaring his passion for me. He bribed all the household, he gave and offered gifts and presents to my parents. Every day was like a holiday or a merry-making in our street. By night no one could sleep for the music, the love-letters that used to come to my hand. No one knew how, more innumerable, full of tender pleadings and pledges, containing more promises and oaths than there were letters in them, all which not only did not soften me, but harden my heart against him, as if he had been my mortal enemy, and as if everything he did to make me yield were done with the opposite intention. Not that the high-bred bearing of Don Fernando was disagreeable to me, or that I found his importunities wearisome, for it gave me a certain sort of satisfaction to find myself so sought and prized by a gentleman of such distinction, and I was not displeased at seeing my praise in his letters. For, however ugly we women may be, it seems to me it always pleases us to hear ourselves called beautiful. 
but that my own sense of right was opposed to all this, as well as the repeated advice of my parents, who now very plainly perceived Don Fernando's purpose, for he cared very little if all the world knew it. They told me they trusted and confided their honor and good name to my virtue and rectitude alone, and bade me consider the disparity between Don Fernando and myself, from which I might conclude that his intentions, whatever he might say to the contrary, had for their aim his own pleasure rather than my advantage, and if I were at all desirous of opposing an obstacle to his unreasonable suit, they were ready, they said, to marry me at once to any one I preferred, either among the leading people of our own town, or of any of those in the neighborhood, for with their wealth and my good name a match might be looked for in any quarter. This offer and their sound advice strengthened my resolution, and I never gave Don Fernando a word in reply that could hold out to him any hope of success, however remote. All this caution of mine, which he must have taken for coyness, had apparently the effect of increasing his wanton appetite, for that is the name I give to his passion for me. Had it been what he declared it to be, you would not know of it now, because there would have been no occasion to tell you of it. At length he learned that my parents were contemplating marriage for me in order to put an end to this hopes of obtaining possession of me, or at least to secure additional protectors to watch over me and this intelligence or suspicion made him act as you shall hear. One night, as I was in my chamber, with no other companion than a damsel who waited on me, with the doors carefully locked, lest my honor should be imperiled through any carelessness, I know not nor can conceive how it happened, but with all this seclusion and these precautions, and in the solitude and silence of a retirement, I found him standing before me, a vision that so astounded me that it deprived me of eyes of sight and my tongue of speech. I had no power to utter a cry, nor, I think, did he give me time to utter one, as he immediately approached me, and taking me in his arms, for, overwhelmed as I was, I was powerless, I say, to help myself. He began to make such professions to me that I know not how falsehood could have had the power of dressing them up to seem so like truth, and the traitor contrived that his tears should vouch for his words, and his sighs for his sincerity. I, a poor young creature all alone, ill-versed among my people in cases such as this, began, I know not how, to think all these lying protestations true, though without being moved by his sighs and tears to anything more than pure compassion. And so, as the first feeling of bewilderment passed away, and I began in some degree to recover myself, I said to him, with more courage than I thought I could have possessed, If I, as I am now in your arms, Signor, I were in the claws of a fierce lion, and my deliverance could be preoccupied by doing or saying anything to the prejudice of my honor. It would no more be in my power to do it or say it than it would be possible that was, should not have been. So then, if you hold my body clasped in your arms, I have my soul secured by virtuous intentions, very different from yours, as you will see, if you attempt to carry them into effect by force. I am your vassal, but I am not your slave. Your nobility neither has nor should have any right to dishonor or degrade my humble birth, and low-born peasant as I am. I have my self-respect as much as you, a lord and gentleman. With me your violence will be to no purpose, your wealth will have no weight, your words will have no power to deceive me, nor your sighs or tears to soften me. Were I to see any of these things I speak of in him whom my parents gave me as a husband, his will should be mine, and mine should be bounded by his, and my honor being preserved, even though my inclinations were not, would willingly to yield him what you, Signor, would now obtain by force. And this I say, lest you should suppose that any but my lawful husband shall ever win anything of me. If that, said this loyal, disloyal gentleman, be the only scruple you feel, fairest Dorothea, for that is the name of this unhappy being, See here, I give you my hand to be yours, and let heaven, from which nothing is hid in this image of our old lady, you have here be witnessed of this pledge. When Cardineo heard her say she called Dorothea, he showed fresh agitation, and felt convinced of the truth of his former suspicion. But he was unwilling to interrupt the story, and wished to hear the end of what he already all but knew. So he merely said, What? Is Dorothea your name, Signora? I have heard of another of the same name who can perhaps match your misfortune. But proceed. By and by I may tell you something that will astonish you as much as it will excite your compassion. 
Dorothea was struck by Cardenio's words, as well as by his strange and miserable attire, and begged him, if he knew anything concerning her, to tell it to her at once, for if fortune had left her any blessing, it was courage to bear whatever calamity might fall upon her, as she felt sure that none could reach her capable of increasing in any degree what she endured already. I would not let the occasion pass, Signora, replied Cardenio, of telling you what I think, if what I suspect were the truth, but so far there has been no opportunity, nor is it any importance to you to know it. Be it as it may, replied Dorothea, what happened in my story was that Don Fernando, taking an image that stood in the chamber, placed it as a witness to our betrothal, and with that most blinding words and extravagant oaths, gave me his promise to become my husband, though before he had made an act of pledging himself, I bade him consider well what he was doing, and think of the anger his father would feel at seeing him married to a peasant girl and one of his vassals. I told him not to let my beauty, such as it was, blind him, for that was not enough to furnish an excuse for his transgressions, and if in the love he bore me he wished to do me any kindness, it would be to leave me lot to follow its course at the level my condition required, for marriages so unequal never brought happiness, nor did they continue long to afford the enjoyment they began with. All this that I have now repeated I said to him, and much more which I cannot recollect, but it had no effect in inducing him to forego his purpose. He who has no intention of paying does not trouble himself about difficulties when he is striking at the bargain. At the same time, I argued the matter briefly in my own mind, saying to myself, I shall not be the first who has risen through marriage from a lowly to a lofty station, nor will Don Fernando be the first whom beauty, or, as it more likely, a blind attachment, has led to mate himself below his rank. Then, since I am introducing no new usage or practice, I may as well avail myself of the honor that chances offer me, for even though inclination for me should not outlast the attainment of his wishes, I shall be, after all, his wife before God. And if I strive to repel him by scorn, I can see that fair means failing. He is in a mood to use force, and I shall be left dishonored, and without any means of proving my innocence to those who cannot know how innocently I have come to be in this position. For what arguments would persuade my parents that this gentleman entered my chamber without my consent? All these questions and answers passed through my mind in a moment, but the oaths of Don Fernando, the witnesses he appealed to, the tears he shed, and lastly the charms of his person and his high-bred grace, which accompanied by such signs of genuine love, might well have conquered a heart even more free and coy than mine. These were the things that more than all began to influence me, and led me unawares to my ruin. I called my waiting maid to me, that there might be a witness on earth beside those in heaven, and again Don Fernando renewed and repeated his oaths, invoked as witnesses fresh saints in addition to the former's ones, called down upon himself a thousand curses hereafter should he fail to keep his promise, shed more tears, redoubled his sighs, and pressed me closer in his arms, from which he had never allowed me to escape, and so I was left by my maid, and ceased to be one, and he became a traitor and a perjured man. The day which followed the night of my misfortune did not come so quickly, I imagine, as Don Fernando wished, for when desire has attained its object, the greatest pleasure is to fly from the scene of pleasure. I say so, because Don Fernando made all haste to leave me, and by the adroitness of my mind, who was indeed the one who had admitted him, gained the street before daybreak. But on taking leave of me, he told me, though not with as much earnestness and fervor as when he came, that I might rest assured of his faith, and of the sanctity and sincerity of his oaths. And to confirm his words, he drew a rich ring off his finger and placed it upon mine. He then took his departure, and I was left. I know not whether sorrowful or happy, all I can say is I was left agitated and troubled in mind, and almost bewildered by what had taken place, and I had not the spirit, or else it did not occur to me, to chide my maid for the treachery she had been guilty of in concealing Don Fernando in my chamber, for as yet I was unable to make up my mind whether what had befallen me was for good or evil. I told Don Fernando at parting that, as I was now his, he might see me on other nights in the same way, until it should be his pleasure to let the matter become known. But, except the following night, he came no more, nor for more than a month could I catch a glimpse of him in the street or in church, while I wearied myself with watching for one. Although I knew he was in the town, and almost every day went on out hunting, a pastime he was very fond of. I remember well how sad and dreary those days and hours were to me. I remember well how I began to doubt as they went by, and even to lose confidence in the faith of Don Fernando, 
and I remember, too, how my maid heard those words in reproof of her audacity that she had not heard before, and how I was forced to put a constraint on my tears, and on the expression of my countenance, not to give my parents cause to ask me why I was so melancholy, and drive me to invent falsehoods in reply. But all this was suddenly brought to an end, for the time came when all such considerations were disregarded, and there was no further question of honor, when my patience gave way, and the secret of my heart became known abroad. The reason was that a few days later it was reported in the town that Don Fernando had been married in a neighboring city to a maiden of rare beauty, the daughter of parents of distinguished position, though not so rich that her portion would entitle her to look for so brilliant a match. It was said, too, that her name was Lucinda, and that at the betrothal some strange things had happened. Cardenio heard the news of Lucinda, but he only shrugged his shoulders, bit his lips, and bent his brows, and before long two streams of tears escaped from his eyes. Dorothea, however, did not interrupt her story, but went on in these words. This sad intelligence reached my ears, and instead of being struck with a chill, with such wrath and fury did my heart burn that I scarcely restrained myself from rushing out into the streets, crying aloud and proclaiming openly the perfidy of treachery of which I was the victim. But this transport of rage was, for the time, checked by a resolution I formed, to be carried out the same night, and that was to assume this dress, which I got from a servant of my father's one of the Zagals, as they are called in farmhouses, to whom I confided the hold of my misfortune, and whom I entreated to accompany me to the city where I heard my enemy was. He, though remonstrated with me for my boldness, and condemned my resolution, when he saw me bent upon my purpose, offered to bear my company. As he said, to the end of the world, I at once packed up in a linen pillowcase a woman's dress and some jewels and money to provide for emergencies, and in the silence of the night, without letting my treacherous maid know, I sallied forth from the house, accompanied by my servant, and abundant anxieties, and on foot set out for the city, but borne as it were on wings by my eagerness to reach it, if not to prevent what I presumed to be already done, at least to call upon Don Fernando to tell me what conscious he had done. I reached my destination in two days and a half, and on entering the city inquired for the house of Lucinda's parents. The first person I asked gave me more in reply than I sought to know. He showed me the house, and told me all that occurred at the betrothal of the daughter of the family, an affair of such notoriety in the city that it was the talk of every knot of idlers in the street. He said that on the night of Don Fernando's betrothal with Lucinda, as soon as she had consented to be his bride by saying yes, she was taken with a sudden fainting fit, and that on the bridegroom approaching to unlace the bosom of her dress to give her air, he found a paper in her own writing in which she said and declared that she could not be Don Fernando's bride because she was already Cardoneros, who, according to the man's account, was a gentleman of distinction of the same city, and that, if she accepted Don Fernando, it was only in obedience to her parents. In short, he said the words of the paper made it clear she meant to kill herself on the completion of the betrothal, and gave her reasons for putting an end to herself all which was confirmed, it was said, by a dagger they found somewhere in her clothes. On seeing this, Don Fernando, persuaded that Lucinda had befooled slightly, and trifled with him, assailed her before she had recovered from her swoon, and tried to stab her with the dagger that had been found, and would have succeeded had not her parents and those who were present prevented him. It was said, moreover, that Don Fernando went away at once, and that Lucinda did not recover from her prostration until the next day, when she told her parents how she was really the bride of that Cardonero I have mentioned. I learned, besides, that Cardonero, according to report, had been present at the betrothal, and that upon seeing her betrothed contrary to his expectation, he had quitted the city in despair, leaving behind him a letter declaring the wrong Lucinda had done him, and his intention of going where no one should ever see him again. All this was a matter of notoriety in the city, and every one spoke of it, especially when it became known that Lucinda was missing from her father's house and from the city, for she was not to be found anywhere, to the distraction of her parents, who knew not what steps to take to recover her. What I learned revived my hopes, and I was better pleased not to have found Don Fernando than to find him married, for it seemed to me that the door was not yet entirely shut upon relief in my case and I thought that perhaps heaven had put this impediment in the way of the second marriage to lead him to recognize his obligations under the former one, and reflect that as a Christian he was bound to consider his soul above all human objects. All this passed through my mind, and I strove to comfort myself without comfort, indulging in faint and distant hopes of cherishing that life that I now abhor. But while I was in the city, uncertain what to do, as I could not find Don Fernando, 
I heard notice given by the public crier offering a great reward to anyone who should find me, and giving the particulars of my age and of the very dress I wore, and I heard it said that the lad who came with me had taken me away from my father's house, a thing that cut me to the heart, showing how low my good name had fallen, since it was not enough that I should lose it by my flight, but they must add with whom I had fled, and that one so much beneath me and so unworthy of my consideration. The instant I heard the notice, I quitted the city with my servant, who now began to show signs of wavering in his fidelity to me, and the same night, for fear of discovery, we entered the most thickly wooded part of these mountains. But, as is commonly said, one evil calls up another, and the end of one misfortune is apt to be the beginning of one still greater, and so it proved in my case, for my worthy servant, until then so faithful and trusty when he found me in this lonely spot, moved more by his own villainy than by my beauty, sought to take advantage of the opportunity which these solitudes seemed to present him, and, with little shame and less fear of God and respect for me, began to make overtures to me, and finding that I replied to the affrontery of his proposals with justly severe language, he laid aside the entreaties which he had employed at first, and began to use violence. But just heaven, that seldom fails to watch over and aid good intentions, so aided mine that with my slight strength and with little exertion I pushed him over a precipice, where I left him, whether dead or alive, I know not. And then, with great speed than seemed possible in my terror and fatigue, I made my way into the mountains without any other thought or purpose save that of hiding myself among them and escaping my father and those dispatched in search of me by his orders. It is now I know not how many months since with this object I came here, where I met a herdsman who engaged me as his servant at a place in the heart of the Sierra, and all this time I have been serving him as herd, striving to keep always a field to hide those lacks which have now unexpectedly betrayed me. But all my care and pains were unavailing, for my master made the discovery that I was not a man, and harbored the same base designs as my servant. And, as fortune does not always supply a remedy in cases of difficulty, and I had no precipice or ravine at hand down which to fling the master and cure his passion, as I had in the servant's case, I thought it a lesser evil to leave him and again conceal myself among these crags, than make trial of my strength and argument with him. So, as I say, once more I went into hiding to seek for some place where I might with sighs and tears implore heaven to have pity on my misery, and grant me help and strength to escape from it, or let me die among the solitudes, leaving no trace of an unhappy being who, by no fault of hers, has furnished matters for talk and scandal at home and abroad. End of chapter 28, part 13 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine Fitz, Davis, California. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Part 11, Chapter 29, which treats of the droll device and method adopted to extricate our love-stricken knight from the severe penance he had imposed upon himself. Such, sirs, is the true story of my sad adventures. Judge for yourselves now whether the sighs and lamentations you heard, and the tears that flowed from my eyes, had not sufficient cause even if I had indulged in them more freely. And if you consider the nature of my misfortune, you will see that consolation is idle, as there is no possible remedy for it. All I ask of you is, what you may easily and reasonably do, to show me where I may pass my life unharassed by the fear and dread of discovery by those who are in search of me. For though the great love my parents bear me makes me feel sure of being kindly received by them, so great is my feeling of shame at the mere thought that I cannot present myself before them as they expect, that I had rather banish myself from their sight for ever than look them in the face with the reflection that they beheld mine stripped of that purity they had a right to expect in me. With these words she became silent and the color that overspread her face showed plainly the pain and shame she was suffering at heart. 
In theirs the listeners felt as much pity as wonder at her misfortunes. But as the curate was just about to offer her some consolation and advice, Cardenio forestalled him, saying, So then, Signora, you are the fair Dorothea, the only daughter of the rich Clenardo? Dorothea was astonished at hearing her father's name, and at the miserable appearance of him who mentioned it, for it has already been said how wretchedly clad Cardenio was. So she said to him, And who may you be, brother, who seems to know of my father's name so well? For so far, if I remember rightly, I have not mentioned it in the whole story of my misfortunes. I am that unhappy being, Signora, replied Cardenio, whom, as you have said, Lucinda declared to be her husband. I am the unfortunate Cardenio, whom the wrong-doing of him who has brought you to your present condition has reduced to the state you see me in, bare, ragged, bereft of all human comfort, and what is worse, of reason, for I only possess it when heaven is pleased for some short space to restore it to me. I, Dorothea, am he who witnessed the wrong done by Don Fernando, and waited to hear the yes uttered by which Lucinda owned herself his betrothed. I am he who had not courage enough to see how her fainting fit ended, or what came of the paper that was found in her bosom, because my heart had not the fortitude to endure so many strokes of ill fortune at once. And so, losing patience, I quitted the house, and leaving a letter with my host, I betook myself to these solitudes, resolved to end here the life I hated as if it were my mortal enemy. But fate would not rid me of it, contenting itself with robbing me of my reason, perhaps to preserve me for the good fortune I have had in meeting you. For if that which you have just told us be true, as I believe it to be, it may be that heaven has yet in store for both of us a happier termination to our misfortunes than we look for. Because seeing that Lucinda cannot marry Don Fernando, being mine, as she has herself so openly declared, and that Don Fernando cannot marry her as he is yours, we may reasonably hope that heaven will restore us to what is ours, as it is still in existence and not yet alienated or destroyed. And as we have this consolation springing from no very visionary hope or wild fancy, I entreat you, Signora, to form new resolutions in your better mind, as I mean to do in mine preparing yourself to look forward to happier fortunes. For I swear to you by the faith of a gentleman and a Christian, not to desert you until I see you in possession of Don Fernando. And if I cannot by words induce him to recognize his obligation to you, in that case to avail myself of the right which my rank as a gentleman gives me, and with just cause challenge him, on account of the injury he has done you, not regarding my own wrongs, which I shall leave to heaven to avenge, while on earth I devote myself to yours. Cardenio's words completed the astonishment of Dorothea, and not knowing how to return thanks for such an offer, she attempted to kiss his feet, but Cardenio would not permit it, and the licentiate replied for both, commending the sound reasoning of Cardenio, and lastly, begged advised and urged them to come with him to his village, where they might furnish themselves with what they needed, and take measures to discover Don Fernando, or restore Dorothea to her parents, or do what seemed to them most advisable. Cardenia and Dorothea thanked him, and accepted the kind offer he made them, and the barber, who had been listening to all attentively and in silence, on his part some kindly words also, and with no less good will than the curate offered his services in any way that might be of use to them. He also explained to them in a few words the object that had brought them there, and the strange nature of Don Quixote's madness, and how they were waiting for his squire who had gone in search of him. Like the recollection of a dream, the quarrel he had had with Don Quixote came back to Cardenio's memory and he described it to the others. But he was unable to say what the dispute was about. At this moment they heard a shout, 
and recognized it as coming from Sancho Panza, who, not finding them where he had left them, was calling aloud to them. They went to meet him, and in answer to their inquiries about Don Quixote, he told them how he had found him stripped to his shirt, lank, yellow, half dead with hunger, and sighing for his lady Dulcinea. And although he had told him that she commanded him to quit that place, and come to El Tobaso, where she was expecting him, he had answered that he was determined not to appear in the presence of her beauty, until he had done deeds to make him worthy of her favour. And if this went on, Sancho said, he ran the risk of not becoming an emperor, as in duty bound, or even an archbishop, which was the least he could be, for which reason they ought to consider what was to be done to get away from there. The licentiate in reply told him not to be uneasy, for they would fetch him away in spite of himself. He then told Cardinia and Dorothea what they had proposed to do to cure Don Quixote, or at any rate, to take him home. Upon which Dorothea said she could play the distressed damsel better than the barber, especially as she had there the dress in which to do it to the life, and that they might trust her to acting the part in every particular requisite for carrying out their scheme, for she had read a great many books of chivalry, and knew exactly the style in which afflicted damsels begged boons of knights errant. In that case, said the curate, there is nothing more required than to set about it at once, for beyond a doubt fortune is declaring itself in our favour, since it has so unexpectedly begun to open a door for your relief, and smooth the way for us to our object. Dorothea then took out of her pillow-case a complete petticoat of some rich stuff, and a green mantle of some other fine material, and a necklace and other ornaments out of a little box. And with these, in an instant, she so arrayed herself that she looked like a great and rich lady. All this, and more, she said, she had taken from home in case of need, but until then she had had no occasion to make use of it. They were all highly delighted with her grace, air, and beauty, and declared Don Fernando to be a man of very little taste when he rejected such charms. But the one who admired her most was Sancho Panza, for it seemed to him, what indeed was true, that in all the days of his life he had never seen such a lovely creature. And he asked the curate with great eagerness who this beautiful lady was, and what she wanted in these out-of-the-way quarters. "'This fair lady, brother Sancho,' replied the curate, "'is no less a personage than the heiress in the direct male line of the great kingdom of Mikomikan, who has come in search of your master, to beg a boon of him, which is that he redress a wrong or injury that a wicked giant has done her, and from the fame as a good knight which your master has acquired far and wide, this princess has come from Guinea to seek him. A lucky seeking, and a lucky finding, said Sancho Panza at this especially if my master has the good fortune to redress that injury, and right that wrong, and kill that son of a bitch of a giant your worship speaks of, as kill him he will if he meets him, unless, indeed, he happens to be a phantom, for my master has no power at all against phantoms. But one thing among others I would beg of you, Signor Licensate, which is, that to prevent my master from taking a fancy to be an archbishop, for that is what I am afraid of, your worship would recommend him to marry this princess at once. For in this way he will be disabled from taking archbishop's orders, and will easily come into his empire, and I to the end of my desires. I have been thinking the matter over carefully, and by what I can make out, I find it will not do for me that my master should become an archbishop, because I am no good for the church, as I am married, and for me now, having as I have a wife and children, to set about obtaining dispensations to enable me to hold a place of profit under the church, would be endless work. So that, Signor, it all turns on my master marrying this lady at once, for as yet I do not know her grace, and I cannot call her by her name. She is called the Princess Mycomicona, said the curate, for as her kingdom is Mycomicon, it is clear that must be her name. 
"'There's no doubt of that,' replied Sancho, "'for I have known many to take their name and title from the place where they were born, "'and call themselves Pedro of Alcala, Juan of Ubeda, and Diego of Valladolid. "'And it may be that over there in Guinea, queens have the same way of taking the names of their kingdoms.' "'So it may,' said the curate. "'And as for your master's marrying, I will do all in my power towards it.' With which Sancho was much pleased, as the curate was amazed at his simplicity, and at seeing what a hold the absurdities of his master had taken of his fancy, for he had evidently persuaded himself that he was going to be an emperor. By this time Dorothea had seated herself upon the curate's mule, and the barber had fitted the ox-tail beard to his face. And they now told Sancho to conduct them to where Don Quixote was, warning him not to say that he knew either the licentiate or the barber, as his master's becoming an emperor entirely depended on his not recognizing them. Neither the curate nor Cardinio, however, thought fit to go with them. Cardinio, lest he should remind Don Quixote of the quarrel he had had with him, and the curate, as there was no necessity for his presence just yet. So they allowed the others to go on before them, while they themselves followed slowly on foot. The curate did not forget to instruct Dorothea how to act, but she said they might make their minds easy, as everything would be done exactly as the books of chivalry required and described. They had gone about three-quarters of a league when they discovered Don Quixote in a wilderness of rocks, by this time clothed, but without his armor. And as soon as Dorothea saw him, and was told by Sancho that this was Don Quixote, she whipped her palfrey, the well-bearded barber following her, and on coming up to him her squire sprang from his mule, and came forward to receive her in his arms and she, dismounting with great ease of manner, advanced to kneel before the feet of Don Quixote, and though he strove to raise her up, she, without rising, addressed him in this fashion. From this spot I will not rise, valiant and doughty knight, until your goodness and courtesy grant me a boon, which will redound to the honor and renown of your person, and render a service to the most disconsolate an afflicted damsel, the sun has seen. And if the might of your strong arm corresponds to the repute of your immortal fame, you are bound to aid the helpless being who, led by the saviour of your renowned name, hath come from far distant lands to seek your aid in her misfortunes. I will not answer a word, beauteous lady, replied Don Quixote, nor will I listen to anything further concerning you until you rise from the earth. I will not rise, Signor," answered the afflicted damsel, unless of your courtesy the boon I ask is first granted me. I grant it and accord it, said Don Quixote, provided without detriment or prejudice to my king, my country, or her who holds the key of my heart and freedom, it may be complied with. It will not be to the detriment or prejudice of any of them, my worthy lord, said the afflicted damsel. And here Sancho Panza drew close to his master's ear, and said to him very softly, Your worship may very safely grant the boon she asks. It's nothing at all, only to kill a big giant, and she who asks it is the exalted Princess Mycomicona, queen of the great kingdom of Mycomicon of Ethiopia. Let her be who she may, replied Don Quixote, I will do what is my bounden duty and what my conscience bids me, in conformity with what I have professed. And turning to the damsel, he said, Let your great beauty rise, for I grant the boon which you would ask of me. Then what I ask, said the damsel, is that your magnanimous person accompany me at once, whither I will conduct you, and that you promise not to engage in any other adventure or quest, until you have avenged me of a traitor, who against all human and divine law, has usurped my kingdom. I repeat that I grant it, replied Don Quixote, and so, lady, you may from this day forth lay aside the melancholy that distresses you, and let your failing hopes gather new life and strength, for with the help of God and of my arm, 
you will soon see yourself restored to your kingdom, and seated upon the throne of your ancient and mighty realm, notwithstanding and despite of the felons who would gainsay it. And now hands to the work, for in delay there is apt to be danger. The distressed damsel strove with much pertinacity to kiss his hands, but Don Quixote, who was in all things a polished and courteous knight, would by no means allow it, but made her rise, and embraced her with great courtesy and politeness, and ordered Sancho to look to Rocinante's girths, and to arm him without a moment's delay. Sancho took down the armor, which was hung up on a tree like a trophy, and having seen to the girths, armed his master in a trice, who, as soon as he found himself in his armor, exclaimed, Let us be gone, in the name of God, to bring aid to this great lady. The barber was all this time on his knees, at great pains to hide his laughter, and not let his beard fall, for had it fallen, maybe their fine scheme would have come to nothing. But now, seeing the boon granted, and the promptitude with which Don Quixote prepared to set out in compliance with it, he rose and took his lady's hand, and between them they placed her upon the mule. Don Quixote then mounted Rocinante, and the barber settled himself on his beast, Sancho being left to go on foot, which made him feel anew the loss of his dapple, finding the want of him now. But he bore all with cheerfulness, being persuaded that his master had now fairly started, and was just on the point of becoming an emperor, for he felt no doubt at all that he would marry the princess, and be king of Mycomicon at least. The only thing that troubled him was the reflection that his kingdom was in the land of the blacks, and that the people they would give him for vassals would all be black. But for this he soon found a remedy in his fancy, and he said to himself, What is it to me if my vassals are blacks? What more have I to do than make a cargo of them, and carry them to Spain, where I can sell them and get ready money for them, and with it buy some title or some office in which to live at ease all the days of my life? Not unless you go to sleep, and haven't the wit or skill to turn things to account, and sell three, six, or ten thousand vassals while you would be talking about it. By God I will stir them up, big and little, or as best I can, and let them be ever so black I'll turn them into white or yellow. Come, come, what a fool I am! And so he jogged on, so occupied with his thoughts and easy in his mind, that he forgot all about the hardship of travelling on foot. Cardinio and the curate were watching all this from among some bushes, not knowing how to join company with the others. But the curate, who was very fertile in devices, soon hit upon a way of effecting their purpose. And with a pair of scissors he had in a case, he quickly cut off Cardinio's beard, and putting on him a grey jerkin of his own, he gave him a black cloak, leaving himself in his breeches and doublet, while Cardinio's appearance was so different from what it had been, that he would not have known himself had he seen himself in a mirror. Having effected this, although the others had gone on ahead while they were disguising themselves, they easily came out on the high road before them, for the brambles and awkward places they encountered did not allow those on horseback to go as fast as those on foot. Then they posted themselves on the level ground, at the outlet of the Sierra, and as soon as Don Quixote and his companions emerged from it, the curate began to examine him very deliberately, as though he were striving to recognize him, and after having stared at him for some time, he hastened toward him with open arms, exclaiming, A happy meeting with the mirror of chivalry! my worthy compatriot Don Quixote of La Mancha, the flower and cream of high breeding, the protection and relief of the distressed, the quintessence of knights-errant. And so saying, he clasped in his arms the knee of Don Quixote's left leg. He, astonished at the stranger's words and behavior, looked at him attentively, and at length recognized him, very much surprised to see him there and made great efforts to dismount. This, however, the curate would not allow. 
on which Don Quixote said, Permit me, Señor Licentiate, for it is not fitting that I should be on horseback, and so reverend a person as your worship, on foot. On no account will I allow it, said the curate. Your mightiness must remain on horseback, for it is on horseback you achieve the greatest deeds and adventures that have been beheld in our age. As for me, an unworthy priest, it will serve me well enough to mount on the haunches of one of the mules of these gentlefolk who accompany your worship, if they have no objection, and I will fancy I am mounted on the steed Pegasus, or on the zebra or charger that bore the famous moor, Muzarake, who to this day lies enchanted in the great hill of Zulima, a little distance from the great Compluntum. Not even will that will I consent to, Signor Licentiate, answered Don Quixote, and I know it will be the good pleasure of my lady the princess, out of love for me, to order her squire to give up the saddle of his mule to your worship, and he can sit behind if the beast will bear it. It will, I am sure, said the princess, and I am sure, too, that I need not order my squire, for he is too courteous and considerate to allow a churchman to go on foot when he might be mounted. That he is, said the barber, and at once alighting he offered his saddle to the curate, who accepted it without much entreaty. But unfortunately, as the barber was mounting behind, the mule, being as it happened a hired one, which is the same thing as saying ill-conditioned, lifted its hind hoofs and let fly a couple of kicks in the air, which would have made Master Nicholas wish his expedition in quest of Don Quixote at the devil had they caught him on the breast or head. As it was, they so took him by surprise that he came to the ground, giving so little heed to his beard that it fell off, and all he could do when he found himself without it was to cover his face hastily with both his hands, and moaned that his teeth were knocked out. Don Quixote, when he saw all that bundle of beard detached, without jaws or blood, from the face of the fallen squire, exclaimed, By the living God! But this is a great miracle! It has knocked off and plucked away the beard from his face, as if it had been shaved off designedly. The curate, seeing the danger of discovery that threatened his scheme, at once pounced upon the beard, and hastened with it to where Master Nicholas lay, still uttering moans, and drawing his head to his breast had it on in a moment, muttering over him some words, which he said were a certain special charm for sticking on beards, as they would see. And as soon as he had it fixed he left him, and the squire appeared well bearded and whole as before, whereat Don Quixote was beyond measure astonished and begged the curate to teach him that charm when he had an opportunity, as he was persuaded its virtue must extend beyond the sticking on of beards, for it was clear that where the beard had been stripped off the flesh must have remained torn and lacerated, and when it could heal all that, it must be good for more than beards. And so it is, said the curate, and he promised to teach it to him at the first opportunity. They then agreed that for the present the curate should mount, and that the three should ride by turns until they reached the inn, which might be about six leagues from where they were. Three then being mounted, that is to say, Don Quixote, the princess, and the curate, and three on foot, Cardinio, the barber, and Sancho Panza, Don Quixote said to the damsel, Let your highness, lady, lead on, whithersoever is most pleasing to you. But before she could answer, the licentiate said, Towards what kingdom would your ladyship direct her course? Is it perchance toward that of Mycomicon? It must be, or else I know little about kingdoms. She, being ready on all points, understood that she was to answer yes. So she said, Yes, senor, my way lies toward that kingdom. In that case, said the curate, we must pass right through my village, and there your worship will take the road to Cartagena, where you will be able to embark, fortune favoring, and if the wind be fair, and the sea smooth and tranquil, in somewhat less than nine years you may come in sight of the great Lake Miona, I mean Meotidas, 
which is little more than a hundred days' journey this side of your highness's kingdom. "'Your worship is mistaken, signor,' said she, "'for it is not two years since I set out from it, and though I never had good weather, nevertheless I am here to behold what I so longed for, and that is my lord Don Quixote of La Mancha, whose fame came to my ears as soon as I set foot in Spain, and impelled me to go in search of him, to commend myself to his courtesy, and entrust the justice of my cause to the might of his invincible arm. Enough, no more praise, said Don Quixote at this, for I hate all flattery, and though this may not be so, still language of the kind is offensive to my chaste ears. I will only say, Signora, that whether it has might or not, that which it may or may not have, shall be devoted to your service, even to death. And now, leaving this to its proper season, I would ask the Signor Licinchit to tell me what it is that has brought him into these parts, alone, unattended, and so lightly clad that I am filled with amazement. I will answer that briefly, replied the curate. You must know then, Signor Don Quixote, that Master Nicholas, our friend and barber, and I, were going to Seville, to receive some money that a relative of mine, who went to the Indies many years ago, had sent me. And not such a small sum, but that it was over sixty thousand pieces of eight, full weight, which is something. And passing by this place yesterday, we were attacked by four footpads, who stripped us even to our beards, and them they stripped off, so the barber found it necessary to put on a false one. And even this young man here, pointing to Cardinio, they completely transformed. But the best of it is, the story goes in the neighborhood that those who attacked us belong to a number of galley slaves, who, they say, were set free almost on the very same spot by a man of such valor that in spite of the commissary and of the guards, he released the whole of them. And beyond all doubt he must have been out of his senses, or he must be as great a scoundrel as they, or some man without heart or conscience, to let the wolf loose among the sheep, the fox among the hens, the fly among the honey. He has defrauded justice, and opposed his king and lawful master, for he opposed his just cabans. He has, I say, robbed the galleys of their feet, stirred up the holy brotherhood, which for many years past has been quiet, and lastly has done a deed by which his soul may be lost without any gain to his body. Sancho had told the curate and the barber of the adventure of the galley slaves, which so much to his glory his master had achieved. And hence the curate, in alluding to it, made the most of it to see what would be said or done by Don Quixote, who changed color at every word, not daring to say that it was he who had been the liberator of these worthy people. These then, said the curate, were they who robbed us, and God in his mercy pardon him who would not let them go to the punishment they deserved. End of Part 11